Volume One, Part One, Chapter One of War and Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. Volume One, Part One, 1805. Chapter One. Well, Prince, Genoa and Lucha are now nothing more than the Aponige, than the private property of the Bonaparte family. I warn you that if you do not tell me we are going to have a war, if you still allow yourself to condone all the infamies, all the atrocities of this Antichrist, on my word, I believe he is Antichrist, that is the end of our acquaintance. You are no longer my friend. You are no longer my faithful slave, as you call yourself. Now be of good courage. I see I frighten you. Come, sit down and tell me all about it. It was on a July evening, 1805, that the famous Anna Pavlovna Scherer, maid of honor and confidant of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna, thus greeted the influential statesman, Prince Vasily, who was the first to arrive at her reception. Anna Pavlovna had been coughing for several days. She had the grip, as she affectionately called her influenza, grip, at that time being a new word only occasionally employed. A number of little notes distributed that morning by a footsman in red livery had been all couched in the same terms. If you have nothing better to do, Monsieur le Comte, or Mon Prince, and if the prospect of spending the evening with a poor invalid is not too dismal, I shall be charmed to see you at my house between seven and ten. Annette Scherer. Oh, what a savage attack, rejoined the prince, as he came forward in his embroidered court uniform, stockings, and diamond-buckled shoes, and with an expression of serenity on his insipid face, showing that he was not in the least disturbed by this reception. He spoke that elegant French, in which Russians formerly not only talked, but also thought, and his voice was low and patronizing, as becomes a distinguished man who has spent a long life in society and at court. He went up to Anna Pavlovna, kissed her hand, bending down to it his perfumed and polished bold head, and then he seated himself comfortably on the sofa. First tell me how you are, cher ami. Calm your friend's anxiety, said he, speaking in Russian, but not altering the tone of his voice, which— in spite of the gallant and sympathetic nature of his remark, still betrayed indifference and even raillery. How can one be well, when one's moral sensibilities are so tormented? Is it possible in these days for a person possessed of any feeling to remain calm? exclaimed Anna Pavlovna. You will spend the evening with us, I hope? Ah, but the English ambassador's fete. It is Wednesday, you know. I must show myself there said the prince. My daughter is coming for me, to take me there. I thought that had been postponed. I confess all these fetes and fireworks are beginning to grow insipid. If they had known that it was your desire, they would have postponed the fete, said the prince, from habit, like a watch wound up, saying things which he had no expectation of being believed. Don't tease me. Well, what decision has been reached in regard to Novosilstov's dispatch? You know everything. How can I tell you, said the prince, in a cold tone of annoyance, what decision has been reached? This, that Bonaparte has burnt his ships, and I believe that we are about to burn ours. Prince Vasily always spoke indolently, like an actor rehearsing an old part. Anna Pavlovna, on the contrary, in spite of her forty years, was full of vivacity and impulses. Being an enthusiast had given her a peculiar position in society, and sometimes, even when it was contrary to her own inclinations, she worked herself up to the proper pitch of enthusiasm, so as not to disappoint her acquaintances. The suppressed smile constantly playing over her face, although incongruous with her faded features, expressed, just as in the case of spoiled children, the unfailing consciousness of a failing on the side of amiability, which she could not and would not correct, even if she thought it advisable. 
They got deep in a conversation about political matters, and Anna Pavlovna became thoroughly heated. Oh, don't say anything to me about Austria. Perhaps I do not know anything about it, but Austria has never wished for war, and she does not now. She is betraying us. Russia alone must be the salvation of Europe. Our benefactor realizes his high calling, and will be faithful to it. That is one thing in which I have a firm belief. The grandest part in the world lies before our kind and splendid sovereign, and he is so benevolent and good that God will not abandon him, and he will fulfill his mission of crushing the hydra of revolution, which is now more monstrous than ever, in the face of this murderer and scoundrel. We alone are called upon to redeem the blood of the just. On whom can we rely, I ask you? England, with her commercial spirit, does not understand, and cannot understand, all the loftiness of soul of the Emperor Alexander. She has refused to evacuate Malta. She is anxious to find. She is seeking for some secret motive in our actions. What did they say to Novosilstov? Nothing. They do not and they cannot understand the self-denial of our Emperor, who wishes nothing for his own gain, but everything for the good of the world. And what have they promised? Nothing. Even what they have promised will not be performed. Prussia has already declared that Bonaparte is invincible, and that all Europe is powerless before him, and I have not the slightest faith in Hedenburg or Hogwitz. This famous Prussian neutrality is only a snare. I believe in God alone, and in the high destiny of our beloved Emperor. He will save Europe. She suddenly paused, with a smile of amusement at her own impetuosity. I think, said the prince, smiling, that if you had been sent instead of our dear Vitzengeroda, you would have taken the king of Prussia's consent by storm. You are so eloquent. Will you give me some tea? Directly, apropos, she added, becoming calm once more. This evening I shall have two very interesting men. Le Vicomte de Montmartre, connected with Montmercy's, through the Rohans, one of the best families of France. He is one of the decent emigrants of the genuine sort. And then Le Abbe Morio. You know that profound mind. He has been received by the sovereign. Do you know him? Ah, I shall be most happy, said the prince. But tell me, he went on to say, as though something just at that moment for the first time occurred to him, whereas in reality this question was the chief object of his visit. Is it true that La Pera Tres Mer wishes Baron Funke to be named as first secretary at Vienna? It seems to me that this baron is a poor specimen. Prince Vasily was anxious for his son to get the appointment to this place, which a party was trying to secure for the baron through the influence of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Anna Pavlovna almost closed her eyes to signify that neither she nor anyone else could tell what would satisfy or please the Empress. Baron Funke was recommended to the Empress Dowager by her sister, she said in French, curtly, dryly, and in a melancholy tone. Whenever Anna Pavlovna spoke of the Empress, her face suddenly assumed a deep and genuine expression of devotion and deference tinged with melancholy, and this was characteristic of her at all times when she was reminded of her august patroness. She said that Her Majesty had been pleased to show Baron Funke beaucoup de thème, and again the shade of melancholy passed over her face. The prince preserved an indifferent silence. Anna Pavlovna, with a quickness and dexterity characteristic of a woman, and especially of one brought up at court, had taken pains to give the prince a rap because of his daring to speak in dispraise of a person who had been recommended to the empress, and at the same time she consoled him. Mais à propos de votre famille, she added, do you know that your daughter, since she came out, has roused the enthusiasm of all our best people? She is considered to be as lovely as the day. The prince bowed in token of his respect and gratitude. I often think, perused Anna Pavlovna, after a moment's silence, drawing a little closer to the prince and giving him a flattering smile, as though to imply that she had nothing more to say about politics and society, but was ready to enter into a confidential chat. I often think how unfairly happiness in life is distributed. 
why should fate have given you two such splendid children? I don't count Anatole, your youngest, for I don't like him, she said decisively, in a way of parenthesis, and raising her brows. Two such lovely children. And really you do not appreciate them, and therefore do not deserve them. And she smiled her enthusiastic smile. Cavoulez-vous? Lavater would have said that I lack the bump of philoprogenitiveness, said the prince. Now stop joking. I wanted to have a serious talk with you. You must know I am out of patience with your youngest son. Between you and me, here her face assumed its melancholy expression, they have been talking about him at Her Majesty's and pitying you. The prince made no reply, but she paused and looked at him significantly while waiting for his answer. Prince Vasily frowned. "'What do you wish me to do?' he exclaimed at last. "'You know I have done everything for their education that is in a father's power, and both have turned out des imbeciles. Ippolit is nothing worse than an inoffensive idiot, but Anatole is one of quite an opposite stamp. "'There is that difference between them,' said he, with a smile more natural and animated than usual, and at the same time allowing an unexpectedly coarse and disagreeable expression to be most distinctly manifest in the wrinkles around his mouth. "'And why is it that such men as you have children? If you were not a father, I should not be able to find fault with you about anything,' said Anna Pavlovna, lifting her eyes pensively. "'I am your faithful slave, and I can confess it to you alone. My children are the stumbling-blocks of my existence.' this is my cross that is the way i explain it to myself que voulez vous he paused expressing with a gesture his submission to his cruel fate anna pavlovna was lost in thought has it never occurred to you to find a wife for your prodigal son they say old maids have a mania for matchmaking i am not as yet conscious of this weakness but i know a petite personne who is very unhappy with her father a relative of ours, un princess Bolkonskaya. Prince Vasily made no reply, but the motion of his head showed that, with the swiftness of calculation and memory characteristic of men of the world, he was taking her suggestion into consideration. "'Do you know that this Anatole cost me forty thousand a year?' said he, evidently unable to restrain the painful current of his thoughts. He hesitated. What will it be five years hence, if it goes this rate? Voilà l'advantage d'être père. Is she rich, this princess of yours? Her father is very rich and stingy. He lives in the country. You know, he is that famous Prince Bolkonsky, who retired during the lifetime of the late emperor. He was nicknamed the King of Prussia. He is a very clever man, but full of whims and a trial. La pauvre petite is as unhappy as she can be. She has a brother who recently married Lise Meinen. He is on Kutuzov's staff. He will be here this evening. Listen, Sharonet, said the prince, suddenly taking his companion's hand and bending it down for some reason. Arrangez moi cette affaire, and I will be your faithfulest slave for ever and ever. She is of good family and rich, all that I require and with that easy and natural grace for which he was distinguished, he raised her hand, kissed it, and having kissed it, still retained it in his, while he settled back in his armchair and looked to one side. Attendi, said Anna Pavlovna, after a moment of consideration, I will speak about it this very evening, to Lise, young Bolkonsky's wife, and perhaps it can be arranged. In your family I shall begin my old maid's apprenticeship, End of chapter 1people most widely differing in age and character, but alike in that they all belonged to the same class of society. Prince Vasily's daughter, the beautiful Ellen, came, 
in order to go with her father to the ambassador's reception. She was in ball toilette and wore the imperial decoration. There came also the little, young Princess Bolkonskaya, known as the most fascinating woman in Petersburg. She had been married during the past winter, and now, owing to her expectations, had ceased to appear at large entertainments, but still went to small receptions. Prince Ippolit, Prince Vasily's son, came with Montmartre, whom he was introducing to society. The Abbe Morio and many others also came. "'Have you seen my aunt yet?' or, "'Do you know my aunt?' asked Anna Pavlovna of her guests as they came in, and with perfect seriousness she would lead them up to a little old lady wearing tremendous bows who had sailed out from the next room the moment the guests began to arrive, and she presented them by name, deliberately looking from guest to aunt, and then going back to her place again. All the guests had to go through the formality of an introduction to this superfluous aunt, whom no one knew or cared to know. Anna Pavlovna, with a melancholy, rapturous expression of sympathetic approval, silently listened to their exchange of formalities. Montante spoke to all newcomers in precisely the same terms about their health, her own health, and the health of Her Majesty, which was better today, thank God. All those who fell into her clutches, though from politeness they showed no undue haste, made their escape with the consciousness of relief at having accomplished a disagreeable duty, and took pains not to stay near the old lady, or to come into her vicinity again during the evening. The young Princess Bolkonskaya came, bringing some work in a gold-embroidered velvet bag. Her pretty little upper lip, just shaded by an almost imperceptible down, was rather alert, but all the more fascinating when it displayed her teeth, and more fascinating still when she drew it down a little and closed it against the underlip. As is always the case with perfectly charming women, her defect of a short lip and a half-open mouth seemed like a peculiar distinction and an addition to her beauty. It was a delight for all to look at this beautiful young woman so full of health and life, and so gracious with the promise of coming motherhood. Old men, and surly young men, soured before their time, as they looked at her, seemed to become like her, after being in her presence and talking with her for a little time. Whoever spoke with her and saw her bright smile, and her shining white teeth, displayed at every word, was sure to go away with the impression that he had been unusually agreeable that day. And everyone felt the same. The young princess, with her work-bag in her hand, making her way along with short, quick steps, passed around the table, and joyously disposing her dress, sat down on the sofa near the silver samovar, as though all that she did was partie de paisière for herself and all around her. "'I have brought my work,' she said in French, opening her reticule and addressing the whole company. "'Now see here, Annette, don't play a naughty trick upon me,' she went on to say, turning to the hostess. "'You wrote me that it was to be a little informal soiree. See how unsuitably I am dressed.' and she spread out her arm so as to display her elegant grey gown trimmed with lace and belted high with a wide ribbon. "'Soyez tranquille, Lise,' replied Anna Pavlovna. "'You will always be the most beautiful of all.' "'You know my husband is deserting me,' continued the young princess, still in French, and addressing a general. "'He is going to meet his death. Tell me, why this wretched war?' she added, this time speaking to Prince Vasily and without waiting for his rejoinder, she had some remark to make to Prince Vasily's daughter, the handsome Ellen. "'Quelle délicieuse personne, que cette petite prosaise,' whispered Prince Vasily to Anna Pavlovna. Shortly after the young princess's arrival, a huge, stout young man came in. His head was close-cropped, he had on eyeglasses, and wore stylish light trousers, an immense frill, and a cinnamon-coloured coat." This stout young man was the illegitimate son of Count Bezukhoi, a famous grandee of Catherine's time, and now lying at the point of death in Moscow. He had not as yet entered any branch of the service, having just returned from abroad, where he had been educated, and this was his first appearance in society. Anna Pavlovna welcomed him with a nod reserved for men of the very least importance in the hierarchy of her salon. But notwithstanding this greeting, almost contemptuous in its way, Anna Pavlovna's face, as Pierre came toward her, 
expressed anxiety and dismay such as one experiences at the sight of anything too huge and out of place. Pierre was indeed rather taller than anyone else in the room, but the princess's dismay could have been caused only by the young man's intelligent and at the same time diffident glance, so honest and keen that it distinguished him from everyone else in the room. "'It is very kind of you, Monsieur Pierre, to come and see a poor invalid,' said Anna Pavlovna, looking up in alarm from her aunt, to whom she was conducting him. Pierre blurted out some incoherent reply, and continued to let his eyes wander around the assembly. With a gay, rapturous smile he bowed to the little princess, as though she were an intimate friend, and was led up to the aunt. Anna Pavlovna's alarm was justified, for Pierre did not wait for the old lady to finish her discourse about Her Majesty's health, but left her in the midst of it. Anna Pavlovna, in dismay, tried to detain him with the words, "'Do you know the Abbe Morio?' she asked. "'He is a very interesting man.' "'Yes, I have heard of his plan for a perpetual peace, and it is very interesting, but hardly feasible.' "'Do you think so?' said Anna Pavlovna, for the sake of saying something, and once more returning to her duties as hostess. But Pierre was now guilty of an incivility of an opposite nature. Before, he had left a lady without allowing her to finish speaking. Now he detained another lady, and made her listen to him, though she wished to leave him. Bending his head down, and spreading his long legs, he began to show Anna Pavlovna why he conceived that the abbe's plan was chimerical. "'We will talk about that by and by,' said Anna Pavlovna, with a smile. And having turned away from this young man who did not know the ways of polite society, she once more devoted herself to her duties as hostess, and continued to listen and look on, ready to lend her aid whenever conversation was beginning to flag. Just as the proprietor of a spinning establishment, who has stationed his workmen at their places, walks up and down on his tour of inspection, and when he notices any spindle that has stopped, or that makes an unusually loud or creaking noise, hastens to it, and checks it, or sets it going in its proper rote, even so Anna Pavlovna, as she walked up and down her drawing-room, came to some group that was silent, or that was talking too excitedly, and by a single word, or a silent transposition, she set the talking machine in regular, decorous running order again. But while she was occupied with these labors, it could be seen that she was all the time in a special dread of Pierre, she watched him anxiously while he went to listen to what was said in the circle around Montmartre, and then joined another group, where the abbé was discoursing. For Pierre, who had been educated abroad, this reception at Anna Pavlovna's was the first introduction to society in Russia. He knew that all the intellect of Petersburg was gathered here, and like a child in a toy show, he kept his eyes open. He was all the time afraid of missing some clever conversation that might interest him, as he saw the assured and refined expressions on the faces of those gathered here, he was ever on the lookout for something especially intellectual. He had finally come to where Morio was. The conversation seemed to him interesting, and he stood there waiting a chance to air his opinions, as young men are fond of doing. End of chapter 2 Part One, Chapter Three of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Anna Pavlovna's reception was in full swing. The spindles on all sides were buzzing smoothly and without halt, with the exception of Ma Tante, near whom sat only one elderly lady with a thin, tear-worn face, a poor soul rather out of place in this brilliant society. The guests were divided into three circles. In one, for the most part, composed of men, the Abbe Morio formed the centre. In the second, there were young people grouped around the beautiful Princess Ellen, Prince Vasily's daughter, and the pretty little Princess Bolkonskaya, fair and rosy, but too stout for her age. In the third were Montmartre and Anna Pavlovna. The Viscount was an attractive-looking young man, with delicate features and refined manners, he evidently regarded himself as a celebrity, but through his good breeding, modestly allowed the company with which he mingled to profit by his presence. It was plain to see that Anna Pavlovna served him as a treat for her guests, just as a good maitre d'hôtel offers a supernaturally delicious dish, 
some piece of meat which no one would feel like eating were it seen in the unsavoury kitchen so this evening anna pavlovna served up to her guests first the viscount then the abbe as some sort of supernatural delicacy in montmartre circle they immediately began to discuss the murder of the duc d'angillon the viscount maintained that the duke had fallen victim to his own magnanimity and that there had been personal reasons for bonaparte's ill-will ah voyons contez-nous cela vicomte said anna pavlovna ecstatically with a consciousness that this phrase contez-nous cela vicomte tell us about it viscount had a certain ring like louis the fifteenth the viscount bowed in token of submission and smiled urbanely anna pavlovna made her circle close in around the viscount and invited all to hear his account the viscount knew the duke personally whispered anna pavlovna in french to one of her guests the viscount is wonderfully clever at telling a story she said to another how easy it is to tell a man used to good society she exclaimed to a third and the viscount was offered to the company in a halo most exquisite and flattering to himself like a roast beef garnished with parsley on a hot platter the viscount was just about beginning his narration and a faint smile played over his lips come over here cherlaine said anna pavlovna to the lovely young princess who was seated at some little distance the centre of the second group the princess ellen smiled she stood up with the smile on her face so natural to a perfectly beautiful woman and which she had worn when she first came into the room lightly trailing her white ball dress ornamented with smilax and moss with shoulders gleaming white with glossy hair and flashing gems she made her way through the ranks of the men who stood aside to let her pass and not looking at any one in particular but smiling on all and as it were amiably granting each one the privilege of viewing the beauty of her form of her plump shoulders of her beautiful bosom and back exposed by the low cut of the dress then in vogue seeming to personify the radiance of festivity she crossed over to anna pavlovna's side ellen was so lovely that not only there was not a shade of coquetry to be perceived in her but on the contrary she was as it were conscience stricken at her unquestionable and all-conquering maidenly beauty she seemed to have the will but not the power to diminish the effect of her loveliness quelle belle personne was remarked by all who saw her the viscount as though overwhelmed by something quite out of the ordinary shrugged his shoulders and dropped his eyes at the moment she took her seat in front of him and turned upon him the radiance of that perpetual smile madame i fear my ability is not on par with such an audience said he inclining his head with a smile the young princess rested her bare round arm on the table and did not think it incumbent upon her to say anything in reply she smiled and waited all the time that he was telling his story she sat upright glancing occasionally now at her beautiful plump arm which by its pressure on the table altered its shape now at her still more beautiful bosom on which she adjusted her diamond necklace once or twice she smoothed out the folds of her dress and when the story was unusually impressive she would look at anna pavlovna and for an instant assume the very same expression that was on the frulein's face and then again relapse into her calm radiant smile the little princess bolkonskaya also left the tea-table and followed ellen wait a moment i am going to bring my work she exclaimed vous she added turning to prince ippolit bring me my work-bag the young wife smiling and having a word for every one quickly effected her transmigration and as she took her seat merrily arranged herself now i am comfortable she exclaimed and begging the viscount to begin she set herself to her work again prince ippolit brought her the bag and placing his chair near her sat down le cher Hippolyte struck one by his extraordinary likeness to his sister the beautiful ellen and still more by the fact that in spite of this likeness he was astonishingly ugly his features were the same as his sister's but in her case all was illumined by her radiantly joyous self-contented unfailing smile of life and youth and the remarkable classic beauty of her form in the case of the brother on the contrary the face though the same was befogged with an idiotic expression 
and looked always self-conceited and sulky, and his body was lean and feeble. Eyes, nose, mouth, all were fixed, as it were, in a perpetual grimace vaguely indicative of his discontented state of mind, while his arms and legs always assumed some unnatural attitude. "'This is not a ghost story, is it?' he asked, as he sat down near the princess and hastily put on his eyeglasses, as though without this instrument it were impossible for him to say a word. "'Why, no, my dear,' replied the astonished narrator, shrugging his shoulders. "'Because I detest ghost stories,' he added, and it was plain from his tone that only after he had spoken these words he realized their significance. The self-assurance with which he spoke was so complete no one could tell whether his remark was very witty or very stupid. He wore a dark green coat, pantaloons of a shade that he called Quiz de Nonf Fray, and stockings and pumps. The Viscount gave a very clever rendering of an anecdote at that time going the rounds, to the effect that the Duc d'Angillon had gone secretly to Paris to see Mademoiselle Georges, and there met Bonaparte, who also enjoyed the favours of the famous actress, and that Napoleon, on meeting the Duke there, happened to fall into one of the swoons to which he was subject, and thus came into the Duke's power. But the Duke refrained from taking advantage of it, while Bonaparte, in return for this magnanimity, revenged himself in the Duke's death. The story was very nice and interesting, especially the place where the rivals suddenly recognized each other, and the ladies, it appeared, were moved. Charmant, exclaimed Anna Pavlovna, looking interrogatively at the little princess. Charmant, whispered the little princess, looking for her needle in her work, as though to signify that the interest and charm of the tale had prevented her from going on with her sewing. The viscount was flattered by this mute tribute of praise, and with a gratified smile was about to continue. But at this instant Anna Pavlovna, who kept her eye constantly on the young man who seemed to her so dangerous, noticed that he and the abbe were talking altogether too loud and energetically, and she hastened to carry aid to the imperiled place. In reality, Pierre had succeeded in leading the abbe into a conversation on political equipoise, and the abbe, evidently interested by the young man's frank impetuosity, was giving him the full benefit of his pet idea. Both were talking and listening with too much natural ardor, and this was displeasing to Anna Pavlovna. "'By what means? The balance of Europe, and droit des gens,' the abbe was saying. "'It is possible for one powerful empire like Russia, having the repute of being barbarous, to take her stand disinterestedly at the head of an alliance whose aim is the balance of Europe, and she would save the world.' how would you bring about this balance of power pierre was beginning to ask but just at this instant anna pavlovna joined them and giving pierre a stern glance asked the italian how he bore the climate of petersburg the italian's face instantly changed and took on an offensively affectedly soft expression which was evidently habitual with him when he engaged in conversation with women i am so enchanted by the charms of the wit and culture especially among the women of the society into which I have the honor of being received, that I have not had time as yet to think of the climate, said he. Anna Pavlovna, making sure of Pierre and the abbe, brought them into the general circle, so that she might keep them under her observation. At this moment a new personage appeared in the drawing-room. This new personage was the young prince, Andrei Bolkonsky, the husband of the little princess. Prince Balkonsky was a very handsome youth of medium height, with strongly marked and stern features. Everything about him, from the weary, bored expression of his eyes to the measured deliberation of his step, presented a striking contrast with his little lively wife. He was not only acquainted, it seemed, with every one in the room, but found them so tedious that even to look at them and hear their voices was too much for his equanimity. Of all those faces there, apparently, the face of his lovely little wife was the one that bored him the most. With a grimace that disfigured his handsome face, he turned away from her. He kissed Anna Pavlovna's hand, and with half-closed eyes looked round at the assembly. "'So, are you getting ready for war, Prince?' asked Anna Pavlovna. "'General Kutuzov has been kind enough to desire me as his aide-de-camp.' He spoke in French, 
and accented the last syllable of Kutuzov's name like a Frenchman. Elise, votre femme? She will go into the country. Isn't it a sin for you to deprive us of your charming wife? Andre, exclaimed the little princess, addressing her husband in the same coquettish tone that she employed toward strangers. You should have heard the story the Viscount has been telling us about Mademoiselle Georges and Bonaparte. Prince André frowned and turned away. Pierre, who from the moment that Prince André entered the room had not taken his merry, kindly eyes from him, now came to him and took him by the arm. Prince André, without looking round, again contracted his face into a grimace expressing his annoyance that any one should touch his arm, but when he saw Pierre's smiling face, his face lighted up with an unexpectedly kind and pleasant smile. "'What is this?' "'You also in gay society,' said he to Pierre. "'I knew that you would be here,' replied Pierre. "'I will go home to supper with you,' he added in a whisper, "'so as not to disturb the Viscount, who is proceeding with his story. "'Can I?' "'No, of course you can't,' said Prince André, laughing, "'and by a pressure of the hand giving Pierre to understand "'that he had no need of asking such a question. "'He had something more on his tongue's end, but at this moment— Prince Vasily and his daughter arose, and the two young men stood aside to give them room to pass. "'You will excuse me, my dear Viscount,' said Prince Vasily, courteously insisting that the Frenchman should keep his seat. "'This unfortunate ball at the embassy deprives me of a pleasure, and compels us to interrupt you. I am very sorry to leave your delightful reception,' he said to Anna Pavlovna. His daughter, the Princess Ellen, gracefully holding the folds of her dress, made her way among the chairs, and the smile on her lovely face was more radiant than ever. Pierre looked with almost startled, though enthusiastic eyes, at the beautiful creature as she passed by him. "'Very handsome,' said Prince André. "'Very,' said Pierre. As he went by, Prince Vasily seized Pierre by the hand and turned to Anna Pavlovna. "'Train this bear for me,' said he. "'He has been living a month at my house,' and this is the first time that I have seen him in society. Nothing is so advantageous for a young man as the society of clever women. End of chapter 3 Part 1, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Anna Pavlovna smiled and promised to look out for Pierre, who was, as she knew, on his father's side related to Prince Vasily. The elderly lady who had been sitting near Montante jumped up hastily and followed Prince Vasily into the entry. Her face lost all its former pretense of interest. Her kind, tear-worn face expressed only anxiety and alarm. "'What can you tell me, Prince, about my Boris?' she said, as she followed him, she pronounced the name Boris, with the accent on the first syllable. "'I cannot stay any longer in Petersburg. Tell me what tidings I can take to my poor boy.' Although Prince Vasily's manner in listening to the old lady was reluctant and almost uncivil, and even showed impatience, still she gave him a flattering and affectionate smile, and took his arm to detain him. "'What would it cost you to say a word to the Emperor, and then he would be at once admitted to the guards?' she added." "'Be assured that I will do all I can, Princess,' replied Prince Vasily. "'But it is not easy for me to ask His Majesty. "'I should advise you to appeal to Romyatsov, through Prince Golitsyn. "'That would be a wiser move.' "'The elderly lady bore the name of the Princess Drubetskaya, "'belonging to one of the best families in Russia. "'But as she was poor, and had long been living in retirement, "'she had lost her former social position.' She was now in Petersburg in the hopes of securing the admittance of her only son into the Imperial Guards. Merely for the sake of meeting Prince Vasily, she had accepted Anna Pavlovna's invitation to come to the reception. Merely for this, she had listened to the Viscount's story. She was dismayed at Prince Vasily's words. Her handsome face expressed vexation, but this lasted only an instant. She smiled once more, and clasped Prince Vasily's arm more firmly. "'Listen, Prince,' said she, "'I have never asked anything of you, "'and I never shall ask anything of you again, 
and I have never reminded you of the friendship that my father had for you. But now I beg of you, in God's name, do this for my son, and I will look upon you as our benefactor, she added hastily. No, don't be angry, but promise me this. I have asked Golitsyn. He refused. Soyez le bon enfant que vous avez été, she said, trying to smile, though the tears were in her eyes. Papa, we shall be late, said the Princess Ellen, who stood waiting at the door, and turned her lovely head on her classic shoulders. Influence in society is a capital which has to be economized lest it be exhausted. Prince Vasily understood this, and having once come to the conclusion that if he asked favors for everybody who applied to him, it would soon be idle to ask anything for himself, he rarely exerted his influence. The Princess Dubitskaya's last appeal, however, caused him to feel something like a pang of conscience. She had reminded him of the fact that he had owed to her father his early advancement in his career. Moreover, he saw by her actions that she was one of those women, notably mothers, who, having once conceived a notion, do not rest until they attain the object of their desires, and, if opposed, are ready with fresh urgencies, and even scenes, at any day or any moment. This last consideration turned the scale with him. Cher Anna Mikhailovna, said he, with his usual familiarity, and with a shade of ill-humour in his voice, it is almost impossible for me to do what you wish, but in order to show you how fond I am of you, and how much I honour your father's memory, I will do the impossible. Your son shall be admitted to the guards. Here is my hand on it. Are you satisfied? My dear, you are our benefactor. I expected nothing less from you. I knew how kind you were. He started to go. Wait, two words more. In fois posé un god. She hesitated. You are good friends with Mikhail Ilarionovitch Kutuzov. Do recommend Boris to him as aide-de-camp. Then I should be content, and then— Prince Vasily smiled. That I can't promise. You have no idea how Kutuzov has been besieged since he was appointed commander-in-chief. He himself told me that all the ladies of Moscow had offered him all their children as adjutants. No, but you must promise. I will not let you go, my dear friend, my benefactor. Papa, again insisted the beautiful Ellen, in the same tone, we shall be late. Well, au revoir. Good-bye, you see. Then to-morrow you will speak to his majesty? Without fail. But I cannot promise about Kutuzov. No, but promise, promise, Basili, insisted Anna Mikhailovna, with a coquettish smile, which perhaps in days long gone by might have been becoming to her, but now ill-suited her haggard face. She evidently forgot her age, and through habit put her confidence in her former feminine resources. But as soon as he was gone, her face again assumed the same expression as before, of pretended cool complacency. She returned to the group where the viscount was still telling stories, and again she made believe listen, though she was anxiously waiting for the time to go, now that her purpose was accomplished. "'But what do you think of this last comedy, du Sacre de Milan?' asked Anna Pavlovna. "'And the new comedy of the people of Genoa and Lucha coming to offer their homage,' to Monsieur Bonaparte, sitting on a throne, and accepting the homage of nations. Oh, this is delicious. No, it is enough to make one beside oneself. He would think the whole world had gone mad. Prince Andrei looked straight into her face and smiled. God has given me this crown. Beware of touching it, he said. Those were Bonaparte's words. Dumele don, gareche cal a touche, at his coronation. They say he was very handsome as he pronounced these words, he added, and again repeated them in Italian. Du mele du nom guie si la tuca. I hope, pursued Anna Pavlovna, that this will at last be the drop too much. The sovereigns cannot longer endure this man, who is a menace to each and every one of them. The sovereigns? I do not refer to Russia, said the viscount politely, but in a tone of despair. The sovereigns, madame. What have they done for Louis the Eighteenth, for the Queen, for Madame Elizabeth? Nothing, he added, becoming animated. And, believe me, they are suffering their punishment for having betrayed the cause of the Bourbons. The sovereigns. 
they sent ambassadors to compliment the usurper and with an exclamation of contempt he again changed his position prince ippolit who had long been contemplating the viscount through his lorgnette suddenly at these words turned completely round to the little princess and asking her for a needle proceeded to show her what the escutcheon of conde was scratching it with the needle on the table he interpreted this coat of arms for her benefit with such a business-like expression that one would have supposed the princess had asked him to do it for her baton de jeu ongrelli de jeu de zoo mise en compte he said the princess listened with a smile if bonaparte remains a year longer on the throne of france things will have gone quite too far said the viscount still pursuing the same line of conversation like a man who without regard to the opinions of others and considering himself the best informed on any given subject insists on following the lead of his own thoughts by intrigue violence proscriptions and capital punishment society i mean good society french society will be utterly destroyed and then he shrugged his shoulders and spread open his hands pierre was about to put in a word the conversation interested him but anna pavlovna who was on the watch broke in the emperor alexander said she with a melancholy which always accompanied any reference to the imperial family has declared that he will leave it to the french themselves to choose their own form of government and it is my opinion that unquestionably the whole nation when once freed from the usurper will throw itself into the arms of its rightful king said she striving to say something flattering to the emigre and royalist that is doubtful said prince andre monsieur le vicomte is perfectly right when he remarks that things have already gone too far i think that there are many difficulties in the way of returning to the old i have recently heard remarked pierre again with a flushed face venturing to take part in the conversation that almost all the nobility have gone over to bonaparte that is what the bonapartists say replied the viscount not looking at pierre it is hard nowadays to know what the public opinion of france really is bonaparte said so sneered prince andre it was evident that the viscount did not please him and also that the latter though without especially addressing him directed all his remarks in his direction i have showed them the path of glory he went on after a moment's silence again quoting napoleon's words and they would not enter it i opened my antechambers to them and they rushed in in throngs i know how far he was justified in saying that not in the least said the viscount after the assassination of the duke even the most partial ceased to look on him as a hero even if he has been a hero for certain people continued the viscount turning to anna pavlovna since the assassination of the duke there is one martyr more in heaven and one hero less on earth anna pavlovna and the others had not time to reward the viscount with a smile of approval for his words before pierre again rushed into the conversation and anna pavlovna though she had a presentiment that he would say something indecorous was unable to restrain him the punishment of the duc d'angeon said monsieur pierre was a political necessity and i for one regard it as magnanimity in napoleon not hesitating to assume the sole responsibility of this act dieu mon dieu exclaimed anna pavlovna in a whisper of dismay what monsieur pierre you see magnanimity in assassination said the little princess smiling and moving her work nearer to her ah oh said a number of different voices capital said prince ippolit in english and he began to slap his knee with his hand the viscount merely shrugged his shoulders pierre looked triumphantly at the company over his spectacles i say this he went on to explain in a sort of desperation because the bourbons fled from the revolution leaving their people a prey to anarchy and it was napoleon alone who was able to understand the revolution to conquer it and consequently when the good of all was in the balance he could not hesitate before the life of a single individual don't you want to come over to this table suggested anna pavlovna but pierre without heeding her went on with his discourse no said he growing more and more excited napoleon is great because he stands superior to the revolution 
because he has crushed out its abuses, preserved all that was good, the equality of citizens, and freedom of speech, and the press, and that was the only way that he gained the power. Yes, if, when he gained the power, instead of using it for assassination, he had restored it to the legitimate king, said the viscount, then I should have called him a great man. But he could not do that. The power was granted him by the people, solely that he might deliver them from the Bourbons, and because they saw that he was a great man. The revolution was a mighty fact, continued Monsieur Pierre, betraying by this desperate and forced proposition his extreme youth, and his propensity to speak out whatever was in his mind. Revolution, and regicide, mighty facts. After this. But will you not come over to this table? insisted Anna Pavlovna. Rousseau's contre social, suggested the viscount, with a benign smile. I am not talking about regicide, I am talking about the idea. Yes, the idea of pillage, assassination, and regicide suggested an ironical voice. Those are the extremes, of course, and the real significance is not in such things, but in the rights of man in emancipation from prejudices, in equality of citizenship, and all these principles Napoleon has preserved in all their integrity. Liberty and equality, exclaimed the viscount, scornfully, as though he had at last made up his mind seriously to prove to this young man all the foolishness of his arguments, all high-sounding words, which long ago were shown to be dangerous. Who does not love liberty and equality? Our Saviour himself preached liberty and equality. But after the Revolution, were men any better off? On the contrary, we wanted freedom, and Bonaparte has destroyed it. Prince André, with a smile on his face, looked now at Pierre, now at the Viscount, and now at the hostess. During the first instant of Pierre's outbreak, Anna Pavlovna was appalled, notwithstanding her experience in society. But when she saw that Pierre's sacrilegious utterances did not make the Viscount lose his temper, and when she became convinced that it was impossible to check him, she collected her forces, and taking the Viscount's side, she attacked the young orator. "'Mais, mon cher, monsieur Pierre,' said Anna Pavlovna, "'how can you call a man great who can put to death a duke?' simply a man, when you come to analyze it, without trial and without cause. I should like to ask, said the viscount, how monsieur explains the eighteenth brumaire. Was it not a fraud? It was a piece of trickery wholly unlike what a great man could have done. And the prisoners of Africa, whom he killed, suggested the little princess. That was horrible, and she shrugged her shoulders. C'est un rotrier, vous a rebaudier. Monsieur Pierre did not know which one to answer. He looked at them all and smiled. His smile was unlike other men's, falsely compounded of seriousness. Whenever a smile came on his face, then suddenly, like a flash, all the serious and even stern expression vanished, and in its place came another, genial, frank, and like that of a child asking forgiveness. The Viscount, who had never seen this young Jacobin before, recognized clearly that he was not nearly as terrible as his words. All were silent. "'How can you expect him to answer all of you at once?' said Prince André. "'Besides, in all the actions of a statesman, one must distinguish the actions of a private individual, a general, or an emperor. It seems to me so.' "'Yes, yes, of course,' put in Pierre, delighted at this ratification of his ideas." It is impossible not to acknowledge, pursued Prince André, that Napoleon was great as a man on the bridge at Arcola, or in the hospital at Jaffa, when he shook hands with the plague-stricken soldiers, but, but there are other actions of his which it is hard to justify. Prince André, who had evidently been desirous of smoothing over Pierre's awkwardness, got up with the intention of leaving and giving his wife the hint. Suddenly Prince Ippolit arose, and with a gesture of his hand detaining the company and begging them to be seated, he went on to say, Ah, aujourd'hui on me raconte une anecdote muscovite charmante. Il faut que vous en regale. Vous m'excuserez, vicomte. Il faut que je raconte en russe. Autrement, on ne s'entrape pas l'usage de l'histoire. 
and Prince Ippolet began to speak in Russian, with much the same fluency as Frenchmen who have spent a year in Russia usually attain. All stopped to listen, because Prince Ippolet had been so strenuously urgent in attracting their attention to his story. In Moscow there is a lady, une dame, and she is very miserly. She has to have two valets de play behind her carriage, and very tall ones. That was her hobby. And she had une femme de chambre, who was also very tall. She said, here Prince Ippolet paused to think, evidently at a loss to collect his wits. She said, yes, she said, girl, à la femme de chambre, put on livery and go with me, behind my carriage, faire des visites. Here Prince Ippolet burst out into a regular guffaw, and his laugh so completely failed to be echoed by his hearers that it produced a very disheartening effect upon the narrator. However, a few, including the elderly lady and Anna Pavlovna, smiled. She drove off. Suddenly a strong wind blew up. The girl lost her hat, and her long hair came down. Here he could not hold in any longer, but through his bursts of broken laughter he managed to say these words— and every one knew about it. That was the end of the anecdote. Although it was incomprehensible why he told it, and why he felt called upon to tell it in Russian rather than French, still Anna Pavlovna and the others appreciated Prince Ippolit's cleverness in so agreeably putting an end to Monsieur Pierre's disagreeable and stupid freak. The company, after the anecdote, broke up into little groups, busily engaged in the insignificant small talk about some ball that had been, or some ball that was to be, or the theatre, or when and where they should meet again. End of chapter 4Congratulating Anna Pavlovna on what they called her charmant soirée, the guests began to take their departure. Pierre, as has been already said, was awkward, stout, of more than the average height, broad-shouldered, with huge red hands. He had no idea of the proper way to enter a drawing-room, and still less the proper way of making his exit. In other words, he did not know how to make some especially agreeable remark to his hostess before taking his leave. Moreover, he was absent-minded. He got up, and instead of taking his own cap, he seized the plumed three-cornered hat of some general, and held it, pulling at the feathers until the general came and asked him to surrender it. But all his absent-mindedness and clumsiness about entering a drawing-room, and his zeal in putting forward his own ideas, were redeemed by his expression of genuine goodness simplicity and modesty. Anna Pavlovna turned to him, and with Christian sweetness, expressing her forgiveness for his behavior, nodded to him, and said, I hope I shall see you again, but I shall hope also that you will change your opinions, my dear Monsieur Pierre, said she. He could find no words to answer her. He only bowed, and again they all saw his smile, which really said nothing except this, Opinions are opinions, and you can see what a good and noble young man I am. And all, Anna Pavlovna included, could not help feeling that this was so. Prince Andrei went into the entry, allowed the lackey to throw his mantle over his shoulders, and with cool indifference listened to the chatter of his wife and Prince Ippolit, who had also come into the entry. Prince Ippolit stood near the pretty little princess, and stared straight at her through his eyeglasses. "'Go back, Annette. You will take cold,' said the little princess, by way of farewell to Anna Pavlovna. "'It is all understood,' she added in an undertone. Anna Pavlovna had already had a chance to speak a word with Lisa in regard to the suggested match between Anatole and the little princess's sister-in-law. "'I shall depend upon you, my dear,' said Anna Pavlovna, also in an undertone. You write to her and tell me, comment le père envisage choix la chose, how the father will look at it. Au revoir. And she went back from the entry. Prince Ippolit came to the little princess, and bending his face down close to her began to talk to her in a half-whisper. Two lackeys, one the princess's, holding her shawl, the other his, with his overcoat, 
stood waiting until they should finish talking and listen to their chatter, which being in French was incomprehensible, but their faces seemed to say, We understand, but we do not care to show it. The princess, as always, smiled as she spoke, and listened, laughing gaily. I am very glad that I did not go to the ambassadors, said Prince Ippolit. A bore. We've had a lovely evening, haven't we? A lovely evening. They say it will be a very fine ball, replied the princess, curling her downy lip. All the pretty women in society will be there. Not all, because you are not there. Certainly not all, said Prince Ippolit, gaily laughing, and taking the shawl from the servant, he even pushed him away and began to wrap it round the princess. Either through awkwardness or intentionally, no one could tell which, it was a long time before he took his arms away from her, even after the shawl was wrapped around her, and he seemed almost to be embracing the young woman. She gracefully, and with a smile on her lips, drew back a little, turned around, and glanced at her husband. Prince Andre's eyes were closed. He seemed so tired and sleepy. "'Are you ready?' he asked, giving his wife a hasty glance. Prince Ippolit hastily put on his overcoat, which being in the latest style came to his heels, and stumbling along in it rushed to the steps after the princess, whom the lackey was assisting into the carriage. "'Princess, au revoir!' he cried, his tongue as badly entangled as his feet. The princess, gathering up her dress, took her seat in the darkness of the carriage. Her husband was arranging his sword. Prince Ippolit, in his efforts to be of assistance, was in everybody's way. "'Excuse me, sir,' said Prince Andrei in Russian, in a cold, disagreeable tone, addressing Ippolit, who stood in his way. "'I shall expect you, Pierre,' said the same voice, but warmly and affectionately. The postillion whipped up the horses, and the carriage rolled noisily away. Prince Ippolit laughed spasmodically as he stood on the steps, waiting for the viscount whom he had promised to take home. "'Eh bien, mon cher, votre petite princesse est très bien, très bien,' said the viscount, as he took his seat in the carriage with Ippolit. "'Mais très bien,' he kissed the tips of his fingers. "'Et tout à fait française,' Ippolit rolled with laughter. "'And do you know you are terrible with your little innocent ways?' continued the viscount. "'I pity the poor husband, that little officer who puts on the airs of a reigning prince.' Ippolit again went off into a burst of laughter, though he managed to articulate, "'And yet you were saying that the Russian ladies were not anywhere equal to the French ladies. One must be able to show a little skill.' Pierre, being the first to reach the house, went into Prince Andrei's own room, like one thoroughly at home, and immediately stretching himself out on the sofa, as his habit was, took up the first book that he found on the shelf. It was Caesar's Commentaries, and leaning his elbow began to read in the middle of the volume. "'What have you been doing to Mademoiselle Cher? She will be quite laid up now,' said Prince Andrei, coming into the room and rubbing his small white hands together. Pierre turned over with his whole body, making the sofa creak looked up at Prince Andre with his eager face, smiled, and waved his hand. "'No,' said he, "'that abbé is very interesting, only he does not understand the matter aright. In my opinion, permanent peace is possible, but I cannot tell how, certainly not through the balance of power.' Prince Andre was evidently not interested in these abstract questions. "'It is impossible, mon cher, always and everywhere, to say what you think.' But have you come to any final decision yet as to your career? Will you be a horse guardsman or a diplomat? asked Prince Andre after a moment's silence. Pierre sat up on the sofa, doubling his legs under him. Can you imagine? I have not as yet the slightest idea. Neither the one nor the other pleases me. But see here, you must come to some decision. Your father is waiting. Pierre, at the age of ten, had been sent abroad, with an abbé for a tutor, and had remained there till he was twenty. On his return to Moscow, his father dismissed the abbé, and said to the young man, "'Now go to Petersburg, look about, and take your choice. I give my consent to anything. Here is a letter to Prince Vasily, and here is money for you. Write me about everything, and I will help you in any way.' 
Pierre had been trying for three months to choose a career, and had not succeeded. It was in regard to this choice that Prince André spoke. Pierre rubbed his forehead. But he must be a Freemason, said he, referring to the abbé, whom he had met that evening. That is all nonsense, said Prince André, again stopping him short. Let us talk about your affairs. Have you been to the house guards? No, not yet. But here is an idea that occurred to me, and I wanted to tell you, now that there is war against Napoleon. If it had been a war for freedom, I should have taken part. I should have been the first to enter the military service. But to help England and Austria against the greatest man in the world, that is not good. Prince André merely shrugged his shoulders at Pierre's childish talk. He made believe that it was impossible to reply to such stupidities, but in reality it was difficult to answer this naive question in any way other than Prince André did answer it. If all men made war only for their convictions, there wouldn't be any war, said he. That would be splendid, said Pierre. Prince André laughed. Very likely that would be splendid, but it will never be. Now, why are you going to war? asked Pierre. Why? I'm sure I don't know. It must be so. Besides, I'm going, he paused. I am going because the life which I lead here, my life, is not to my mind. End of chapter 5「Part One, Chapter Six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The rustle of a woman's dress was heard in the adjoining room. As though caught napping, Prince André shook himself, and his face assumed the same expression which it had worn in Anna Pavlovna's drawing room. Pierre set his feet down from the sofa. The princess came in. She had already changed her dress for another, a wrapper to be sure, but equally fresh and elegant. Prince André got up and courteously pushed forward an easy chair. "'Why is it, I often wonder?' she remarked, speaking as always in French, and at the same time briskly and spryly sitting down in the easy chair. "'Why is it that Annette never married? How stupid you all are, messieurs, that you never married her! You will excuse me for saying so, but you have not the slightest comprehension of women. What an arguer you are, Monsieur Pierre!' "'Your husband and I were just this moment arguing.' I cannot understand why he wants to go to war, said Pierre, turning to the princess without any of the embarrassment so commonly shown in the relations of a young man toward a young woman. The princess gave a start. Evidently Pierre's words touched her to the quick. Ah, that is exactly what I say, said she. I do not understand. Really, I do not understand why men cannot live without war. Why is it that we women wish nothing and need nothing? Now you be the judge. I will tell him just as it is. Here he is adjutant to uncle, a most brilliant position. Everybody knows him. Everybody esteems him. The other day, at a Praskin's, I heard a lady asking, C'est ça la femme ou présent, mes paroles du noir. She began to laugh. And he is received so everywhere he might very easily be even flegal adjutant. You know his majesty talks very cordially with him. Annette and I have talked it all over. It might be very easily arranged. What do you think? Pierre glanced at Prince André, and seeing that this conversation did not please his friend, made no reply to her. When are you going? he asked. Ah, don't speak of going. Don't speak of it. I do not wish to hear a word of it, exclaimed the princess, in the same capriciously vivacious tone in which she had spoken to Ippolit. It was obviously out of place in the family circle, in which Pierre was an adopted member. Today, when it came over me that I had to break off from all these pleasant relations, and then, you know, André, she blinked her eyes significantly at her husband. J'ai pour, j'ai pour, she whispered. A shiver ran down her back. Her husband looked at her with a surprised expression, as though for the first time he had noticed that anyone besides himself and Pierre had come into the room. 
Then with a cool politeness he addressed his wife inquiringly. "'What is it that you are afraid of, Liza? I cannot understand,' said he. "'Now how selfish all you men are! All! All selfish! Simply from his own whim, God knows why, he deserts me, shuts me up in the country alone.' "'With my father and sister. Don't forget that,' said Prince Andre gently. "'All alone, just the same, away from my friends, and he expects me not to be afraid.' Her tone grew querulous. Her lip was lifted, making the expression of her face not mirthful but repulsive and like a squirrel's. She paused, as though she regarded it as indecorous to speak of her condition before Pierre, though it was the real secret of her fear. "'And still I do not understand why vous avez Pierre,' drawled Prince André, letting his eyes rest on his wife. The princess blushed, and spread open her hands with a gesture of despair. "'Non, André, j'ai des coups vous avez tellement, tellement changé. "'Your doctor bids you to go to bed earlier,' said Prince André. "'You had better retire.' The princess made no answer, and suddenly her short, downy lip trembled. Prince André, shrugging his shoulders, got up and began to walk up and down the room. Pierre gazed through his glasses with naive curiosity, first at him, then at the princess, and made a motion as though he also would get up, but then changed his mind. "'What difference does it make to me if Monsieur Pierre is here?' suddenly exclaimed the little princess and her pretty face at the same time was contracted into a tearful grimace. "'I have been wanting for a long time to ask you, André, why you have changed toward me so. What have I done to you? You are going to the army. You are not sorry for me at all. Why is it?' "'Lise!' exclaimed Prince André, but this one word carried an entreaty, a threat, and above all a conviction that she herself would regret what she had said— but she went on hurriedly. "'You treat me as though I were ill, or a child. I see it all. You were not so six months ago.' "'Lise, I beg of you to stop,' said Prince André, still more earnestly. Pierre, growing more and more stirred as this conversation proceeded, arose and went to the princess. He could not, it seemed, endure the sight of tears, and he himself was ready to weep. "'Calm yourself, princess. This is only your fancy, because, I assure you, I myself have experienced, and so, because. No, excuse me, a stranger is in the way. No, calm yourself. Good-bye. Prince André detained him, taking him by the arm. No, stay, Pierre. The princess is so kind that she will not have the heart to deprive me of the pleasure of spending the evening with you.' "'Yes, he only thinks about his own pleasure,' exclaimed the princess, not restraining her angry tears. "'Lise,' said Prince André, dryly, raising his voice sufficiently to show that his patience was exhausted. Suddenly the angry, squirrel-like expression on the princess's pretty little face changed to one of alarm, both fascinating and provocative of sympathy. Her beautiful eyes looked from under her long lashes at her husband, and there came into her face that timid look of subjection, such as a dog has, when it wags its drooping tail quickly but doubtfully. "'Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu!' muttered the princess, and gathering up the skirt of her dress with one hand, she went to her husband and kissed him on the forehead. "'Bonsoir, Lise,' said Prince André, getting up and courteously kissing her hand as though she were a stranger. The friends were silent. Neither the one nor the other felt like being the first to speak. Pierre looked at Prince André. Prince André rubbed his forehead with his slender hand. "'Let us have some supper,' said he, with a sigh, getting up and going to the door. They went into the elegant dining-room, newly furnished in the richest style. Everything— from the napkins to the silver, the faience and the glassware had that peculiar imprint of newness which is characteristic of the establishment of a young couple. In the midst of supper Prince André leaned forward on his elbows, and, 
like a man who has for a long time had something on his heart and suddenly determines to confess it he began to talk with an expression of nervous exasperation such as pierre had never before beheld in his friend never never get married my friend this is my advice to you do not marry until you have come to the conclusion that you have done all that is in your power to do and until you have ceased to love the woman whom you have chosen until you have seen clearly what she is otherwise you will make a sad and irreparable mistake when you are old and good for nothing then get married otherwise all that is good and noble in you will be thrown away all will be wasted in trifles yes 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 don't look at me in such amazement if ever you have any hope of anything ahead of you you will be made to feel at every step that as far as you are concerned all is at an end all closed to you except the drawing-room where you will rank with the court lackeys and idiots that's a fact he made an energetic wave of his hand pierre took off his spectacles and this made his face as he gazed in amazement at his friend even more expressive than usual of his goodness of heart my wife continued prince andrei is a lovely woman she is one of those few women to whom one can feel that his honor is safely entrusted but my god what i would not give at this moment if i were not married you are the first and only person to whom i have whispered this and it is because i love you prince andrei in saying this was still less like the bolkonsky who that same evening had been comfortably ensconced in anna pavlovna's easy chairs and murmuring french phrases as he blinked his eyes every muscle in his spare face was quivering with nervous animation his eyes in which before the fire of life seemed to be extinguished now gleamed with a fierce and intense brilliancy it was evident that however lacking in life he might appear in ordinary circumstances he more than made up for it by his energy at moments of almost morbid excitability you cannot understand why i say this to you he went on why it is the whole history of a life you talk about bonaparte and his career said he although pierre had not said a word about bonaparte you talk about bonaparte but bonaparte when he was toiling went step by step straight for his goal he was free he let nothing stand between him and his goal and he reached it but tie yourself to a woman and your whole freedom is destroyed as though you were a prisoner in chains and in proportion as you feel that you have ambition and powers the more you will be weighed down and tormented with regrets drawing-rooms tittle-tattle balls vulgar show meanness such is the charmed circle from which it is impossible for me to make my escape i am now getting ready to take part in the war in the greatest war that ever was and yet i know nothing and am fit for nothing je suis très aimable et très cause de coup continued prince andrei and at anna pavlovna they hang upon my lips and this stupid society without which my wife cannot live and these women if you could only know what toutes les femmes destinguées and women in general amount to my father is right egotism ostentation stupidity meanness in every respect such are women when they show themselves in their real light you see them in society and think that they amount to something but they are not 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 no don't marry my dear heart don't marry said prince andrei in conclusion it seems ridiculous to me said pierre that you should regard yourself as incapable and your life as spoiled everything is before you everything and you he did not finish his sentence but his very tone made it evident how highly he prized his friend and how much he expected from him in the future how can he speak so thought pierre who considered prince andrei the model of all accomplishments for the very reason that prince andrei united in himself to the highest degree all those qualities that were lacking in pierre and which more nearly than aught else can express the concept will-power 
Pierre always admired Prince Andrei's ability to meet with perfect ease all sorts of people, his extraordinary memory, his breadth of knowledge. He had read everything, he knew about everything, he had ideas on every subject, and, above all, his powers of work and study. And if Pierre was often struck by Andrei's lack of aptitude for speculative philosophy, which was his own specialty, he at least regarded it not as a fault, but as a sign of strength. In all the best relations, however friendly and simple, flattery or praise is indispensable, just as grease is indispensable for making wheels move easily. Je suis un homme fini, said Prince Andre. What is there to say about me? Let us talk about yourself, said he, after a short silence, and smiling at his consoling thoughts. This smile was instantly reflected on Pierre's face. "'But what is there to say about me?' asked Pierre, his lips parting in a careless, merry smile. "'What am I, anyway?' "'Je suis un bâtard.' And suddenly a purple flush dyed his cheeks. It was evident that he had exerted great effort to say that. "'Sans non, sans fortuna. And yet it is true.' He did not say what was true, I am free for the present, and I like it. Only I don't know what to take up next. I should like to have a serious talk with you on the subject. Prince Andrei looked at him with kindly eyes, but in his glance, friendly and flattering as it was, there was betrayed the consciousness of his superiority. I am fond of you, especially for the reason that you are the only living man in all our circle. You are happy. Choose whatever you like. It is all the same. You will be happy anywhere. But there's one thing. Stop going to those Kurigans and leading their kind of life. That sort of thing does not become you. All those revels, that wild life and all. Que voulez-vous, mon cher? exclaimed Pierre, shrugging his shoulders. Les femmes, mon cher, les femmes. I don't understand it, replied André. Les femmes comme il faut. That is another thing. But such as have to do with Kurigan. Les femmes et le va. I can't understand it. Pierre had been living at Prince Vasily Kurigan's, and had been taking part in the dissipated life of his son Anatole, the very same young man to whom it had been proposed to marry Prince André's sister, in order to reform him. Do you know, said Pierre, as though a happy thought had come unexpectedly into his mind, seriously, I have been thinking about it for some time. Since I have been leading this sort of life, I have not been able to think or to come to any decision. My head aches. I have no money. This evening he invited me, but I did not go. Give me your word of honor that you will not go with him again. Here's my word on it. End of chapter 6《Part One, Chapter Seven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. It was already two o'clock when Pierre left his friend. It was a luminous June night, characteristic of Petersburg. Pierre took his seat in the hired carriage with the intention of going home, but the farther he rode, the more impossible he found it to think of sleeping on such a night which was more like twilight or early morning. He could see far down through the empty streets. On the way it occurred to him that the gambling club were to meet as usual that evening, at Anatoly Kurigan's, after which they were accustomed to have a drinking bout, topping off with one of Pierre's favorite entertainments. It would be good fun to go to Kurigan's, said he to himself, but instantly he remembered that he had given Prince André his word of honor not to go there again. But, as it happens to men of no strength of character, this was immediately followed by such a violent desire to have one more last taste of this dissipated life, so well known to him, that he determined to go. And, in excuse for it, the thought entered his mind that his promise was not binding, because, before he had given it to Prince André, he had also promised Anatole to be present at his house. Moreover, he reasoned that all such pledges were merely conditional, and had no definite meaning, especially if it were taken into consideration that perhaps by the next day he might be dead, 
or something might happen to him so extraordinary that the distinctions of honorable and dishonorable would entirely vanish arguments of this nature often occurred to pierre entirely upsetting his plans and purposes he went to kuragin's driving up to the great house at the horse guard barracks where anatole lived he sprang upon the lighted porch ran up the steps and entered the open door there was no one in the entry empty bottles cloaks and overshoes were scattered about there was an odor of wine in some distant room he could hear loud talking and shouts play and supper were over but the guests had not yet dispersed pierre threw off his cloak and went into the first room where were the remains of the supper a single waiter thinking that no one could see him was stealthily drinking up the wine in the half-empty glasses in a third room were heard the sounds of scuffling laughter the shouts of well-known voices and the growl of a bear eight young men were eagerly crowding around an open window three were training with the cub which one of their number was dragging by a chain and trying to frighten the others with i bet a hundred on stevens cried one see that he doesn't hold on cried a second i bet on dolokhov cried a third get those fellows away from the bear kurigan there let mishka go the wager is here one pull or he loses cried a fourth yakov bring the bottle yakov cried the host of the evening a tall handsome fellow standing in the midst of the crowd in a single thin shirt thrown open at the chest hold on gentlemen here he is here is our dear friend petrushka he cried turning to pierre a short man with clear blue eyes whose voice among all those drunken voices was noticeable for its tone of sobriety shouted from the window come here and hear about the wagers this was dolokhov an officer of the semyonovsky regiment a well-known gambler and bully whose home was with anatole pierre smiled as he gaily looked around him i don't understand at all what's up hold on he's not drunk bring a bottle cried anatole and taking a glass from the table went up to pierre first of all drink pierre proceeded to drain glass after glass at the same time closely observing and listening to his drunken companions who had again crowded around the window anatole kept his glass filled with wine and told him how dolokhov had laid a wager with stevens an english navalman who happened to be there that he dolokhov was to drink a bottle of rum sitting in the third-story window with his legs hanging out there now drink it all said anatole handing the last glass to pierre i shan't let you off no i don't wish any more replied pierre and pushing anatole aside he went to the window dolokhov was holding the englishman by the arm and was clearly and explicitly laying down the conditions of the wager turning more particularly to anatole and pierre as they approached dolokhov was a man of medium height with curly hair and bright blue eyes he was twenty-five years old like all infantry officers he wore no moustache so that his mouth which was the most striking feature of his face was wholly revealed the lines of the mouth were drawn with remarkable delicacy the upper lip closed firmly over the strong lower one in a sharp curve at the centre and in the corners hovered constantly something in the nature of two smiles one in each corner and all taken together and especially in conjunction with a straightforward bold intelligent look made it impossible not to take notice of his face dolokhov was not a rich man and he had no influential connections but although anatole spent ten thousand roubles a year and it was known that dolokhov lived with him nevertheless he had succeeded in winning such a position that anatole and all who were acquainted with the two men had a higher regard for him than for anatole dolokhov played nearly every kind of a game and almost always won however much he drank he never was known to lose his head both kuragin and dolokhov were at this time notorious among the rakes and spendthrifts of petersburg the bottle of rum was brought two lackeys evidently made timid and nervous by the orders and shouts of the boon companions tried to pull away the sash that hindered any one from sitting on the outer slope of the window seat anatole with his swaggering way came up to the window he wanted to smash something 
he pushed the lackeys away and tugged at the sash but the sash would not yield so he broke the window panes now you try it you man of muscle said he turning to pierre pierre seized hold of the crossbar gave a pull and the oaken framework gave way with a crash take it all out or they'll think i clung to it said dolokhov the englishman accepts it does he all right asked anatol all right said pierre glancing at dolokhov who took the bottle of rum and went to the window through which could be seen the sky where the evening and morning light were beginning to mingle he leaped upon the window-sill with the bottle in his hand listen he cried as he stood there and looked back into the room all were silent i wager he spoke french so that the englishman might understand him and spoke it none too well either i wager fifty imperials or perhaps you prefer a hundred he added addressing the englishman no fifty replied the englishman very well then fifty it is that i will drink this whole bottle of rum without taking it once from my mouth drink it sitting in this window in that place there he bent over and pointed to the sloping projection of the wall outside the window and not holding on to anything is that understood very good anatol turned to the englishman and holding him by the button of his coat and looking down upon him for the englishman was of small stature began to repeat the terms of the wager in english hold cried dolokhov thumping the window with the bottle in order to attract attention hold kurgan listen if anyone else does the same thing then i will pay down a hundred imperials do you understand the englishman nodded his head though he did not make it apparent whether or no he were prepared to accept this new wager anatol still held him by the button and in spite of the nods that he made to signify that he understood all that was said anatol insisted on translating dolokhov's words for him into english a lean young lipusar who had been playing a loser game all the evening climbed upon the window leaned over and gazed down who Ooh. Ho! Oh, he exclaimed as he looked down from the window to the flagstones below hush cried dolokhov and he pulled the officer back from the window who getting his feet entangled in his spurs awkwardly leaped down into the room placing the bottle on the window-sill so as to be within reach dolokhov warily and coolly climbed into the window letting down his legs and spreading out both hands he measured the width of the window sat down let go his hands moved to the right then to the left and took up the bottle anatol brought two candles and set them on the window seat although it was now quite light dolokhov's back in the white shirt and his curly head were illuminated on both sides all gathered around the window the englishman stood in the front row pierre smiled and said nothing one of the older men present suddenly stepped forward with a stern and frightened face and attempted to seize dolokhov by the shirt gentlemen this is folly he will kill himself said this man who was less foolhardy than the rest anatol restrained him don't touch him you will startle him and then he might fall what if he should eh dolokhov turned around straightening himself up and again stretching out his hands if any one touches me again said he hissing the words through his thin compressed lips i shall send him flying down there so now thus having spoken he resumed his former position dropped his hands and seizing the bottle he lifted it to his lips bent his head back and raised his free arm as a balance one of the lackeys who had begun to clear away the broken glass paused in his work and without straightening himself up fixed his eyes on the window and dolokhov's back anatol stood straight with staring eyes the englishman thrusting out his lips looked askance the man who had tried to stop the proceeding repaired to one corner of the room and threw himself on a sofa with his face to the wall pierre covered his eyes and the feeble smile still hovering over his lips now expressed horror and apprehension all were silent pierre took his hand from his eyes dolokhov was still sitting in the same position only his head was thrown farther back so that the curly hair in the nape of his neck touched his shirt-collar 
and his hand, holding the bottle, was lifted higher and higher, trembling under the effort. The bottle was evidently nearly empty, and consequently had to be held almost perpendicularly over his head. Why should it take so long? thought Pierre. It seemed to him as though more than a half hour had elapsed. Suddenly Dolokhov's body made a backward motion, and his arm trembled nervously. This tremor was sufficient to make him slip as he sat on the sloping ledge. In fact, he slipped, and his arm and head wavered more violently as he struggled to regain his balance. He stretched out one hand to clutch the window seat, but refrained from touching it. Pierre again covered his eyes, and declared to himself that he would not open them again. Suddenly he was conscious that there was a commotion around him. He looked up. Dolokhov was standing on the window seat. His face was pale, but radiant. Empty! He flung the bottle at the Englishman, who cleverly caught it on the fly. Dolokhov sprang down from the window. He exhaled a powerful odor of rum. Capital! Bravo! That's a wager worth having. The devil take you all! were the voices that rang from all sides. The Englishman, taking out his purse, was counting out his money. Dolokhov was scowling and had nothing to say. Pierre started for the window. "'Gentlemen, who wants to make the bet with me? I will do the same thing,' he cried. "'But there's no need of any wager. Give us a bottle. I will do it anyway. Bring a bottle.' "'Hold on, hold on,' said Dolokhov, smiling. "'What's the matter with you? Are you beside yourself? We won't let you. It makes you dizzy even on a staircase.' were shouted from various sides. "'I will drink it. Give me a bottle of rum,' cried Pierre, pounding on the table with drunken resolution, and climbing into the window. He was seized by the arm, but his strength was so great that whoever approached him was sent flying across the room. "'No, you will never dissuade him that way,' said Anatole. "'Hold on. I will throw dust in his eyes. "'Listen, I will make the wager with you, but tomorrow. But now we are all going to blanks.' "'Come on!' cried Pierre. "'Come on, and we will take Mishka with us.' And seizing the bear, he began to gallop round the room with him. End of chapter 7Prince Vasily fulfilled the promise which he had made to the Princess Drubetskaya when she asked him on the evening of Anna Pavlovna's reception to help her only son, Boris. The request had been preferred to the Emperor, and contrary to the experience of many others, he was allowed to enter the Semyonovsky Regiment of the Guard as ensign. But in spite of all Anna Mikhailovna's efforts and intrigues, Boris failed of his employment as adjutant or attaché to Kutuzov. Shortly after Anna Pavlovna's reception, the princess returned to Moscow and went straight to her rich relations, the Rostovs, at whose house she always stayed when visiting in Moscow, and where her idolized Borenka had been educated from early childhood and had lived some years, waiting to be transferred from the line to his position as ensign of the guard. The guard had already left Petersburg on the 22nd of August, and the young man, delayed in Moscow by his uniform and outfit, was to join his regiment at Radzivilov. The Rostovs were celebrating the fete day of the mother and the youngest daughter, both of whom were named Natalia. Since morning there had been an unceasing stream of carriages coming and going with guests, who brought their congratulations to the countess's great mansion on the Povarskaya, so well known to all Moscow. The countess herself and her eldest daughter, a beautiful girl, were in the drawing-room receiving the guests, whose places were constantly filled by newcomers. The Countess Rostova was a woman of forty-five, of a thin oriental type of countenance, and evidently worn out by her cares as mother of a family of a dozen children. Her deliberateness of motion and speech, which arose from her lack of strength, gave her a certain appearance of dignity that commanded respect. The Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubetskaya, in her capacity of friend of the family, was also in the drawing-room, helping to receive the company and join in the conversation. The young people were in the rear rooms, 
not considering it incumbent upon them to take part in receiving the visitors. The Count met the guests, and escorted them to the door again, urging them all to dine with him. "'Very, very much obliged to you, ma chère, or mon cher. Ma chère and mon cher, he said to all without exception, without the slightest shadow of difference whether his guests stood high or low in the social scale. "'Much obliged to you for myself and for my dear ones, whose name-day we are celebrating. See here, I come back to dinner. You'll affront me if you do not, mon cher. Cordially I invite you, and my whole family join with me, mon cher.' These words he repeated to all, without exception or variation, with an unchanging expression on his round, jolly, and clean-shaven countenance, and with a monotonously firm grip of the hand, and with repeated short bows. Having escorted a guest to his carriage, the Count would return to this, that, or the other visitor, still remaining in the drawing-room, dropping down on a chair with the aspect of a man who understands and enjoys the secret of life, he would cross his legs in boyish fashion, lay his hands on his knees, and shaking his head significantly, would send forth his conjectures concerning the weather, or exchange confidences about health, sometimes speaking in Russian, sometimes in very exorable but self-confident French, and then again, with the air of a weary man, who is nevertheless bound to fulfill all obligations, he would go to the door with still another departing guest, straightening the thin grey hairs on his bald head, and dutifully proffering the invitations to dinner. Sometimes returning through the entry to the drawing-room, he would pass through the conservatory and butler's room to the great marble hall, where covers were laid for eighty guests, and glancing at the butlers who were bringing the silver and china, setting the tables and unfolding the damask table linen, he would call to him Dmitri Vesalievich, a man of noble family, who had charge of all his affairs, and would say, Well, well, Mitenka, see that everything is all right. That's good, that's good, he would say, glancing with satisfaction on the huge extension table. The principal thing is the service. Very good, very good. And with a deep sigh of satisfaction he would go back to the drawing-room once more. Marya Lvovna Karagin and her daughter, announced the countess's footman, in a thundering bass voice, coming to the door. The countess was thoughtful for a moment, and took a pinch of snuff from a gold snuff-box ornamented with a portrait of her husband. "'I am tired to death of these callers,' said she. "'Well, this is the last one I shall receive. She is very affected. "'Ask her to come in,' she said to the footman, in a mournful voice, as though her words had been, "'If I must be killed, kill me now.' A tall, portly, haughty-looking lady, in a rustling train, came into the drawing-room, followed by her round-faced, smiling young daughter." "'Dear Countess, it has been such a long time. She has been ill in bed. Le pauvre enfant. Ou belle de raison mosqui. Et la comtesse à Praxine. J'ai et si oreza. Such were the phrases spoken by lively feminine voices, and mingling with the rustle of silks and the moving of chairs. That sort of conversation had begun which is, by unanimous consent, manoeuvred in such a way that at the first pause the visitor is ready to get up with the rustling garments to murmur, Je sais bien charmé. La santé de maman. A la comtesse à Praxine. And again, with rustling garments, to be to retreat into the entry, to throw on the shuba or the cloak, and to depart. The conversation was turning on the chief item of city news at that time, namely, the illness of the famous old Count Bozokoy, one of the richest and handsomest men of Catherine's time, and also about his illegitimate son, Pierre, the same young man who had behaved in such an unseemly manner at Anna Pavlovna's reception. "'I am very sorry for the old Count,' said one of the ladies. "'His health is so wretched, and now to have to suffer this mortification on account of his son, it will be the death of him.' "'What is that?' asked the Countess, as though she were not aware of what the visitor was talking about although she had heard fifty times already the cause of Count Bezakoy's mortification. "'It all comes from the present system of education. Sending them abroad,' pursued the lady. "'This young man has been left to shift for himself, and now they say that he has been carrying on so horribly in Petersburg that the police had to interfere and send him out of the city.' "'Pray tell us about it,' 
urged the countess. "'He made a bad choice of friends,' remarked the Princess Anna Mikhailovna. "'Prince Vasily's son, this Pierre, and a young man named Dolokhov, they say, have been doing, heaven only knows what, but all of them have had to suffer for it. Dolokhov has been reduced to the ranks, and Bezukhoi's son has been sent to Moscow, and Anatol Kuragin has been taken in charge by his father. At all events, he has been sent away from Petersburg.' "'Yes, but what is it, pray, that they did?' asked the countess. "'They acted like perfect cutthroats, especially Dolokhov,' said the visitor. "'He is a son of Maria Ivanovna Dolokhova, such an excellent woman. Just think of it. Can you imagine it? The three of them somehow got hold of a bear, took it with them into a carriage, and carried it to the house of some actresses. The police hastened to apprehend them. They seized the officer and tied him back to back to the bear, and then threw the bear into the Moskva. The bear started to swim, with the police officer on his back. "'Capital, mon cher! What a figure this officer must have cut!' cried the Count, bursting with laughter. "'Oh, how terrible! What can you find to laugh at, Count?' But the ladies had to laugh in spite of themselves." "'It was with difficulty that they rescued the unfortunate man,' pursued the visitor. "'And to think that a son of Count Kirill Vladimirovich Bezakoy should find amusement in such intellectual pursuits,' she added sarcastically. "'But they say that he is so well educated and so clever. That shows what educating young men abroad makes of them. I hope that no one will bring him here, though he is so rich. They wanted to give him an introduction to me. I most decidedly refused.' I have daughters, you know. What made you say that this young man was so rich? asked the countess, bending away from the younger ladies, who immediately pretended not to hear what she was saying. You see, he has only illegitimate children, it appears, and Pierre is also illegitimate. The guest waved her hand. I imagine he has a score of them. The Princess Anna Mikhailovna took part in the conversation, with the evident desire of showing off her powerful connections and her acquaintance with all the details of high life. And "'This is the truth of the matter,' said she, significantly, and also in a half-whisper. "'Count Kirill Vladimirovich's reputation is notorious. As for his children, he has lost count of them, but this Pierre was his favourite.' "'How handsome the old man,' said the Countess, "'and only last year, too. I never saw a handsomer man.' now he is very much changed said anna mikhailovna as i was going to say on his wife's side prince vasily is the direct heir to all his property but the old man is very fond of pierre has taken great pains with his education and has written to the emperor about him so that no one knows if he should die he is so weak that it may happen any moment and dr lorraine has come up from petersburg no one knows i say which will get his colossal fortune pierre or prince vasily he has forty thousand souls and millions i know all about this because prince vasily himself told me yes and besides kirill vladimirovitch is my great-uncle on my mother's side and he is also boris's godfather she added pretending that she attributed no significance to this circumstance prince vasily came to moscow yesterday he is on some official business i was told said the guest yes but entre nous, said the princess, it's a mere pretext. He has come principally on account of Count Kirill Vladimirovitch, because he knew that he was so sick. At all events, mon cher, that's a splendid joke, said the count, and perceiving that the elderly visitor did not hear him, he turned his attention to the young ladies. Charming figure, that cut by the police officer, I can imagine it. And as he waved his arms in imitation of the unfortunate police officer, he again burst into a ringing bass laugh, which made his portly frame fairly shake, as is the way with men who always live well, and especially those who indulge in generous wines. So glad to have you dine with us, said he. End of chapter 8 Part 1, Chapter 9 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. A silence ensued. The countess looked at the guest, smiling pleasantly, 
but nevertheless making no pretense of the fact that she would not be sorry if she got up and took her departure the daughter was already arranging her dress and looking inquiringly at her mother when suddenly there was heard in the next room the noise of several persons running towards the door then the catching and upsetting of a chair and instantly into the drawing-room darted a maiden of thirteen holding something in her short muslin skirt she halted in the middle of the room and it was evident that her wild frolic had carried her farther than she had intended at the same instant there appeared in the door a student with a crimson collar a young officer of the guard a maiden of fifteen and a plump rosy-faced little boy in a frock the count jumped up and swinging his arms threw them around the little girl who had come running in ah here she is he cried with a jolly laugh her name day mon cher her name day mon cher il y a un temps pour tout said the countess feigning severity you are always spoiling her Ily, she added addressing her husband bonjour mon cher je vois felicite said the visitor coule des ses enfants she added turning to the mother the little maiden with her black eyes and her large mouth was not pretty but was full of life her childish shoulders still breathlessly rising and sinking from the effort of her exciting running were bare her dark locks were thrown back in confusion she had thin bare arms and wore pantalettes trimmed with lace and low slippers on her dainty feet she was at that charming age when the girl is no longer a child but when the child is not yet a young lady tearing herself away from her father she ran to her mother and giving no heed to her stern reproof hid her blushing face in the lace folds of her mother's mantilla and went into a fit of laughter the cause of her laughter was the doll which she took out from under her skirt trying to tell some fragmentary story about it do you see it's my doll <laughs> mimi you see and natasha was unable to say any more it seemed to her so ludicrous she leaned on her mother and laughed so merrily and infectiously that all even the conceited visitor in spite of herself joined in her amusement now run away run away with your monster admonished the mother pushing away her daughter with pretended sternness she is my youngest she added turning to the visitor natasha for a moment raising her face from her mother's lace mantle glanced up at the stranger through her tears of laughter and again hid her face the visitor compelled to admire this family scene felt it incumbent upon her to take some part in it tell me my dear said she turning to natasha what relation is this mimi to you she is your daughter i suppose natasha was offended by the condescending tone in which the lady addressed her she made no reply and looked solemnly at her meantime all the young people mentioned the officer who was none other than boris the son of princess anna mikhailovna nikolai the student the count's oldest son sonya the count's fifteen-year-old niece and the little patricia his youngest boy all crowded into the drawing-room evidently doing their utmost to restrain within the bounds of propriety the excitement and merriment which convulsed their faces it could be seen that there in the rear rooms from which they had rushed so impetuously they had been engaged in much more entertaining conversation than town gossip the weather and comtesse apraxine occasionally they would glance at one another and find it hard to refrain from bursting out laughing again the two young men the student and the officer who had been friends from childhood were of the same age and were both good-looking but totally unlike each other boris was tall and fair with regular delicate features and a placid expression nikolai was a short curly-haired young man with a frank open countenance on his upper lip the first dark down had already begun to appear and his whole face was expressive of impetuosity and enthusiasm nikolai's face had flushed crimson the moment he entered the drawing-room it was plain to see that he strove in vain to find something to say boris on the contrary immediately regained his self-possession and began to relate 
calmly and humorously how he had been acquainted with this mimi kolka when she was a fine young lady before her nose had lost its beauty how since their acquaintance begun five years before she had grown aged and cracked as to the whole surface of her cranium as he said this he looked at natasha but she turned away from him and looked at her little brother who was squeezing his eyes together and shaking with suppressed laughter and finding that the effort was beyond her power snickered out loud and darted from the room as fast as her nimble little feet would carry her boris managed to preserve his composure maman do you not want to go out shall i not order the carriage he asked turning to his mother with a smile yes yes go and order it please said she returning his smile boris quietly left the room and went in pursuit of natasha the plump little boy trotted sturdily after them as though he was vexed at heart at the disarrangement made in his plans End of chapter nine Part one, chapter ten of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Of the young people, not reckoning Miss Kurajina, and the cousin's oldest daughter, who was four years older than her sister and regarded herself as already grown up, only Nikolai and the niece Sonya remained in the drawing room. Sonya was a miniature little brunette with a tawny tinted complexion especially noticeable on her neck and bare arms which were slender but graceful and muscular she had soft eyes shaded by long lashes and she wore her black hair in a long braid twined twice about her head by the easy grace of her movements by the suppleness and softness of her slender limbs and by a certain cunning and coyness of manner she reminded one of a beautiful kitten which promises soon to grow into a lovely cat she evidently considered it the right thing to manifest her interest in the general conversation by a smile, but her eyes against her will shot glances of such passionate girlish adoration from under their long, thick lashes at her cousin, who was soon to join the army, that her smile could not for an instant deceive anyone, and it was plain to see that the kitten had only crouched down in order to jump and play all the more merrily with her cousin as soon as the two followed the example of boris and natasha and left the drawing-room yes ma chere said the old count turning to mrs kuragina and pointing to nikolai his friend boris here has been appointed an officer of the guard and they are such good friends that they cannot be separated so he throws up the university and his old father and is going into the military service ma chere and yet there was a place all ready for him in the department of the archives and all that's what friendship is concluded the count with a dubious shake of the head yes there's going to be a war they say said the visitor they have been saying so for a long time replied the count and they will say so again and keep saying so and that will be the end of it mon cher that's what friendship is he repeated he is going to join the hussars the visitor not knowing what reply to make shook her head it is not out of friendship at all declared nikolai flushing up and spurning the accusation as though it were a shameful aspersion on his character it is not from friendship at all but simply because i feel drawn to a military life he glanced at his cousin and at the young lady visitor both were looking at him with a smile of approbation Colonel Schubert, of the Pavlogradsky Regiment of Hussars, is going to dine with us tonight. He has been home on leave of absence, and was going to take Nikolai back with him. What's to be done about it? asked the Count, shrugging his shoulders, and affecting to treat as a jest what had evidently occasioned him much pain. I have already told you, Papenka, said the lad, that if you do not wish me to go, I will stay at home, but i know that i am not good for anything except the army i cannot be a diplomatist or a chinovic i can't hide what i feel and as he said this he glanced with a handsome young fellow's coquetry at sonya and the young lady visitor the kitten feasted her eyes on him and seemed ready at a second's notice to play and show all her kittenish nature 
"'Well, well, let it go,' said the old count. "'He's all on fire. This Bonaparte has turned all their heads. They all think what an example he gave them in rising from a lieutenant to be an emperor. Well, good luck to them,' he added, not noticing his visitor's sarcastic smile. They began to talk about Napoleon. Julie Karagina turned to young Rostov. "'How sorry I was that you didn't come last Thursday to the Arkharovs. It was lonesome there without you,' said she, giving him an affectionate smile. The young man, much flattered, drew his seat nearer to her and engaged the smiling Julie in a confidential conversation, entirely oblivious that this coquettish smile cut as with a knife the jealous heart of poor Sonya, who flushed and tried to force a smile. In the midst of this conversation he happened to glance at her. She gave him a look of passionate anger, and, scarcely able to hold back her tears, and with the pretended smile still on her lips, got up and left the room. All Nikolai's animation deserted him. He availed himself of the first break in the conversation, and with a disturbed countenance left the room in search of Sonya. "'How the secrets of these young folks are sewed with white threads!' exclaimed Anna Mikhailovna, nodding in the direction of the vanishing Nikolai. "'Cousinage dangereux visionage,' she added. "'Yes,' replied the countess, when, as it were, the very light of the sun had departed from the room, together with these young people, and then, as though she were answering a question which no one had asked, but which was constantly in her mind, how much suffering, how much unrest, must be gone through with in order that at last we may have some joy in them. And even now, truly, there's more sorrow than joy. You're always in apprehension, always in apprehension." This is the age when there are so many perils for both young girls and for boys. It all depends upon the education, said the visitor. Yes, you are right, continued the countess. So far I have been, thank God, the confidant of my children, and enjoy their perfect confidence, declared the countess, repeating the air of many parents who cherish the illusion that their children have no secrets in which they do not share. I know that I shall always be my daughter's chief confidant, and that Nicolina, even with his impetuous nature, if he does play some pranks, as all boys will, still, there's no danger of his being like those Petersburg young men. Yes, they're splendid, splendid children, emphatically affirmed the Count, who always settled every question too complicated for him by finding everything splendid. But what's to be done? He wanted to go into the Hussars, what would you have, mon cher? What a charming creature your youngest girl is, said the visitor. Like powder. Yes, like powder, said the Count. She resembles me, and what a voice she has. Although she is my daughter, yet I am not afraid to say that she is going to be a singer, a second Salomini. We have engaged an Italian master to teach her. Isn't she too young yet? They say it is injurious for the voice to study at her age. Oh, no. Why do you consider it too early? exclaimed the Count. Didn't our mothers get married when they were twelve or thirteen? And she's already in love with Boris. Just think of it, said the Countess, looking at the Princess with a sweet smile. Then, apparently answering a thought that constantly occupied her, she went on to say, Well, now, you see, if I were too strict with her, if I were to forbid her— God knows what they might be doing on the sly. She meant they might exchange kisses. But now I know everything they say. She comes to me herself every evening and tells me all about it. Maybe I spoil her, but indeed this seems to be the best plan. I kept a too strict reign over my eldest daughter. Yes, I was brought up in an entirely different way, said the oldest daughter, the handsome Countess Viera, smiling but the smile did not add to the beauty of her face, as often happens. On the contrary, it lost its natural expression and therefore became unpleasant. She was handsome, intelligent, well-bred, well-educated. Her voice was pleasant. What she said was right and proper enough, and yet, strange to say, her mother and all the others looked at her as though surprised at her saying such a thing, and regarded it as one of the things that had better have been left unsaid. 
people always try to be very wise with their eldest children try to accomplish something extraordinary said the visitor how naughty to prevacate mon cher the little countess tried to be very wise with viera said the count well on the whole she has succeeded splendidly he added winking approvingly at his daughter the visitors got up and took their departure promising to return to dinner what manners i thought they were going to stay for ever remarked the countess after she had seen her visitors to the door End of chapter ten part one chapter eleven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne when natasha left the drawing-room she ran only as far as the conservatory there she paused listening to the chatter in the drawing-room and expecting boris to follow her she was already beginning to grow impatient and stamped her foot on the very verge of crying because he did not follow her instantly when she heard the noisy deliberate steps of a young man natasha hastily sprang between some tubs of flowers and concealed herself it was boris who paused in the centre of the room looked around him brushed the dust from the sleeve of his uniform and then going to the mirror contemplated his handsome face natasha holding her breath peered out from her hiding-place and waited to see what he would do he stood for some moments in front of the mirror then smiling with satisfaction went toward the entrance door natasha was just about to call to him but then she thought better of it let him find me she said to herself as soon as boris had left the conservatory sonya came in from the other door all flushed and angrily muttering to herself natasha restrained her first impulse to run to her and kept in her hiding-place as though under an invisible cap looking at what was going on in the world she was experiencing a new and peculiar enjoyment sonya was still muttering something and looking expectantly towards the drawing-room then nikolai made his appearance sonya what is the matter how can you do so asked the lad going up to her no no leave me alone and sonya began to sob well i know what the trouble is if you know so much the better go back to her then sonya one word how can you torment me and torment yourself for a mere fancy asked nikolai taking her hand sonya did not withdraw her hand and ceased weeping natasha not moving and hardly breathing peered from her concealment what will they do now i wonder she said to herself sonya the whole world is nothing to me thou alone art all to me said nikolai and i will prove it to thee i don't like it when you talk so with well i won't do so any more only forgive me sonya he drew her to him and kissed her ah how nice thought natasha and when sonya and nikolai had left the room she followed them and called boris to her boris come here said she with her face full of mischievous meaning i want to tell you something here come here she said and drew him into the conservatory to the very place among the tubs where she had been hiding boris smiling followed her what may this something be he inquired she grew confused glanced around her and espying the doll which she had thrown on one of the tubs she took it up kiss the doll said she boris looked down into her eager face with an inquiring gracious look and made no reply don't you care to well then come here said she and made her way deeper among the flowers at the same time throwing away the doll nearer nearer she whispered she seized the officer's coat by the cuff and her flushed face expressed eagerness and apprehension then will you kiss me she whispered so low as hardly to be heard looking up at him and smiling and almost crying with emotion boris reddened how absurd you are he exclaimed but he bent over to her reddening still more violently but not quite able to make up his mind whether to do it or not natasha suddenly sprang on a tub so that she was taller than he threw both slender bare arms around his neck and by a motion of her head tossing back her curls 
kissed him full on the lips. Then she slipped away between the flower pots and hanging her head stood still on the other side. Natasha, said he, you know that I love you, but... Are you in love with me? asked Natasha, interrupting him. Yes, I am. But please let us not do this again. In four years, then I will ask for your hand. Natasha pondered. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, said she, reckoning on her delicate fingers. Good, then it is decided, and a smile of joy and satisfaction lighted up her animated face. Yes, it is decided, said Boris. For ever and ever, said the girl, till death itself, and taking his arm, she went with a happy face into the divan room with him. End of chapter 11《パート1》Chapter 12 of《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The countess was now so tired of receiving that she gave orders not to admit any more visitors, and the Swiss was told to invite any one else who came to return to dinner. The countess was anxious to have a confidential talk with the friend of her childhood, the Princess Anna Mikhailovna whom she had scarcely seen since her return from Petersburg. Anna Mikhailovna, with her rather sad but pleasant face, drew her chair nearer to the countess. "'I will be perfectly frank with you,' said she. "'We have very few of our old friends left, and that's why I prize your friendship so highly.' She glanced at Viera and paused. The countess pressed her hand. Then, turning to her eldest daughter, who was evidently not her favorite, she said, Vera, haven't you any perception at all? Cannot you see that you are in the way? Go to your sisters, or... The handsome Vera smiled scornfully, evidently not feeling the least offended. If you had only told me sooner, Mamenka, I should have gone immediately, said she, and she left the room. But as she was going past the divan room, she saw that two couples were snugly ensconced in the embrasures of the two windows, she paused and smiled satirically. Sonya was sitting close by Nikolai, who was copying some verses in her honor, the first he had ever written. Boris and Natasha were sitting in the other window, and stopped talking as Viera passed. Both of the girls looked up at her with guilty, yet happy faces. It was both amusing and touching to see these two girls, so head over ears in love, but the sight of them evidently did not rouse pleasant thoughts in Viera's mind. "'How many times have I asked you not to touch my things?' said she. "'You have your own room.' And she took the inkstand away from her brother. "'Wait a minute, wait a minute,' said he, dipping his pen. "'You always succeed in doing things at just the wrong time,' exclaimed Viera. "'There you come running into the drawing-room, so that everyone was mortified on your account.' In spite of the fact, or perhaps because what she said was perfectly true, no one made her any reply, and all four only exchanged glances among themselves. Viera lingered in the room, holding the inkstand in her hand. "'And how can such young things as Natasha and Boris, and you two, have secrets? It's all nonsense.' "'Well, what concern is it of yours, Viera?' asked Natasha, in a gentle voice, defending herself." She was evidently more than ordinarily sweet, and well disposed to everyone just at the time. "'It's very stupid,' said Viera. "'I blush for you. What sort of secrets?' "'Everyone has his own. We don't disturb you and Berg,' said Natasha, hotly. "'I suppose you don't disturb me,' said Viera. "'And because you can't find anything improper in my behavior. But I'm going to tell Mamenka how you behave to Boris.' Natalia Ilyanishna behaves very well to me, said Boris. I cannot complain of it. Stop, Boris. You are such a diplomat. The word diplomat was in great vogue among the young people, with a special meaning which they gave to it. It's very annoying, said Natasha, in an offended and trembling voice. Why should she worry me so? You will never understand such things, she added, turning to Viera, because you never were in love with anyone. You have no heart. 
you are only madame de genis this was a nickname considered very insulting which had been first applied to viera by nikolai and your chief pleasure is to cause other people annoyance you may flirt with berg as much as you please she said spitefully well at all events you don't find me running after a young man in the presence of visitors there now you have done what you wanted interrupted nikolai you have said all sorts of unpleasant things and disturbed us all let's go to the nursery all four like a frightened bevy of birds jumped up and flew out of the room it's you who have been saying unpleasant things but i haven't said anything to any one cried viera madame de genlis madame de genlis shouted the merry voices from the other room through the open door the handsome viera who found a sort of pleasure in doing these unpleasant and irritating things smiled evidently undisturbed by what was said of her went to the mirror and rearranged her sash and hair as she caught a glimpse of her pretty face she became to all appearances cooler and more self-satisfied meantime the ladies in the drawing-room continued their talk ah cher said the countess in my life tu ne parodes i cannot help seeing that at the rate we are going our property will not hold out much longer and then his club and his easy ways even if we live in the country how much rest do we get theatricals hunting and heaven knows what all but what's the use of my talking now tell me how you manage to get along i often marvel at you annette how is it that you at your time of life fly about so in your carriage alone in moscow in petersburg to all the ministers to all the notables and succeed in getting around them all i marvel at it now tell me how do you do it i cannot understand it at all ah my dear heart replied the princess anna mikhailovna may god forbid that you ever learn by experience what it is to be left a widow and without any protector with a son whom you adore you get schooled to everything she went on to say with some pride my lawsuit has given me a great experience if i need to see any bigwig i write a note princess untel desires to see such and such a person and i myself go in a hired carriage twice three times four times until i get what i need it is a matter of indifference to me what they think of me well now how was it whom did you apply to for borenka asked the countess there he is already an officer of the guard and my nikolushka is going merely as a yunker there was no one to work for him whom did you ask prince vasily he was very kind he immediately consented to do all in his power and he laid the matter before the emperor said the princess anna mikhailovna entirely forgetting in her enthusiasm all the humiliation through which she had passed for the attainment of her ends prince vasily must have aged somewhat queried the countess i have not seen him since our theatricals at the rumyatsovs i suppose he has entirely forgotten me il m'a fusé la cour she added with a smile he is just the same as ever replied anna mikhailovna polite and full of compliments his head hasn't been turned at all by his elevation i am grieved that it is such a small thing to do for you my dear princess said he you have only to command me no he's a splendid man and a lovely relative to have but you know nathali my love for my boy i don't know what i would not do for his happiness but my means are so small for doing anything continued the princess in a melancholy tone lowering her voice they are so small that i am really in a most terrible position my unlucky lawsuit eats up all that i have and is no nearer to an end i have nothing you can imagine it a la lette i haven't a kopeck and i don't know how i shall get boris his uniform she drew out her handkerchief and began to weep i must have five hundred roubles and all i have is a twenty-five rouble bill that's the position i am in i have only one hope now in kirill vladimirovitch buzakoy if he will not help out his godson for you see 
he stood sponsor to boris and grant him something for his support then all my pains will have been lost i shall not have enough to pay for his uniform the countess shed some sympathetic tears and sat silently pondering maybe it's a sin said the princess but i often think there is count kira buzakoy living alone that enormous fortune and why does he live on life is a burden for him while boris is only beginning to live he will probably leave something to boris said the countess god only knows cher ami these rich men and grandees are so selfish but nevertheless i am going right away to see him with boris and i am going to tell him plainly how things are let them think what they please of me it is all the same to me when my son's fate depends upon it the princess got up it is now two o'clock and you dine at four i shall have plenty of time to go there and with the decision of the true petersburg lady of business who knows how to make the best use of her time she called her son and went with him to the entry good-bye dear heart she said to the countess who accompanied her to the door wish me luck she added in a whisper so that her son might not hear so you are going to count kirill vladimirovitch ma chere said the count coming out from the dining-room into the entry if he is better ask pierre to come and dine with me you see he used to be here a great deal and danced with the children now we shall see how splendidly taras will do by us to-day he declares that count orloff never had such a dinner as we are going to have End of chapter twelve Part one chapter thirteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Mon cher Boris, said the Princess Anna Mikhailovna to her son, as the Countess Rostova's carriage, in which they were riding, rolled along the straw covered street and entered the wide court of Count Kirill Vladimirovitch Buzakoy's residence mon cher boris said the mother stretching out her hand from under her old mantle and laying it on her son's with a timid and affectionate gesture be amiable and considerate count kirill vladimirovitch is your godfather and your prospects depend upon him remember this mon cher be as nice as you can be if i knew that anything would come from this except humiliation replied the son coldly but i have given you my promise and i do it for your sake though it was a respectable carriage that drove up to the steps the swiss noticing the lady's well-worn mantle looked askance at mother and son who without sending the footman to announce them had walked straight into the mere lined vestibule between two rows of statues standing in niches and asked them who they wished to see the young princesses or the count and when they said the count he told them that his excellency was worse and could not receive any one to-day then let us go said the son in french mon ami exclaimed the mother in a supplicating voice again laying her hand on his arm as though her touch had the effect of calming or encouraging him boris said no more but without removing his cloak looked dubiously at the mother my dear said the princess in a wheedling tone turning to the swiss i know that count kirill vladimirovitch is very ill that is why i came i am a relative of his i do not wish to disturb him my dear i only wanted to know see prince vasily sergeyevitch i understand that he is here be so good as to announce us the swiss gruffly pulled the bell cord and turned away princess dubetskaya for prince vasily sergeyevitch he called to the footman in small clothes pumps and dress coat who ran to the head of the stairs and looked over from above the princess straightened the folds of her dyed silk dress glanced at the massive venetian mirror on the wall and firmly mounted the carpeted staircase in her old worn shoes mon cher vous me va promis said she turning round to her son and encouraging him with a touch of her hand the young man dropping his eyes silently followed her they went into a hall which led into the suite of rooms occupied by prince vasily 
just as the mother and son started to walk through this room and were about to ask the way of an elderly footman who had sprung to his feet on their approach the bronze door-knob of one of the heavy doors turned and prince vasili himself dressed in a velvet fur-trimmed coat with a single star as though he were at home came in escorting a handsome black-bearded man this man was the celebrated petersburg doctor lorraine c'est un positif the prince was saying mon prince errare humanum est mais replied the doctor who swallowed his r's and spoke the latin words to air is human with a strong french accent Sebia, perceiving anna mikhailovna and her son prince vasili dismissed the doctor with a bow and advanced in silence and with an inquiring look toward them the son noticed that his mother's eyes suddenly took on an expression of deep concern and grief and he laughed in his sleeve under what melancholy circumstances we meet again prince well how is our dear invalid said she as though she did not notice the cold insulting glance fastened upon her prince vasili looked questioningly at her and then at boris as though he were surprised to see them there boris bowed civilly prince vasili entirely ignoring it replied to anna mikhailovna's question by a significant motion of his head and lips giving her to understand that there was very slim hope for the sick man is it possible cried anna mikhailovna ah oh, this is terrible fearful to think this is my son she added pointing to boris he was anxious to thank you in person boris again bowed politely be assured prince that a mother's heart will never forget what you have done for us i am glad if i have been able to be of service to you my dear anna mikhailovna said prince vasili adjusting his frill and manifesting both in tone and manner here in moscow before anna mikhailovna whom he had put under deep obligation a far more consequential air than at petersburg at annette scherer's reception do your best to serve with credit and prove yourself deserving he added turning to boris i am glad are you here on leave of absence he asked in an apathetic tone i am waiting for orders your excellency before setting out for my new position replied boris manifesting not the slightest resentment of the prince's peremptory tone nor any inclination to pursue the conversation but bearing himself with such dignity and deference that the prince gave him a scrutinizing glance do you live with your mother i live at the countess rostova's said boris again taking pains to add your excellency it is that ilya rostov who married nathalie shashina said anna mikhailovna i know i know returned prince vasili in his monotonous voice I could never understand how Natalia made up her mind to marry that unlicked bear, a perfectly stupid and absurd creature, and a gambler besides, they say. Mais très brave somme, mon prince, remarked Anna Mikhailovna, smiling with a touching smile, as though she too knew very well that Count Rostov deserved such an opinion of him, but did her best to say a good word for the poor old man. What do the doctors say? asked the princess, after a short silence, and again allowing an expression of deep grief to settle upon her careworn face very little hope said the prince i wanted so much to thank my uncle once more for all his kindnesses to me and boris he's his godson she added in french in such a tone as though this piece of information must be highly delightful to the prince prince vasili sat pondering and knitting his brows anna mikhailovna realized that he was apprehensive lest she were a rival for the count's inheritance she hastened to reassure him if it were not for my true love and devotion to my uncle said she uttering the words my uncle with remarkable effrontery and unconcern i know his noble straightforward character but you see he has only the young princesses with him they are both so inexperienced she inclined her head and added in a whisper has he yet fulfilled the last duty prince how precious are these last moments things couldn't be worse he should be prepared at once if he is so ill we women prince she smiled with self-importance always understand how to put these things it's indispensable that i should see him 
however hard it may be for me. But then, I am accustomed to sorrow. The prince evidently knew only too well, just as he had known at Annette Scherer's, that he would have no little difficulty in getting rid of Anna Mikhailovna. This interview might be injurious to him, Cher Anna Mikhailovna. Better wait till evening. The doctors have been expecting a crisis. But it is impossible to wait, prince, at such moments. Pensez, il y avait du salut de son homme. Ah, c'est terrible. Les devoirs d'un chrétien. A door opened, and from an inner chamber appeared one of the count's nieces, a young lady with a sour, cold face, and with a waist disproportionately long for her stature. Prince Vasily went toward her. Well, how is he? Just about the same. But what could you expect? This noise, said the princess, staring at Anna Mikhailovna as though she were a stranger. Ah, oh, cher, I did not recognize you, exclaimed Anna Mikhailovna with a beaming smile, and ambling lightly forward toward the Count's niece. I have just come, and I am at your service to help you take care of my uncle. I can imagine how much you have suffered, she added, still in French, and sympathetically turning up her eyes. The Count's niece made no reply, nor did she even smile, but immediately left the room. Anna Mikhailovna took off her gloves, and established herself in an armchair, as though ready to endure a siege, and motioned to the prince to sit down near her. Boris, she said to her son, with a smile, I am going to see the count, my uncle. In the meantime, mon ami, you go and find Pierre, and don't forget to give him the invitation from the Rostovs. They asked him to dinner. I think very likely he may not wish to come, she suggested, turning to the prince. On the contrary, returned the prince, evidently very much annoyed. I should be very glad to have him taken off my hands. He stays in his own room. The Count has not asked for him once. He shrugged his shoulders. A footman conducted the young man downstairs, and then up, by another flight, to Pierre's quarters. End of chapter 13Part 1, Chapter 15 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Pierre had not succeeded in choosing a career for himself when he was sent to Moscow on account of his disorderly conduct. The story which had been related at Count Rostov's was correct. Pierre had been one of the young men who had tied the policeman on the bear's back. He had arrived in Moscow a few days previous and taken up his abode as usual in his father's house. Although he foresaw that the story would be noised abroad in Moscow, and that the ladies who formed his father's household, and who were always hostile to him, would take advantage of this occurrence to irritate the Count against him, he nevertheless, on the very day of his arrival, started to go to his father's apartments. As he went into the drawing-room, where the princesses usually sat, he stopped to pay his respects to the ladies, who were there busy with their embroidery frame and in listening to a book which one of them was reading aloud. There were three of them. The oldest, a severely prim old maid with a long waist, the very one who had made the descent upon Anna Mikhailovna, was the reader. The younger ones, both rosy-cheeked and rather pretty, and exactly alike, except that one of them had a little mole on her lip, decidedly adding to her beauty, were engaged at the embroidery frame. Pierre was received like a ghost, or a leper. The oldest princess ceased reading, and silently looked at him with eyes expressive of alarm. The one without the mole did the same. The third, who had the mole, and some sense of the ludicrous, bent over the embroidery to conceal a smile, caused by what she thought promised to be an amusing scene. She drew the thread down, and bent over, as though studying the pattern, but in reality to hide her laugh. "'Bonjour, mon cousine,' said Pierre. "'Vous ne me reconnaissez pas?' "'I know you very well, altogether too well.' "'How is the Count? Can I see him?' asked Pierre, awkwardly as usual, but still not disconcerted. "'The Count is suffering, both physically and mentally,' 
and it seems you have taken pains to cause him the greater part of his moral suffering. "'Can I see the Count?' repeated Pierre. Hm. "'If you desire to kill him, to kill him out and out, then you can see him. Olga, go and see if the bullion is ready for uncle. It is high time,' she added." making Pierre see by this that they were wholly absorbed in caring for his father, while he, on the contrary, was palpably bent on annoying him. Olga left the room. Pierre stood still, looking at the sisters, and then said with a bow, "'Then I will go back to my room. As soon as it is possible you will please tell me.' He went out, and behind his back was heard the young princess's laugh, ringing but not loud." On the next day came Prince Vasily and put up at the Count's. He called Pierre and said to him, Mon cher, si vous vous condescez, ici comme à Petersburg, vous finirez très mal, c'est tout ce que vous dites. The Count is very ill, very ill. It is imperative that you should not see him. From that time Pierre had been left severely alone and spent his days in solitude, upstairs in his own rooms. At the moment that Boris appeared at the door, Pierre was walking up and down his room, occasionally pausing in the corners and making threatening gestures at the walls, as though trying to thrust through some unknown enemy, and looking savagely over his spectacles, and then again beginning his promenade, muttering indistinct words, shrugging his shoulders, and spreading out his hands. L'Angleterre a vécu, he was declaiming, with a frown and pointing at some imaginary person with his finger. Monsieur Pitt, comme traître à la nation et à droit des gens, et comme damnia. But he had no time to complete his denunciation of Pitt, spoken by himself, personating his hero Napoleon, in whose company he imagined himself crossing the perilous Dover Straits and already taking London by storm, before he caught sight of a handsome, well-built young officer coming towards him. He stopped short. Boris was a lad of fourteen when he had last seen him, and he did not recognize him at all. But, nevertheless, he seized him by the hand in his impulsive, cordial way, and smiled affectionately. "'Do you remember me?' asked Boris, calmly, with a pleasant smile. "'I came with my mother to see the Count, but it seems he is too ill to receive us.' "'Yes, he is very ill.' They keep him stirred up all the time, returned Pierre, striving to recollect who this young man was. Boris was certain that Pierre did not recognize him, but he did not think it necessary to tell him his name, and without manifesting the slightest awkwardness, he looked him full in the face. Count Rostov invites you to dine with him this afternoon, said he, after a rather long silence that made Pierre feel uncomfortable. Ah, Count Rostov, exclaimed Pierre, joyfully. Then you are his son, Ilya. At the first instant I did not recognize you, as you can easily imagine. Do you remember how you and I and Madame Jacot used to go out walking on the Sparrow Hills, years ago? You are mistaken, said Boris deliberately, and with a bold and rather derisive smile. I am Boris, the son of the Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubetskaya. Rostov's father is named Ilya, and his name is Nikolai, and I never knew Madame Jocotte. Pierre made a gesture with his hands and head, as though he were driving away mosquitoes. Ah, it is so indeed. I have mixed everything all up. I have so many relatives in Moscow. So you are Boris? Yes. Well, you and I seem to have begun with a misunderstanding. Well, what do you think of the expedition to Bologna? It will go pretty hard with the English, if only Napoleon crosses the Channel, won't it? I think the expedition is feasible, if only Villeneuve doesn't fail him. Boris knew nothing about the Bologna expedition. He had not read the newspapers, and this was the first time he had ever heard of Villeneuve. We here in Moscow are more taken up with dinners and gossip than with politics, said he, in his calm, satirical tone. I know nothing about such things. Moscow is given over especially to tittle-tattle, he went on to say. Now you and the Count are the talk. Pierre smiled his good-natured smile, 
as though to depreciate anything unpleasant which his companion might be likely to say but boris spoke with due circumspection clearly and dryly looking straight into pierre's eyes moscow likes to do nothing better than talk gossip he repeated all are solicitous about knowing to whom the count is going to leave his property and yet very possibly he will outlive all of us i hope so with all my heart yes this is all very trying interrupted pierre very trying pierre all the time was apprehensive lest this young officer should unexpectedly turn the conversation into some awkward channel but it must seem to you said boris flushing slightly but not allowing his voice or his manner to vary it must seem to you that all take an interest in this simply because they hope to get something from the estate here it comes thought pierre i expressly wish to tell you lest any misunderstanding should arise that you are entirely mistaken if you consider me and my mother in the number of these people we are very poor but i at least say this on my own account for the very reason that your father is rich that i do not consider myself a relative of his and neither i nor my mother would ask or even be willing to receive anything from him pierre for some time failed to comprehend but when the idea dawned on him he leaped from the sofa seized boris under the arm with characteristic impetuosity and clumsiness and while he reddened even more than the other he began to speak with a mixed feeling of vexation and shame now this is strange i then indeed and who would have ever thought i know very well but boris again interrupted him i am glad that i have told you all perhaps it was disagreeable to you you will pardon me said he soothing pierre instead of letting himself be soothed by him i hope that i have not offended you it is a principle with me to speak right to the point what answer am i to give will you come to dinner to the rostovs and boris having acquitted himself of a difficult explanation and got himself out of an awkward position by putting another into it again became perfectly agreeable now look here listen said pierre calming down you are a remarkable man what you have just said is very good very good of course you don't know me we have not met for a long time we were still children you might have had all sorts of ideas about me i understand you understand you perfectly i should not have done such a thing i should not have had the courage but it is excellent i am very glad to have made your acquaintance strange he added after a short silence and smiling strange that you should have had such an idea of me he laughed well who knows we shall get better acquainted i beg of you he pressed boris's hand do you know i have not seen the count yet he has not asked for me it is trying to me as a man but what can i do about it and do you think that napoleon will succeed in getting his army across asked boris with a smile pierre understood that boris wanted to change the conversation and taking his cue he began to expound the advantages and disadvantages of the bologna expedition a footman came to summon boris to his mother the princess was ready to start pierre looking affectionately through his spectacles promised to come and dine with the rostovs so as to get better acquainted with boris whose hand he pressed warmly as they parted after he was left alone pierre still paced for a long time up and down the room no longer threatening an invisible enemy with the sword but smiling at the thought of this likable young man who was so intelligent and clever and decided as often happens in early youth and especially when a man is lonesome he felt an inexplicable affection for the lad and promised himself that they should become good friends prince vasily escorted the princess to the door the good lady held her handkerchief to her eyes and there were traces of tears on her cheeks this is terrible terrible she exclaimed but so far as in me lay i fulfilled my duty i will come back and spend the night it is impossible to leave him in such a state every moment is precious i cannot understand why the princesses have delayed about it 
Perhaps God will enable me to find some means of preparing him. Adieu, mon prince, que les bon Dieu vous soutien. Adieu, ma bonne, replied Prince Vasily, as he turned away from her. Ah, he is in a frightful state, said the princess to Boris, after they had again taken their seats in the carriage. He scarcely knows any one. I cannot understand, Mamenka, what his feelings are in regard to Pierre. Can you? asked the son. Everything will be made clear by his will, my dear. Our fate also depends upon that. What makes you think he is going to leave anything to us? Ah, my dear, he is so rich, and we are so poor. Well, that is a most inconclusive reason, Mamenka. Ah, my God, my God, how ill he is, exclaimed the mother. End of chapter 14「Part One, Chapter Fifteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. After Anna Mikhailovna and her son had gone to Count Vesikoy's, the Countess Rostova sat for some time alone, applying her handkerchief to her eyes. At last she rang the bell. "'What is the matter with you, my dear?' she demanded severely of the maid, who had kept her waiting several minutes. "'Don't you care to serve me? If not, I can find another place for you.' The countess was greatly affected by her old friend's grief and humiliation, and therefore she was out of sorts, as could be told by her speaking to the maid by the formal "we," oui, you, and milia, dear. "'Beg pardon,' said the girl. "'Ask the count to come to me.' The count came waddling to his wife with a rather guilty look, as usual. "'Well, little countess, what a sauté a Madeira of woodcock we are going to have, ma chère. I have been trying it. Terra's is well worth the thousand roubles that I give for him. It was well spent.' He took a seat near his wife, with an affectation of bravery, leaning one hand on his knee and with the other rumpling up his grey hair. "'What do you wish, little countess?' "'See there, my love. How did you get that spot on you?' she said, pointing to his waistcoat. "'It is evidently some of your sauté,' she added with a smile. "'See here, Count. I need some money.' His face grew mournful. "'Ah, little Countess!' And the Count made a great ado in getting out his pocket-book. "'I want a good deal, Count. I want five hundred roubles.' and she took her cambric handkerchief and began to rub her husband's waistcoat. "'You shall have it at once.' "'Hey there!' cried the Count, in a tone used only by men who are certain that those whom they command will rush headlong at their call. "'Send Matenka to me.' Matenka, the nobleman's son whom the Count had brought up and had now put in charge of all his affairs, came with soft, noiseless steps into the room. "'See here, my dear,' said the Count, to the deferential young man as he entered the door. "'Bring me—' he hesitated. "'Yes, bring me seven hundred roubles. Yes, and see here, don't bring such torn and filthy ones as you do sometimes, but clean ones. They are for the countess.' "'Yes, Matenka, please see that they are clean,' said the countess, with a sigh. "'Your Excellency, when do you wish them?' asked Matenka. "'You will deign to know that—' however. Don't allow yourself to be uneasy, he added. Perceiving that the Count was already beginning to breathe heavily and rapidly, which was always a sign of a burst of rage. I had forgotten. Will you please to have them this instant? Yes, yes, instantly. Bring them. Give them to the Countess. What a treasure Matinka is, he added with a smile as the young man left the room. He never finds anything impossible. That is a thing I cannot endure. All things are possible. Ah, money, Count, money. How much sorrow it causes in the world, exclaimed the Countess. But this money is very important for me. Little Countess, you are a terrible spendthrift, declared the Count, and kissing his wife's hand, he disappeared again into his own apartment. When Anna Mikhailovna returned from her visit to Buzikoy, the money, all in new clean banknotes, 
was laying on a stand under a handkerchief in the countess's room. Anna Mikhailovna noticed that the countess was excited over something. "'Well, my dear?' asked the countess. "'Oh, he's in such a terrible state. You would never know him. He is so ill, so ill. I stayed only a short minute, and didn't say two words. "'Annette, for heaven's sake, don't refuse me,' suddenly exclaimed the countess, taking out the money from under the handkerchief, while her old, thin, grave face flushed in a way that was strange to see. Anna Mikhailovna instantly understood what she meant, and was already bending over so as to embrace the countess gracefully at the right moment. "'It is from me to Boris, for his outfit.' Anna Mikhailovna interrupted her by throwing her arms around her and bursting into tears. The countess wept with her. They wept because they were friends, and because they were kind-hearted, and because, having been friends from childhood, they were now occupied with such a sordid matter as money, and because their youth had passed. But theirs were pleasant tears. End of chapter 15《パート1》Chapter 16 of《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Countess Rostova, with her daughters and a considerable number of guests, were sitting in the drawing room. The Count had taken the men into his cabinet and was showing them his favorite collection of Turkish pipes. Occasionally, he would go out and ask, "Hasn't she come yet?" They were waiting for Maria Dmitrievna Akrosimova, called in society Le Terrible Dragon, a lady who was distinguished not for her wealth or her titles, but for the honesty of her character and her frank, simple ways. The imperial family knew her, all Moscow knew her, and all Petersburg, and both cities, while they laughed at her on the sly and related anecdotes of her brusque manners, nevertheless, without exception, respected and feared her the conversation in the cabinet which was full of smoke turned on the war which had just been declared through a manifesto in regard to the recruiting no one had as yet read the manifesto but all were aware of its appearance the count was sitting on a low ottoman between two of his friends who were talking and smoking he himself did not smoke and did not talk but inclining his head now to one side now to the other he looked with manifest satisfaction at those who did and listened to the conversation of his two friends whom he had already set by the ears one of the men was a civilian with a wrinkled sallow lean and cleanly shaven face though he was approaching old age he was dressed in the height of style like a young man he was sitting with his feet on the ottoman like a man thoroughly at home and holding the amber mouthpiece at one side of his mouth, was sucking strenuously at the smoke, and frowning over the effort. This was the old bachelor, Shinshin, the countess's own cousin, a venomous tongue, as it was said of him in Moscow drawing-rooms. He talked as though it were an act of condescension toward his opponent. The other, a fresh, ruddy young officer of the guard, irreproachably belted, buttoned, and barbered, held the mouthpiece in the middle of his mouth, and gently sucked the smoke through his rosy lips, sending it out in rings from his handsome mouth. This was Lieutenant Berg, an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment, with whom Boris was going to the army, the very person about whom Natasha had teased Viera by calling him her lover. The Count was sitting between these two and listening attentively. The occupation that the Count enjoyed most, next to the game of Boston, of which he was very fond, was that of listener, especially when he had a chance to get two good talkers on the opposite sides of an argument. "'Well now, Batyushka, my most honourable Alfonso Kerlich, said Shinshin, with a sneer, and, as his custom was when he talked, mixing up the most colloquial Russian expressions with the most refined French idioms, "'Your idea is to make money out of the state?' You expect to get a nice little income from your company, do you? Not at all, Pyotr Nikolaitch. I only wish to prove that the advantages of serving in the cavalry are far less than in the infantry. You can now imagine my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. 
Berg always spoke very accurately, calmly, and politely. His conversation invariably had himself as its central point. He always preserved a discreet silence when people were talking about anything that did not directly concern himself, and he could sit that way silently for hours, without feeling or causing others to feel the slightest sense of awkwardness. But as soon as the conversation touched any subject in which he was personally interested, he would begin to talk at length and with evident satisfaction. Consider my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. If I were in the cavalry, I should not receive more than two hundred a quarter, even with the rank of lieutenant. But now I get two hundred and thirty, said he, with a pleasant, joyful smile, glancing at Shinshin and the Count, as though it were plain for him that his success would always be an object of interest to everybody else. Moreover, Pyotr Nikolaitch, continued Berg, by being transferred to the guard, I am in sight. Vacancies in the infantry occur far more often. Then, you can see for yourself, on two hundred and thirty roubles a quarter, how well I can live. I can lay up some and send some to my father, too, he went on to say, puffing out a spiral of smoke. That's where the difference lies. A German can grind corn on the butt of his hatchet, as the proverb puts it, said Shinshin, shifting the mouthpiece of his pipe to the other side of his mouth and winking at the Count. The Count laughed heartily. The other guests, seeing that Shinshin was engaged in a lively conversation, crowded round to listen. Berg, remarking neither the quizzical nor indifferent looks of the others, proceeded to explain how, by his transfer to the guard, he would attain rank before his comrades of the corpus, how, in time of war, the company commanders were apt to be killed, and he, if left the senior in the company, might very easily become a captain, and how everybody in the regiment liked him, and how proud of him his papenka was. Berg evidently took great delight in telling all this, and he never seemed to suspect that other people had also their interests. But all that he said was so suavely serious, the naivete of his youthful egotism was so palpable, that he quite disarmed his auditors. Well, my lad, whether you are in the infantry or in the guard, you will get on, that I can predict, said Shinshin, tapping him on the shoulder and setting his feet down from the ottoman. Berg smiled with self-satisfaction. The Count, followed by his guests, passed into the drawing-room. It was the time, just before dinner is announced, when the assembled guests, in expectation of being summoned to partake of the zakuska, are disinclined to entering any detailed conversation and, at the same time, feel that it is incumbent upon them to stir about and say something, in order to show that they are in no haste to sit down. The host and hostess keep watching the dining door and exchange glances from time to time. The guests try to read in those glances for whom or for what they are waiting, some belated influential connection, or for some dish that is not done in time. Pierre came in just before the dinner hour and awkwardly sat down in the first chair that he saw, right in the middle of the drawing room so that he was in everybody's way. The countess tried to engage him in conversation, but he merely answered her questions in monosyllables, and kept looking naively around him through his spectacles, as though in search of someone. It was exceedingly annoying, but he was the only person who did not notice it. The majority of the guests, knowing about his adventure with the bear, looked curiously at this big, tall, quiet-looking man, and found it difficult to believe that such a burly, unassuming creature could have played such a trick on a police officer. "'Have you only just come?' asked the Countess. "'Oui, madame,' replied he, glancing around. "'You have not seen my husband?' "'No, madame,' and he smiled at absolutely the wrong time. "'You were in Paris lately, I believe. "'I think it is very interesting. "'Very interesting.' The countess exchanged glances with Anna Mikhailovna, who perceived that she was wanted to take charge of this young man. She took a seat by his side and began to talk to him about his father, but he answered her, just as he had the countess, merely in monosyllables. The other guests were all engaged in little groups. Le Razumonsky. That was charming. You are very good. La Comtesse Apricocina were the broken phrases that were heard on all sides. 
the countess got up and went into the hall is that you Marya dmitrievna rang her voice through the hall my own self was the answer in a harsh voice and immediately after Marya dmitrievna entered the room all the young ladies and even the married women except those who were aged rose Marya dmitrievna paused in the doorway she was tall and erect fifty years old and wore her gray hair in ringlets under the pretext of turning back and adjusting the wide sleeves of her dress she took a deliberate survey of all the guests Marya dmitrievna always spoke in russian congratulations to the dear ones said she in her loud deep voice which drowned all other sounds well you old sinner how are you she said addressing the count who kissed her hand i suppose you are bored to death in moscow eh no chance to let out the dogs well what's to be done batyushka when you have these birds already grown up she waved her hand toward the young ladies whether you wish it or no you've got to find husbands for them well my cossack said she Marya dmitrievna always called natasha the cossack smoothing natasha's hair as she came running up to kiss her hand gaily and without any fear i know that this little girl is a madcap but i am fond of her all the same she took out of a monstrous reticule a pair of pear-shaped amethyst earrings and gave them to the blushing natasha in honor of her name-day then she turned immediately upon pierre he he my dear come here right here she cried in a pretended gentle voice come here my dear fellow and she threateningly pulled her sleeve still higher pierre went to her ingenuously looking at her through his spectacles come here come my dear fellow i have been the only one who dared tell your father the whole truth when he required it and now i shall do the same in your case it's god's will she paused all held their breath waiting for what was to come and feeling that this was but the prologue he's a fine lad i must say a fine lad his father lying on his deathbed and this young man amuses himself by tying a policeman on a bear's back for shame batyushka for shame you would better have gone to the war she turned away from him and gave her hand to the count who found it difficult to keep from laughing outright well then to dinner it is ready i believe said marya dmitrievna the count led the way with marya dmitrievna followed by the countess escorted by the colonel of hussars a man to be made much of since nikolai was to join his regiment anna mikhailovna went in with shinshin berg gave his arm to viera the smiling julie karagina went with nikolai to the table behind them followed the rest of the couples making a long line through the hall and the rear was brought up by the tutors and governesses each leading one of the children the waiters bustled about chairs were noisily pushed back an orchestra was playing in the gallery and the guests took their places the sounds of the count's private band were soon drowned in the clatter of knives and forks the voices of the guests and the hurrying steps of the waiters at the head of the table sat the countess marya dmitrievna at her right anna mikhailovna at her left then the other ladies at the other end of the table sat the count with the colonel of hussars at his left and shinshin and the other men at his right at one side of the long table were the young gentlemen and ladies viera next to berg pierre and boris together all facing the children and their guardians on the other side the count through the long line of decanters and vases with fruits looked across to his wife and her towering headdress with its blue ribbons and zealously helped his neighbors to wine not forgetting himself the countess also not neglecting the duties of a hostess cast significant glances at her husband over the tops of the pineapples and it seemed to her that his bald forehead and face were all the more conspicuously rubicund from the contrast of his gray hair on the ladies side there was an unceasing buzz of conversation on the side of the men the voices grew louder and louder and loudest of all talked the colonel of hussars who ate and drank all that he could his face growing more and more flushed so that the count felt called upon to hold him up to the other guests as an example berg with an affectionate smile was talking with viera on the theme of love being not an earthly but a heavenly feeling 
boris was enlightening his new friend pierre as to the guests who were at the table and occasionally exchanged glances with natasha who was seated on the opposite side pierre himself said little but he ate much while he scanned the faces of the guests having been offered two kinds of soups he had chosen turtle and from the fish kulabyaka to the saute of woodcock he did not refuse a single dish or any of the wines which the butler offered him thrusting the bottle mysteriously wrapped in a white napkin over his neighbor's shoulder murmuring dry madeira or hungarian or rhine wine he held up the first that he had happened to lay his hand upon of the four wine glasses engraved with the count's arms that stood before each guest and drank rapturously and the face that he turned upon the guests grew constantly more and more friendly natasha sitting opposite gazed at boris as young girls of thirteen only can on the lad with whom they have just exchanged kisses and are very much in love occasionally she let her eyes rest on pierre and this glance of the ridiculous little maiden so lively in all her ways almost made him feel like laughing he could not tell why nikolai was seated at some distance from sonya and next to julie karagina and was again talking with her with the same involuntary smile sonya also had a smile on her lips but it was not natural and she was evidently tortured with jealousy first she turned pale then red and was trying with all her might to imagine what nikolai and julie were talking about the governess was looking around nervously as though ready to make resistance should any one presume to injure her young charges the german tutor was endeavouring to fix in his memory all the different courses desserts and wines so as to give a full description of it when he wrote home to germany he felt sorely grieved because the butler who had the bottle wrapped in the napkin passed him by he frowned and tried to make it appear that he had no wish to taste that wine and was only affronted because no one was willing to see that he needed the wine not for allaying his thirst or from greediness but from motives of mere curiosity End of chapter 16part one chapter seventeen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne at the men's end of the table the conversation was growing more and more animated the colonel was telling that the manifesto in regard to the declaration of war had already appeared in petersburg and that he had seen a copy of it which had been brought that day by a courier to the commander-in-chief why the deuce should it behoove us to fight with bonaparte exclaimed shinshin he has already made austria talk very mild i fear that now it will be our turn the colonel was a stout tall german of sanguine temperament but a thorough soldier and a patriot nevertheless he felt affronted at what shinshin said but why my dear sir said he mispronouncing every word inasmuch as the emperor knows that in his manifest he says that he cannot look with indifference on the dangers threatening russia and that the safety of the empire and the sanctity of the allies and he put special emphasis on the word allies as though it contained the whole essence of the matter and then with his infallible memory trained by official life he began to repeat the introductory clause of the manifesto and as the emperor's wish and constant unalterable aim is to establish peace in europe on lasting foundations he has determined to move a portion of his army across the frontier and make every effort for the attainment of this design and that is the reason my dear sir said he in conclusion edifyingly draining his glass of wine and glancing at the count for encouragement do you know the proverb yurima yurima you'd better stay at home and twirl the spindle said shinshin frowning and smiling that fits us to a t even surarov was cut all to pieces and where shall we find a surarov nowadays what do you think about it asked he incessantly changing from russian to french we must fight to the last drop of our blood said the colonel thumping on the table we must be willing to perish for our emperor and then all will be well and argue as little as possible as little as possible he repeated giving a strong stress to the word possible and looking again at the count that's the way the old hussars look at it 
and how do you look at it young man and young hussar he added turning to nikolai who quite neglecting his fair companion now that the talk turned on the war was looking with all his eyes at the colonel and drinking in all that he had to say i agree with you entirely returned nikolai in a glow and turning his plate round and rearranging his wine-glasses with a resolute and desperate face as though at that very instant he were going to be called upon to face a great peril i am convinced that we russians must either conquer or die said he and then instantly felt just as the rest did after the words were out of his mouth that he had spoken more enthusiastically and bombastically than the occasion warranted and had therefore been guilty of a solecism what you just said was splendid said julie with a sigh sonya was all of a tremble and blushed to her ears and even to her shoulders while nikolai was speaking pierre listened to the colonel's speeches and nodded his head in approval here that's splendid said he you're a real hussar young man cried the colonel again thumping on the table what are you making such a noise about there suddenly spoke up marya dmitrievna her deep voice ringing across the table why are you pounding on the table she demanded of the hussar what are you getting so heated about pray one would really think that the french were right here before you i am telling the truth said the hussar smiling always talking about the war cried the count across the table you see i have a son who is going marya dmitrievna my son is going well i have four sons in the army but i don't mourn over it god's will rules all you may die at home lying on your oven or god may bring you safe out of battle rang marya dmitrievna's loud voice without any effort from the further end of the table that is so and the conversation was again confined among the ladies at their end of the table and among the men at theirs you won't dare to ask it said natasha's little brother to her i tell you you won't dare yes i will too replied natasha her face suddenly kindled and expressed a desperate and mischievous resolution she started up with a glance causing pierre who was sitting opposite to her to listen and addressing her mother mamma rang her childish chest voice across the table what is it you wish asked the countess alarmed but seeing by her daughter's face that it was some prank she shook her finger sternly at her and shook her head warningly there was a lull in the conversation mamma what sort of pastry is coming cried the little voice even more clearly and without any hesitation the countess tried to look severe but could not marya dmitrievna shook her stout finger at the little girl cossack said she the majority of the guests looked at the old ladies and did not know what to make of this freak you will see what i shall do to you said the countess mamma tell me what pastry we are going to have cried natasha again all in a giggle and assured in her own merry little heart that her prank would not be taken amiss sonya and the stout little petya were struggling with suppressed laughter there i did ask whispered natasha to her little brother and to pierre on whom she again fastened her eyes ices but you are not to have any said marya dmitrievna natasha saw that there was nothing to be afraid of and therefore she had no fear of marya dmitrievna marya dmitrievna what kind of ices i don't like ice cream carrot no what kind marya dmitrievna tell me what kind she almost screamed marya dmitrievna and the countess laughed and the rest of the guests did the same all laughed not so much at marya dmitrievna's repartee as at the incomprehensible bravery and cleverness of the little girl who could and dared treat marya dmitrievna so natasha was made to hold her tongue only when she was told that they were to have pineapple sherbet before the ices were brought champagne was handed around again the orchestra played the count exchanged kisses with his little countess and the guests standing drank a health to the hostess clinking their glasses across the table with the count with the children and with each other again the waiters bustled about there was the noise of moving chairs and in the same order but with more flushed faces the guests returned to the drawing-room and to the count's cabinet 
End of chapter 17「Part 1, Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The card tables were brought out, partners were selected, and the Count's guests scattered through the two drawing-rooms, the divan room, and the library. The Count, having arranged his cards in a fan shape, found it difficult to keep from indulging in his usual after-dinner nap, and laughed heartily at everything. The young people, at the Countess's instigation, gathered around the clavichord and the harp. Julie, first, by general request, played a piece with variations on the harp, and then she joined with the rest of the girls in urging Natasha and Nikolai, whose musical talent was known to all, to sing something. Natasha was evidently very much flattered by this request, and at the same time it filled her with trepidation. "'What shall we sing?' she asked. "'The fountain?' suggested Nikolai. "'Well, give me the music, quick. "'Boris, come here,' said Natasha. "'But where is Sonya?' She looked around, and seeing that her cousin was nowhere in the room, she started to find her. She ran into Sonya's room, and not finding her there, hastened to the nursery, but she was not there. Natasha then came to the conclusion that Sonya might be in the corridor on the great chest. The great chest in the corridor was the place of mourning for all the young women of the house of Rostov. There, in fact, Sonya was found, in her airy pink frock, all crumpled, lying flat on her face on a dirty striped pillow that belonged to the nurse, and, hiding her face in her hands, was crying as though her heart would break, while her poor, bare shoulders shook under her sobs. Natasha's face, which had been so radiant all through her name-day, suddenly changed. Her eyes grew fixed, then her throat contracted, and the corners of her mouth drew down. "'Sonya, what is the matter? Tell me what it is. What is the matter with you? Oh, oh!' And Natasha— opening her large mouth and becoming perfectly ugly, cried like a child, without knowing any reason for it, except that Sonya was crying. Sonya tried to lift up her head, tried to answer, but found it impossible, and hid her face again. Natasha sat down on the blue cushion, and threw her arms around her dear cousin. At length Sonya put forth an effort, sat up, and began to wipe away her tears, saying, "'Nikolenka is going away in a week.' his papers have come he himself told me so but i should not have wept she held out a little piece of paper which she had been reading it contained the verses which nikolai had written for her i should not have wept for that but you cannot understand no one can understand what a noble heart he has and once more her tears began to flow at the thought of what a noble heart he had you are happy. I do not envy you. I love you, and Boris, too, she said, composing herself by an effort. He is good. For you there are no obstacles. But Nikolai is my cousin. We should have to. The archbishop himself. Else it would be impossible. And that if Mamenka, Sonya always regarded the countess as her mother and called her so, she will say that I am spoiling Nikolai's career— that I am heartless and ungrateful, and she would be right, too. But God is my witness. Here she crossed herself. I love her so, and all of you, except only Viera. And why is it? What have I done to her? I am so grateful to you, that I would gladly make any sacrifice for you. But it's no use. Sonya could say no more, and again she buried her face in the cushion and her hands. Natasha tried to calm her, but it could be seen by her face that she understood all the depth of Sonya's woe. "'Sonya!' she exclaimed, suddenly, as though surmising the actual reason of her cousin's grief. "'Truly, didn't Viera say something to you after dinner? Tell me.' "'Nikolai wrote these verses himself, and I copied off some other ones, and she found them on my table, and said that she was going to show them to Mamenka, and she said, too, that I was ungrateful, that Mamenka would never let him marry me, and that he was going to marry Julie. You saw how he was with her all the time, Natasha. Why should it be so? 
and again she began to sob, more bitterly than before. Natasha tried to lift her up, threw her arms around her, and smiling through her tears, began to console her. Sonya, don't you believe her, dear heart? Don't believe her. Don't you remember we three and Nikolenka talked together in the divan room after lunch? Why we thought it all out, how it should be. I don't exactly remember how it was, but you know it will be all right, and everything can be arranged. There was Uncle Shinshin's brother married his own cousin, and we are only second cousins. And Boris said that that was perfectly possible. You know I tell him everything, for he is so very clever and so kind, said Natasha. Now, Sonya, don't cry any more, dear dove, sweetheart, Sonya. And she kissed her and laughed merrily. Viera is spiteful, I'm sorry for her, but all will be well, and she won't say anything to Mamenka. Nikolenka himself will tell her, and then again, he doesn't care anything about Julie, and she kissed her on her hair. Sonya jumped up, and again the kitten became lively, its eyes danced, and it was ready, waving its tail, to spring down on its soft little paws and to play with the ball again, as was perfectly natural for it to do. "'Do you think so? Truly? Do you swear it?' said she quickly, smoothing her crumpled dress and hair. "'Truly, I swear it,' replied Natasha, tucking an unruly tuft of curly hair back under her cousin's braid. "'Well, now, let us go and sing the fountain. Come on. But do you know, that stout Pierre who sat opposite me is so amusing,' suddenly exclaimed Natasha, stopping short. "'Oh, it is such fun!' And the girl danced along the corridor. Sonya, shaking off some down, and hiding the verses in her bosom, her face all aglow, followed Natasha with light, merry steps along the corridor into the divan room. According to the request of the guests, the young people sang the quartet, entitled The Fountain, which was universally acceptable. Then Nikolai sang a new song which he had just learned. The night is bright, the moon is sinking. How sweet it is to tell one's heart that someone in the world is thinking, My own true only love thou art. That she, her lovely hand, is laying upon the golden harp tonight, while passionate harmonies are swaying her soul and thine to new delight. One day, two days, then paradise. Alas, thy love on her deathbed lies. He had hardly finished singing the last word, when preparations began to be made for dancing, and the musicians made their way into the gallery with a tramping of feet and coughing. Pierre was sitting in the drawing-room with Shinshin, who, knowing that he had recently returned from abroad, was trying to induce a political conversation that was exceedingly tedious to the young man. Several others had joined the group. When the music struck up, Natasha went into the drawing-room and going straight up to Pierre, said, laughing and blushing, "'Mama told me to ask you to join the dancers.' "'I am afraid of spoiling the figures,' said Pierre, "'but if you will act as my teacher,' and he offered his big arm to the dainty damsel, though he was obliged to put it down very low. While the couples were getting their places, and the musicians were tuning up, Pierre sat down with his little lady. Natasha was perfectly delighted, she was going to dance with a big man who had just come from abroad. She sat out in front of everybody, and talked with him, exactly as though she were grown up. In her hand she had a fan which some lady had given her to hold, and with all the self-possession of an accomplished lady of the world, God knows when and where she had learned it, she talked with her cavalier, flirting her fan and smiling behind it. "'Well, well, do look at her, do look at her,' said the countess, as she passed through the ballroom and caught sight of Natasha. The girl reddened and laughed. "'Now what is it, Mamma? What would you like? What is there extraordinary about me?' In the midst of the third, Ecouzes, the chairs in the drawing-room, where the Count and Maria Dmitrievna were playing cards, were moved back, and a large number of the distinguished guests and the older people, stretching their cramped limbs after long sitting, and putting their portemonnaies and wallets into their pockets, came into the ballroom. First of all came the Count and Maria Dmitrievna, 
both with radiant faces. The Count, with farcical politeness, as though in ballet fashion, offered the lady his bended arm. Then he straightened himself, and his face lighted with a peculiarly shrewd and youthful smile, and as soon as the last figure of the Ecusees was danced through, he clapped his hands at the musicians and called out to the first violin, Semyon, do you know Daniel Cooper? This was the Count's favorite dance, which he had danced when he was a young man. More particularly, it was one of the figures of the Anglais. Look at Papa, cried Natasha, loud enough to be heard all over the ballroom. She forgot entirely that she was dancing with a grown-up man. She bent her curly head over her knees and let her merry laugh ring out unchecked. Indeed, all who were in the hall gazed with a smile of pleasure at the jolly man standing with the dignified Marya Dmitrievna, who was considerably taller than her partner, holding his arms in a bow, straightening his shoulders, and turning out his toes, slightly beating time with his foot, while a beaming smile spread more and more over his round face, and gave the spectators an inkling of what was to follow. As soon as the merry, fascinating sounds of Daniel Cooper were heard, reminding one of the national dance, the trepaca, all the doors of the ballroom were suddenly filled, on one side by the serving men belonging to the household, on the other with the women, all with smiling faces coming to look at their merry-hearted baron. "'Ah, our little father, an eagle!' exclaimed an old nurse, in a loud staccato, in one of the doors. The Count danced well, and he knew it, but his partner had absolutely no wish or ability to dance well. Her portentous form was erect, her big hands hung down by her side. She had handed her reticule to the Countess. Only her stern but handsome face danced. What was expressed in the whole rotund person of the Count was expressed in Marya Dmitrievna merely in her ever more and more radiantly smiling face and loftier lifted nose. But while the Count, growing ever more and more lively, captivated the spectators by the unexpectedness of his graceful capers and the light gambols of his lissom legs, Marya Dmitrievna, by the slightest animation on her part, by the motion of her shoulders, or the bending of her arms in turning about or beating time, produced the greatest impression, for the very reason that every one always felt a certain awe before her dignity of bearing and habitual severity. The dance grew livelier and livelier. The other dancers could not for an instant attract attention to themselves, and did not even try. All eyes were fastened on the Count and Marya Dmitrievna. Natasha kept pulling at the sleeves and dresses of all who were near her to make them look at her papenka, but even without this reminder they would have found it hard to take their eyes off the two dancers. The Count, in the intervals of the dance, made desperate efforts to get his breath, waved his hands, and cried to the musicians to play faster. Quicker, quicker, and ever quicker, lighter, lighter and even more lightly gambled the count now on his toes now on his heels pirouetting around marya dmitrievna and at last having conducted the lady to her place he made one last paw lifting his fat leg up from behind in a magnificent scrape and bowing his perspiring head low at the same time with a smiling face sweeping his arm round amid rapturous applause and laughter especially on the part of natasha both of the dancers paused, breathing heavily and wiping their heated faces with cambric handkerchiefs. "'That's the way we used to dance in our time, mon cher,' said the Count. "'Good for Daniel Cooper,' exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna, drawing a long breath and tucking back her sleeves. End of chapter 18「At the very time when in the Rostov's ballroom they were dancing the sixth Anglaise, and the musicians from weariness were beginning to play out of tune, and the tired servants and cooks were preparing for the supper, Count Bezukhoi received his sixth stroke of apoplexy. The doctors declared that there was not the slightest hope of his rallying from it. The form of confession and communion was administered to the dying man, and preparations were making for extreme unction, while the mansion was filled with the bustle and expectation usual in such circumstances. 
Outside the house, around the doors, hidden by the throngs of carriages, gathered the undertakers, hoping to reap a rich harvest from the Count's obsequies. The military governor of Moscow, who had been assiduous in sending his adjutant to inquire for the Count, this evening came himself to bid farewell to the famous grandee of Catherine's time. The magnificent reception room was crowded. All stood deferentially when the governor, who had been closeted for half an hour with the sick man, came out, slightly bowing in reply to the salutations, and endeavoring to pass as rapidly as possible by the doctors, priests, and relatives who fixed their eyes upon him. Prince Vasily, grown a trifle thinner and paler under the strain, accompanied the military governor, and was repeating something in an undertone. Having seen the distinguished caller to the door, Prince Vasily sat down alone in the hall, threw one leg over the other, resting his elbow on his knee, and covering his eyes with his hand. Having sat that way for some little time, he got up and with hasty, irregular steps, looking around with startled eyes, he passed through the long corridor that led to the rear portion of the house, to the room occupied by the oldest of the three princesses. The visitors in the dimly lighted reception room talked among themselves in low whispers, and relapsed into silence, looking with eyes full of curiosity or expectation when the door that led to the death chamber opened to let any one pass in or out. The limit of his life, said a little old man, a priest, to a lady sitting near him and listening earnestly, the limit is fixed, he will not live beyond it. It seems to me it is late for extreme unction, is it not? asked the lady, adding the name of the priest. She affected to be unenlightened on this point. It is a great mystery, gentle lady, replied the priest, passing his hand over his bald forehead, on which still lay a few carefully brushed locks of grayish hair. Who is that? The governor of Moscow? someone asked at the other end of the room. What a young-looking man! But he's seventy years old. They say, don't they, that the Count doesn't recognize anyone any longer. Are they going to give him extreme unction? All I know is, he's had seven strokes. The second niece just came out of the sick chamber with weeping eyes, and sat down by Dr. Lorraine, who had assumed a graceful position under the portrait of the Empress Catherine, and sat with his elbow resting on the table. Beautiful weather, princess, and this being in Moscow is like being in the country, said the doctor in French. It is, indeed, said the princess with a sigh. Can he have a drink? Lorraine pondered a moment. Has he taken his medicine? Yes. Take a glass of boiled water, and add a pinch, he indicated with his slender fingers what he meant by a pinch, of cream of tartar. I never heard of a gaze where a man survived more than a third stroke, said a German doctor to an adjutant. What a constitution the man must have had, said the adjutant. And who will get all his wealth, he added in a whisper. Some van will be found to take it, replied the German with a smile. Again they all looked at the door. It opened to let the young princess pass with the drink which Lorraine had suggested for the sick man. The German doctor went over to Lorraine. Do you think he will last till tomorrow morning? he asked, in atrocious French. Lorraine thrust out his lips and made a motion of severe negation with his fingers in front of his nose. Tonight, at latest, said he in a low voice, with a slight smile of self-satisfaction at being able to understand and express the state of his patient. Then he went out. Meantime, Prince Vasily had opened the door to the princess's apartment. It was almost dark in the room. Two little lamps were burning before the holy pictures, and there was a pleasant odor of incense and flowers. The whole room was furnished with small articles of furniture, chiffoniers, cabinets, and little tables. Behind a screen could be seen the white curtain of a high post bedstead. A little dog came running out and barking. Ah, is it you, mon cousin? She got up and smoothed her hair, which, as always, was so extraordinarily smooth that one would have thought it made of one piece with her head, and then covered with varnish. "'What is it? What has happened?' she asked. "'You startled me so.' "'Nothing. There is no change. I only came to have a talk with you, Katish, about business,' said the prince, 
wearily sitting down in the chair from which she had just risen. "'How warm you are here!' he exclaimed. "'However, sit down there. Let us talk.' "'I thought something must have happened,' said the princess, and she took a seat in front of him, with her face hard and stony as usual, and prepared to hear what he had to say. "'I was trying to get a nap, mon cousin, and I could not.' "'Well, my dear,' said Prince Vasily, taking the princess's hand and doubling it over in a way peculiar to himself. It was evident that this, well, my dear, referred to a number of things, which, though unspoken, were understood by both of them. The princess, with her long, thin waist, so disproportionate to the rest of her body, looked at the prince full in the face from her prominent gray eyes. Then she shook her head and, with a sigh, glanced at the holy pictures. This action might have been taken as an expression of grief and resignation, or as an expression of weariness and hope of a speedy respite. Prince Vasily explained this action as an expression of weariness. "'That's the way with me,' said he. "'Do you suppose it's any easier for me? I am as played out as a post-horse. But still, I must have a talk with you, Ketish, and a very serious one.' Prince Vasily became silent and his cheeks began to twitch nervously, first on one side, then on the other, giving his face an unpleasant look, such as it never had when he was in company. His eyes, also, were different from usual. At one moment they gleamed, impudently malicious, at the next a sort of fear lurked in them. The princess, holding the little dog in her dry, thin hands in her lap, scrutinized the prince sharply, but it was plain to see that she did not intend to break the silence by asking any question, even though she sat till morning. "'Do you not see, my dear princess and cousin, Katerina Sebyanovna, continued Prince Vasily, evidently bringing himself, not without an inward struggle, to attack the subject. "'At such moments as this, we must think about all contingencies. We must think about the future, about yourselves.' I love all of you as though you were my own children. You know that. The princess gazed at him immovably, betraying no sign of her feelings. In a word, it is necessary, also, to think of my family, continued Prince Vasily, testily giving the stand a push. You know, Katish, that you three Mamontov sisters and my wife are the Count's only direct heirs. I know— I know how hard it is for you to speak and think about such things, and it is no easier for me. But, my dear, I am sixty years old. I must be ready for anything. Do you know that I have had to send for Pierre? The Count pointed directly at his portrait, signifying that he wanted to see him. Prince Vasily looked questioningly at the princess, but he could not make out whether she had comprehended what he had said to her or was simply looking at him. I do not cease to pray God for him, mon cousin, she replied, that he will pardon him and grant his noble soul a peaceful passage from this. Yes, of course, hastily interposed Prince Vasily, rubbing his bald forehead and again testily drawing toward him the table that he had just pushed away. But, but, to make a long story short, this is what I mean. You yourself know that last winter the Count wrote a will by which all his property was left to Pierre, and all the rest of us were left out in the cold. But think how many wills he has made, replied the princess, calmly. Besides, he can't leave, make Pierre his heir. Pierre is illegitimate. Mon cher, said Prince Vasily, suddenly clutching the table in his excitement and speaking more rapidly. But supposing a letter has been written to the Emperor, in which the Count begs to have Pierre legitimatized, do you understand that in view of the Count's services his petition would be granted? The Princess smiled that smile of superiority peculiar to people who think they know more about any matter than those with whom they are talking. I will tell you, moreover, pursued Prince Vasily, seizing her by the hand, the letter has been written, but it has not yet been sent but the emperor knows about it. The question is merely this. Has it been destroyed or not? If not, then, as soon as all is over, Prince Vasily sighed, giving to understand what he meant to convey by the words, all is over, then the count's papers will be opened, the will and the letter will be handed to the emperor, and the petition will be undoubtedly granted. 
Pierre, as the legitimate son, would inherit all. But our share? demanded the princess, smiling ironically, as though all things except this were possible. But, my poor Katish, it is as clear as day. Then he will be the only legal heir, and will have the whole, and you will simply get nothing. You ought to know, my dear, whether the will and the letter have been written, or whether they have been destroyed. And if they have been forgotten, then you ought to know where they are, and to find them, so that— That's the last feather, interrupted the princess, smiling sardonically, and not varying the expression of her eyes. I am a woman, and according to your idea, all of us women are stupid. But I know well enough that an illegitimate son cannot inherit. Un petard, she added, with the intention of showing the prince, by this French term, conclusively how inconsistent he was. Why can't you understand, Katish? You are so clever. Why can't you understand that if the Count has written a letter to the Emperor, begging him to legitimize his son, of course Pierre will not be Pierre any longer, but Count Bouzoukoy, and then he will inherit the whole according to the will. And if the will and letter are not destroyed, then you will get nothing except the consolation of knowing that you were dutiful a tout ce qui s'en suit. That is one sure thing. I know that the will has been made, but I know also that it is not good for anything, and it seems to me that you take me for a perfect fool, mon cousin, said the princess, with that expression that women assume when they think they have said something sharp and insulting. My dear Princess Katerina Semyonovna, impatiently reiterated Prince Vasily, I did not come with the intention of having a controversy with you, but to talk with you about your own interests as with a relative, a kind, good, true relative. I tell you for the tenth time that if this letter to the Emperor and the will in Pierre's favor are among the Count's papers, then you, my dear little friend, will not inherit anything, nor your sisters either. If you don't believe me, then ask somebody who does know. I have just been talking with Dmitri Onufryitch, that was the Count's lawyer, and he says the same thing. A change evidently came over the Countess's thoughts. Her thin lips grew white, her eyes remained the same, and her voice when she spoke evidently surprised even herself by the violence of its gusty outburst. "'That would be fine,' said she. "'I have never desired anything, and I would not now.' She brushed the dog from her lap, and straightened the folds of her dress. "'Here is gratitude. Here is recognition for all the sacrifices that people have made for him,' cried she. "'Excellent. Very fine. I don't need anything, Prince.' "'Yes, but it is not you alone. You have sisters,' replied Prince Vasily. The princess, however, did not heed him. "'Yes, I have known for a long time, but I had not realized it that I had nothing to expect in this house except baseness, deception, envy, intrigue, except ingratitude, the blackest ingratitude. "'Do you know, or do you not know, where the will is?' asked Prince Vasily, his cheeks twitching even more than before. "'Yes, I was stupid. I have always had faith in people, and loved them, and sacrificed myself. But those only are successful who are base and low.' I know through whose intrigues this came about. The princess wanted to get up, but the prince detained her by the arm. The princess's face suddenly took on the expression of one who has become soured against the whole human race. She looked angrily at her relative. There is still time enough. You must know, my dear Katish, that all this may have been done hastily, in a moment of pique, of illness, and then forgotten. Our duty, my dear, is to correct his mistake, to soothe his last moments, so that he cannot in decency commit this injustice. We must not let him die with the idea that he was making unhappy those who— Those who sacrificed everything for him, interrupted the princess, taking the words out of his mouth. Again she tried to get up, but still the prince would not allow her. And he has never had the sense to perceive it. No, mon cousin, she added with a sigh. I shall yet live to learn that in this world it is idle to expect one's reward, and that in this world there is no such thing as honor or justice. 
in this world one must be shrewd and wicked well voyon calm yourself i know your good heart no i have a heart full of wickedness i know your heart repeated the prince i prize your friendship and i could wish that you had as high an opinion of me now calm yourself and parlons raison now is the golden time a few hours at most perhaps a few moments now tell me all you know about this will and above all where it is you must know he has probably forgotten all about it now we must take it and show it to the count probably he has forgotten all about it and would wish it to be destroyed you understand that my sole desire is sacredly to carry out his wishes that is why i came here i am here only to help him and you now i understand all i know whose intrigues it was i know said the princess that is not the point my dear heart it is your protege your dear princess drubitskaya anna mikhailovna whom i would not take for my chambermaid that filthy vile woman let us not lose time said the prince in french ah oh, don't speak to me last winter she sneaked in here and she told the count such vile things such foul things about all of us especially about sophie i cannot repeat them so that the count was taken ill and for two weeks would not see any of us it was at that time i know that he wrote that nasty vile paper but i suppose that it did not mean anything that is just the point why haven't you told me before in the mosaic portfolio which he keeps under his pillow now i know again went on the princess yes if i have any sins on my soul the greatest sin is my hatred of that horrid woman almost cried the princess her face all convulsed and why did she sneak in here but i will tell her my whole mind that i will the time will come End of chapter nineteen Part One, Chapter Twenty of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At the time that these various conversations were going on in the reception room and in the princess's apartment, the carriage with Pierre, who had been sent for, and with Anna Mikhailovna, who found it essential to accompany him, drove into Count Buzukhoi's courtyard when the carriage wheels rolled noiselessly upon the straw scattered under the windows anna mikhailovna turned to her companion with consoling words but was surprised to find him asleep in the corner of the carriage she wakened him and as he followed her from the carriage it dawned upon him for the first time that a meeting with his dying father was before him he noticed that they had drawn up not at the state entrance but at the rear door just as he left the carriage two men in merchant garb skulked down from the doorway and hid in the shadow of the wall stopping a moment to look around he saw several other similar figures on both sides in the shadow but neither anna mikhailovna nor the lackey nor the coachman though they could not have helped seeing these men paid any attention to them why of course it must be all right said pierre to himself and followed anna mikhailovna anna mikhailovna with hurried steps tripped up the dimly lighted narrow stone stairway and beckoned to pierre who loitered behind her he could not seem to realize why it was necessary for him to go to the count and still less why they had to enter by the rear door but concluding by anna mikhailovna's assurance and haste that it was absolutely necessary he decided to follow her halfway up the stairs they almost ran into some men with buckets who came clattering down and pressed up close to the wall to let them pass but showed not the slightest surprise to see them there is this the way to the princess's apartments she inquired of one of them yes replied the lackey in a loud insolent voice as though now anything were permissible the door at the left matushka perhaps the count did not call for me said pierre when they reached the landing i would better go to my room anna mikhailovna waited till pierre overtook her ah mon ami said she laying her hand on his arm just as she had done that morning to her son believe that i suffer as much as you but be a man 
really hadn't i better go asked pierre looking affectionately at anna mikhailovna through his spectacles ah mon ami she said still in french forget the wrongs that may have been done you remember he is your father perhaps even now dying she sighed i have loved you from the very first like my own son trust in me pierre i will not forget your interests pierre did not in the least comprehend but again with even more force it came over him that all this must necessarily be so and he submissively followed anna mikhailovna who had already opened the door the door led into the entry of the rear apartments in one corner sat an old manservant of the princesses knitting a stocking pierre had never before been in this part of the house he was not even aware of the existence of such rooms anna mikhailovna hailed a maid whom she saw hurrying along with a carafe on a tray and calling her by various familiar terms of endearment asked how the princesses were and at the same time beckoned pierre to follow her along the stone corridor the first door on the left led into the princess's private rooms the chambermaid with the carafe in her haste everything was done in haste at this time in this mansion failed to close the door and as pierre and anna mikhailovna passed by they involuntarily glanced into the room where sat the oldest of the nieces in close conference with prince vasili seeing them passing prince vasili made a hasty movement and drew himself up the princess sprang to her feet and in her vexation slammed the door to with all her might this action was so unlike the princess's habitual serenity the apprehension pictured on the princess's face was so contrary to his ordinary expression of self-importance that pierre paused and looked inquiringly at his guide through his spectacles anna mikhailovna manifested no surprise she merely smiled slightly and sighed as though to signify that all this was to be expected Soyons, mon ami i will watch over your interests said she in answer to his glance and tripped along the corridor even more hastily than before pierre did not comprehend what the trouble was and still less her words watch over your interests but he came to the conclusion that all this must be so they went from the corridor into a dimly lighted hall which adjoined the count's reception room it was one of those cold and magnificent apartments in the front of the house which pierre knew so well but even in this room right in the middle stood a forgotten bathtub from which the water was leaking into the carpet a servant and a clergyman carrying a censer came toward them on their tiptoes but paid no attention to them then they entered the reception room with its two italian windows its door leading into the winter garden and adorned with a colossal bust and full-length portrait of the empress catherine the room was filled with the same people in almost the same attitudes sitting and whispering together they all stopped talking and stared at anna mikhailovna as she entered with her pale tear-stained face followed by the stout burly pierre submissively hanging his head anna mikhailovna's face expressed the consciousness that a decisive moment was at hand and with the bearing of a genuine petersburg woman of affairs she marched into the room not allowing pierre to leave her and showing even more boldness than in the morning she knew that as she was bringing the person whom the dying count desired to see her reception was assured with a quick glance she surveyed all who were in the room and perceiving the count's priest she without exactly bowing but suddenly diminishing her stature sailed with a mincing gait up to the confessor and respectfully received the blessing first of one and then of the other priest thank god we are in time said she to the priest we are his relatives and were so much alarmed lest we should be too late this young man here is the count's son she added in a lower tone a terrible moment after speaking these words she went over to the doctor cher docteur she said to him ce jeune homme est la face du comte il était de l'espoir is there any hope the doctor silently with a quick movement shrugged his shoulders and cast his eyes upward anna mikhailovna exactly imitating him also raised hers almost closing them and drew a deep sigh then she turned from the doctor to pierre her manner was respectful and affectionate with a shade of sadness have confidence in his mercy said she in french pointing him to a small sofa where he should sit and wait for her 
while she noiselessly directed her steps toward the door which was the attraction for all eyes and noiselessly opening it disappeared from sight pierre making up his mind in all things to obey his guide went to the little sofa which she pointed out to him as soon as anna mikhailovna was out of sight he noticed that the eyes of all who were in the room were fastened upon him with more curiosity than sympathy he noticed that all were whispering together nodding toward him with a sort of aversion and even servility he was shown a degree of respect which he had never been shown before a lady whom he did not know the one who had been talking with the two priests got up from her place and motioned to him to sit down the adjutant picked up a glove which he had dropped and gave it to him the doctors preserved a respectful silence as he passed by them and fell back to make way for him at first pierre was inclined to sit down in another place so as not to disturb the lady was inclined to pick up his own glove and to turn out for the doctors though they were not at all in his way but on second thought it suddenly occurred to him that this would not be becoming he felt that this night he was a person expected to fulfil some terrible and obligatory ceremony and therefore he was in duty bound to accept the services of all these people he silently received the glove from the adjutant and took the lady's place laying his huge hands on his evenly plated knees in the naive poise of an egyptian statue and saying to himself that all this was just as it was meant to be and that lest he should lose his presence of mind and commit some absurdity it behooved him this evening above all to give up all idea of self-guidance but commit himself wholly to the will of those who assumed the direction of him not two minutes had passed when prince vasili in his kaftan with three stars on his breast carrying his head majestically came into the room he seemed thinner than when pierre had last seen him his eyes opened larger than usual when he glanced about the room and caught sight of pierre he went straight up to him took his hand a thing which he had never done before and bent it down as though trying by experiment whether it had any power of resistance courage courage mon ami he has asked to see you that is good and he started to go away but pierre felt that it was suitable to ask how is he he stammered not knowing exactly how to call the dying count he was ashamed to call him father he had another stroke half an hour ago courage mon ami pierre was in such a dazed condition of mind that at the word coupe he imagined that some one had hit him he looked at prince vasili in perplexity and it was only after some time that he was able to gather that coupe meant an attack of apoplexy prince vasili as he went by said a few words to lorraine and went into the bedroom on his tiptoes he was not used to walking on his tiptoes and his whole body jumped as he walked he was immediately followed by the oldest princess then came the confessor and priests some of the house servants also joined in the procession and passed into the sleeping room there was heard some stir and finally anna mikhailovna with the same pale countenance firmly bent on the fulfilment of her duties came running out and touching pierre on the arm said the goodness of god is inexhaustible the ceremony is about to begin come pierre passed into the room treading on the soft carpet and noticed that the adjutant and the strange lady and one of the servants all followed him as though now it were no longer necessary to ask permission to go in end of chapter twenty part one chapter twenty one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne pierre well knew this great room divided by columns and an arcade and all hung with persian tapestries the part of the chamber behind the columns where on one side stood a huge mahogany bedstead with silken curtains and on the other a monstrous kyot or shrine with images was all brightly and beautifully lighted just as churches are usually lighted for evening service under the glittering decorations of this shrine stood a long voltaire reclining chair and in the chair supported by snowy white unruffled cushions apparently only just changing lay the majestic form of pierre's father count buzikoy with his hair heaped up on his lofty forehead like a lion's mane as pierre remembered it so well and the same strong deep wrinkles on his handsome aristocratic face 
reddish-yellow in color. He was wrapped to the waist in a bright green quilt, and lay directly under the holy pictures. Both of his great stout arms were uncovered and lay on the quilt. In his right hand, which lay palm down, a wax taper was placed between the thumb and forefinger, and an old servant bending over the chair held it upright. Around the chair stood the clergy in their magnificent glittering robes, with their long locks streaming down over their shoulders, with lighted tapers in their hands, performing their functions with slow solemnity. A little back from them stood the two younger princesses, with handkerchiefs in their hands, pressed to their eyes, and just in front of them was the oldest sister, Katish, with a spiteful, resolute face, not for a moment letting her eyes wander from the icon as though she were saying to all that she would not be responsible for her actions if she looked around. Anna Mikhailovna, with an expression of sanctified grief and universal forgiveness on her face, stood near the door with the strange lady. Prince Vasily, on the other side of the door, near the count, stood behind a carved chair, upholstered in velvet, which he had turned back to, and was leaning on it his left hand with a taper, and crossing himself with his right hand, raising his eyes each time that his fingers touched his forehead. His face expressed calm devoutness and submission to the will of God. If you cannot comprehend these feelings, so much the worse for you, his countenance seemed to say. Behind him stood the adjutant, the doctors, and the men-servants, just as in church the men and women took opposite sides. No one spoke. All kept crossing themselves, the only sound was the reading of the service, the low, subdued chanting of the priest's deep bass, and during the intervals of silence, the restless movement of feet and deep sighs. Anna Mikhailovna, with that significant expression of countenance that showed she knew what she was doing, crossed the whole width of the chamber to where Pierre was, and gave him a taper. He lighted it, and then, growing confused under the glances of those around him, began to cross himself with the hand which held the taper. The youngest of the sisters, the rosy and fun-loving Princess Sophie, the one with the mole, was looking at him. She smiled and hid her face in her handkerchief, and did not expose it for some time. When she caught sight of Pierre again, her amusement again overcame her. Then, evidently feeling that she had not the self-control sufficient to allow her to look at him without smiling, and that she could not keep from looking at him, she quietly fled from temptation by retreating behind a column. In the midst of the service the voices of the clergy suddenly ceased. The priest whispered something to each other. The old waiting man, who held the candle in the Count's hand, straightened up and went over to the lady's side. Anna Mikhailovna stepped forward, and bending over the sick man, beckoned to Dr. Lorraine without turning around. The French doctor had been standing without a lighted taper, leaning against one of the pillars, in that reverent attitude by which one who, though a stranger and belonging to a different creed, shows that he appreciates all the solemnity of the ceremony and even assents to it. With the noiseless steps of a man possessed of perfect vigor, he answered Anna Mikhailovna's call, went over to the sick man, lifted in his white, slender fingers the hand that lay on the green quilt, and bending over, began to count the pulse and grew grave. Something was given to the invalid to drink. There was a slight stir about him. Then once more they all took their places, and the service proceeded. At the time of this interruption, Pierre noticed that Prince Vasily left his position behind the carved chair, and, with an expression of countenance that seemed to say that he knew what he was doing, and that it was so much worse for others if they did not understand him, went, not to the sick man, but past him, and being joined by the oldest of the princesses, retired with her into the depths of the alcove, to the high bedstead under the silken hangings. From there both the prince and the princess disappeared through a rear door, but before the end of the service both resumed their places, one after the other. Pierre gave this strange action no more thought than to anything else, having once for all made up his mind that all that took place that evening was absolutely essential. The sounds of the church chant ceased, and the voice of the priest was heard respectfully congratulating the sick man on his having received the mystery. The count lay as before, motionless and as though lifeless. Around him was a stir. Footsteps and a whispering were heard. Anna Mikhailovna's voice could be distinguished above the rest. Pierre listened and heard her say, He must be carried instantly to bed. 
it will never do in the world for him here to the doctors princesses and servants crowded around the invalid so that pierre could no longer see that reddish yellow face with the gray mane of hair which ever since the service began had constantly filled his vision to the exclusion of everything else he surmised by the guarded movements of those who crowded around the armchair that they were lifting and carrying the dying man hold by my arm you'll drop him so said one of the servants in a frightened whisper take him lower down one more said different voices and the labored breathing and shuffling of feet growing more hurried seemed to indicate that the load that these men were carrying was beyond their strength as the bearers among their number anna mikhailovna came opposite the young man he caught a momentary glimpse over their heads and backs of his father's strong full chest uncovered his stout shoulders lifted above the people carrying him under their arms and his leonine head with its curly mane the face with its extraordinary high forehead and cheekbones handsome sensitive mouth and majestic cold eyes was undisfigured by the nearness of death it was just the same as when pierre had seen it three months previously when the count had sent him to petersburg but the head rolled helplessly under the uneven steps of the bearers and the cold indifferent eyes gave no sign of recognition there followed a few moments of bustle around the high bedstead those who had been carrying the sick man withdrew anna mikhailovna touched pierre on the arm and said Vini. pierre went with her to the bed whereon the sick man had been placed in solemn attitude evidently in some manner connected with the sacrament just accomplished he lay with his head propped high on pillows his hands were placed side by side palm downward on the green silk quilt as pierre went to him the count was looking straight at him but his look had that meaning and significance which it is impossible for a man to read either that look had simply nothing to say and merely fastened upon him because those eyes must needs look at something or they had too much to say pierre paused not knowing what was expected of him and glanced inquiringly at his guide anna mikhailovna made him a hasty motion with her eyes toward the sick man's hand and with her lips signified that he should kiss it pierre bent over carefully so as not to disturb the quilt and in accordance with her advice touched his lips to the broad brawny hand neither the hand nor a muscle of the count's face moved pierre again looked questioningly at anna mikhailovna to find what he should do next she signed to him with her eyes to sit down in an armchair which stood near the bed pierre submissively sat down his eyes mutely asking if he were doing the right thing anna mikhailovna approvingly nodded her head pierre again assumed the symmetrically simple attitude of the egyptian statue and evidently really suffered because his awkward huge frame took up so much space though he strove with all his might to make it seem as small as possible he looked at the count the count was staring at the spot where pierre had just been standing anna mikhailovna showed by her actions that she realized the pathetic importance of this final meeting of father and son this lasted two minutes which seemed an hour to pierre suddenly a tremor appeared in the deep powerful muscles and lines of the count's face it grew more pronounced the handsome mouth was drawn to one side this caused pierre for the first time to realize how near to death his father was and from the drawn mouth proceeded an indistinguishable hoarse sound anna mikhailovna looked anxiously into the sick man's eyes and tried to make out what he wanted pointing first at pierre then at the tumbler then she asked in a whisper if she should call prince vasily then pointed at the quilt the sick man's face and eyes expressed impatience he mustered force enough to look at the manservant who never left his master's bedside he wants to be turned over on the other side whispered the servant and proceeded to lift and turn the count's heavy body face to the wall pierre got up to help the servant just as they were turning the count over one of his arms fell back helplessly and he made a futile effort to raise it did the count notice the look of terror on pierre's face at the sight of that lifeless arm or did some other thought flash across his dying brain at that moment at all events he looked at his disobedient hand then at pierre's terror-stricken face and back to his hand again and over his lips played a martyr's weak smile out of character with his powerful features 
and seeming to express a feeling of scorn for his own lack of strength. At the sight of this smile, Pierre unexpectedly felt an oppression around the heart, a strange pinching in his nose, and the tears dimmed his eyes. The sick man lay on his side toward the wall. He drew a long sigh. He is going to sleep, said Anna Mikhailovna to one of the nieces who returned to watch. Allons. Pierre left the room. End of chapter 21《パート1》Chapter 22 of《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. There was no one in the reception room except Prince Vasily and the oldest princess, and these two were sitting under the Empress's portrait, talking eagerly about something. As soon as they caught sight of Pierre and his guide, they stopped, and it seemed to the young man that the princess hid something and whispered. I cannot abide the sight of that woman. Katish has made tea in the little drawing-room, said Prince Vasily in French, addressing Anna Mikhailovna. Come, ma pauvre Anna Mikhailovna, you had better take something to eat, else you might be the worse for it. He said nothing to Pierre, but gave his arm a sympathetic pressure just below the shoulder. Pierre and Anna Mikhailovna went into what he called le petit salon, there is nothing so refreshing as a cup of this excellent russian tea after a sleepless night said dr lorraine with an expression of restrained liveliness as he stood in the small circular drawing-room sipping his tea from a delicate porcelain cup just back of him was a table with the tea service and a cold supper around the table were gathered for refreshments all those who were spending this night in count buzakoy's mansion Pierre well remembered this little circular drawing-room, with its mirrors and small tables. In days gone by, when the Count gave balls, Pierre, who did not know how to dance, liked to sit in this little room of mirrors, and watch the ladies in their ball toilets, with diamonds and pearls on their bare necks, as they passed through, glance at themselves in the brightly illuminated mirrors, which reflected back their beauties. Now the room was dimly lighted by a pair of candles, and at this midnight hour there stood on one of the small tables a disorderly array of tea-things, while a motley throng of people in anything but ball-dresses was scattered about it, talking in whispers, by every motion, every word, evincing how little they could forget what was now taking place, or going to take place in that chamber of death. Pierre did not care to eat, though he was very hungry. He glanced inquiringly at his guide, and saw that she was tiptoeing back to the reception-room, where they had left Prince Vasily and the oldest niece. Pierre took it for granted that this also was as it should be, and after waiting a little while he followed her. Anna Mikhailovna was standing in front of the young lady, and both were talking at once in angry undertones. "'Permit me, princess, to decide what is necessary and what is not necessary,' the Princess Katish was saying, evidently still in the same angry frame of mind that she had been in when she slammed the door of her room." but my dear young princess said anna mikhailovna in a sweet but conclusive manner barring the way to the count's chamber and not allowing the young lady to pass will this not be too great an effort for your uncle at this time when he so much needs rest at this time any conversation about worldly matters when his soul has already been prepared prince vasily still sat in the armchair in his familiar posture with one leg thrown over the other his cheeks twitched violently, and seemed to grow flabbier than usual, but he preserved the attitude of a man to whom the altercation of the two women was of no consequence. Voyon, ma bonne Anna Mikhailovna, let Katish have her way. You know how fond the Count is of her. I don't even know what is in this paper, said the young princess, turning to Prince Vasily, and pointing to the mosaic portfolio which she had in her hand. I only know that his last will is in his bureau but this is a paper which he has forgotten. They tried to pass by Anna Mikhailovna, but Anna Mikhailovna springing forward again barred her way. I know, my good, dear princess, said Anna Mikhailovna, grabbing the portfolio and so firmly that it was evident she would not let go in a hurry. My dear princess, I beg of you, I beseech you, have pity on him. Je vous en conjure. The young princess said not a word. 
all that was heard was the noise of the struggle for the possession of the portfolio. It was plain to see that if she had opened her mouth to speak, what she said would not have been flattering for Anna Mikhailovna. The latter clung to the portfolio unflinchingly, but, nevertheless, her voice was soft, sweet, and gentle as ever. "'Pierre, my dear, come here. I think he will not be in the way in this family council, will he, Prince?' "'Why don't you speak, mon cousin?' suddenly cried the young princess, so loud that those in the little drawing-room heard it and were startled. "'Why don't you speak? When here, God knows who permits herself to meddle in matters that don't concern her, and make scenes on the very threshold of the death-chamber. Intrigantka! she hissed in a loud whisper, and snatched at the portfolio with all her force. But Anna Mikhailovna took two or three steps forward so as not to let go her hold of it, and succeeded in keeping it in her hand. Oh, cried Prince Vasily reproachfully, and rising in surprise. C'est ridicule, veillons. Let go, I tell you. The Princess Katish obeyed. You also. Anna Mikhailovna paid no attention to him. Drop it, I tell you. I will assume the whole responsibility. I will go and ask him. I will. That ought to satisfy you. May, mon prince, said Anna Mikhailovna. After this great mystery, allow him a moment to rest. Here, Pierre, give us your opinion, said she, turning to the young man, who, coming close to them, looked in amazement at the princess's angry face, from which all the dignity had departed, and at Prince Vasily's twitching cheeks. "'Remember that you will answer for all the consequences,' said Prince Vasily angrily. "'You don't know what you are doing.' "'You vile woman!' screamed the young princess, unexpectedly darting at Anna Mikhailovna and snatching away the portfolio. Prince Vasily hung his head and spread open his hands. At this juncture, that terrible door at which Pierre had been looking so long, and which was usually opened so gently, was hastily and noisily flung back, so that it struck against the wall, and the second sister rushed out wringing her hands. "'What are you doing?' she cried in despair. "'He is dying!' and you leave me alone. The Princess Katerina dropped the portfolio. Anna Mikhailovna hastily bent over, and picking up the precious object, hastened into the death chamber. The Princess Katerina and Prince Vasily, coming to their senses, followed her. In a few moments, Princess Katerina came out again, the first of all, with a pale, stern face, and biting her lower lip. At the sight of Pierre, her face expressed uncontrollable hatred. "'Yes, now you can swell round,' said she. "'You have been waiting for this.' And beginning to sob, she hid her face in her handkerchief and ran from the room. The princess was followed by Prince Vasily. Reeling a little, he went to the sofa on which Pierre was sitting and flung himself on it, covering his face with his hands. Pierre noticed that he was pale, and that his lower jaw trembled and shook as though he had an ague attack. "'Ah!' Uh, my friend, said he, taking Pierre by the elbow, and there was in his voice a sincerity and gentleness which Pierre had never before noticed in it. How we sin, and how we cheat, and all for what? I am sixty years old, my dear. Look at me. Death is the end of all. All. Death is horrible. And he burst into tears. Anna Mikhailovna came out last of all. She went straight up to Pierre with slow, quiet steps. Pierre, said she. Pierre looked at her inquiringly. She kissed the young man on the forehead, which she wet with her tears. Then, after a silence, she added, Il n'est pas, he is dead. Pierre looked at her through his glasses. Come, I will lead you away. Try to weep. Nothing is so consoling as tears. She led him into the dark drawing-room and Pierre was relieved that no one was there to see his face. Anna Mikhailovna left him there, and when she returned he was sound asleep, with his head resting on his arm. The next morning Anna Mikhailovna said to Pierre in French, "'Yes, my dear, it is a great loss for all of us. I am not speaking of you, but God will give you support. You are young, and at the head of an immense fortune, I hope. The will has not been opened yet.' I know you well enough to believe that this will not turn your head, but new duties will devolve upon you, and you must be a man. Pierre made no reply. 
Perhaps later I will tell you, mon cher, that if I had not been here, God knows what might have happened. You know, mon oncle, only the day before, promised me that he would not forget Boris. But he did not have the time. I hope, mon cher ami, that you will fulfill your father's desire. Pierre entirely failed to see what she was driving at, and without saying anything and reddening with mortification, looked at Anna Mikhailovna. Having thus spoken with Pierre, she drove back to the Rostovs and lay down to rest. After her nap, that same morning, she began to tell the Rostovs and all her acquaintances the particulars of the death of Count Buzakoy. She declared that the Count had died as she herself would wish to die, that his end had not only been pathetic but even edifying. The last meeting of father and son had been so touching that she could not think of it without tears, and that she could not tell which had borne himself with the more composure during these dreadful moments. The father, who had had a thought for everything and every one during those last hours, and had spoken such affectionate and touching words to his son, or Pierre, whom it was pitiful to see, he was so overcome, and yet in spite of it, struggled so manfully to hide his grief, so as not to pain his dying father. Such scenes are painful, but they do one good. It is elevating to the soul to see such men as the old count and his noble son. As to the actions of Princess Katerina and Prince Vasily, she spoke of them also, but in terms of reprobation, and under the promise of strictest secrecy. End of chapter 22part 1 chapter 23 of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne the arrival of the young prince andre and his wife at luisia gori bald hills prince nikolai andreyevich bolkonsky's estate was daily expected but this did not make any break at all in the strenuous routine according to which life in the old prince's mansion was regulated. Prince Nikolai Andreyevich, a former general-in-chief, popularly called Le Roi de Prusse, had been banished to his estates during the reign of the Emperor Paul, and had lived like a hermit there ever since with his daughter, the Princess Maria, and her hired companion, Mademoiselle Burine. Even after the death of Paul, although he was free to go wherever he pleased, he still continued to live exclusively in the country, saying that if any one wanted him, it was only half a hundred verse from Moscow to Luisia Guri, while as far as he was concerned, he wanted nothing and nobody. He declared that there were only two sources of human vice, idleness and superstition, and only two virtues, activity and intelligence. He himself undertook his daughter's education, and in order to inculcate both these virtues, he had given her lessons up to the age of twenty in algebra and geometry, and had apportioned her life into an uninterrupted system of occupations. He himself was constantly engaged in writing his memoirs, or in solving problems in the higher mathematics, or in turning snuff-boxes on a lathe, or in working in his garden and superintending the erection of buildings which were always going up on his estate. As the chief condition of activity is order, therefore order in his scheme of life was carried to the last degree of minuteness. His appearance at meals invariably took place under the same circumstances, and at not only the same hour, but the same moment each day. The prince was sharp and scrupulously exacting with the people around him, from his daughter to the humblest menial, and therefore, while he was not cruel, he inspired an awe and deference such as it would have been difficult for even the cruelest man to exact. Although he was living in seclusion, and had now no influence in matters of state, every nachalnik of the government in which he lived considered it his duty to pay his respects to him, and, precisely the same as the architect or the gardener or the Princess Maria, waited the designated hour for the princess's appearance in the lofty hall and each one of those waiting in this hall experienced the same feeling of awe and fear as soon as the massive door of his cabinet swung open, and the form of the little old man appeared, in his powdered wig, with his small, dry hands, and pendulous grey eyebrows, which sometimes when he frowned concealed the gleam of his keen and youthfully glittering eyes. 
on the morning of the day when the young couple were expected princess maria as usual at the regular hour came down into the hall to wish her father good morning and with fear and trembling crossed herself and repeated an inward prayer each morning she came the same way and each morning she prayed that their daily meeting might be propitious the old servant in a powdered wig who was sitting in the hall got up quietly and addressed her in a respectful whisper beyond the door could be heard the monotonous hum of the lathe the princess timidly opened the door which moved easily and noiselessly on its hinges and stood at the entrance the prince was working at his lathe he looked round and then went on with his work the great cabinet was full of things apparently in constant use a huge table whereon lay books and plans the lofty bookcases with keys in the mirror-lined doors a high reading desk a cabinet-maker's lathe with various kinds of tools and shavings and chips scattered about all this indicated a constant varied and regular activity by the motion of his small foot shod tartar fashion in a silver embroidered boot by the firm pressure of his sinewy thin hand it could be seen that the prince had still the tenacious and not easily impaired strength of a green old age having made a few more turns he took his foot from the treadle of the lathe wiped his chisel put it in a leather pocket attached to the lathe and going to the table called his daughter to him he never wasted blessings on his children and therefore merely offering his bristly cheek which had as not yet been shaven for the day he said with a severe and at the same time a keenly affectionate look are you well now then sit down he took a copy-book of geometrical work written out in his own hand and pushed his chair along with his foot for to-morrow said he briskly turning to the page and marking the paragraphs with his stiff nail the princess leaned over the table toward the notebook wait a letter for you said the old man abruptly taking an envelope addressed in a feminine hand from the pocket fastened to the table and tossing it to her the princess's face colored in blotches at the sight of the letter she hastily picked it up and examined it intently from your heloise asked the prince with a chilling smile that showed his teeth that were still sound though yellow yes from julie said the princess timidly glancing up and timidly smiling i shall allow two more letters to pass but i shall read the third said the prince severely i fear you pen much nonsense i shall read the third you may read this mon père replied the princess with a still deeper flush and holding the letter toward him the third i said the third rejoined the prince laconically pushing away the letter then leaning his elbow on the table he laid the notebook with the geometrical designs before her well young lady began the old man bending over toward his daughter and laying one arm in the back of her chair so that the young princess felt herself surrounded by that peculiar acrid odor of tobacco and old age which she had so long learned to associate with her father well young lady these triangles are equal if you will observe the angle a b c the princess gazed in dismay at her father's glittering eyes so near to her the red patches again overspread her face and it was evident that she had not the slightest comprehension of what he said and was so overcome with fear that it really prevented her from comprehending any of her father's instructions no matter how clearly they were expressed the teacher may have been at fault or the pupil may have been but each day the same thing recurred the princess's eyes pained her she could not see anything or hear anything all that she felt was the consciousness of her stern father's withered face the consciousness of his breath and peculiar order and her single thought was to escape as soon as possible from the cabinet and solve the problem by herself in peace the old man would lose all patience noisily push back the chair in which he was sitting and then draw it forward again then he would exert his self-control so as not to break out into a fury but rarely succeeded and sometimes he would fling the notebook upon the floor the princess made a mistake in her answer now how can you be so stupid stormed the prince throwing aside the notebook and hastily turning away then he rose to his feet walked up and down laid his hand on her hair and again sitting down drew close to her and proceeded with his instructions no use princess 
no use said he as the young lady took the lesson book and closing it started to leave the room mathematics is a great thing my girl and i don't wish you to be like our stupid silly women by dint of perseverance one learns to like it he patted her on the cheek the dullness will vanish from your brain she started to go he detained her by a gesture and took down from the high table a new book with uncut leaves here your heloise has sent you something else some key to the mystery a religious work i don't interfere with anyone's belief i looked it over take it now be off be off he patted her on the shoulder and closed the door himself after she had gone out the young princess Maria returned to her chamber with the pensive, scared expression which rarely left her, and which rendered her plain, sickly face still more unattractive. She sat down at her writing-table covered with miniature portraits and cluttered with notebooks and volumes. The princess was just as disorderly as her father was systematic. She threw down her book of problems and hastily broke the seal of the letter, which was from the most intimate friend of her childhood, this was no other than the Julie Karagina who was at the Rostovs on the day of the fete. Julie read as follows. Cherie excellente en me. What a terrible and frightful thing is distance! It is in vain that I tell myself that half of my existence and happiness is in you, that, in spite of the distance which lies between us, our hearts are bound to each other by indissoluble ties. Mine rebels against my fate, and— notwithstanding all the pleasures and attractions that surround me i cannot overcome a certain lurking sadness which i have felt in the depths of my heart ever since our separation why are we not together as we were this past summer in your great cabinet on the blue sofa la canopée aux confidences why can i not now as i did three months ago draw fresh moral strength from your eyes so sweet so calm so penetrating the eyes which I loved so much, and which I imagine I see before me as I write. Having read to this point, the Princess Maria sighed and glanced at the pier-glass that stood over against her, reflecting her slight, homely form and thin face. Her eyes, which were generally melancholy, just now looked with a peculiarly helpless expression at her image in the glass. "'She is flattering me,' said the Princess to herself, turning away and continuing her reading of the letter." Julie, however, had not flattered her friend. In reality, the princess's eyes were large, deep, and luminous. Sometimes whole sheaves, as it were, of soft light seemed to gleam forth from them, and then they were so beautiful that they transformed her whole face, notwithstanding the plainness of her features, and gave her a charm that was more attractive than mere beauty. But the young princess had never seen the beautiful expression of her own eyes, the expression which they had at times when she was not thinking of herself. Like most people, her face assumed an affectedly unnatural and ill-favored expression as soon as she looked into the glass. She went on with the letter. All Moscow is talking of nothing but the war. One of my two brothers has already gone abroad. The other is with the guard, which is just about to set out for the frontier. Our beloved emperor has left Petersburg, and, according to what they say, is intending to expose his precious life to the perils of war. God grant that the Corsican monster, who is destroying the peace of Europe, may be laid low by the angel whom the Almighty, in his mercy, has sent to rule over us. Now, to speak of my brothers, this war has deprived me of one who is nearest and dearest to my heart. I mean the young Nikolai Rostov who was so enthusiastic that he was unable to endure inactivity, and has left the university to join the army. A bien, ma chère Marie, I will confess to you, that, notwithstanding his extreme youth, his departure for the army is a great grief to me. The young man, I told you about him last summer, has so much nobility, so much of that genuine youthfulness, which we meet with so rarely in this age of ours, among our men of twenty. He has really so much candor and heart, he is so pure and poetic, that my acquaintance with him, slight as it has been, must be counted as one of the sweetest enjoyments of my poor heart, which has already suffered so keenly. Some day I will tell you of our parting and what passed between us. As yet, it is still too fresh in my memory. Ah, cher ami, how happy you are not to experience these joys and these pangs so keen! You are fortunate— 
because the latter are usually the keenest. I know very well that Count Nikolai is too young ever to be anything to me more than a friend, but this sweet friendship, these relations, so poetic and so pure, have become one of the necessities of my heart. But enough of this. The chief news of the day, which all Moscow is engaged in talking about, is the death of the old Count Buzakoy and his inheritance. Just imagine, the three princesses get very little, Prince Vasily nothing, and it is Monsieur Pierre who has inherited everything. He has, moreover, been declared legitimate, and is, therefore, Count Buzakoy, and the possessor of the finest fortune in Russia. It is claimed that Prince Vasily has played a very poor part in this whole business, and that he has gone back to Petersburg very much crestfallen. I confess I have very little understanding of this matter of the bequests and the will. All I know is, that since this young man, whom we knew under the name Monsieur Pierre, pure and simple, has become Count Bozokoy, and master of one of the greatest fortunes of Russia, I am greatly amused to notice the changed tone and behavior of mamas burdened with marriageable daughters, and even the young ladies themselves, toward this individual, who, parenthetically, has always seemed to me to be a poor specimen. As it has been the amusement of many people for the past few years to marry me off, and generally to men whom I do not even know, la chronique matrimoniale of Moscow now makes me out Countess Buzakova. You know perfectly well that I have no desire of acquiring that position. A propos de mariage, do you know that quite recently, la tante en général, Anna Mikhailovna, has confided to me, under the seal of strictest secrecy, a marriage project for you. This is neither more nor less than Prince Vasily's son, Anatol, whom it is proposed to bring to order by marrying him to a young lady of wealth and distinction, and you are the one upon whom the choice of the relatives has fallen. I know not how you will look upon the matter, but I felt that it was my duty to inform you. They say he is very handsome, and a great scapegrace, that is all that I have been able to find out about him. But a truce to gossip like this, I am at the end of my second sheet, and Mamma is calling me to go to dine at the Apraxkins. Read the mystic book which I send you, and which is all the rage with us. Although there are things in this book difficult for the feeble mind of man to fathom, it is an admirable work, the reading of which soothes and elevates the mind. Adieu. My respects to your father and my compliments to Mademoiselle Burine. I embrace you with all my heart. Julie. P.S. Tell me the news about your brother and his charming little wife. The princess sat thinking, a pensive smile playing over her lips. Her face, lighted up by her luminous eyes, was perfectly transfigured. Then, suddenly jumping up, she walked briskly across the room to her table. She got out some paper, and her hand began to fly rapidly over it. This was what she wrote in reply. Cherie excellente amie, your letter of the thirteenth caused me great delight. So, then, you still love me, my poetic Julie, and absence, of which you say such hard things, has not had its usual effect upon you. You complain of absence. What should I have to say if I dared complain, bereft as I am of all those who are dearest to me? Ah, if we had not religion to console us, life would be very sad. Why should you suspect me of looking stern when you speak to me of your affection for this young man? In this respect I am lenient to all except myself. I appreciate these sentiments in others, and if I cannot approve of them, never having myself experienced them, I do not condemn them. It only seemed to me that Christian love, love for our neighbor, love for our enemies, is more meritorious and therefore, sweeter and more beautiful than those sentiments inspired in a poetic and loving young girl like you by a young man's handsome eyes. The news of Count Buzakoy's death reached us in advance of your letter, and my father was very much moved by it. He says that he was the last representative but one of the Grand Segale, and that now it is his turn, but that he shall do his best to put it off as long as possible. God preserve us from such a terrible misfortune." I cannot agree with you in your judgment of Pierre, whom I knew as a boy. He always seemed to me to have an excellent heart, and that is the quality which I most value in people. As to his inheritance and the role played by Prince Vasily, it is very sad for both of them. Ah, dear friend, our divine Saviour's saying, 
that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God is terribly true. I pity Prince Vasily, and I am still more sorry for Pierre. So young, and to be loaded down with this wealth, what temptations will he not have to undergo? If I were asked what I should desire most in this world, it would be to be poorer than the poorest of beggars. A thousand thanks, cher ami, for the work which you send me and which is so much the rage with you in Moscow. However, as you say that while there are many good things in it, there are others which the feeble mind of men cannot fathom, it seems to me quite idle to waste one's time in reading what is unintelligible, and which, therefore, can be productive of no good fruit. I have never been able to understand the passion which some people have for disturbing their minds by devoting themselves to mystical books that only arouse doubts kindling their imaginations and giving them a love for exaggeration utterly contrary to christian simplicity let us read the apostles and the gospels let us give up trying to penetrate the mysteries they contain for how should we miserable sinners that we are presume to investigate the terrible secrets of providence while we carry with us this garment of flesh which forms an impenetrable veil between us and the eternal then let us confine ourselves to a study of the sublime principles which our divine Saviour has left for our guidance here below. Let us seek to conform to them and follow them, being persuaded that the less rein we give to our feeble human minds, the more pleasing it is to God, who repudiates all knowledge not proceeding from Him, that the less we seek to explore what it has seemed best to Him to hide from our comprehension, the sooner He will grant us to discover it by His divine Spirit." My father has not said anything to me of a suitor. He has merely told me of having received a letter and of expecting a visit from Prince Vasily. As far as the project of marriage concerns me, I will tell you, chère excellente amie, that in my opinion marriage is a divine institution to which it is necessary to conform. However painful it might be to me, if the Almighty should ever impose upon me the duties of a wife and mother, I shall endeavor to fill them as faithfully as I can without disturbing myself by inquiring into the nature of my feelings toward him whom he shall give me as a husband. I have had a letter from my brother announcing his speedy arrival at Louisia Gori with his wife. This will be a joy of short duration, for he will leave us to take part in this unhappy war, into which we are dragged God knows why and how. Not alone with you, at the center of business and society, is the war the only topic of conversation, but here amid the labors of the field, and that calm of nature which the inhabitants of cities ordinarily imagine to be peculiar to the country, the rumors of the war make themselves painfully heard and felt. My father can talk of nothing else but marches and countermarches, things of which I have no comprehension, and the day before yesterday, while taking my usual walk down the village street, I witnessed a heart-rending scene. It was a party of recruits, enlisted on our estate and on their way to the army. You ought to have seen the state in which were the mothers, wives, and children of the men who were off, and to have heard their sobs. You should think that humanity had forgotten the precepts of their divine Saviour, who taught love and the forgiveness of offences. One would think that they imputed their greatest merit to the art of killing each other. Adieu, cher bon ami. May our divine Saviour and his holy mother keep you in their holy and powerful keeping. Marie. Ah! You are dispatching a courier, princess. I have already sent mine. I have written to my poor mother, said the smiling Mademoiselle Burine, speaking rapidly and swallowing her R's, and altogether bringing into the Princess Maria's concentrated and melancholy atmosphere what seemed like the breath of another world, where reigned gaiety, light-heartedness, and complacency. Princess, I must warn you, she added, lowering her voice. The prince has had a quarrel with Mikhail Ivanov. He is in a very bad humor very morose. I warn you, you know. Ah, cher ami, replied the Princess Maria, I have asked of you never to speak to me of the humor in which my father happens to be. I do not allow myself to make remarks about him, and I do not wish others to. The Princess glanced at her watch, and noticing that she was already five minutes behind the time when it was required of her to practice on the harpsichord, she hurried from the room with dismay pictured on her face. Between twelve o'clock and two the prince took his nap, and it was the immutable rule of the house that the princess should then practice. End of chapter 23
Part One, Chapter Twenty Four of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The gray-haired manservant was sitting in the cabinet, dozing and listening to the prince's snoring. From a distant part of the house, through the closed doors, came the notes of a difficult phrase of a Dussek sonata, repeated for the twentieth time. At this time, a coach and britchka drove up to the entrance door, and from the coach descended Prince Andre, who handed his little wife down and allowed her to pass ahead of him. The gray-haired Tikhon, in a wig, thrust his head out of the hall door and informed them in a whisper that the prince was asleep, and then softly closed the door. Tikhon was well aware that not even the arrival of the sun, nor any other event, however uncommon, should be allowed to interrupt the order of the day. Prince Andre knew this as well as Tikhon. He looked at his watch, as though to convince himself that there had been no change in his father's habits since he had seen him, and having satisfied himself on that score, turned to his wife. "'He will be awake in twenty minutes. Let us go to the Princess Maria,' said he. The little princess had grown stouter, but her eyes and her short, downy lip and her sweet smile were just the same as ever. "'Mosse un palais!' she exclaimed, glancing around with an expression as such people have in congratulating a host on a ball. "'Come along, quick, quick!' And she glanced with a smile at Tacon and her husband, and the footman who was leading the way. "'It is Marie practicing. Let us go softly so as to surprise her.' Prince André followed her with a polite but bored expression. "'You have grown older, Tacon," he said to the old man-servant, who, as he passed by, kissed his hand. Just as they reached the room where the harpsichord was heard, the pretty, fair-haired Frenchwoman came tripping out. Mademoiselle Bourienne seemed overjoyed to see them. "'Ah, quel bonheur pour la princesse!' cried she. "'You are here at last. I must go and tell her. Non, non, I beg of you. You are Mademoiselle Bourienne. I know you already from the friendship which my sister-in-law has for you,' said the princess, kissing her. "'She is not expecting us?' They went to the door of the sitting-room, where the phrase was being repeated again and again. Prince André paused and frowned, as though he were expecting a disagreeable scene. The princess went in. The phrase was broken off in the middle. A cry was heard, followed by the sound of hasty footsteps and kisses. When Prince André went in, the two sisters-in-law, who had only met once for a short time at Prince André's wedding, were still locked in a fond embrace, just as at the first moment of their meeting. Mademoiselle Burine was standing near them, with her hand on her heart, and a beatific smile on her lips, evidently as ready to cry as to laugh. Prince André shrugged his shoulders and frowned, just as lovers of music frowned when they hear a discord. Both the women stood apart. Then once again, as though time were precious, they seized each other's hand and began to kiss them, and not satisfied with kissing their hands, they began to kiss each other in the face, and to Prince André's unqualified surprise, they both burst into tears and again began to kiss each other. Mademoiselle Burine was also melted. It was awkward enough for Prince André, but to the women it seemed perfectly natural to weep. Indeed, they could never have dreamed of a meeting without such an accompaniment. "'Ah, cher! Ah, Marie!' they kept exclaiming, amid laughter and tears. "'I dreamed about you last night. Ah, Marie, you have grown so thin, and you have grown so stout!' J'ai de sweet reconnu, Madame la Princesse, put in Mademoiselle Brunin. And here I was not thinking of such a thing, cried the Princess Maria. Ah, André, I did not see you. Prince André kissed his sister's hand, and told her that she was as great a crybaby as ever. The Princess Maria turned to her brother, and through her tears, her eyes, now large and beautiful and luminous, rested on him with a fond, gentle, and sweet expression. The young wife chattered incessantly. Her short, downy upper lip every instant drew down and touched the rosy under lip, and then curled again with a brilliant smile that made her eyes and her teeth shine. She related about an accident that happened at Spaskaya Gora, which threatened to be seriously dangerous in her condition, and then she apprised them that she had left all her dresses in Petersburg, and God knew what she would have to wear while here, and that Andre had greatly changed, and that Kitty— Odunistova had married an old man, and that she had a husband for Marie, pour tout de bon, but that they would talk about that afterwards. 
the Princess Maria stood looking silently at her brother, and her lovely eyes beamed with affection and melancholy. It was evident that she was now following her own course of thought, quite independent of her sister-in-law's prattle. Right in the midst of the description of the last fete at Petersburg, she turned to her brother. "'And are you really going to the war, André?' she asked with a sigh. Lise also sighed. "'Yes, and I must be off by to-morrow,' replied her brother. "'He leaves me, and God knows why, when he might have been promoted.' The Princess Marya paid no attention to this remark, but following the thread of her thoughts gave her sister-in-law a significant glance from affectionate eyes. "'You are sure of it?' The young wife's face changed. She sighed again. "'Certainly I am,' said she. "'Ah, it is terrible.' Her lip went down. She brought her face near to the young princess's, and again unexpectedly burst into tears. "'She needs to rest,' said Prince Andrei, scowling. "'Don't you, Lisa? Take her to her room, and I will go to my batushka. How is he? Just the same as ever?' "'Just the same. But perhaps your eyes will see some change in him,' replied the princess cheerfully. "'The same regular hours, the same promenades in the garden, the lathe,' said Prince Andrei, with a barely perceptible smile, which proved that notwithstanding all his love and reverence for his father, he was not blind to his weaknesses. Yes, just the same hours, and the lathe, and the mathematics, and my geometry lessons, replied the princess merrily, as though her geometry lessons were among the most delightful reminiscences of her life. When the twenty minutes which remained for the princess's nap were over, Tikhon came to summon the young man to see his father, the old man allowed a variation in his mode of life in honour of his son. He commanded to have him come to him in his own room, while he was dressing, before dinner. The prince dressed in the old-time costume of a kafkan and powdered wig. When Prince André, not with the peevish face and manners which he assumed in society, but with a lively expression, such as he had when he was talking with Pierre, went into his father's room, the old man was at his toilet, sitting in a wide Morocco-upholstered armchair in a wrapper, while Tikhon was putting on the last touches to his head. "'Ah, my soldier! So you are going to conquer Bonaparte!' cried the old prince, and he shook his powdered head, so far as he was allowed by the pigtail which Tikhon was busily plaiting. "'You do well to go against him. Otherwise, he would soon be calling us his subjects. Are you well?' And he offered his son his cheek." The old man awoke from his noon nap in an excellent frame of mind. He was accustomed to say that a nap after dinner was silver, but one before dinner was golden. He squinted cheerily at his son from under his thick, beetling brows. Prince Andrei went and kissed his father on the spot designated. He made no reply to his father's favorite topic of conversation, and his sarcasms on the military men of the present time, and especially on Napoleon. "'Yes, I have come to you, Batyushka, with my wife, who soon expects to be a mother,' said Prince Andrei, watching with eager and reverent eyes all the play of his father's features. "'How is your health?' "'Only fools and rakes ever need to be unwell, my boy, and you know me, busy from morning till night, and temperate, and of course I'm well.' "'Thank God for that,' said the son, smiling. "'God has nothing to do with it. "'Well,' continued the old man, returning to his favorite hobby. Tell us how the Germans and Bonaparte have taught us to fight, according to this new science of yours, that you call strategy. Prince Andrei smiled. Let me have time to collect my wits, Batushka, said he, and his expression showed that his father's foibles did not prevent him from reverencing and loving him. Why, you see I have not even been to my room yet. Nonsense! Nonsense! cried the old man, pulling at his little pigtail to assure himself that it was firmly plated, and grasping his son by the arm. The quarters for your wife are all ready. The Princess Maria will take her there and show them to her, and they will chatter their three basketfuls. That's their women's way. I'm glad to have her here. Sit down and talk. I understand Michelson's army, and Tolstoy's too. It's a simultaneous descent. But what's the southern army going to do? Prussia remains neutral, I know that. But how about Austria? he asked, as he got up from his chair and began to walk up and down the room, with Tikhon running after him to give him the various parts of his attire. What's Sweden going to do? How will they get across Pomerania? Prince Andrei, perceiving the urgency of his father's inquiries, began, at first unwillingly, 
but gradually warming up more and more to explain the plan of operations determined upon for the campaign as he spoke he involuntarily from very force of habit kept dropping from russian into french he explained how the army of ninety thousand was to threaten prussia and force her to abandon her neutrality and take part in the war how a portion of this army was to go to strassund and unite with the swedish forces how two hundred and twenty thousand austrians with a hundred thousand russians were to engage in active operations in italy and on the rhine and how fifty thousand russians and fifty thousand english were to disembark at naples and how this army with a total of five hundred thousand men was to make an attack simultaneously from different sides upon the french the old prince did not manifest the least interest in the description any more than if he had not heard it and continued to dress himself as he walked up and down though three times he unexpectedly interrupted him once he stopped him crying the white one the white one that meant tikhon had not given him the waistcoat that he wished the second time he stopped him and asked and is the baby expected soon and reproachfully shaking his head said that's too bad go on go on the third time when prince andrei had finished his description the old man sang in a high falsetto with a cracked voice of age Marburg, sauvant en guerre, d'où ce qu'on reviendra. The son merely smiled. I don't say that I approve of this plan, said he. I am only telling you what it is. Napoleon, of course, has his plan, which is probably as good as ours. Well, you haven't told me anything that is in the least new, and the old man thoughtfully continued to hum the refrain, d'où ce qu'on reviendra. Go into the dining room. End of chapter 24
as though he meant by his lively ways to make a contrast with the stern routine of the house. Just at the instant that the great clock struck two, and was answered by a feebler tone of another in the reception room, the prince made his appearance. He paused. From under his thick, overhanging brows, his keen, flashing, stern eyes surveyed all who were present, and then rested on his son's young wife. The young princess instantly experienced that feeling of fear and reverence which this old man inspired in all those around him, a feeling akin to that experienced by courtiers at the coming of the Tsar. He smoothed the princess's head, and then, with a clumsy motion, patted her on the back of the neck. "'I am glad to see you, glad to see you,' said he, and, after looking into her face steadily once more, he turned away and sat down in his place. "'Sit down, sit down. Mikhail Ivanovitch, sit down.' He assigned his daughter-in-law to the place next him. The waiter pushed the chair up for her. "'Ho, ho,' said the old man, looking at her critically. "'Your time is coming. Too bad.' He smiled dryly, coldly, disagreeably, with his lips alone, as usual, and not with his eyes. "'You must walk. Walk. As much as possible. As much as possible.' said he. The little princess did not hear, and did not wish to hear, his words. She said nothing, and seemed dispirited. The prince asked after her father, and she replied and smiled. He asked about common acquaintances. The princess grew more animated, and began to deliver messages, and tell the prince the gossip of the town. The Countess Apratskina, poor woman, has lost her husband, and quite cried her eyes out, said she growing still more lively. The livelier she became, the more sternly the prince looked at her, and suddenly, as though he had studied her enough, and had formed a sufficiently clear idea of her mental caliber, he turned abruptly away and began to talk with Mikhail Ivanovitch. Well, now, Mikhaila Ivanovitch, it is going to go hard with our Bonaparte. As Prince Andre has been telling me, he always spoke of his son in the third person, great forces are collecting against him. But then you and I have always considered him to be a windbag. Mikhail Ivanovitch really did not know when he and the prince had ever said any such thing about Bonaparte, but perceiving that this was necessary as a preliminary for the prince's favorite subject of conversation, looked in surprise at the young prince, and wondered what would be the outcome of it. "'He is great at tactics,' said the old prince to his son, referring to the architect and again the conversation turned on the war, on Bonaparte, and the generals of the present day, and the great men of the reign. The old prince, it seemed, was persuaded in his own mind that all the men at the head of affairs at the present day were mere schoolboys, who did not know even the A, B, C's of war and civil administration, and that Bonaparte was an insignificant Frenchman, who had been successful simply from the fact that there were no Potemkins, or Suvorovs to meet him. But he was persuaded, also, that no political complications, of any account, existed in Europe, that the war did not amount to anything, but was a sort of puppet show, at which the men of the present day were playing, while pretending to do something great. Prince Andre took his father's sarcasms at the new men, in good part, and with apparent pleasure led him on, and heard what he had to say. The past always seems better than the present, said the young man. Yet didn't that same Servorov fall into the trap which Moriot laid for him, fell in, and hadn't the wit to get himself out of it? Who told you that? Who told you? cried the prince. Suvorov. And he flung away his plate, which Tikhon was quick enough to catch. Suvorov. Consider, Prince Andre. Friedrich and Suvorov were a pair. Morio, Morio would have been taken prisoner if Suvorov's hands had been free. But he had his hands on a Hofskrieg's Wirtschnapsroth. The devil himself could not have done anything. Now if you go on, you will find out what these Hofskrieg's Wirtschnapsroths are like. Suvorov was no match for them. What chance do you suppose Mikhail Kurtisov will have? No, my dear young friend, he went on to say. There's no chance for you and your generals against Bonaparte. You must needs take Frenchmen, 
so that birds of a feather may fight together. You have sent the German Phelan to New York, to America, after the Frenchman Moreau, said he, referring to the overtures that had been made that same year to Moreau to enter the Russian service. It's marvelous. Were the Potemkins, Suvorovs, Orlovs, Germans, pray? No, brother, either all of you have lost your wits, or I have gone into my second childhood. God give you good luck. But we shall see. Bonaparte, a great general, on their side. Hm. I don't say at all that all our arrangements are wise, returned Prince Andrei. Only I can't understand how you have such a low opinion of Bonaparte. Laugh as much as you please, but Bonaparte is, nevertheless, a great general. Mikhail Ivanovitch, cried the old prince to the architect, who was giving his attention to the roast, and devoutly hoping that he was quite forgotten. I have told you, have I not, that Bonaparte was a great tactician? And he says so, too. How, your illustriousness, replied the architect. The prince again laughed his chilling laugh. Bonaparte was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His soldiers are excellent. And then, again, he had the good luck to fight with the Germans first. Only a lazy man would fail to whip the Germans. Ever since the world began, the Germans have always been whipped, and they have never whipped anyone. Oh, yes, each other. He made his reputation by fighting them. And the prince began to expatiate on all the blunders that Napoleon, in his opinion, had made in all his wars, and even in his act of administration. His son did not dispute what he said, but it was evident that whatever arguments were employed against him, he was just as little inclined to alter his opinion as the old prince himself. Prince Andre listened refraining from engaging in any discussion, and only smiling as he involuntarily wondered how it was possible for this old man, who had lived for so many years like a hermit in the country, to know so thoroughly and accurately all the military and political occurrences that had taken place in Europe during the last years, and was able to form such an opinion of them. "'You think, do you, that I am too old to understand the present state of affairs? Well,' This is all there is of it. I can't sleep o' nights. Now, wherein is this general of yours so great? Where has he shown it? It would take too long to tell, replied the son. Well, then, go off to your Bonaparte. Mademoiselle Bourine, here is another admirer of your clodhopper of an emperor, he cried in excellent French. You know that I am not a Bonapartist, prince. Du sais quoi il reviendra, hummed the prince, in his falsetto, and with a smile that was still more falsetto, he got up and left the table. The little princess, during the whole time of the discussion and the rest of the meal, sat in silence, looking in alarm, now at her husband's father, now at the princess Maria. After they left the table, she took her sister-in-law's arm and drew her into the next room. "'How bright your father is,' said she, that's probably the reason that he makes me afraid of him. Ah, he is so good, exclaimed the princess. End of chapter 25。Part 1, Chapter 26 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The next evening, Prince Andrei was about to take his departure. The old prince, not making any change in his routine, had gone to his room immediately after dinner. The young wife was with the Princess Maria. Prince Andrei, having put on a traveling coat without epaulets, was engaged in his room, with his valet, in packing up. He himself had personally looked after the carriage, and the arrangements of his luggage, and ordered the horses to be put in. In the chamber remained only those things which Prince Andrei always took with him, his dressing-case, a huge silver bottle-holder, two Turkish pistols, and a sabre which his father had captured at Okchakov and presented to him. All these appurtenances had been put in the most perfect order. All were bright and clean, in woolen bags, carefully strapped. 
if men are ever inclined to think about their actions the moment when they are about to go away and enter upon some new course of life is certain to induce a serious frame of mind generally at such moments the past comes up for review and plans are made for the future prince andrei's face was very thoughtful and tender with his hands behind his back he was walking briskly from corner to corner up and down the room with his eyes fixed and occasionally shaking his head was it terrible for him to be going to the war or was he a little saddened at the thought of leaving his wife perhaps there was a trifle of each feeling however hearing steps in the entry and evidently not wishing to be seen in any such state he hurriedly dropped his hands and paused by the table as though engaged in fastening the cover of his dressing-case and his face became as usual serene and impenetrable the steps he heard were those of the princess maria i was told that you had ordered the horses put in said she panting she had evidently been running and i did so want to have a little talk with you all alone god knows how long it will be before we see each other again you are not angry with me for coming you have changed very much andrusha she added as though an explanation of such a question she smiled as she called him by the pet diminutive andrusha evidently it was strange for her to think that this stern handsome man was the same andrusha the slender frolicsome lad who had been the playmate of her childhood where's lees he asked merely replying to her question with a smile she was so tired that she fell asleep on the sofa in my room oh andre what a treasure of a wife you have she said as she sat down on the sofa facing her brother she's a perfect child such a sweet merry-hearted child i have learned to love her dearly prince andre made no reply but the princess noticed the ironical and scornful expression which her words called forth on his face but you must be indulgent to her little weaknesses who is there that is without them andre you must not forget that she was educated and brought up in society and besides her position is now not all roses we ought always to put ourselves in the place of another to understand is to forgive just think how hard it is on the poor little woman after the gay life to which she is accustomed to be parted from her husband and to be left alone in the country and in her condition it is very hard prince andrei smiled and looked at his sister as we smile when we look at people whose motives are perfectly transparent to us you live in the country and don't find this life so horrible do you i but that's another thing why should you speak about me i have no desire for any other life because i have never known any other life but you think andre what it is for a healthy young woman to be buried for the best years of her life in the country alone too for papenka is always busy and i you know what poor company i am for a woman who has been accustomed to the best society there is only mademoiselle bourine your bourine does not please me very much said prince andre oh how can you say so she is very kind and good and what is more is greatly to be pitied she has no one no one at all to tell you the truth she is not at all necessary but if anything she's in my way you know that i have always been somewhat a misanthrope and now more than ever i love to be alone mon père is very fond of her she and mikhail ivanitch are two people for to whom he is always polite and kind because both of them are under obligations to him as stern says we do not love men so much for the good that they do us as for the good that we do them mon père took her in as an orphan from the street and she is very good and mon père loves her way of reading she always reads aloud to him in the evening she reads beautifully now tell the truth marie i am afraid my father's temper must be very trying to you sometimes isn't it so suddenly demanded prince andre the princess maria was at first dumbfounded then terrified at this question to me me trying she stammered he has always been harsh but now he has become desperately trying i should think said prince andrei speaking lightly of his father apparently for the sake of perplexing or testing his sister you're good to everyone andrei but you have such pride of intellect said the princess following the trend of her own thoughts rather than the course of the conversation 
all that is a great sin. Have we any right to judge our father? And even if we had, what other feeling besides veneration could such a man as mon père inspire? I am so happy and content to live with him. I only wish that all were as happy as I am. Her brother shook his head incredulously. There is only one thing that is hard for me. I will tell you the truth about it, André. It is father's ways of thinking of religious things. I cannot understand how a man with such a tremendous intellect can fail to see what is as clear as day, and can go so far astray. This is the one thing that makes me unhappy. But even in this I have noticed lately a shade of improvement. Lately his sarcasms have not been quite so pronounced, and there is a monk whom he has allowed to come in and have a long talk with him. Well, my dear, I am afraid that you and the monk wasted your powder, said Prince André, in a jesting but affectionate way. Ah, oh, mon ami, all I can do is to pray to God and hope that he will hear me. André, she said timidly, after a moment's silence, I have one great favor to ask of you. What is that, my dear? Promise me that you will not refuse me. It won't be any trouble to you at all, and nothing unworthy of you in doing it, but it will be a great comfort to me. Promise me, Andrushka, said she, thrusting her hand into her reticule and holding something in it, but not yet showing it, as though what she held constituted the object of her request, and she were unwilling to take this something from the reticule until she were assured of his promise to do what she desired. She looked at her brother with a timid, beseeching glance. "'Even if it required great trouble, I would,' replied Prince André, evidently foreseeing what the request was. "'Think whatever you please. I know you are exactly like mon père. Think whatever you please, but do this for my sake. Please do. My father's father, our grandfather, wore it in all his battles. Not even now did she take from the reticule what she held in her hand. So—' Will you promise me? But what is it? André, I give you this little picture with my blessing, and you must promise me that you will never take it off. Will you promise? If it does not weigh two poots, and won't break my neck, I will do it if it will give you any pleasure. But at that instant, noticing the pained expression which passed over his sister's face at this jest, he regretted it. With pleasure, really with pleasure, my dear, he added. He will save and pardon you in spite of your hardness of heart, and he will bring you to himself, because in him alone is truth and peace, said she, in a voice trembling with emotion, and with a gesture of solemnity held up before her brother an ancient oval medallion of the Saviour, with a black face in a silver frame, attached to a silver chain of delicate workmanship. She made a sign of the cross, kissed the medallion, and held it out to André. Please, André for my sake. Her large eyes were kindled by the rays of a soft and kindly light which transfigured her thin, sickly face and made it beautiful. Her brother was about to take the medallion, but she stopped him. He understood what she meant and crossed himself and kissed the image. His face was both tender, for he was touched, and, at the same time, ironical. Thanks, my dear. She kissed him on the brow and again sat down on the sofa. Both were silent. As I was saying to you, André, be kind and magnanimous, as you always used to be. Don't judge Lise harshly, she began after a little. She is so sweet, so good, and her position is very hard just now. Why, Masha, I have not said that I found any fault with my wife or have been vexed with her. Why do you say such things to me? The Princess Maria flushed and she was silent as though she felt guilty. I have not said anything to you, but someone has been talking to you, and I am sorry for that. The red patches flamed still more noticeably on the Princess Maria's forehead, neck, and cheeks. She tried to say something, but speech failed her. Her brother had guessed right. His little wife after dinner had wept, and confessed her forebodings about the birth of her baby, and how she dreaded it, and poured out her complaints against her father-in-law and her husband. And after she had cried, she fell asleep. Prince André was sorry for his sister. I wish you to know this, Masha, that I find no fault with my wife. I never have found fault with her, and never shall, and there is nothing for which I can reproach myself. 
and this shall always be so, no matter in what circumstances I find myself. But if you wish to know the truth, if you wish to know whether I am happy, I tell you, no. Is she happy? No. Why is it? I don't know. As he said this, he got up, went over to his sister, and bending down, kissed her on the forehead. His handsome eyes showed an unwonted gleam of sentiment and kindliness, though he looked not at his sister, but over her head at the dark opening of the door. Let us go to her. It is time to say good-bye. Or rather, you go ahead and wake her, and I will follow you. Petrushka, he called to the valet, come here. Pick up those things. This goes under the seat, this at the right. The Princess Maria got up and directed her steps toward the door. Then she paused. Andre, said she, in French, if you had faith, you would have implored God to give you the love which you do not feel, and your prayers would have been heard. Yes, perhaps so, said Prince Andre. Go on, Masha, I will follow immediately. On the way to his sister's room, in the gallery which connected one part of the house with the other, Prince Andre met the sweetly smiling Mademoiselle Bourine. It was the third time that she had crossed his path that day in the corridor, and with the same enthusiastic and naive smile. "'Ah, I thought you were in your own room,' said she, blushing a little and dropping her eyes. Prince Andre looked at her sternly. His face suddenly grew wrathful. He gave her no answer, but looked at her with such a scornful expression that the little Frenchwoman flushed scarlet and turned away without another word. When he reached his sister's room, the princess, his wife, was already awake, and her blithe voice was heard through the open door. She was chattering as fast as her tongue would let her, as though she were anxious to make up for lost time after long repression. "'No, Marie, but just imagine the old Countess Zubova, with her false curls and a mouthful of fake teeth, as though she were trying to cheat old age. Ha <laughs> ha!' Prince Andre had heard his wife get off exactly the same phrase about the Countess Zubova, and the same joke, at least five times. He went quietly into the room. The princess, plump and rosy, was sitting in an easy chair, with her work in her hands, and was talking an incessant stream, repeating her Petersburg reminiscences, and even the familiar Petersburg phrases. Prince Andrei went up to her, smoothed her hair, and asked if she felt rested. She answered him, and went on with her story. A coach, with a six in hand, was waiting at the front entrance. It was a dark autumn night. The coachman could not see the pole of the carriage. Men with lanterns were standing on the doorsteps. The great mansion was alive with lights, shining through the lofty windows. The domestics were gathered in the entry to say good-bye to the young prince. All the household were collected in the hall. Mikhail Ivanovitch, Mademoiselle Berlin, the Princess Maria, and her sister-in-law. Prince Andrei had been summoned to his father's cabinet, where the old prince wanted to bid him good-bye privately. All were waiting for their coming. When Prince Andre went into the cabinet, the old prince, with spectacles on his nose and in his white dressing-gown, in which he never received any one except his son, was sitting at the table and writing. He looked around. "'Are you off?' and he went on with his writing. "'I have come to bid you good-bye. "'Kiss me here,' he indicated his cheek. "'Thank you, thank you.' "'Why do you thank me?' "'Because you don't dilly-dally, because you don't hang on to your wife's petticoats. Service before all. Thank you. Thank you.' And he went on with his writing so vigorously that the ink flew from his sputtering pen. "'If you have anything to say, speak. I can attend to these two things at once,' he added. "'About my wife. I am so sorry to be obliged to leave her on your hands. "'What nonsense is that? Tell me what you want.' When it is time for my wife to be confined, send to Moscow for an accoucheur. Get him here. The old prince paused, and pretending not to understand, fixed his eyes on his son. I know that no one can help, if nature does not do her work, said Prince Andre, evidently confused. I am aware that out of millions of cases only one goes amiss. But this is her whim and mine. They have been talking to her. She had a dream, and she is afraid. Hmm growled the old prince, taking up his pen again. I will do so. He wrote a few more lines, suddenly turned upon his son, and said with a sneer, 
Bad business, eh? What is bad, Batushka? Wife, said the old prince, with laconic significance. I don't understand you, said Prince Andrei. Well, there's nothing to be done about it, my young friend, said the prince. They're all alike. There's no way of getting unmarried. Don't be disturbed. I won't tell anyone, but you know tis so. He seized his son's hand in his small, bony fingers and shook it, looking him straight in the face with his keen eyes, which seemed to look through a man, and then once more laughed his cold laugh. The son sighed, thereby signifying that his father read him correctly. The old man continued to fold and seal his letters with his usual rapidity, and when he had finished he caught up and put away the wax, the seal, and the paper. "'What can you do? She's a beauty. I will see that everything is done. Be easy on that score,' said he, abruptly, as he sealed the last letter. Andre made no reply. It was both pleasant and disagreeable to have his father understand him so well. The old man stood up and handed a letter to his son. "'Listen,' said he, "'don't worry about your wife. Whatever can be done, shall be done. Now listen, give this letter to Mikhail Ilarionovitch. I have written him to employ you in the good places, and not keep you too long as adjutant. It's a nasty position. Tell him I remember him with affection, and write me how he receives you. If all goes well, stay and serve him. Nikolai Andreitch Bolkonsky's son must not serve anyone from mere favoritism. Now, come here. He spoke so rapidly that he did not finish half his words, but his son understood him. He led him to a desk, threw back a lid, opened a little box and took out a notebook, written in his own large, angular, but close hand. I shall probably die before you do. Remember, these are my memoirs. They are to be given to the emperor after my death. Now, see here. Take this banknote and this letter. This is a prize for the one who shall write a history of the wars of Suvorov. Send it to the academy. Here are my remarks. After I am gone, you may read them. You will find them worth your while. Andre did not tell his father that he would probably live a long time yet. He felt it was not necessary to say that. I will do it all, Petushka, said he. Well, then, good-bye. He offered him his hand to kiss, and then gave him an embrace. Remember one thing, Prince Andre. If you are killed, it will be hard for me to bear. I am an old man. He unexpectedly paused, and then as suddenly proceeded, in a tempestuous voice, but if I should hear that you have behaved unworthy of a son of Nikolai Bolkonsky, I should be ashamed, he hissed. You should not have said that to me, Batyushka, replied the son with a smile. The old man was silent. I have still another request to make of you, Prince Andrei went on to say. If I should be killed, and if a son should be born to me, don't let him go from you, as I was saying last evening. Let him grow up under your roof please? Not let your wife have him, asked the old man, and tried to laugh. Both stood in silence for some moments, facing each other. The old man's keen eyes gazed straight into his son's. There was a slight tremor in the lower part of the old prince's face. We have said good-bye. Now go, said he suddenly. Go, he cried in a stern, loud voice, opening his cabinet door. What is it? What's the matter? asked Prince Andrei's wife and sister, as the young man came out, and they caught a momentary glimpse of the old prince, in his white dressing-gown, and without his wig, and in his spectacles, as he appeared at the door, screaming at his son. Prince Andrei sighed, and made no answer. "'Well,' said he, turning to his wife, and this well, new, sounded chillingly sarcastic, as though he had said, "'Now begin your little comedy.' "'Andrei, already?' said the little wife, turning pale, and fixing her terror-stricken eyes on her husband. He took her in his arms. She gave a cry, and fell fainting on his shoulder. He carefully disengaged himself of her form, looked into her face, and tenderly laid her in an armchair. Adieu, Marie, said he, gently to his sister, kissed her hand, and hastened out of the room. The fainting princess lay in the chair. Mademoiselle Burine chafed her temples, the Princess Maria, holding her up, 
was still looking, with her lovely eyes dim with tears, at the door through which Prince Andre had disappeared, and her blessing followed him. In the cabinet the old prince was heard repeatedly blowing his nose, with sharp, angry reports, like pistol shots. Prince Andre had hardly left the room when the cabinet door was hurriedly flung open, and the prince's stern figure appeared in the white dressing gown. "'Has he gone?' he asked. "'Well, it is just as well,' said he. Then, looking angrily at the unconscious little princess, he shook his head reproachfully and clapped the door to after him. End of chapter 26 and end of part 1 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Volume 1, Part 2, Chapter 1 of War and Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. Volume 1, Part 2, 1805. Chapter 1. In October 1805, the Russian army were cantoned in certain villages and towns in the Archduchy of Austria, making a heavy burden for the inhabitants, and still new regiments were on the way from Russia, and concentrating around the fortress of Brunau, where Kutuzov, the commander-in-chief, had his headquarters. On the 23rd of October, one of the many regiments of infantry that had just arrived stopped about a half-mile from the city awaiting to be reviewed by the commander-in-chief. Notwithstanding the un-Russian landscape, orchards, stone walls, tiled roofs, and mountains on the horizon, and the un-Russian aspect of the people, who gathered to look with curiosity at the soldiers, this regiment presented exactly the same appearance as every other Russian regiment getting ready for inspection anywhere in the center of Russia. The evening before, during their last march, Word had been received that the commander-in-chief would review the regiment. The words of the order had not seemed altogether clear to the regimental commander, and the question having arisen, how it was to be taken, were they to be marching in order or not, he called a council of officers, at which it was decided that the regiment should be presented in parade dress, on the principle that it is always better to go beyond than not come up to the requirements. And the soldiers, after a march of three hundred verse, during which they had not once closed their eyes, were kept all night mending and cleaning up. The aides and captains classified and enrolled their men, and by morning the regiment, instead of a straggling, disorderly mob, such as it had been during the last stage of their march, presented a compact mass of two thousand men, each one of whom knew his place and his duty. Every button and every strap were in order." and shining with neatness. Not only were all the externals put in perfect order, but if the commander-in-chief should take it into his head to look under the uniforms, then he would have found that each man had on a clean shirt, and that in each knapsack were the required number of things, shiltsi imiltsi, all and soap, as the soldiers express it. There was only one particular in regard to which no one could be satisfied. This was footwear, the shoes of more than half of the men were in tatters. But this lack was not the fault of the regimental commander, since, notwithstanding his repeated demands, the necessary goods had not been furnished by the Austrian commissariat, and, moreover, the regiment had marched a thousand verse. The regimental commander was an elderly general, of sanguine complexion, with grey brows and side whiskers, stout and broad, the distance from his chest to his back was greater than across his shoulders. He wore a brand new uniform, which showed the creases caused by having been folded, and on his shoulders were heavy gold epaulets, which raised his fat shoulders still higher. The regimental commander had the aspect of a man who had happily accomplished one of the most important functions of life. He marched up and down in front of the line, and as he marched he shook at every step, slightly bending his back. It could be seen that the regimental commander was very fond of his regiment, and felt happy at the idea that all his mental faculties were absorbed in it. But, nevertheless, his pompous gait seemed to insinuate that over and above his military interests 
there was still left no small room in his heart for the affairs of society and the feminine sex. "'Well, Batushka, Mikhailo Miltrich, said he, turning to one of the majors, who stepped forward with a smile. It was evident that all were happy. We had a pretty tough tussle last night, didn't we? However, according to my idea, our regiment isn't one of the worst, eh? The major appreciated the jocund irony and laughed. No, we should not be driven off from the Empress's field. What is it? asked the commander, catching sight of two horsemen galloping along the road to the city, lined with signalmen. It was an adjutant, with a Cossack riding behind him. The adjutant had been sent from headquarters to explain what had been enigmatical in the last evening's order, and especially to insist upon it that the commander-in-chief wished to review the regiment in exactly the condition in which it had arrived, in cloaks, gun covers, and without any preparations whatever. The evening before, it had happened that a member of the Hofkriegsrath had arrived from Vienna, asking and urging that Kutuzov should make all haste to join the Allied armies under the Archduke Ferdinand and General Mack, and Kutuzov, considering that this junction was not advantageous, desired to exhibit in support of his own theories, and to have the Austrian general see for himself the pitiable state in which the army of Russia had arrived. With this end in view, he was anxious to find the regiment in marching order, and therefore the worse the situation of the men, the more agreeable it would be to him. The adjutant knew nothing about these reasons, but he transmitted to the regimental commander the general-in-chief's urgent desire that the men should be in marching order, and added that if it were otherwise the commander-in-chief would be very much offended. On hearing these words, the regimental commander hung his head, silently shrugged his shoulders, and spread his hands with a despairing gesture. "'This is great doings,' he cried. "'It's what I told you, Mikhailo Mitrich, in marching order, in cloaks,' said he, turning reproachfully to the major. "'Ah, my God!' he exclaimed, and stepped resolutely forward. "'Gentlemen! Captains!' he cried, in a voice accustomed to command. "'Sergeants! Will they be here soon?' he asked." turning to the adjutant with an expression of deferential politeness, evidently proportioned to the dignity of the personage of whom he was speaking. Within an hour, I think. Shall we have time to make the change? I don't know, General. The regimental commander, hastening into the ranks, made the dispositions for changing back into marching costume again. The captains ran to their companies, the sergeants bustled about, the cloaks were not altogether in order and in an instant the solid squares which had just been standing silently and orderly stirred, stretched out, and began to buzz with busy voices. Soldiers were running this way and that, getting their knapsacks on their shoulders and over their heads, taking down their cloaks and lifting their arms high in the air, trying to get them into their sleeves. Within half an hour the whole regiment was in the same order as before, only the squares were transformed from black to grey. The regimental commander was again walking up and down in front of the regiment, with the same tottering gait and inspecting it from a distance. "'What does that mean? What is that?' he cried, suddenly halting. "'Captain of the Third Company!' "'The general wants the captain of the Third Company. "'The general wants the Third Captain. "'The general wants the Third Company,' cried various voices along the ranks, and an aide hastened to discover the missing officer. Even while the sounds of gruff voices commingling, and some even crying the "'Company wants the general!' rang along the lines, the missing officer appeared from behind his company, and although he was well on in years, and not used to running, he came toward the general at an awkward dog-trot on his tiptoes. The captain's face expressed such anxiety as a schoolboy feels when he is called upon to recite a lesson that has not been learned. His nose was red and covered with blotches, evidently caused by intemperance, and his mouth twitched nervously. The regimental commander surveyed the delinquent captain from head to foot as he came up panting, and slackened his pace as he approached. "'Do you let your men wear women's seraphans? What does that mean?' cried the regimental commander, thrusting out his lower jaw and pointing to a soldier in the ranks of the third company, 
who wore a colored capote of broadcloth in violent contrast with the cloaks of the other soldiers where have you been the commander-in-chief is expected and here you are out of your place eh i will teach you to dress your men in cossack coats for review hey the captain not taking his eyes from his chief kept his two fingers at his visor as though he found his salvation now in this one position alone well why don't you speak whom have you there in that hungarian costume sternly demanded the regimental commander with grim fastidiousness your excellency well what of your excellency your excellency and your excellency but what does what do you mean by your excellency nobody knows what you mean your excellency that is dolokhov cashiered stammered the captain well was he cashiered to be a field marshal or a private if as a private then he ought to be dressed like the others in uniform your excellency you yourself allowed him to dress so on the march allowed him allowed him that's always the way with you young men said the general cooling down a little allowed him we tell you one thing and you the general paused we tell you one thing and you well he said with a fresh access of temper be good enough to have your men dressed decently and the regimental commander glanced at the adjutant and proceeded along the line with his faltering gait it could be seen that his outburst of temper had given him great satisfaction and that as he passed along the line he wanted to find some excuse for further violence berating one officer for not having a clean gorget and another for having his company dressed unevenly he proceeded to company three how are you standing where is your leg your leg where is it screamed the regimental commander with a suggestion of keen suffering in his voice passing by half a dozen men to come to dolokhov who was dressed in a bluish capote dolokhov slowly straightened his bended leg and with his keen bold eyes stared into the general's face why is that blue capote off with it sergeant strip him the blunt he did not have time to finish general i am bound to fulfil orders but i am not bound to put up began dolokhov hastily no talking in the ranks no talking no talking i am not bound to put up with insults cried dolokhov in a loud ringing voice the eyes of the general and the private met the general said no more but angrily pulled down his tight belt have the goodness to change your coat i beg of you said he as he turned away End of chapter 1
and again the regiment stirred into life and presented arms. In the dead silence the undertone of the commander-in-chief was heard. The regiment shouted, Long life to your highness! And again all was still. At first Kutuzov stood where he was and watched the regiment go through this evolution, then side by side with the general in the white uniform, and accompanied by his suite, he started to walk down the line. By the way in which the regimental commander had saluted his chief, and kept his eyes fastened upon him, and now followed behind the two generals as they walked down the lines, and as he drew himself up and bent forward to listen to every word that fell from their lips, it was evident that he fulfilled his duties as a subordinate with even greater satisfaction than he did those of a commander. The regiment, thanks to the commander's stern discipline and strenuous endeavors, was in excellent condition compared to the others which had come to Brnau at the same time. There were only two hundred and seventeen sick and stragglers, and all things were in excellent order, with the exception of the shoes. Kutuzov proceeded down the ranks, occasionally stopping to say a few friendly words to officers, or even privates whom he had known during the war with Turkey. Glancing at their shoes, he more than once shook his head mournfully, and directed the Austrian general's attention to them, with an expression that meant to imply that no one was to blame for it, but it was a pity, all the same, to see such a state of things. The regimental commander, at each time that he did so, pushed forward, fearing to lose a single word that his chief might speak regarding his regiment. Behind Kutuzov, just near enough to be able to catch every word, however lightly spoken, that might fall from his lips, followed the twenty men of his suite, talking among themselves and occasionally laughing. Nearest to the commander-in-chief walked a handsome adjutant. This was Prince Bolkonsky. Next him went his messmate, Nesvitsky, a tall and remarkably stalwart staff officer, with a kindly, smiling, handsome face and liquid eyes. Nesvitsky could hardly refrain from laughing at the antics of a dark-complexioned officer of the hussars, who was walking near him. The hussar officer, without smiling, and not changing the serious expression of his eyes, gazed at the regimental commander's back, and was mimicking his every motion. Every time that the general tottered and pushed forward, the young hussar officer would, in almost precisely the same way, totter and push forward. Nesvitsky was amused, and nudged the others to look at the mimic. Kutuzov walked slowly and lazily in front of the thousands of eyes that were starting from their sockets to follow the motions of the chief. As he came along to Company 3, he suddenly halted. The suite, not anticipating this halt, involuntarily crowded up close to him. "'Ah, Timokin!' cried the commander-in-chief, recognizing the red-nosed captain, the one who had been obliged to suffer on account of the blue capote, it would seem as though it were impossible for him to draw himself up higher than he had done during the scolding administered by the regimental commander. But now that the commander-in-chief stopped to speak to him, the captain put such a strain upon himself that it seemed as though he could not stand it should the commander-in-chief stay a moment longer, and accordingly Kutuzov, evidently appreciating his position and being anxious to show every kindness to the captain, hastened to turn away, a scarcely perceptible smile flitting over his plump, scarred face. "'Another comrade of Ismailo, said he. "'A brave officer. Are you satisfied with him?' asked Kutuzov of the regimental commander. The regimental commander, who, unknown to himself, was mimicked as in a mirror by the officer of hussars, started as if stung, sprang forward, and replied, "'Very well satisfied, your high excellency.' We all of us have our weaknesses, continued Kutuzov, smiling and turning away. His used to be his devotion to Bacchus. The regimental commander was alarmed, lest he were to blame for this, and found no words to reply. The hussar at this instant caught sight of the captain with the red nose and rounded belly, and perpetrated such an exact imitation of his face and pose that Nesvitsky laughed outright. Kutuzov turned around. It was evident that the young officer had perfect command of his features, for at the instant that Kutuzov turned round the officer's face had assumed the most serious, deferential, and innocent of expressions. The third company was the last, and Kutuzov paused, 
evidently trying to recollect something. Prince André stepped out from the suite and said in French in an undertone, You ordered me to remind you of Dolokhov, who was cashier to this regiment. Where is this Dolokhov? Dolokhov, who now wore the grey military capote, did not wait to be summoned. Kutuzov saw a well-built soldier with light curly hair and bright blue eyes come forth from the ranks and present arms. A grievance? asked Kutuzov, slightly frowning. That is Dolokhov, said Prince Andrei. Ah? exclaimed Kutuzov. I hope that you will profit by this lesson. Do your duty. The Emperor is merciful, and I will not forget you, if you deserve well. The clear blue eyes looked into the chief's face with the same boldness as at the regimental commanders, their expression seeming to rend the veil of rank that so widely separated the commander-in-chief from the private soldier. "'I should like to ask one favour, Your High Excellency,' said he deliberately, in a firm, ringing voice. "'I beg that you give me a chance to wipe out my fault and show my devotion to His Majesty, the Emperor, and to Russia.' Kutuzov turned away. The same sort of smile flashed over his face and through his eyes, as at the time when he turned away from Captain Timokhin. He turned away and frowned, as though he wished to express by this that all that Dolokhov had said to him, and all that he could possibly say to him, he had known long, long ago, and that it was all a bore to him, and that it was so much wasted breath. He turned away and went back to the calash. The regiment broke up into companies, and marched to the quarters assigned them not far from Bernau, where they hoped to get shoes and clothes and rest after their long marches. "'You will not complain of me, will you, Prokhor Ignatyich?' asked the regimental commander, galloping after the third company and overtaking Captain Timokhin, who rode at their head. The general's face shone with unrestrained delight at the successful outcome of the review. The service of the Tsar— can't help. One flies off. I am the first to apologize. You know me. Thank you very much. And he held out his hand to the captain. I beg of you, General. How could I think such a thing? replied the captain. His nose grew scarlet, and he smiled, the smile betraying the lack of two front teeth which had been knocked out by the butt end of a gun under Ismailo. And assure Mr. Dolokhov that I shall not forget him, to rest easy on that score. And tell me, please, I have been wanting for some time to ask you, how does he behave? And always. He is very regular in his duty, Your Excellency, but his temper, said Dimokhin. Well, what of his temper? demanded the regimental commander. Some days, Your Excellency, he goes it, said the captain, but otherwise he is intelligent and well-informed and quiet, and then again he is a wild beast. In Poland he almost killed a Jew. You will have the grace to know. Yes, yes, said the regimental commander. We must always be easy on a young man in misfortune. You see he has influential connections, so you had better... I understand, Your Excellency, rejoined Timokhin, with a smile that showed that he understood his chief's desires. Yes, yes, just so. The regimental commander sought out Dolokhov in the ranks and reined in his horse. Epilots at the first engagement, said he. Dolokhov looked up, but made no answer and did not alter the expression of the ironical smile that curled his lips. Well, this is very good, continued the regimental commander. A glass of vodka to the men from me, he added, loud enough to be heard by the soldiers. I thank you all. Slava Brohu, glory to God. And he rode on and overtook the next company. Well, it's a fact. He's a good man and not hard to serve under, said Timokhin, to a subaltern riding next him. In a word, very hearty, said the subaltern officer, laughing at his own joke. The regimental commander was nicknamed the King of Hearts. The cheerful frame of mind felt by the officers after the review was shared also by the men. The regiment marched along merrily. On all sides were heard the voices of the soldiers talking. How is it? They say Kutuzov is blind in one eye. Well, so he is, quite blind. Nay, brother, he can see better than you can. He inspected our boots and leg wrappers and everything. My, when he looked at my legs, I didn't know what I was standing on. And that other one, 
the Avstriak who was with him. I should think he was whitewashed, white as flour. Think what a job to clean that uniform. Say, Fetishow, did he say when we should begin to be on our guard? You were in the front. I was told that Bonaparte himself was at Brunova. Bonaparte here? What a lie, you fool! Don't you know anything? Now the Prusk is up in arms, and the Avstriak, of course, have got to put him down, and when he's put down, then there'll be war with Bonaparte, and yet they say Bonaparte is here at Brunova. Anybody can see you was a fool. Keep your ears peeled, you idiot. The devil! What sort of quartermasters these are! See, there's the fifth company turning off into the village. They'll have their kasha pots boiling before we get in. Give me a biscuit, you devil. Didn't I give you some tobacco last evening? Too thin, brother. Well, then, God be with you. Oh, I wish they'd call a halt. The idea of marching five verse more on an empty stomach. What you'd like to be for those Germans to give us a lift in their carriages. Then you'd go easy enough. That would be fine. But here, brother, see all these beggarly people come out. The Polyaks, back there, belong to the Russian crown. But here, brother, there's nothing but Germans come out. Singers to the front, cried the captain. A score of men from the different companies ran to their places at the head of the column. The drummer who led the singing faced the singers and waved his arms, and struck up the drawling soldier's song, beginning with the words, Is it the dawn, and has the red sun risen? and ending, Well, boys, what glory we shall win with Father Kamensky. This song had been composed in Turkey, and was now sung in Austria, with simply this variation, that in place of Father Kamensky, Father Kutuzov was substituted. The drummer, a stalwart, handsome fellow, forty years old, having sung these last words in staccato, soldier style, made a gesture with his hands as though he were throwing something to the ground, looked sternly at his singers, and frowned. Then, feeling the consciousness of all eyes being fastened upon him, he lifted his arms high above his head, as though he were carrying with the greatest care some invisible and precious object, and holding them so for several moments, he suddenly flung it down with a despairing gesture, singing, Ach, voi seni, moi seni, Ah, my cottage, my cottage, while twenty voices took up the refrain, and a spoon-maker, disregarding the weight of his equipment, friskily danced ahead and walked backwards before the company, shrugging his shoulders and making gestures of defiance with his spoons. The soldiers, clapping their hands in time with the measure of the song, marched in step. Behind them were heard the rattle of wheels, the creaking of springs, and the trampling of horses' feet. It was Kutuzov and his suite, on their way back to the city. The commander-in-chief signified that the men should keep on as they were, and he and all his suite showed by their faces how much they enjoyed the music of the songs, the sight of dancing soldier, and the bold and buoyant appearance of the company. Conspicuous in the second file of the right flank, near which the calash passed, was Dolokhov, the blue-eyed private, as he marched along with an extraordinarily bold and graceful gait, keeping time to the song and looking into the faces of the passing officers, with an expression that seemed to smack of pity for all that did not march with his company. The cornet of hussars in Kutuzov's suite, who had mimicked the regimental commander, fell behind the calash and drew up along Dolokhov. Zerkarf, this cornet of hussars, had at one time belonged to the same wild set in Petersburg, of which Dolokhov was the leader. Here abroad, Zerkov met Dolokhov in the ranks, but did not find it expedient to recognize him at first. Now, however, since Kutuzov had set the example by talking with the degraded officer, he went to him with all the cordiality of an old friend. "'My dear fellow, how are you?' said he, right in the midst of the song, as he walked his horse abreast of the company. "'How am I?' replied Dolokhov. "'As you see.' The military song gave special significance to the tone of easy good fellowship in which Zerkov spoke, and the pronounced coolness of Dolokhov's answer. "'And how do you get along with your chiefs?' asked Zerkov. "'All right. Good fellows. How did you manage to get on the staff?' "'I am attached. On duty.' Neither spoke. "'Vu puskala sokolt, da is pravava rukad.' 
she unleashed the falcon and from the right sleeve rang out the song involuntarily inspiring a bold blithe feeling their talk would probably have been different if they had not spoken while the singing was in progress is it true that the austrians are beaten asked dolokhof the devil only knows so they say i'm glad of it exclaimed dolokhof curtly as though the song demanded it of him say come to us this evening you'll have a chance at faro said zerkov did you bring a good deal of money with you come i can't i've sworn off i neither drink nor play till i'm promoted well that'll come first engagement we shall see again they relapsed into silence look in anyway if you need anything the staff will help you dolokhof laughed don't make yourself uneasy if i need anything i shall not ask for it i'll take it well i mean well and so do i mean good-bye farewell if we saco if dalico norodomu storanu high and far in our fatherland zerkov put spurs to his horse which pranced and danced not knowing with which foot to start and then with a spring galloped off leaving the company far behind and overtook the calash while still the rhythm of the song seemed to wing its feet End of chapter two part two chapter three of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne on his return from the review kutuzov accompanied by the austrian general went into his private room and calling his adjutant bade him bring certain papers relating to the state of the troops and some letters received from the archduke ferdinand the commander of the army of the van prince andrei bolkonsky came into the commander-in-chief's office with the desired papers kutuzov and the member of the hofkriegsroth were sitting at a table on which was spread a map ah said kutuzov with a glance at bolkonsky signifying by his exclamation that the adjutant was to wait while at the same time he went on in french with the conversation that he had begun i have only one thing to say general proceeded kutuzov with a pleasing elegance of diction and accent which constrained one to listen to each deliberately spoken word it was evident that kutuzov took pleasure in hearing himself i have only one thing to say general if the matter depends solely on me then the desire of his majesty the emperor of france would long ago have been fulfilled i should long ago have joined the archduke and i assure you on my honour that for me personally i should have rejoiced to give over the supreme command of the armies to a general so much more learned and more experienced than myself and such men abound in austria and to be relieved of the heavy responsibility but circumstances are often beyond our control general and kutuzov smiled with an expression that seemed to say you are at perfect liberty not to put any confidence in what i say and it is absolutely of no consequence to me whether you believe me or not but you have no need to tell me so and that's all there is of it the austrian general looked dissatisfied but could not do otherwise than reply in the same tone on the contrary said he in a querulous and angry tone that to put the lie to the flattering intention of his words on the contrary his majesty highly appreciates the part that you have taken in the common cause but we think that the present delay will rob the brave russian army and their generals of those laurels which they are in the habit of winning in war he rejoined in a phrase evidently prepared beforehand kutuzov bowed but still continued to smile well such is my idea of it and relying upon the last letter which his highness the archduke ferdinand has done me the honour of writing me i have no doubt that the austrian army under the command of such an experienced coadjutor as general mack has already won a decisive victory and no longer needs our aid said kutuzov the general frowned there was indeed no accurate information about the condition of the austrians yet there was a prepondering weight of circumstantial evidence in favour of the unfavourable rumours that were in circulation and therefore kutuzov's assumptions of an austrian victory 
seemed very much like a jest. But Kutuzov smiled blandly, with an expression that seemed to affirm his right to make this assumption. In fact, the last letter that he had received from Mack's army informed him of a probable victory, and of the very advantageous strategical position of his army. "'Give me that letter,' said Kutuzov, addressing Prince Andrei. "'Have the goodness to listen to this.' And Kutuzov, with an ironical smile hovering on his lips, read in German to the Austrian general the following passage from the Archduke Ferdinand's letter. "'We have our forces perfectly concentrated, nearly seventy thousand strong, so that we can attack and defeat the enemy should he attempt to cross the Lech. Since we are masters of Ulm, we cannot lose the advantage of having control of both banks of the Danube. Moreover, should the enemy not cross the Lech, we can at any moment take the other side of the Danube, attack his line of communication, and, by recrossing the Danube lower down, instantly nullify his plans if he should think of turning the main body of his forces against our faithful allies. Thus we can confidently wait the moment when the Imperial Russian army is ready to join us, and then easily find an opportunity in common to inflict upon the enemy the fate that he deserves. Kutuzov drew a long breath when he had finished this passage, and looked with a sympathetic and kindly expression at the member of the Hofkriegsroth. But you know, Your Excellency, that the law of courage advises you to be prepared for the worst, said the Austrian general, evidently anxious to have done with jokes and take up serious business. He involuntarily glanced at the adjutant. Excuse me, general, exclaimed Kutuzov, interrupting him and also turning to Prince Andrei. See here, my dear fellow, get from Kozlovsky all the reports from our spies. Here are two letters from Count Nostitch, and here's a letter from the Archduke Ferdinand, another still, said he, handing him a quantity of papers. Have an abstract of these made out neatly in French, as a memorandum, so that we can see at a glance all the facts that we have in regard to the doings of the Austrian army. Now then, when it is done you will hand it to His Excellency. Prince Andre inclined his head as a sign that he comprehended from the very first word not only all that Kutuzov had said, but all that he meant to say to him. He gathered up the papers, and with a general salutation went into the reception room, stepping noiselessly over the soft carpet. Notwithstanding the fact that not much time had elapsed since Prince Andrei had left Russia, he had greatly changed. In the expression of his face, in his motions, in his gait, there was almost nothing to be recognized of his former affectation, lassitude, and laziness. He had the appearance of a man who had no time to think about the impression that he produced upon others, but who was occupied with pleasant and interesting work. His face showed more of contentment with himself and his surroundings. His smile and glance were more cheerful and attractive. Kutuzov, whom he joined in Poland, had received him very warmly and promised not to forget him, treated him with more distinction than his other adjutants, and had taken him to Vienna with him, and entrusted him with the most important duties. From Vienna, Kutuzov sent a letter to his old comrade, Prince Andrei's father. Your son, he wrote, bids fair to become an officer who will be distinguished for his quickness of perception, his firmness, and his faithfulness. I count myself fortunate in having such a helpmeet. Among the officers of Kutuzov's staff, and in the army generally, Prince Andrei bore two diametrically opposite reputations, just the same as in Petersburg society. One party, the minority, regarded Prince André as in some way different from themselves and all other people, and expected him to achieve the most brilliant success. They listened to him, praised him, and imitated him, and Prince André was on pleasant and easy terms with these men. The other party, the majority, were not fond of Prince André. They considered him haughty, cold, and disagreeable but Prince André had succeeded in winning their respect and even their fear. Coming into the reception room from Kutuzov's cabinet, Prince André took his papers to one of his colleagues, the adjutant Kozlovsky, who was on duty and was sitting with a book at the window. "'Well, what is it, Prince?' asked Kozlovsky. "'You are ordered to draw up a memorandum to account for our not advancing.' "'But why?' Prince André shrugged his shoulders." 
Any news of Mac? No. If it were true that he is defeated, we should have heard of it by this time. Probably, rejoined Prince Andre, and started for the outer door. But at that very instant the door was flung almost into his face, and a tall Austrian general, in an overcoat, and with his head swathed in a dark handkerchief, and with the order of Maria Theresa around his neck, hurried into the room, having evidently just arrived from a journey. Prince Andrei paused. "'General-in-chief Kutuzov,' hurriedly demanded the newly arrived general, with a strong German accent, and looking anxiously on all sides, started without delay for the door of the general's private room. "'The general-in-chief is engaged,' said Kozlovsky, hastening toward the unknown general, and barring the way to the cabinet. "'Whom shall I announce?' The unknown general looked scornfully down on the diminutive Kozlovsky, and seemed to be amazed that he was not recognized. "'The general-in-chief is engaged,' repeated Kozlovsky, calmly. The general's face contracted, his lips drew together and trembled. He drew out a notebook, quickly wrote something in pencil, tore out the leaf, and handed it to the adjutant. Then, with quick steps, he walked over to the window— threw himself into a chair, and surveyed those in the room, as though asking why they stared at him so. Then the general lifted his head, stretched out his neck as though he were about to say something, and then, affecting to hum to himself, produced a strange sound, instantly swallowed. The office door opened, and Kutuzov himself appeared on the threshold. The general, with the bandaged head, who had apparently escaped from some peril, bowed, and hastened with long swift strides across the room toward Kutuzov. Vous voyez la maharud mach, said he in a broken voice. Kutuzov's face, as he stood at his office door, remained perfectly unchangeable for several moments. Then a frown ran like a wave across his brow and passed off, leaving his face as serene as before. He respectfully bent his head, shut his eyes, silently allowed Mac to pass in front of him into the office, and then closed the door behind him. The rumor, already spread abroad, as to the defeat of the Austrians and the surrender of the whole army at Ulm, was thus proved to be correct. Within half an hour, adjutants were flying about in all directions, with orders for the Russian army, till now inactive, to prepare immediately to meet the enemy. Prince Andre was one of those uncommon staff officers whose interest is concentrated on the general operations of the war. On seeing Mac, and learning the particulars of his defeat, he realized that half of the campaign was lost, and appreciated the painfully difficult situation of the Russian army, while his imagination vividly pictured the fate that was awaiting the army, and the part which he was about to play in it. In spite of himself, he experienced a strong feeling of delight at the thought of the shame that Austria had brought upon herself, and that perhaps within a week he would have a chance to witness and take part in an encounter between the Russians and the French, the first since the time of Suvorov. But he feared lest Bonaparte's genius should show itself superior to the valor of the Russian troops, and at the same time he could not bear the thought of his hero suffering disgrace. Agitated and stirred by these thoughts, Prince Andrei started for his room to write his father, to whom he sent a daily letter. In the corridor he fell in with his roommate, Nesvitsky, and the buffoon, Zerkov. As usual, they were laughing and joking. "'Why are you so down in the mouth?' asked Nesvitsky, noticing Prince Andrei's pale face and flashing eyes. "'There is nothing to be gay about,' replied Bolkonsky. Just as Prince Andrei joined Nesvitsky and Zerkov, there came toward them from the other end of the corridor the Austrian general, Strauch, who was attached to Kutuzov's staff to look after the commissariat of the Russian army. He was with the member of the Hofkriegsrath, who had arrived the evening before. There was plenty of room in the wide corridor for the general to pass without incommoding three officers, but Zerkov, giving Nesvitsky a push, exclaimed in a hurried voice, they are coming, they are coming. Stand aside, please. Please make room. The generals came along, evidently desiring to avoid embarrassing etiquette. A stupid smile spread over the buffoon Zerkov's face. Your Excellency, said he in German, as he stepped forward and addressed the Austrian general. I have the honor of congratulating you. He made a low bow and, awkwardly, like a child learning to dance, began to scrape first with one foot, then with the other. 
the member of the hofkriegsroth gave him a stern look but concluding by his idiotic smile that he was in earnest he was constrained to listen for a moment he frowned to show that he was listening i have the honor of congratulating you general mac has come he's perfectly well save for a slight wound here said he with a radiant smile pointing to his forehead the general frowned and turned away and went on his way heavens what simplicity said he angrily after he had gone a few steps nesvitsky with a laugh threw his arms around prince andrei but the latter paler than ever and with a wrathful look on his face pushed him aside and turned to zherkov the nervous excitement induced by the sight of mac by the news of his defeat and the thoughts of what was awaiting the russian army found its outlet in wrath at this ill-timed jest of zherkov's if you my dear sir he exclaimed scornfully while his lower jaw twitched a little choose to be a buffoon why i cannot hinder you but i assure you that if you dare a second time to act like a fool in my presence i will teach you how to behave nesvitsky and zherkov were so amazed at this outburst that all they could do was to look in silence at bolkonsky with wide open eyes why i only congratulated them said zherkov i am not jesting with you be good enough to hold your tongue cried bolkonsky and taking nesvitsky by the arm he drew him away from zherkov who found nothing to say well now what's the matter brother asked nesvitsky in a soothing tone what's the matter repeated prince andrei pausing in his excitement why you know well enough either we are officers in the service of our czar and our country rejoicing at our common success and grieving over our common failure or we are lackeys who have no interest in our master's concerns forty thousand men massacred and the army of our allies destroyed and still you find it something to laugh at said he as though these last sentences which were spoken in french added to the effect of what he was saying it is well enough for a trifler en garçon de rion like that fellow whom you have made your friend only street arabs could find amusement in such things said prince andrei suddenly changing to russian again but pronouncing the russian word for street arab with a french accent noticing that zherkov was still within hearing he waited to see if the cornet had any answer to make but zherkov went away and left the corridor End of chapter 3Part two, chapter four of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Pavlograd regiment of hussars was encamped two miles from Brnau. The squadron in which Nikolai Rostov served as Yunker was quartered in the German village of Salzenek. The squadron commander, Captain Denisov, who was known to the entire cavalry division as Vaska Denisov had been assigned to the best house in the village. Junker Rostov had shared the captain's quarters ever since he joined the regiment in Poland. On the very same October day, when at headquarters all had been thrown into excitement by the news of Mac's defeat, the camp life of the squadron was going on in its usual tranquil course. Denisov, who had been playing a losing game of cards all night long, had not yet returned to his rooms, when Rostov, early in the morning rode up on horseback from his foraging tour he was in his younger uniform and as he galloped up to the doorstep and threw his leg over with the agile dexterity of youth he paused a moment in the stirrup as though sorry to dismount but at last sprang lightly from the horse and called the orderly hey bondarenko my dear fellow he shouted to the hussar who hurried forth to attend to the horse lead him about a little my friend said he with that fraternal geniality with which handsome young men are apt to treat everybody when they are happy i will your illustriousness replied the little russian gaily shaking his head see that you walk him about well another hussar also hastened up to attend to the horse but bondarenko had already taken the bridle it was evident that the yunker gave handsome fees and that it was a pleasure to serve him Rostov smoothed the horse's neck, then his flank, and turned and looked back from the step. Excellent. He'll be a horse worth having, said he to himself, 
and then smiling and picking up his sabre, he mounted the steps with clinking spurs. The German who owned the house glanced up as he worked in his shirt-sleeves and nightcap, pitching over manure in the cowhouse. The German's face always lighted at the sight of Rostov. He gaily smiled and winked. "'Good morning, good morning,' he reiterated, evidently taking great satisfaction in giving the young man his morning greeting. "'Busy already, schon fleissig? asked Rostov, with the same good-natured, friendly smile, which so well became his animated face. "'Hurrah for the Austrians! Hurrah for Russians! Hurrah for the Kaiser Alexander!' he shouted, repeating the words which his German host was fond of saying. The German laughed, came out from the door of the cowhouse, took off his nightcap, and waving it over his head, cried, "'Hurrah for the whole world! Und die ganze Welt hoch!' Rostov, following the German's example, waved his forage cap around his head, and with a merry laugh shouted, Und vivant die ganze Welt! Long live the whole world! Although there was no special reason for rejoicing, either on the part of the German who was engaged in pitching manure, or for Rostov, who had been on a long ride with his men after hay, nevertheless both men looked at each other with joyous enthusiasm and brotherly love, nodded their heads to show that they understood each other, and then separated with a smile, the German to his cow-house, and Rostov to the cottage which he and Denisov shared together. "'Where's the baron?' he asked of Luvroshka, Denisov's rascally valet, who was known to the whole regiment. "'He hasn't been in since evening, probably been losing at cards,' replied Lavrushka. "'I have learned that if he has good luck, he comes in early and in high spirits,' but if he does not get in before morning, it means he's been losing, and he'll come in mad enough. Will you have coffee? Yes, give me some. In less than ten minutes, Lavrushka brought the coffee. He's coming, he said. Now we'll get it. Rostov glanced out the window and saw Denisov meandering home. He was a little man, with a red face, brilliant black eyes, and dark moustache, and hair all in disorder. He wore a hussar's pelisse unbuttoned, wide, sagging pantaloons, and a hussar's cap on the back of his head. He came up the steps in a gloomy mood, with hanging head. Lavushka, he cried in a loud, surly voice, "'Here, you blockhead, take this off!' "'Don't you see I am taking it off?' replied Lavrushka's voice. "'Ah, you up already?' asked Denisov, as he came into the cottage." "'Long ago,' replied Rostov, "'I've been after hay, and I saw Fräulein Matilda. "'So, ho, and there I have been, brother, "'losing horribly all night, like a son of a dog,' "'cried Denison, slurring over his R's. "'Such horrid bad luck, perfectly horrid. "'The moment you left, luck changed. "'Hey, tea!' "'Denisov snarled with a sort of smile "'that showed his short, sound teeth, and began to run the short fingers of both hands through his thick, black hair that stood up like a forest. The devil himself dwove me to that what, the officer's nickname was the rat, said he, rubbing his forehead and face with both hands. Just imagine, didn't have a single cod, not one, not a single one. Denisov took out the pipe which he had been smoking, knocked the ashes into his palm, and scattering the fire, laid it upon the floor, and went on shouting, "'Simple stakes! Lose the doubles! Simple stakes! Lose the doubles!' After he had scattered the fire, he broke his pipe in two and flung it away. Then, after a silence, he suddenly looked up at Rostov, with his bright black eyes full of merriment. "'If there were only some women here! But here there's nothing to do but dwink! If we could only have a wound of fighting! He! Who's there?' he cried, going to the door, on hearing the sound of heavy boots and the jingling of spurs in the next room. The quartermaster announced Lavrushka. Denisov frowned still more portentously. Twat it, he exclaimed, flinging his friend a purse containing a few gold pieces. Wistov, count it, chicken. See how much is left, then hide it under my pillow, said he, and went out to see the quartermaster. Rostov took the money, and mechanically making little heaps of the new and old coins, according to their denominations, began to count them. "'Ah! Tell you, Nin. How do you?' "'Got done up last night,' Denisov was heard saying in the next room. "'Where? At Brukov's. At the Rats. I heard about it,' said a second, thin voice, 
and immediately after lieutenant telyanin a young officer of the same squadron came into the room rostof thrust the purse under the pillow and pressed the little moist hand that was held out to him telyanin had been removed from the guards shortly before the campaign for some reason or other he now conducted himself very decently in the regiment but he was not liked and rostof especially could not conquer or even conceal his unreasonable antipathy to this officer well young cavalier how does my grachek suit you grachek or young rook was a saddle-horse that telyanin had sold rostof the lieutenant never looked the man with whom he was talking straight in the eye his eyes were constantly wandering from one object to another i saw you riding him this morning first rate he's a good horse said rostof in spite of the fact that the animal for which he had given seven hundred roubles was worth half the price he had paid he's begun to go lame in the front foreleg hoof cracked that's nothing i will teach you or show you what kind of a rivet to put on yes show me please said rostof i will show you certainly i will it's no secret and you will thank me for the horse i'll have him brought right round said rostof anxious to get rid of telyanin and he went out to give his orders in the entry denisof with a pipe in his mouth was sitting cross-legged on the threshold in front of the quartermaster who was making his report when he saw rostov denisof made a face and pointing with his thumb over his shoulder into the room where telyanin was scowled still more darkly and shuddered with aversion ugh i don't like that young fellow said he undeterred by the quartermaster's presence Rostov shrugged his shoulders, as much as to say, nor I either, but what is to be done about it, and having given his orders, returned to Telyanin. The latter was still sitting in the same indolent position in which Rostov had left him, rubbing his small, white hands. "'What repugnant people one has to meet,' said Rostov to himself, as he went into the room. "'Well, did you order the horse brought round?' asked Telyanin, getting up and carelessly looking around i did come on then i just ran over to ask denisof about to-day's orders that was all have they come in yet denisof not yet where are you going oh i'm just going to show this young man how to shoe his horse replied telyanin they went out down the front steps to the stable the lieutenant showed rostov how to make a rivet and then went home when rostov returned he found denisof sitting at the table with a bottle of vodka and a sausage before him and writing with a sputtering pen he looked gloomily into rostov's face i'm writing to her said he he leaned his elbow on the table with the pen in his hand and told to his friend what his letter was to be evidently taking real delight in the chance of saying faster than he could write all that he had in his mind to put on the paper do you see my friend said he we are asleep when we are not in love we are children of the dust but when you are in love then you are like god you are as pure as on the first day of creation who is there send him to the devil i have no time he cried to lavrushka who came up to him not in the least abashed what can i do it's your own order it's the quartermaster come back for the money denisov scowled opened his mouth to shout something but made no sound nasty job he muttered to himself how much money was there left in that purse he asked rostov seven new pieces and three old ones ach dwat it well what are you standing there for like a booby fetch in the quartermaster cried denisov to lavrushka please denisov take some of my money you see i have plenty said rostov reddening i don't like to bow on my friends i don't like it declared denisov but if you don't let me lend you money comrade fashion i shall be offended insisted rostov truly i have plenty no indeed i shan't and denisov went to the bed to get the purse from under the pillow where did you put it rostov under the bottom pillow it isn't there denisov flung both pillows on the floor there was no purse there that's strange hold on didn't you throw it out asked rostov picking up the pillows and shaking them and then hauling off the bedclothes and shaking them but there was no purse i could not have forgotten it could i no i remember very well thinking how you kept it like a treasure trove under your pillow where is it he demanded to lavrushka 
I haven't been into the room. It must be where you put it. But it isn't. That is always the way with you. You throw it down and then forget all about it. Look in your pockets. No, if I had not thought about the treasure trove, said Rostov, and I remember putting it there. Lavrushka tore the whole bed apart, looked under it, under the table, searched everywhere in the room, and then stood still in the middle of the room. Denisov silently followed all his motions, and when Lavrushka, in amazement, spread open his hands, he glanced at Rostov. Rostov, stop your schoolboy twix. Rostov, conscious of Denisov's gaze fixed upon him, raised his eyes and instantly dropped them again. The blood, till then contained somewhere below his throat, rushed in an overmastering flood into his face and eyes. He could not get a breath. "'There has been no one in the room except the lieutenant and yourselves. It is nowhere to be found,' said Lavrushka. "'Now, you devil's puppet, fly wound, hunt for it,' suddenly cried Denisov, growing livid and starting toward the valet with a threatening gesture. "'Find me that purse, or I'll horsewhip you. I'll horsewhip you all.' Rostov, avoiding Denisov's glance, began to button up his jacket, adjusted his saber, and put on his cap. "'I tell you, give me that purse,' cried Denisov, shaking his man by the shoulders and pushing him against the wall. "'Denisov, let him go. I know who took it,' said Rostov, going toward the door and not lifting his eyes. Denisov paused, considered a moment, and evidently, perceiving whom Rostov meant, seized him by the arm. Wubbish, he cried, the veins on his face and neck standing out like cords. I tell you, you are beside yourself, and I won't have it. The purse is here. I'll take the hide off this waskel, and I'll get it. I know who took it, repeated Rostov in a trembling voice, and went to the door. But I tell you, don't you dare to do it, cried Denisov, throwing himself on the yunker to hold him back. But Rostov freed his arm, and with as much anger as though Denisov were his worst enemy, gave him a direct and heavy blow right between the eyes. "'Do you realize what you are saying?' he cried, in a trembling voice. "'He is the only person beside myself who has been in the room. Of course, if it was not he, then—' He could not finish, and rushed from the room. "'Ah! The devil take you in all the West!' were the last words that Rostov caught. He went straight to Telyanin's rooms— "'My baron's not at home. He went to headquarters,' said Telyanin's man. "'Why, has anything happened?' he added, surprised at the younger's distorted face. "'No, nothing. You just missed him,' said the man. Headquarters were three verse from Salzanek. Rostov, without returning home, took a horse and galloped off to headquarters. In the village occupied by the staff was a tavern where the officers resorted. Rostov went to this tavern— at the doorsteps he saw Telyanin's horse. The lieutenant himself was sitting in the second room of the tavern with a plate of sausages and a bottle of wine. "'Ah, so you have come too, young man,' said he, smiling and lifting his brows. "'Yes,' said Rostov, though it required the greatest effort to speak this monosyllable, and he took his seat at the next table. Neither said more. Two Germans and a Russian officer were the other occupants of the room." No one was talking, and the only sounds were the rattle of knives and forks, and the lieutenant's munching. When Telyanin had finished his breakfast, he pulled out of his pocket a double purse, and with his delicate white fingers, which turned up at the ends, slipped up the ring, took out a gold piece, and lifting his brows, gave it to the waiter. "'Please make haste,' said he. The gold piece was new. Rostov got up and went to Telyanin. "'Allow me to look at your purse.' he said, in a quiet, almost inaudible voice. With wandering eyes and still lifted brows, Telyanin handed him the purse. "'Yes, it's a handsome little purse, isn't it?' "'Yes,' said he, and suddenly turned pale. "'Look at it, youngster,' he added. Rostov took the purse into his hand and looked at it, and at the money that was in it, and at Telyanin. The lieutenant glanced around in his usual way, and apparently became suddenly very merry. If we ever get to Vienna, I shall leave all this there, but there's nothing to get with it in these filthy little towns, said he. Will you give it back to me, youngster? I must be going. Rostov said nothing. And you? Aren't you going to have some breakfast? Pretty good fare, continued Telyanin. Give it to me. 
He stretched out his hand and took hold of the purse. Rostov let it go. Telyanin took the purse and began to let it slip into the pocket of his riding trousers, and his brows went up higher than usual, and his mouth slightly parted as much as to say, Yes, yes, I will put my purse in my pocket, and it is a very simple matter, and it is no one's business at all. Well, what is it, youngster? said he, sighing and glancing into Rostov's eyes from under his raised eyebrows. Something like a swift electric flash darted from Telyanin's eyes into Rostov's, and was darted back again, and again and again, all in a single instant. "'Come here with me,' said Rostov, taking Telyanin by the arm. He drew him almost to the window. "'This money is Denisov's. You took it,' he whispered in his ear. "'What? What? How do you dare? What?' exclaimed Telyanin but his words sounded like a mournful cry of despair and a prayer for forgiveness. As soon as Rostov heard this note in his voice, it seemed as though a great stone of doubt had fallen from his heart. He was rejoiced and at the same time felt sincere pity for the unhappy man standing before him, but he was obliged to carry the matter to the end. "'There are men here. God knows what they will think,' stammered Telyanin, seizing his cap and starting for a small, unoccupied room. "'We must have an explanation.' I know this and can prove it, said Rostov. I. All the muscles of Telyanin's scared, pale face began to tremble. His eyes kept wandering, though they were fixed on the floor, and never once raised to Rostov's, and something like a sob was heard. Count! Don't ruin a young fellow. Here's that wretched money. Take it, he threw it on the table. I have a father who is an old man. I have a mother. Rostov took the money avoiding Telyanin's gaze, and, not saying a word, started to leave the room. But at the door he paused and turned back. "'My God!' said he, with tears in his eyes. "'How could you have done it?' "'Count,' said Telyanin, coming towards the younger. "'Don't touch me!' cried Rostov, drawing himself up. "'If you need this money, take it!' He tossed him the purse and hurried out of the tavern. End of chapter 4 Part two, chapter five of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. On the evening of the same day, a lively discussion took place in Denisov's rooms between some of the officers of the squadron. But I tell you, Rostov, that it's your business to apologize to the regimental commander, said the second captain, a tall man with grayish hair enormous moustache, and powerful wrinkled features. Captain Kirsten had twice been reduced to the ranks for affairs of honour, and twice promoted again. "'I will not allow anyone to call me a liar,' cried Rostov, who flushed crimson and was in a great state of excitement. He told me that I lied, and I told him that he lied, and there the matter rests. He may keep me on duty every day, he may put me under arrest, but neither he nor anyone else can force me to apologize. If he, as regimental commander, considers it improper to give me satisfaction, then— Yes, yes, calm yourself, Batushka. Listen to me, interrupted Captain Kirsten, in his deep, bass voice, calmly twirling his moustaches. You told the regimental commander, in the presence of other officers, that an officer had stolen— it wasn't my fault that the conversation took place before other officers. Maybe it was not best to have spoken before them, but I am not a diplomat. That is why I joined the hussars. I thought that here, at least, such fine distinctions were not necessary. And he told me that I lied. Let him give me satisfaction, then. That's all very good. No one thinks that you are a coward. But that isn't the point. Ask Denisov. Put it to anyone if a younker can demand satisfaction of his regimental commander. Denisov, chewing his moustache, was listening to the discussion with a gloomy expression of countenance, evidently not wishing to take any part in it. In reply to the captain's question, he shook his head. In the presence of other officers, you spoke to the regimental commander about this rascality, continued the second captain. Bogdanuitch, so the regimental commander was called, Bogdanuitch shut you up. He did not shut me up. He told me that I was lying. Well, 
have it so but you were saying foolish things to him and you ought to apologize not for the world cried rostof i did not think that of you said the captain seriously and sternly you are unwilling to apologize and yet batyushka you are in fault not only towards him but towards the whole regiment towards all of us this is the way of it if you had only thought if you had only taken advice as to how to move in this matter but no you out with it right before other officers too well then what can the regimental commander do must he bring the other officer before a court-martial and disgrace the whole regiment insult the whole regiment on account of a single rogue is that your idea of it well it isn't ours and bogdanuitch was a brave fellow he told you that you were not telling the truth disagreeable but what else could he do you found your match and now when we want to hush it up you out of sheer obstinacy and pride aren't willing to apologize but want to have everybody know about it you are offended because you are put on extra duty because you are required to apologize to an old and honored officer even if it were not bogdanuitch our honorable and brave old colonel even then you would be offended and would be willing to insult the whole regiment would you the captain's voice began to tremble yes batyushka you who will perhaps not be in the regiment a year from now to-day here to-morrow transferred somewhere as adjutant you don't care a fig if it is said thieves in the pavograd regiment but it isn't all the same to us what do you say denisof it isn't a matter of indifference is it denisof had kept silent all the time and did not move though he occasionally glanced at rostof from his brilliant black eyes your pride is so dear to you that you aren't willing to apologize continued the captain we old men who have grown up and are going to die if god granted in the regiment guard its honor dearly and bogdanuitch knows it oh how we love it batyushka and this is not good of you not good at all get mad if you please but i shall always stick to mother truth you're all wrong and the captain got up and turned his back on rostof white devil take it screamed denisof jumping up now then rostof now then rostof flushing turned pale looked first at one and then at the other officer no gentlemen no you do not think i see that you are perfectly mistaken in your opinion of me i for my own sake for the honor of the regiment what am i saying and i will prove it yes for my own sake and the honor of the regiment well it's all the same you're right i was to blame tears stood in his eyes i was to blame to blame all around now what more do you want that's the way to do it cried the captain turning round and slapping him on the shoulder with his big hand i tell you cried denisof he's a glorious young fellow that's the best way count repeated the captain as though the giving him his title made his words more emphatic go and apologize your illustriousness that's it gentlemen i won't do anything no one shall ever hear another word from me declared rostof in a low supplicating voice but i cannot apologize by heavens i cannot how can you expect it how can i apologize like a little schoolboy begging forgiveness denisof laughed so much the worse for you bogdanuitch is spiteful you will pay for your stubbornness said kirsten by god tis not stubbornness i cannot describe every feeling for you i assure you i cannot well do just as you please said the captain by the way where is this worthless scamp asked he of denisof he reported himself ill he's to be struck off the list in tomorrow's orders replied denisof well it's a kind of illness there's no other way of explaining it said the captain whether illness or not he'd better not come into my sight i'd kill him cried denisof in a most bloodthirsty manner at this instant zherkov came into the room what are you doing here demanded the officer turning to the newcomer an expedition gentlemen mac and his army have surrendered it's all up with them what a story i saw him myself what you saw mac alive with his hands and his feet an expedition an expedition 
give him a bottle for bringing such news but how came you here i am sent back to my regiment on account of that devil of a mac the austrian general complained of me i congratulated him on mac's arrival how are you rostof just out of a bath my dear boy we've been having such a stew here these two days the regimental adjutant came in and confirmed the news brought by zerkov the regiment was ordered to break camp the next day an expedition gentlemen well glory to god for that no more in action end of chapter five Part two, chapter six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Kutuzov was retreating toward Vienna, destroying the bridges behind him over the river Inn at Bernau, and over the river Tuan at Linz. On the fourth of November, the Russian army were crossing the river Enns. At noon, the baggage wagons, the artillery, and the columns of the army stretched through the city of Enns, on both sides of the river. It was a mild autumnal day, but showery. The wide prospect commanded by the height where stood the Russian batteries protecting the bridge was now suddenly veiled by a muslin-like curtain of slanting rain, then again was suddenly still further broadened so that distant objects stood out distinctly, gleaming in the sunlight as though they were varnished. At their feet lay the little city, with its white houses and red roofs, its cathedral and the bridge on both ends of which the russian troops could be seen pouring along in dense masses down the bend of the danube where it was joined by the waters of the ends could be seen boats and an island with a castle and park farther still was the left bank of the river with bold rocks and overgrown with evergreens while in the mysterious distance arose green mountains with deep ravines the turrets of a monastery stood out above the wild and apparently impenetrable pine forest, and far away, on a height in front, on the same side of the river ends, the enemy's scouts could be discerned. On the brow of the hill, among the field pieces, stood the general in command of the rear guard, with an officer of his suite making observations of the landscape with a glass. A little behind them, astride a gun carriage, sat Nesvitsky who had been sent to the rear-guard by the commander-in-chief. The Cossack who accompanied him was handing out a lunch-bag and flask, and Nesvitsky was inviting the officers to share his little pies and genuine dopokumel. The officers gaily crowded around him, some on their knees, some sitting Turkish fashion on the wet grass. Certainly that Austrian prince was no fool in building his castle there. Glorious place! You are not eating anything, gentlemen, said Nesvitsky. "'Thank you cordially, Prince,' returned one of the officers, glad of the chance to exchange a word with such an important member of Kutuzov's suite. "'Yes, it is a splendid place. We went by that very park, saw a couple of deer, and it's a magnificent house.' "'Look, Prince,' said another, who would very gladly have accepted another pie, but was ashamed to do so, and was, therefore, pretending to examine the landscape. "'Look yonder. Our infantry have got in already. Look there.' on that meadow, behind the village, three men are dragging something along. They'll clear out that little place quick enough, said he, with evident approval. Yes, that's so, said Nesvitsky. Ah, but I should like, he added, stuffing a pie into his handsome, moist mouth, I should like to get in yonder. He pointed to the turret convent, which could be seen on the mountainside. He smiled, and his eyes contracted and flashed. That would be some fun, gentlemen. The officers laughed. How I should like to frighten those little nuns. Italians, they say, and some of them young and pretty. Truly, I would give five years of my life. And they say they find it a bore, said an officer, bolder than the rest, with a laugh. Meantime, the officer of the suite, standing on the brow of the hill, was pointing out something to the general, who scrutinized it with his field-glass. Yes, that is so, that is so, said the general, gravely, taking the glass from his eye and shrugging his shoulders. You are right. They are going to fire at them as they cross the river. Why do they dawdle so? 
in that direction with even the naked eye could be seen the enemy and his battery from which arose a milk-white puff of smoke immediately followed by the distant report and it could be seen how the russian troops were hastening to get across the river nesvitsky dismounted from the cannon and with a smile went up to the general wouldn't your excellency like to have a bite of luncheon he asked it's all wrong said the general not answering him our men are so slow shall i not go down to them your excellency asked nesvitsky yes do go down please replied the general reiterating the orders that he had already given and tell the hussars to cross last and burn the bridge as i ordered and see to it that no combustible materials are left in it very good said nesvitsky he called the cossack to bring up the horses bade him pack up the bag and flask and lightly swung his heavy body into the saddle truly i am going to that nunnery said he to the officers who were looking at him with a smile and then galloped off down the path that skirted the hill now then try if you can reach them take good aim captain said the general turning to the officer you'll relieve the monotony by a little fun serve the guns commanded the officer and in a minute the gunners were running with a will from their bouviac fires and beginning to load number one rang the command number one rushed spitefully away with a deafening metallic ring the cannon resounded and the whizzing shell flew far away over the head of the russians in the valley and then a spurt of smoke showed where it had fallen and burst long before it reached the enemy the faces of the officers and men grew radiant at this report all leaped to their feet and watched with intense curiosity the motions of their troops in the valley below them and the approach of the enemy all spread out before them as on the palm of the hand at the moment the gun had been fired the sun came out entirely from under the clouds and the report of the cannon and the brilliancy of the sun mingled in one single martial and joyous impression end of chapter six part two chapter seven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne two of the enemy's shots had already been fired at the men as they crossed the river and on the bridge there was a jam halfway across stood prince nesvitsky who had dismounted from his horse and was leaning with his stout body against the parapet laughing he looked back at his cossack who stood a short distance behind him holding the bridles of their two horses as soon as prince nesvitsky tried to force his way forward the throng of soldiers and baggage wagons crowded him and forced him up against the parapet and nothing was left for him but to wait look out there my boy cried the cossack to a soldier who was driving a baggage wagon and forcing his way right into the infantry as they thronged under the horse's feet and among the wheels look out there have a little patience don't you see the general wants to pass but the driver paying no heed to the title of general only cried to the soldiers who blocked his way hey there boys keep to the left hold on but the boys crowding shoulder to shoulder and locking bayonets moved on across the bridge in one unbroken mass as nesvitsky looked down over the parapet he could see the swift babbling ripples of the ends chase each other along as they bubbled curled and foamed around the piers of the bridge looking at the bridge he saw almost incessant living waves of soldiery tassels shaycocks shakus with covers knapsacks bayonets and muskets and under the shakus faces with high cheekbones sunken cheeks and careless weary eyes and legs trampling through the mud which covered the planks of the bridge sometimes among the monotonous waves of the infantry like a spurt of white foam on the ripples of the river an officer in riding cloak would force his way through his face noticeable for its refinement in contrast to the men then again like a chip borne along on the river a hussar on foot an officer a denschik or a civilian would be carried across the bridge by the tide of troops and sometimes like a log floating down stream an officer's company or baggage wagon loaded to the top and covered with leather would roll across the bridge submerged in the throng see it's like a freshet breaking through the dike said the cossack hopelessly blocked say are there many more of you to come a million 
minus one, replied a jolly soldier in a torn overcoat, winking as he passed. In an instant he was carried by. Behind him came an old soldier. When he, he that is the enemy, takes to making it hot for us on the bridge, said the old soldier glumly, in his Tembuf dialect, addressing a comrade, we shan't stop to scratch ourselves. And the Tembuf soldier and his comrade passed beyond. Following them came a soldier riding a baggage wagon. Where in the devil did I put my leg wrappers? exclaimed Adenshik, hurrying behind the wagon and rummaging into the rear of it. And he, in turn, was borne past with the wagon. Behind them came a jovial band of soldiers who had evidently been drinking. My dear fellow, he hit him with the butt-end of his gun right in the teeth, gaily said one of the soldiers, who wore the collar of his overcoat turned up and was eagerly gesticulating. Good for him, a regular milksop, said the other with a loud laugh, and they too passed by. So that Nesvitsky did not find out who was struck in the teeth and to whom the epithet applied. Ugh, they're in such a hurry. Because he fired a blank cartridge, one would think they were all in danger of being killed, said a non-commissioned officer, in an angry, reproachful tone. When it flew by me, that round shot, said a young soldier with a monstrous mouth, I thought I was dead. Fact. I was that frightened, by God, added the soldier, scarcely restraining himself from laughing outright with pleasure at the thought of being so frightened. And he, too, passed on. Behind him came a vehicle unlike any that had passed so far. This was a German Forspann, loaded apparently with the effects of a whole household. Behind the cart, which was drawn by a pair of horses driven by a German, was a handsome brindled cow with an enormous udder. On a pile of feather beds sat a woman with a baby at the breast, an old granny, and a young, healthy-looking German girl, with flaming red cheeks. Evidently, these natives were availing themselves of the general permission to remove with all their permissions. The eyes of the soldiers were fixed upon the women, and as the cart moved forward at a slow pace, step by step, all sorts of remarks were directed at the two young women. Almost all the faces wore the peculiar smile suggested by unseemly thoughts concerning them. "'Look ye, that sausage there, she's moving too. "'Sell me the little woman,' cried another soldier to the German, who, with downcast eyes, walked with long strides, frightened and solemn. "'Eh, hey, ain't she gay? They're fine little devils.' "'There's a chance for you to make up to em, Fordidoff. "'Did you ever see anything like it, old fellow?' "'Where are you going?' asked an infantry officer, who, as he munched an apple, looked up at the pretty German girl with a half-smile. The German shut his eyes, signifying that he did not understand. "'If you'd like it, take it,' said the officer, giving the girl an apple. She took it and thanked him with a smile. Nesvitsky, like all the rest who were on the bridge, kept his eyes on the women till they vanished from sight. After they had passed beyond, came the same manner of soldiers with the same interchange of repartee, and then at length the train came to a halt. As often happens, the horses attached to some company's baggage wagon became entangled at the end of the bridge, and the whole line were obliged to halt. "'What are they waiting for? There's no order,' said the soldiers. "'Don't crowd. The devil! Why can't you have patience? It will be worse than this when he sets the bridge on fire. You're crushing that officer.' Such were the remarks made on all sides among the halting columns, as the men looked at each other and still kept trying to push forward toward the outlet. As Nesvitsky looked under the bridge at the water of the ends, he suddenly heard a sound that was new in his ears, of something swiftly approaching him, of something huge, and something that splashed into the water. "'Did you see where that flew to?' gravely asked a soldier who was standing near and trying to follow the sound. "'They are encouraging us to move a little faster.' said another uneasily. Again the throng began to move along. Nesvitsky realized that it had been a cannonball. He, Cossack, bring me my horse, he said. You there, make way. Get out of the way. Clear the road. By main force he managed to swing himself upon his horse. By shouting constantly he succeeded in forcing his way forward. The soldiers crowded together so as to let him pass, 
but immediately after pressed on his heels so that they squeezed his leg and those who were nearest could not help themselves because they were pushed on from behind nesvitsky nesvitsky is it you you old fwite cried a hoarse voice just behind him nesvitsky turned round and saw twenty paces away but separated from him by this living mass of hurrying infantry the handsome vaska denisov shaggy as ever with his cap on the back of his head and with his hussar's pelisse jauntily flung back over his shoulder tell these devils these fiends to give us womb cried denisov going into a paroxysm of rage his coal-black eyes with their bloodshot whites rolling and flashing while he brandished his unsheathed sabre in his bare little hand as red as his face he vasya replied nesvitsky delighted is that you can't get through the squad one cried vaska denisov angrily showing his shining teeth and spurring on his handsome coal-black bedouin which pricked back his ears at the touch of the bayonets and snorting and scattering around him the froth from his bit was pawing impatiently on the planks of the bridge apparently ready to leap over the parapet if only his rider gave the permission what does this mean like sheep just like sheep out of the way give us womb to pass hold on there you men driving that wagon dwat it i'll cut you into mincemeat he cried actually drawing his sabre and beginning to flourish it the soldiers with frightened faces crowded closer together and denisov managed to reach nesvitsky so you aren't drunk to-day said nesvitsky as denisov joined him they don't give us time to get dwunk replied baska the wegiment has been wunning this way and that way all day long if we're going to fight then let us fight but the devil knows what all this means how fine you are these days said nesvitsky glancing at his new police and housings denisov smiled took his scented handkerchief from his sabre tasha and held it to nesvitsky's nose can't help it i'm going into action perhaps and so i shaved brushed my teeth and perfumed myself nesvitsky's imposing figure with his cossack in attendance and denisov's determination as he flourished his sabre and shouted at the top of his voice enabled them to get to the farther end of the bridge and halt the infantry nesvitsky there found the colonel to whom he was obliged to deliver the message and having accomplished his errand he rode back after the way was cleared denisov reined up his horse at the exit of the bridge carelessly holding in his stallion that stood pawing with one hoof anxious to join his fellows he gazed at the squadrons that were moving in his direction the hoof-beats of the eager horses sounded hollow on the flooring of the bridge and the squadrons with the officers riding in advance hastened to cross the bridge four men abreast and began to pour off from the other end of the road the infantry which had halted in the mud and were packing together gazed at the neat jaunty hussars riding by in good order with that peculiar malevolent feeling of jealousy and scorn with which different branches of the service are apt to regard each other very tidy lads but only fit for the podnovinskoya what's the use of them they're merely for show said another you infantrymen don't kick up such a dust jestingly shouted a hussar whose horse playfully splattered the foot-soldier with mud if you'd been forced to march two stages with a knapsack your gold lace would be tarnished said the infantryman wiping the mud from his face with his sleeve you're not a man but a bird on that horse well now zekin if they should put you on a horse you'd have an easy time of it you'd make a graceful rider jestingly remarked the corporal aiming his jest at the lean little soldier who was bent almost double under the weight of his knapsack take a broomstick between your legs that would be a good enough horse for you retorted the hussar end of chapter seven part two chapter eight of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The rest of the infantry hurriedly marched across the bridge, though they were crowded in the tunnel-like passage at the end. At last all the baggage wagons had crossed, the crush became less, and the last battalion marched upon the bridge. Only the hussars of Denisov's command were left on the end of the bridge toward the enemy. The enemy, 
though plainly visible from the heights opposite, could not as yet be seen from the level of the bridge, since from the valley, through which flows the ends, the horizon is bounded by an eminence lying about half a verst distant. Directly in front was a plot of waste land, over which here and there moved bands of Cossack patrols. Suddenly, on the height opposite the road, appeared troops in blue capotes and accompanied by artillery. It was the French. The Cossack patrol came galloping down the road. All the officers and men of Denisov's squadron, although they tried hard to talk of different things and to look in other directions, nevertheless were unable to keep out of their thoughts what was there before them on the hill, and their eyes constantly turned to those patches which were moving against the horizon and which they knew were the troops of the enemy. It was now afternoon, and the weather had cleared. The sun was sinking brilliantly over the Danube and the forest-clad mountains that walled him in. There was no wind, and occasionally from the hilltop came the sound of bugles and the shouts of the enemy. Between the squadron and the enemy there was now no one except the Cossack patrols. The space between them was only a little more than two thousand feet. The enemy had ceased to fire, and all the more distinctly was felt that solemn, ominous gap, unapproachable and inexorable, that divides two hostile armies. One step beyond that line, which is like the bourne that divides the living from the dead, and there is the unknown of suffering and death. And what is there? Who is there? There, beyond that field, beyond that tree, and that roof glittering in the sun. No one knows, and no one wishes to know, and it is terrible to pass across that line, and I know that sooner or later I shall have to cross it, and shall then know what is on that side of the line, just as inevitably as I shall know what is on the other side of death. And yet I am strong, full of life, joy, and exuberant spirits, and surrounded by other men, just as full of health and exuberant spirits. Thus every man feels, even if he does not formulate it in his thought, when he comes in sight of the enemy, and this feeling lends a peculiar vividness and distinctness of impression to everything that occurs at such moments. On the hill where the enemy were arose a puff of smoke, and a cannonball, whistling, flew over the heads of the squadron of hussars. The officers, who had been standing together, scattered to their posts. The hussars began to get their horses into regular line. No one spoke in the ranks. All looked intently at the enemy and at the commander, and awaited the word of command. A second, a third shot flew over them. Evidently, the enemy were firing at the hussars, but the cannonballs, whistling as they flew swiftly by, went far over their heads and fell somewhere in the rear. The hussars did not look up, but each time that they heard the whiz of the ball, the whole squadron, as though by orders, holding their breath until the cannon shot had passed over, with their monotonously diverse faces, raised themselves in their stirrups, and then settled back again. The soldiers, not turning their heads, looked at each other out of the corners of their eyes, each curious to know what impression was produced upon his neighbor. Every face, from Denisov's to the trumpeters, showed, around the lips and chin, a line denoting internal struggle, excitement, and agitation. The quartermaster frowned, and looked at the men as though he meditated inflicting punishment upon them. The Junker, Miranov, ducked his head each time that the ball flew over. Rostov, posted on the left flank, on his prancing Gritchik, had the delighted look of a schoolboy called out before a great audience to pass his examination, in which he believes that he is going to distinguish himself. He looked at every one with a face unclouded and bright, as though asking them to bear him witness that he was perfectly calm under fire. But even in his face, the same line, indicative of something new and solemn, showed itself around his mouth, against his will. "'Who's that making a bow there? You grew me, Wonoff. You?' "'It isn't white. Look at me,' cried Denisov, who could not keep still, but kept riding up and down in front of the squadron." Vaska Denisov, with his flat nose and black hair, his little bent figure, his sinewy hand with short, hairy fingers, grasping the hilt of his drawn sword, was just the same as usual. 
or rather, just the same as he was apt to be in the evening, after he had been drinking a couple of bottles. Only he was a trifle ruddier than ordinary, and, carrying his head very high, like a bird when it is drinking, he pitilessly plunged the spurs into the flanks of his good Bedouin, and galloped back to the other flank of the squadron, and cried out in a hoarse voice his orders that they should examine their pistols. Then he rode off toward Kirsten, the second captain, who came up to meet Denisov, walking his broad and steady-going mare. The captain, with his long moustaches, was as grave as usual, but his eyes flashed with unwonted brilliancy. "'Well, how is it?' said he to Denisov. "'It won't come to a fight. You'll see. We shall be ordered back.' "'The deuce only knows what they'll do,' replied Denisov. "'Ah! Wustov!' he cried to the yonker, noticing his radiant face. "'Well, now's your chance,' and he smiled approvingly, evidently feeling proud of the yonker. Rostov felt perfectly happy. At this moment a high officer appeared on the bridge. Denisov spurred off to meet him. "'Your Excellency, let us attack em. I will drive em back.' "'Attack them!' cried the officer, showing his annoyance in his voice, and frowning as though at a persistent fly. "'And why are you delaying here? Don't you see the flankers are withdrawing? Order your squadron back.' The squadron crossed the bridge and retired beyond the reach of shots, not having lost a single man. Behind them came a second squadron which had been forming the rear guard, and last of all, the Cossacks crossed to the farther side. The two squadrons of the Pavlograd regiment, crossing the bridge one after another, galloped up the road. The regimental commander, Karl Bogdanovich Schubert, overtook Denisov's squadron and walked his horse along, not far from Rostov, but without giving him the slightest notice, although it was the first time that they had met since their quarrel about Telyagin. Rostov, who, now that he was in line, realized that he was in the power of the man toward whom he felt guilty, did not take his eyes from the colonel's athletic back, the light hair at the back of his head, and his red neck. Sometimes it seemed to Rostov that Bogdanuitch was merely pretending not to notice him, and that his whole aim now was to try the yunker's courage and he straightened himself up and looked around him gaily. Then, again, it seemed to him that Bogdanuitch rode close to him to display his own courage. Now it occurred to him that his opponent was going to send the squadron into some forlorn hope in order to punish him. And then again it occurred to him that after the affray he would come to him and magnanimously extend to him the hand of reconciliation in honor of the wound which he should receive. The high-shouldered Zerkov, well known to the Pavlograd boys, having not long since been in their regiment, came riding up to the regimental commander. Zerkov, after his dismissal from the general staff, had not remained in the regiment, saying that he was not such a fool as to put on the tugging collar in the ranks, when, by serving on the staff and having nothing to do, he could gain greater rewards, and so he had succeeded in getting himself appointed a special orderly to Prince Bagration. He now came to his former chief with a message from the commander of the rearguard. Colonel, said he, with his most melancholy assumption of gravity, turning to Rostov's opponent, and glancing at his comrades, you are ordered to halt and burn the bridge. Who orders it? asked the colonel testily. Well, I don't know, colonel, who orders it, replied the cornet gravely, but the prince said to me, Go and tell the colonel that the hussars are to return as quickly as possible and burn the bridge. Immediately after Zerkov, an officer of the suite rode up to the colonel of the hussars with the same order, and immediately after the officer of the suite came the stout Nesvitsky galloping up with all his might on his Cossack's horse, which could hardly carry him. How is it, colonel? he cried, while still at a distance. I told you to burn the bridge, but now someone has mistaken the order. Everybody here has lost his wits, and there's nothing done right. The colonel took his time in halting the regiment, and turned to Nesvitsky. You told me to burn up the combustibles, said he, but as to burning that, you did not say a word. What's that, Batyushka? exclaimed Nesvitsky, reining in his horse, taking off his cap, and with his fat hand brushing back his hair, dripping with perspiration. How's that? "'Didn't I say that the bridge was to be burned "'when you burned all the combustibles?' 
I won't be called Batyushka by you, Mr. Staff Officer, and you did not tell me to burn the bridge. I know my duties, and I am accustomed faithfully to carry out what I am commanded to do. You said the bridge was to be burned, but who was to do it, the Holy Ghost could not tell me. Well, that's always the way, cried Nesvitsky, with a wave of the hand. What are you doing here? he asked, turning to Zerkov. Exactly the same thing as you are. But how wet you are! Let me wring you out. You said, Mr. Staff Officer, proceeded the Colonel in an offended tone. Colonel, interrupted the officer from the suite, you must make haste, or else the enemy will be pouring grape shot into us. The Colonel silently looked at the officer from the suite, at stout Prince Nesvitsky, and at Zerkov, and frowned. I will burn the bridge, he said in a solemn voice, as though to express by it that in spite of all the disagreeable things that happened to him, he was always prepared to do his duty. Spurring his horse with his long, muscular legs, as though the animal were to blame for everything, the colonel started forward and ordered the second squadron, in which Rostov served, to return, under the command of Denisov, and burn the bridge. Well, that's the way it is, said Rostov to himself. He wants to try me. His heart beat and the blood rushed to his face. Let him see if I am a coward, he thought. Once more, over all the happy faces of the men in the squadron, appeared that same serious line which they had worn at the time they were under fire. Rostov, not taking his eyes from his opponent, the regimental commander, tried to discover in his face a confirmation of his suspicions. But the colonel did not look at Rostov but as usual gazed sternly and solemnly along the line. The word of command was heard. "'Lively! Lively!' cried voices around him. With their sabres catching in the reins, with rattling spurs, the hussars dismounted in all haste, not knowing what they were to do. They crossed themselves. Rostov now looked no more at the colonel. He had no time. He was afraid, afraid with a real sinking of the heart, that he should be left behind. His hand trembled as he turned his horse over to the groom, and he felt how the blood was rushing back to his heart. Denisov, on his way back, shouted something to him as he passed. Rostov saw nothing except the hussars running by his side, impeded by their spurs and with rattling sabres. "'The stretchers!' cried some voice behind him, but Rostov did not stop to think what that demand for stretchers meant. He ran on, striving only to be in advance of the others, but at the bridge he failed to look where he was going, and slipping in the slimy, sheeted mud, stumbled and fell upon his hands. The others dashed ahead of him. "'At both sides, Captain,' shouted the colonel, who, having ridden ahead, had reined his horse not far from the bridge, and sat looking on with a triumphant and radiant expression. Rostov, wiping his soiled hands on his riding trousers, glanced at his opponent and determined to go on, thinking that the further forward he went, the better it would be. But Bogdanuitch, without looking at him, or even noticing that it was Rostov, cried to him, "'Who is that in the middle of the bridge? Take the right side. Younger, come back!' he shouted testily, and then turned to Denisov, who, making a show of his foolhardiness, was riding upon the bridge. "'Why run such risks, Captain? You better dismount!' cried the Captain. "'Ha! He always finds someone in fault,' replied Vaska Denisov turning in his saddle. Meantime, Nesvitsky, Zerkov, and the staff officer stood in a little group, out of range, and watched the now little band of hussars in yellow shakos, dark green turnabouts, embroidered with gold lace and blue trousers, who were swarming over the bridge, and now, in the other direction, looked at the blue capotes marching down from the distant hill, and the groups with horses, which could easily be recognized as field pieces. Will they get the bridge burnt or not? Who is ahead? Will they have time to set the bridge on fire before the French turn grape on them and drive them back? Such questions as these, every man in the great band of soldiers that were stationed near the bridge involuntarily asked himself as he looked at that bright afternoon, at the bridge, and at the hussars, and then again, on the other side, at the blue coats approaching with bayonets and field pieces. Ooh, the hussars will catch it! exclaimed Nesvitsky. They're within range of grape now. It was useless to send so many men, said the staff officer. That's a fact, returned Nesvitsky. If he'd only sent two smart young fellows, it would have been just as well. Ugh, 
your illustriousness remarked zherkov not taking his eyes from the hussars but still speaking in his own peculiar fashion which left it in doubt whether he was serious or in earnest ach your illustriousness how can you think so the idea of sending two men how then would we get the vladimir and the ribbon supposing they do have a little thrashing then there'll be a chance for the colonel to report the squadron and get a ribbon for himself our bogdanuitch knows a thing or two now there said the staff officer that means grape he pointed at the french field pieces which they were unlimbering and bringing into range in the direction of the french from the groups which had been recognized as the artillery they saw a puff of smoke arise then a second a third almost simultaneously and by the time the report of the first had reached their ears a fourth puff arose two reports one after another and then a third oh ugh groaned nesvitsky as though from excruciating agony and seizing the staff officer's arm look one fell fell one fell two i should think if i were tsar there should be no more war said nesvitsky turning away the french guns were again quickly loaded the infantry in the blue capotes came dashing at double quick toward the bridge again at different distances puffs of smoke appeared and the grape pattered and rattled on the bridge but this time nesvitsky could not see what took place on it a thick smoke poured up from it the hussars had succeeded in setting fire to it and the french field pieces were fired at it not indeed to prevent it but because they were loaded and there was nothing else to shoot at the french had succeeded in sending three charges of grape before the hussars returned to their grooms two of the volleys had been wildly aimed and the grape had gone afield but the last discharge struck in the middle of the group and hit three hussars rostof preoccupied by his relations with bogdanuitch remained on the bridge not knowing what he had to do there was no one to cut down he had always imagined a battle to consist of cutting down and he could not help set fire to the bridge either because he had not provided himself with wisps of straw as the others had he was standing there and looking on when suddenly there was a rattling on the bridge as though someone had been scattering hazelnuts and one of the hussars who happened to be nearest to him fell against the parapet with a groan rostov and several others ran to him again there was a cry for stretchers four men grasped the wounded hussar and started to bear him away oh let me alone for christ's sake shrieked the wounded man but nevertheless they took him and bore him off nikolai rostov turned away and as though he were searching for something began to gaze into the distance at the water of the danube at the sky at the sun how beautiful the sky seemed how blue how calm how profound how bright and magnificent the sinking sun how carelessly brilliant the waters of the distant danube gleamed and still more lovely were the far purpling mountains beyond the danube the monastery the mysterious defiles the pine forests veiled to the top in a transparent mist there it was full of peace and happiness i should wish for nothing wish for nothing for nothing in the world if only i were there thought rostof how much happiness i might have there in this sunshine while here groans suffering terror and confusion and hurry there again someone shrieks and here we are all running for our lives and i am running with the rest and here it is here is death all above me and around me a moment and perhaps never again shall i see the sun this river those defiles at that instant the sun went into a cloud rostof saw several stretchers being carried before him and the terror of death and of the stretchers and love for the sun and for life all mingled in one painfully disturbing impression o oh lord god thou who art there in yonder heaven save pardon and defend me whispered rostof in his heart the hussars hastened back to their grooms their voices grew louder and more confident the stretchers were now out of their sight well brother so you smelt powder rang vaska denisov's voice in his ear it's all over but i am a coward yes i am a coward thought rostov and with a heavy sigh he took the bridle from the hands of his groom and mounted his grechik which was waiting for him what was that 
Grapeshot? asked he of Denisov. That's just what it was, shouted Denisov. We worked like heroes, and it was waskily work. A charge is wear sport, and you hewn down the dogs. But here, the devil only knows what it is. They shoot at you as though you were a target. And Denisov rode off and joined the colonel, Nesvitsky, Zerkov, and the staff officers, who were talking together a short distance from Rostov. One thing's evident, no one noticed it, thought Rostov. And in truth no one had noticed it, because each and every one shared in the sensation which the Junker experienced at being under fire for the first time. "'We shall have a splendid report sent,' Zerkov was saying. "'Do you know they may give me a lieutenancy?' "'Inform the prince that I burned the bridge,' said the colonel, with a gay and triumphant expression. "'But suppose it is asked about our loss?' "'A mere trifle,' said the colonel, in his deepest tones. Two hussars wounded, and one finished,' said he, with apparent joy, and scarcely refraining from a contented smile, as he brought out with ringing emphasis the happy phrase, "'Finished.'" End of chapter 8part two chapter nine of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne the russian army of thirty five thousand men under command of kutuzov pursued by the french a hundred thousand strong under bonaparte himself meeting with unfriendly disposed natives no longer having confidence in their allies suffering from a lack of provisions and obliged to act in a manner opposite to all preconceived conditions of war, was in a hasty retreat down the Danube, halting when the enemy overtook them, and fighting them off by skirmishes at the rear guard, but fighting no more than was necessary to ensure their retreat without losing any of their baggage. Actions had taken place at Lambach, at Amstetten, at Melk, but, notwithstanding the bravery and fortitude displayed by the Russians, as even their enemy acknowledged, these actions did not prevent their movements from being a retreat, conducted with all possible celerity. The Austrians, who had escaped from the surrender at Ulm, and had joined Kutuzov at Brnau, had now separated from the Russians, and Kutuzov was left with only his weakened, famished forces. It was impossible any longer to think of defending Vienna. In place of the offensive warfare, so craftily elaborated in accordance with the laws of the new science of strategy, the plan of which had been communicated to Kutuzov by the Hofskriegsrath while he was in Vienna, the only thing that was left him now, unless he were to sacrifice his army, as Mack had done at Ulm, was to effect a juncture with the troops on their way from Russia, and even this was almost an impossibility. On the ninth of November, Kutuzov and his army crossed to the left bank of the Danube, and, for the first time, halted, having now put the river between himself and the main body of the French. On the 11th, he attacked and defeated the division under Mortier, which was stationed on the left bank of the Danube. In this engagement, for the first time, some trophies were captured, a stand of colors, cannon, and two of the enemy's generals. For the first time, after a fortnight's retreat, the Russian army halted, and at the end of the battle not only held the field of battle, but had driven off the French. Although the army was exhausted and in rags, and reduced a third by the killed, wounded, sick, and stragglers. Although the sick and wounded had been left on the other side of the Danube, with a letter from Kutuzov commending them to the magnanimity of the enemy, although the regular hospitals, and the houses of Krems which had been turned into lazarettos, were unable to receive all the sick and wounded remaining, still, in spite of all this, the halt at Krems, and the victory over Mortier, signally raised the spirits of the army. The most gratifying but improbable reports were in circulation throughout the troops, and even at headquarters, concerning imaginary reinforcements from Russia being at hand, concerning some great victory won by the Austrians, and the retreat and panic of Bonaparte. During the battle, Prince André had been near the Austrian general, Schmidt, when he was killed. His own horse had been wounded under him, and he himself had been slightly grazed by a bullet on the hand. As a sign of special favor from the commander-in-chief, he was sent to carry the news of this victory to the Austrian court, which had left Vienna, now threatened by the French, and was established at Brunn. 
on the evening of the victory prince andrei excited but not weary for in spite of his apparently delicate constitution he could endure physical fatigue far better than much stronger men having brought dokhturov's report to kutuzov was dispatched that same evening as a special courier to brunn such an errand ensured the courier not only a decoration but pointed infallibly to promotion the night was dark but starry the road made a black line across the snow which had been falling during the engagement now recalling the impressions of the battle through which he had passed now joyfully imagining the impression which he should cause by the news of the victory recollecting the parting words of the commander-in-chief and his comrades prince andrei drove on at a furious pace in his post-carriage experiencing the feelings of a man who had long waited and at last is about to attain his wished-for joy as soon as he closed his eyes his ears were filled with the roar of musketry and cannon mingled with the rumble of the wheels and the details of victory now it seemed to him that the russians were flying and that he himself was killed but he would awake with a start feeling a strange delight at the realization that nothing of the sort had taken place and that on the contrary it was the french who had been defeated then again he would recall all the details of the victory his own serene manliness during the engagement and his recollections would lull him to sleep again the dark starry night was followed by a bright joyous day the snow gleamed in the sunshine and the horses sped swiftly along and in monotonous variety on both sides flew by new woods fields and villages at one of the post-houses he overtook a train of russian wounded a russian officer in charge of the convoy was stretched out in the foremost cart and shouting at the top of his voice and scolding the soldiers in coarse language the long german forspuns each containing six or more wounded pale and bandaged and dirty jolted heavily along over the rough paved road some of them were talking prince andrei overheard their russian speech others were munching bread while those who were most seriously hurt gazed with the good-natured and childish curiosity of sickness at the courier hurrying by them prince andrei ordered the driver to stop and asked one of the soldiers where they had been wounded day before yesterday on the danube replied the soldier prince andrei took out his purse and gave the soldier three gold pieces for them all he added turning to the officer in command get well as fast as you can boys said he to the soldiers there's still much to be done well mr adjutant what's the news asked the old officer evidently taking a fancy to have a talk good news forward he cried to his driver and he was borne swiftly on it was already quite dark when prince andrei reached brunn and found himself surrounded by lofty houses lighted shops and street lamps handsome carriages rumbling over the wooden pavements and by all that atmosphere of a large lively city which is always so fascinating to a soldier after camp life prince andrei notwithstanding the swiftness of his journey and his sleepless night felt as he drove up to the palace even more excited than he had the evening before his eyes gleamed with a feverish light and his thoughts rushed through his mind with extraordinary rapidity and clearness vividly all the details of the battle came into his mind not with any confusion but in due sequence word for word as he imagined he should render his account to the emperor franz vividly he imagined the circumstantial questions which might be asked him and the answers which he should make to them he supposed that he should be immediately summoned before the emperor but at the principal entrance of the palace he was met by an official who discovering that he was only a courier sent him round to another entrance take the corridor at the right or your hoch geboren there you will find the flugel adjutant who is on duty said the official he will take you to the minister of war the flugel adjutant coming to meet prince andrei asked him to wait while he went to the minister in five minutes he returned and bowing with unusual deference and allowing prince andrei to pass in front of him directed him through a corridor into a private office occupied by the minister of war the flugel adjutant by his extravagant politeness seemed to be trying to defend himself from any attempt at familiarity on the part of the russian courier prince andrei's exultant feeling was decidedly cooled down the moment he entered the door into the minister's private office he felt humiliated and this feeling of wounded pride changed instantly but imperceptibly into a feeling of contempt which had no reasonable cause 
his fertile mind at the same moment began to search for a point of view according to which he might be justified in scorning both the fugal adjutant and the minister of war it is probably very easy for them to show how to gain victories though they have never smelt gunpowder he said to himself his eyes contracted contemptuously he walked into the war minister's private office with all the deliberation in the world this feeling was still further intensified when he caught sight of that dignitary sitting between two candles at a great table and not deigning to give his visitor even a glance for the first two minutes the war minister's bald head with its fringe of gray hair was bent over some papers which he was reading and marking with a lead pencil he finished reading them not even lifting his head when the door opened to admit his visitor though he must have heard the steps take this and deliver it at once said the minister of war to his secretary handing him some papers and not even yet recognizing the existence of the courier prince andrei came to the conclusion that out of all the affairs that preoccupied the minister of war the feats of kutuzov's army either interested him the least or else he felt obliged to give this impression to the russian courier well it is all the same to me he said to himself the minister of war assorted the rest of his papers placing them in regular order and then at last lifted his head he had an intelligent and determined face but at the instant that he turned to prince andrei this intelligent and firm expression seemed to change as if by purpose and consciously and in its place came a dull hypocritical smile in which there was no pretense even of hiding its hypocrisy the habitual smile of a man accustomed to receiving many petitions one after the other from general field marshal kutuzov he asked i hope it is good news so he has had an encounter with mortier a victory it was time he took the dispatch which was directed to him and began to read it with a melancholy expression ach mein gott mein gott schmidt said he in german what a misfortune what a misfortune having run through the paper he laid it on the table and glanced at prince andrei evidently weighing something in his mind ach what a misfortune that affair you say was decisive but mortier was not taken he pondered i am very glad that you have brought me this good news although the death of schmidt is a costly price to pay for the victory his majesty will probably desire to see you but not this evening i thank you go and get rested to-morrow be at the levee after the parade however i will give you due notice the dull smile which had disappeared during the conversation again appeared on the war minister's face Goodbye, bye Auf Wiedersehen. I thank you very much. His Majesty the Emperor will no doubt wish to see you, he repeated, and inclined his head. When Prince Andrei had left the palace, he felt that all the interest and happiness which the victory had brought him had deserted him and been left behind in the indifferent hands of the war minister and of the polite flugel adjutant. The whole course of his thoughts had instantly changed. The battle seemed to him like the recollection of something that happened long before. End of chapter 9。Part 2 Chapter 10 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Prince Andre put up at Brune, at the residence of his friend, the diplomat Bilibin. Ah, my dear prince, no one could be more welcome, said Bilibin, coming down to greet him. Franz, take the prince's luggage into my sleeping room, he added, turning to the valet who had admitted the visitor. So you're bringing news of a victory. Excellent. But I'm under the weather, as you can see. Prince Andre, having washed and changed his dress, joined the diplomat in his luxurious study and sat down to the dinner which had been prepared for him. Bilibin drew up comfortably before the fire. After his hurried journey, and indeed after this whole campaign, during which he had been deprived of all the comforts and elegancies of life, Prince Andrei experienced a pleasant feeling of repose amid these luxurious conditions of existence, to which he had been accustomed since childhood. Moreover, it was pleasant after his reception by the Austrians to talk, not indeed in russian for they spoke in french but with a russian who as he supposed shared the general russian aversion 
now felt with especial keenness, for the Austrians. Bilibin was a man of thirty-five, unmarried, and belonging to the same set as Prince André. They had been acquaintances long before Petersburg, and had become more intimate during Prince André's last visit to Vienna, in company with Kutuzov. Just as Prince André was a young man who promised to make a brilliant career in the military profession, so Bilibin, with even greater probability, was on the road to success in diplomacy. He was still a young man, but he was not a young diplomat, since he had begun his career at the age of sixteen, had been in Paris and in Copenhagen, and now held a very responsible post in Vienna. Both the Chancellor and the Russian ambassador at the court of Vienna knew him and prized him highly. He was not one of those diplomats who are considered to be very good, because they have merely negative qualities, do nothing but their perfunctory duties, and are able to speak French. He was rather one of those who work con amour, and with intelligence. Notwithstanding his natural indolence, he sometimes spent the whole night at his writing-table. He put in good work, no matter what the nature of the work in hand. It was the question, how, not the question, why, that interested him. It was a matter of indifference to him what the diplomatic business was about, but he took the greatest satisfaction in artistically, accurately, and elegantly composing circulars, memorials, or reports. Bilibin's services were prized, not only because of his skill in inditing letters, but still more because of his faculty for shining in society and carrying on conversation in the highest spheres. Bilibin liked to talk just as he liked to work, but it was essential that the topic should let him display his delicately polished wit. In society he was constantly on the watch for a chance to say something remarkable, and he never mingled in conversation except under such conditions. His talk was plentifully begemmed with keen and polished phrases, original with himself, and yet having an interest for all. These phrases were prepared in Bilibin's internal laboratory, as a sort of portable property, which even the dullest members of society might easily remember and carry from party to party. And, in fact, Bilibin's witticisms made the rounds of Viennese drawing-rooms. Les mots de Bilibin, c'est copotent dans les salons de Vienne, and had often had an effect on so-called important events. His thin, weary-looking, sallow face was covered with deep wrinkles, which always seemed clean and parboiled, like the ends of the fingers after a bath. The motions of these wrinkles constituted the principal play of his physiognomy. Now, it was his forehead that was furrowed with broad lines, and his eyebrows were lifted high, again his brows were contracted and deep lines marked his cheeks, his deep-set little eyes looked always frank and cheerful. "'Now, then, tell us your exploits,' said he. Bolkonsky, in the most modest manner, without once referencing to himself, told him of the combat and of the minister's behaviour. "'They received me and the news that I brought, like a dog in the game of ninepins,' said he, in conclusion. Bilibin smiled, and the wrinkles in his face relaxed. "'However, mon cher,' said he, in spite of the high esteem which I profess for the orthodox Russian army, I confess that your victory is not one of the most victorious. Thus he went on, and all the time speaking in French, and introducing Russian words only when he wished to give them a scornful emphasis. It was this way, wasn't it? You fell with all your overwhelming numbers upon that unhappy Montier, and yet Montier slipped between your hands. Where was the victory in that? Well, speaking seriously replied prince andre we can at least say without boasting that it was rather better than olm why didn't you take one at least one marshal prisoner because things aren't always done as they are forecast nor can they be arranged with all the regularity of a parade we expected as i told you to turn their flank at seven o'clock in the morning and we did not succeed till five in the evening why didn't you succeed by seven in the morning you ought to have outflanked them by seven in the morning, said Bilibin, smiling. You ought to have done it at seven in the morning. Why didn't you suggest to Bonaparte, through diplomatic agency, that he'd better abandon Genoa? asked Prince André in the same tone. I know, interrupted Bilibin. 
as you sit on your sofa before the fire you think that it is very easy to capture marshals it is indeed but why didn't you capture him and don't be surprised that neither the minister of war nor his most august majesty my emperor nor king franz is very grateful for your victory and i myself the unfortunate secretary of the russian legation feel no special impulse to express my delight by giving my franz a tailor and letting him take his liebchen for a walk on the prater to be sure there's no prater here he looked straight at prince andrei and suddenly smoothed out the wrinkled skin upon his forehead now my dear it is my turn to ask you why said Belkonsky. i assure you i cannot understand perhaps there are diplomatic subtleties here that are above my feeble mind but i cannot understand mac has destroyed a whole army the archduke ferdinand and the archduke karl are giving no signs of life and are making one blunder after another finally kutuzov alone really gains a victory destroys the spell of the french la chambre de Francais, and the minister of war isn't interested enough to inquire after the details that is the very reason my dear voyez-vous mon cher hurrah for the czar for russia the faith tout c'est bel et bon all that's very well and good but what do we i mean the austrian court care for your victories only bring them your fine news about a victory won by the archduke karl or ferdinand un archiduc voulotre one is as good as another as you well know a victory even though it were only over a squad of bonaparte's firemen and that would be another thing we should proclaim it with the thunder of cannon but this as a matter of course can only vex us the archduke karl is nothing the archduke ferdinand covers himself with disgrace you desert vienna you no longer defend it as though you said god is with us may god be with you and your capital one general whom we all loved schmidt you allowed to be killed by a bullet and you congratulate us on the victory confess that nothing could be imagined more exasperating than this news which you bring c'est comme un fait exprès comme un fait exprès moreover even if you had won the most brilliant victory even if the archduke karl should what change would that make in the course of events it's too late now for vienna has been occupied by the french army what occupied vienna occupied not only occupied but bonaparte is at schonbrunn and the count our dear friend count verbna has gone there to him for orders volkonsky after his fatigue and the impressions of his journey and his reception and especially since his dinner felt that he did not grasp the full meaning of the words which he heard this morning count lichtenfels was here continued bilibin and showed me a letter containing a circumstantial account of the parade of the french in vienna les princes mouraient et tous les tremblements you can see that your victory is not such an immense delight and you can hardly be regarded as our saviors truly as far as i am concerned it is a matter of indifference absolute indifference said prince andrei beginning to comprehend that his tidings about the engagement at krems was of really little importance compared with such an event as the occupation of the austrian capital how came vienna to be occupied how about the bridge and that famous tete de pont and prince Ausberg? it was reported among us that prince Ausberg was defending vienna said he prince Ausberg is on this side on our side of the danube and will defend us defend us very wretchedly i think but still he will defend us and vienna is on the other side no the bridge is not taken yet and i hope it will not be it has been mined and the order is to blow it up if it were not for that we should have been long ago in the mountains of bohemia and you and your army would have spent a wretched quarter of an hour between two fires but still this does not mean that the campaign is at an end does it asked prince andre well it's my impression that it is and so think the bigwigs here but they dare not say so what i said at the beginning of the campaign will come true that your skirmish near durtstein will not settle the affair nor gunpowder in any case but those who invented it said bilibin repeating one of his malts while he puckered his forehead and paused a moment 
the question simply depends on this what is to be the outcome of the berlin meeting of the emperor with the prussian king if prussia joins the alliance on force a la main l'autriche austria's hand is forced and there will be war but if not then all they have to do is arrange for the preliminaries of a second campo formio but what an extraordinary genius suddenly cried prince andrei doubling his small fist and pounding the table with it and what luck that man has who bonaparte queried bilibin knitting his brow and thereby signifying that he was going to get off a witticism bonaparte he repeated laying a special emphasis on the u i certainly think that now when he is laying down the laws for austria from schoenburn he must be spared that u il faut lui faire grosse de lui i am firmly resolved to make the innovation and i shall call him bonaparte tout court no but joking aside said prince andrei is it possible that you think the campaign is finished this is what i think austria has been made a fool of and she is not used to that and she will take her revenge and she has been made a fool of because in the first place her provinces have been pillaged it is said the orthodox est terrible pour le pillage her army is beaten her capital is taken and all this pour les bourgeois of the king of sardinia and in the second place entre nous mon cher i suspect that we are being duped i suspect dealings with france and a project of peace a secret peace separately concluded that cannot be said prince andrei that would be too base qui vivra verrai you will see said bilibin scowling this time in a way that signified that the conversation was at an end when prince andrei went to the chamber that had been prepared for him and stretched himself between clean sheets on a soft down mattress and on warm perfumed pillows he began to feel that the battle the report of which he had brought was far far away the prussian alliance the treachery of austria bonaparte's new triumph the parade and levy and his reception by emperor franz the next day filled his mind he closed his eyes but instantly his ears were deafened by the cannonading the musketry the rumble of the carriage wheels and now once more the musketeers came marching in scattered lines down the hillside and the frenchmen were firing and he felt how his heart thrilled and he galloped on ahead with schmidt at his side and the bullets whistled merrily around him and he experienced such a feeling of intensified delight in life as he had not felt since childhood he awoke with a start yes it was all so said he smiling to himself a happy childlike smile and he fell asleep with the sound sleep of youth end of chapter ten part two chapter eleven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle the slipper box recording is in the public domain recording by marianne he awoke the next morning late recalling the impressions of the previous day he remembered first of all that he was to be presented that day to the emperor franz he remembered the minister of war the officiously polite flugel adjutant bilibin and the conversation of the evening before putting on his full dress uniform which he had not worn for a long time to go to court he went down to bilibin's study with his hand bandaged but fresh full of spirits and handsome four young gentlemen connected with the diplomatic corps were gathered in the study bolkonsky was already acquainted with prince ippolit kuragin one of the secretaries of the legation bilibin introduced him to the others the gentlemen at bilibin's were gay rich young men of fashion who formed both in vienna and here in brun an exclusive circle which bilibin the leader of it called ours les notes this coterie composed almost exclusively of diplomats were occupied with the doings of society their relations to certain women and their duties as secretaries so that the interests of war and diplomacy were a sealed book to them the gentlemen apparently took prince andrei and adopted him as one of themselves an honor which they did not confer upon every one from politeness and as a topic for beginning conversation they asked him a few questions about the army and the battle 
and then conversation quickly drifted into inconsequential but jovial sallies of wit and gossip but this is specially good said one relating the misfortunes of a colleague especially good when the chancellor himself told him to his face that his transfer to london was a promotion and that he was to so regard it can you imagine his looks at hearing that but what is worse than all gentlemen i must expose kurrigan a man is in trouble and this don juan this terrible man must needs take advantage of it prince ippolit was stretched out in a voltaire chair with his legs thrown over the arm he laughed parlez moi de ça tell me about it he said oh you don juan oh you snake said various voices you don't know belkonsky said bilibin turning to prince andrei that all the atrocities committed by the french army i almost said the russian army are nothing in comparison with what this man has been doing among the ladies la femme est la campagne de l'homme woman is man's helpmeet said prince ippolit sententiously and he began to stare through his lorgnette at his elevated feet bilibin and our fellows roared as they looked at prince ippolit prince andrei saw that this young man of whom it must be confessed he had almost been jealous was the butt for this circle i must give you a little sport with kurigan whispered bilibin to bolkonsky it's rich to hear him talk about politics you must see what an important air he assumes he took a seat near ippolit and wrinkling his brows portentously began to draw him into conversation on political affairs prince andrei and the others gathered around the two the cabinet cannot express any thought of alliance began ippolit letting his eyes wander significantly from one to the other without expressing as in its last note vous comprenez vous comprenez and then if his majesty the emperor does not go back on his principles our alliance attendez i have not finished said he to prince andrei seizing him by the arm i suppose that intervention will be stronger than non-intervention and he was silent for a moment the non-receipt of our dispatch of the twenty-eighth of november cannot be charged as intentional that will be the end of it and he let go of bolkonsky's arm signifying that now he was entirely done demosthenes i recognize thee by the pebble which thou hast concealed in this golden mouth said bilibin his cap of hair moving on his head with satisfaction all laughed ippolit laughed louder than the rest he was evidently not at his ease and could not get his breath but he was unable to refrain from the forced laugh that distorted his usually impassive face now then gentlemen said bilibin bolkonsky is a guest at my house here in brune and i am anxious to treat him well and give him a taste of all our pleasures here so far as possible if we were in vienna this would be easy but here in this beastly moravian hole civilian true moras it will be harder and i beg you all to lend me your aid il faut lui faire les honneurs de brune you undertake the theatres i will introduce him to society you ippolit of course the ladies i must show him amelie she's a beauty said one of the circle kissing the ends of his fingers all in all this bloodthirsty soldier said bilibin must be brought to more humane views it is doubtful if i can profit by your hospitality gentlemen for it is now time for me to go out said bolkonsky looking at his watch where to the emperor oh 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 well au revoir bolkonsky good-bye prince come back to dinner with us as early as you can shouted several voices we will look for you try to say as much as you can in praise of the commissariat and the roads when you speak to the emperor said bilibin as he accompanied bolkonsky into the entry i wish i could say flattering things but i cannot said bolkonsky with a smile well then do just as much of the talking as you can his passion is for audiences but he does not like to talk and he does not know how as you will see for yourself End of chapter eleven
Part two, chapter twelve of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At the levee, Prince Andre, who stood in the place appointed among the Austrian officers, merely received a long fixed stare from the Emperor Franz, and a slight inclination of his long head. But after the levee, the flugel adjutant of the evening before, politely communicated to bolkonsky the emperor's desire to give him an audience the emperor franz received him standing in the middle of his room before beginning the conversation prince andrei was stuck by the evident confusion of the emperor who reddened and did not know what to say tell me when the action began he asked hurriedly prince andrei told him this question was followed by others no less simple is Kutuzov well? How long ago did he leave Krems? And so on. The emperor spoke as though his whole aim were to ask a certain number of questions. The answers to these questions, as he made only too evident, did not interest him. At what hour did the engagement begin? asked the emperor. I cannot tell, your majesty, at what hour the fighting began on the front, but at Durenstein, where I happened to be, the army made the first attack at six o'clock in the evening said bolkonsky eagerly for he supposed that he now had a chance to enter into the carefully prepared and accurate description of all that he had seen and knew but the emperor smiled and interrupted him how many miles is it from where and to where your majesty from dernstein to krems three miles and a half your majesty have the french abandoned the left bank According to the reports of our scouts, the last of them crossed that same night on rafts. Plenty of provender at Krems. Provender was not furnished in that abundance which... But the emperor interrupted him. At what hour was General Schmidt killed? At seven o'clock, I should think. At seven o'clock. Very sad. Very sad. Then the emperor thanked him and made him a bow. Prince Andrei left the audience chamber and was immediately surrounded by courtiers coming from all sides. From all sides flattering glances rested on him, and flattering words were heard around him. The flugel adjutant reproached him for not having put up at the palace and offered him the use of his rooms. The minister of war came and congratulated him on having received the order of Maria Theresa of the third degree, which the emperor had conferred upon him. The Empress's Chamberlain invited him to wait upon Her Majesty. The Grand Duchess also desired to see him. He did not know who to answer first, and it took him several seconds to collect his wits. The Russian ambassador put his hand on his shoulder, drew him into a window, and began to talk with him. In spite of Bilibin's prognostications, the news brought by Bolkonsky was joyfully hailed. A thanksgiving to Deum was ordained. Kutuzov was decorated with the Grand Cross of Maria Theresa, and all the army was rewarded. Bolkonsky was overwhelmed with invitations and was obliged to spend the whole morning in making up calls upon the principal dignitaries of Austria. Having finished his calls, about five o'clock in the afternoon, Prince Andrei, mentally composing a letter to his father about the engagement and his visit to Brunn, returned to Bilibin's lodgings. At the door of the house occupied by Bilibin stood a britzka, half full of luggage, and Franz, Bilibin's valet, was just coming out, laboriously dragging another trunk. On his way back to Bilibin's, Prince Andrei had stepped into a bookstall to lay in a store of books for his campaign, and had spent some time there. "'What does this mean?' asked Bolkonsky. "'Alas, your excellency,' said Franz, with difficulty tumbling the trunk into the brutska. We're going farther off. The rascal is after us again. But what is it? What does it mean? demanded Prince Andrei. Bilibin came out to meet Bolkonsky. His usually tranquil face showed traces of excitement. Well, well, confess that it's delightful, said he. This story of the Thaber Bridge, the bridge at Vienna. They crossed it without striking a blow. Prince Andrei still failed to understand. Where have you been that you don't know what every coachman in the city has heard long since? I have just come from the Grand Duchess's. I heard nothing of it there. 
and haven't you noticed that everywhere they're packing up? No, I haven't. But what is the trouble? asked Prince Andrei impatiently. What is the trouble? The trouble is that the French have crossed the bridge which Auersburg was defending, and the bridge was not blown up, so that Marat is now hastening down the road to Brune, and they will be here today or tomorrow. Be here? But why was the bridge not blown up when it was mined? Well, that's what I ask you. No one, not even Bonaparte, knows that. Bolkonsky shrugged his shoulders. But if the bridge is crossed, the army is destroyed, and of course it will be cut off, said he. That's the joke of the thing, rejoined Bilibin. Listen, the French enter Vienna, just as I told you. All very good. On the next day, that is yesterday, Messrs. Marshals Marat, Lan, and Billiard mount their horses and ride down to the bridge. Notice, all three of them are Gascons. Gentlemen, says one of them, you know that the Thaber Bridge is mined and countermined, and that in front of it is a terrible tete de pont, and fifteen thousand men who are commanded to blow up the bridge and not allow us to pass. But our master, the Emperor Napoleon, would be pleased if we took that bridge. Let us three go, therefore, and take that bridge. Yes, let us go, said the other, and they go to it and take it and cross it, and now they are on this side of the Danube with their whole army, and are in full march against us and against your communications. A truce is jesting, said Prince Andrei, becoming melancholy and serious. This news was sad, and at the same time pleasant to him. As soon as he knew that the Russian army was in such a hopeless situation, it occurred to him that he himself was the one called upon to rescue it from this situation. That this was his Toulon, destined to lift him up from the throng of insignificant officers and open to him the straight path of glory. Even while he was listening to Bilibin, he was picturing himself going back to the army, and there, in a council of war, proposing a plan which alone might save them, and that to him alone it was granted to accomplish this plan. A truce is jesting, said he. I am not jesting, insisted Bilibin. Nothing is more voracious or more melancholy. These gentlemen ride upon the bridge without escort, displaying their white handkerchiefs. They assert that there is an armistice, and that they, the marshals, have come over to talk with Prince Auersburg. The officer on guard lets them into the tete de pont. They give him a thousand choice specimens of Gasconade, and they say that the war is ended, that the Emperor Franz has decided upon a conference with Bonaparte, and that they wanted to see Prince Auersburg, and a thousand other trumpery lies. The officer sends for Auersburg. These gentlemen embrace the officers, jest, sit astride the cannon, and meantime a French battalion quietly crosses the bridge and flings the bags with the combustibles into the water and enters the tete pont At last the lieutenant-general, our dear Prince Auersburg von Mauthorn himself, appears on the scene. Our dear enemy, flower of the Austrian army, hero of the Turkish wars, our enmity is at an end, we can shake hands. The Emperor Napoleon is dying with anxiety to make the acquaintance of Prince Auersburg. In one word, these gentlemen, who are not Gascons for nothing, so but juggle Auersburg with fine words, he is so ravished by this rapidly instituted intimacy with the French marshals, so dazzled by the sight of Marat's mantle and ostrich feathers, that he does not see the point, and quite forgets that he himself ought to be pointing at the enemy. Notwithstanding the vehemence of his remarks, Bilibin did not fail to pause after this mou, so as to allow Belkonsky time to appreciate it. The French battalions run on the bridge, spike the cannon, and capture the bridge, the bridge is theirs, but this is best of all, he went on to say, allowing the fascination of his narrative to keep his excitement within bounds. This, that the sergeant who had charge of the cannon, the discharge of which was to explode the mines and blow up the bridge, this sergeant, I say, seeing the French soldiers running over the bridge, was just going to fire his gun, but Lanz pulled away his hand. The sergeant, who was evidently more intelligent than his generals, hastens to Auersburg and says, Prince, you are imposed upon. The French are here. 
Marat sees that their game is played if the sergeant is allowed to speak further. With pretended surprise, a true Gascon, that he is, he turns to Auersburg. I don't see in this anything of your world-renowned Austrian discipline, says he. Do you allow a man of inferior rank to speak to you so? It was a stroke of genius. Prince Auersburg prides himself on punctilio, and has the sergeant put under arrest. But you must confess that all this story of the Thaber Bridge is perfectly delightful. It was neither stupidity nor cowardice. C'est très huson peut-être. Perhaps it is treason, though, said Prince Andre, his imagination vividly bringing up before him the grey capotes, their wounds, the gunpowder smoke, the sounds of battle, and the glory which was awaiting him. Not at all. This puts the court in the most stupid position, continued Bilibin. It is neither treason nor cowardice, nor stupidity. It's just the same as at Ulm. He paused as though trying to find a suitable expression. Say, c'est du mac. Nous sommes maquis. We are macked, he said, at last satisfied that he had coined un mot, and a brilliant mot, such a one as would be repeated. The wrinkles that had been deeply gathering on his forehead quickly smoothed themselves out in token of his contentment, and with a slight smile on his lips he began to contemplate his fingernails. "'Where are you going?' he asked, suddenly turning to Prince Andre, who had got up and was starting for his chamber. "'I'm off.' "'Where?' "'To the army.' "'But you intended to stop two days longer, didn't you?' "'Yes, but now I'm going immediately.' And Prince Andre, having given his orders for the carriage, went to his room. "'Do you know, my dear fellow,' said Bilibin, coming into his room, "'do you know, I have been thinking about you.' why are you going and in testimony of the irrefragability of his argument against it all the wrinkles vanished from his face prince andrei looked inquiringly at his friend and made no reply why are you going i know you think that it is your duty to hurry back to the army now when it is in danger i understand it mon cher c'est de la voisima not at all said prince andrei but you are un philosophie. Be one absolutely. Look at things from the other side, and you will see that your duty, on the contrary, is to preserve yourself. Leave this to others who are not fit for anything else. You have no orders to return, and you won't be allowed to go from here. So, of course, you can stay, and go with us, wherever our unhappy lot carries us. They say we are going to Olmutz, and Olmutz is a very nice little city." and you and I can make the journey very comfortably in my calash. "'Cease your jesting, Bilibin,' said Balkonsky. "'I am speaking to you sincerely, as your friend. Judge for yourself. Where, and for what purpose, are you going now, when you can remain here? One of two things will happen to you.' Here he managed to gather a fold of wrinkles under his left temple. "'Either peace will be concluded before you reach the army,' or else defeat and disgrace will await you with the rest of Kutuzov's army. And Bilibin smoothed the skin again, feeling that the dilemma was unavoidable. "'Of that I am not in a position to judge,' said Prince Andrei coldly. But he thought in his own mind, "'I am going to save the army.' "'Mon cher, vous êtes héros,' said Bilibin. End of chapter 12 Part two, chapter thirteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. That same night, having taken his leave of the Minister of War, Volkonsky set out for the army, though he did not himself know where he should find it, and had some apprehensions, lest on the road to Krems he should be captured by the French. At Brune, all the court were engaged in packing and the heavy luggage had already been dispatched to Olmutz. Near Etzelsdorf, Prince Andrei struck the highway over which the Russian army was moving in the greatest haste and the greatest disorder. The road was so encumbered with teams that it was impossible for a carriage to make its way along. Having secured from the head of the Cossack division a horse and Cossack, Prince Andrei, hungry and tired, managed to get past the teams, 
and at last drove on in search of the commander-in-chief and his own train the most ominous reports of the condition of the army had reached him on his way and these reports were more than confirmed by the sight of the army hurrying on in disorder this russian army which english gold has brought together from the ends of the universe we shall make it suffer the same fate the fate of ulm volkonsky remembered these words from bonaparte's general orders to his army at the beginning of the campaign and these words inspired in him an admiration for the genius of his hero together with a sense of wounded pride and a hope of glory but suppose nothing be left me but to die he said to himself well then be it so if it is necessary i shall not die more shamefully than others prince andrei looked contemptuously at the endless confusion of detachments baggage wagons field pieces and gun carriages and again baggage wagons baggage wagons baggage wagons of every possible description trying to outstrip each other and getting in each other's way as they toiled along over the muddy road three and four abreast in all directions in front as well as behind wherever the ear listened were heard the creaking of wheels the rumble of vehicles carts and gun carriages the tramping of horses feet the cracking of whips the shouts of drivers the cursing of soldiers denshkits and officers along the borders of the highway were everywhere seen the carcasses of horses that had fallen and been left either flayed or not flayed as the case might be then broken down wagons by which solitary soldiers sat waiting for something then again he saw little detachments of troops straying from the main column and hastening to scattered villages or coming back from them with hens sheep hay or bags filled with various objects on the slopes and rises the groups crowded together still more densely and an uninterrupted tumult of noises arose soldiers plodding through mud up to their knees helped to drag by main force the field pieces and wagons whips cracked hoofs slipped traces strained and throats were split with shouting the officers who directed the retreat galloped back and forth among the wagons their voices were hardly distinguishable above the general uproar and it could be seen by their faces that they were in despair at the possibility of reducing this chaos into order voila cher orthodox army said bolkonsky to himself quoting bilibin's words wishing to inquire of some of these men where the commander-in-chief was to be found he galloped up to the train directly opposite to him was an odd equipage a sort of cross between a cart cabriolet and a calash driven by one horse and evidently constructed out of some soldier's domestic belongings this vehicle was driven by a soldier and under the leather cover behind the apron sat a woman all wrapped up in shawls prince andrei rode up and was just going to question the soldier when his attention was attracted by the despairing shrieks of the woman sitting in the vehicle an officer who had charge of the train had set to beating her driver because he attempted to pass ahead of the others and the blows of the whip fell on the apron the woman was screaming desperately seeing prince andrei she thrust her head out from under the hood and waving her thin arms freed from the shawls she cried adjutant mr adjutant for god's sake protect me what is going to happen i am the doctor's wife of the seventh jaegers they won't let us pass we are left behind and have lost our friends i will knock you flatter than a pancake turn back cried the officer angrily to the soldier back with you and take your jade mr adjutant help me what can i do cried the doctor's wife please let this team pass don't you see that it is a woman said prince andrei riding up to the officer the officer glanced at him and without saying a word turned to the soldier again i'll teach you back let them pass i tell you repeated prince andrei compressing his lips who are you anyway suddenly cried the officer turning to prince andrei in a drunken fury who are you he addressed him insolently with a special emphasis on the pronoun are you commander here i'm the commander here and not you back with you i'll knock you flatter'n a pancake this expression had evidently pleased the officer he gave the little adjutant a capital rating 
said a voice behind. Prince Andrei saw that the officer had got into one of those paroxysms of drunken fury in which a man is not responsible for what he says. He saw that his interference in the troubles of the doctor's wife was attended with what he feared more than aught else in the world, being made ridiculous. But instinct immediately came to his aid. The officer had not time to finish what he was saying, before Prince Andrei, his face distorted by rage, rode up to him and threw up his whip. Have the goodness to let them pass. The officer made an angry gesture and hastily rode off. It all comes from them, from these staff officers, all this disorder does, he muttered. Do as you please. Prince Andrei hastily rode away, without looking up or heeding the thanks of the doctor's wife, who called him her preserver, and, recalling with disgust the particulars of this humiliating scene, he galloped toward the village where he had been told that the commander-in-chief was to be found. When he reached the village he dismounted and started for the first house, intending to rest, if only for a minute, and get something to eat and try to banish all the humiliating thoughts that tortured him. This is a troop of footpads and not an army, he was saying to himself, when, just as he happened to look up at the window of the first house, a well-known voice called him by name. He looked up and saw Nesvitsky's handsome face thrust out of the little window. Nesvitsky, vigorously chewing something in his moist mouth, was waving his hand and calling him to come in. Volkonsky! Volkonsky! Don't you hear me? Come quick! he cried. Entering the house, Prince Andrei found Nesvitsky and another adjutant having some lunch. They turned eagerly to Volkonsky with the question whether he had brought anything new. Prince Andrei read in their familiar faces an expression of alarm and uneasiness. This expression was especially noticeable on Nesvitsky's unusually jolly face. "'Where is the commander-in-chief?' asked Bolkonsky. "'Here, in this very house,' replied the adjutant. "'Tell us, is it true there is peace and a capitulation?' demanded Nesvitsky. "'I should have to ask you that. I know nothing, except that I had great trouble in finding you.' "'And what sort of a plight do you find us in?' It's horrible, my dear fellow. I plead guilty for having laughed at Mac, but here we are in a far worse position, brother, said Nisvitsky. But sit down and have something to eat. Now, prince, you won't find your luggage or anything, and only God knows where your man Pyotr is, said the other adjutant. Where's the headquarters? We are to spend the night at Nam. And I had everything that I needed packed on two horses, said Nisvitsky, and they made me some splendid pack-saddles, even though we should have to worry through the mountains of Bohemia. It's a bad state of things, brother. What's the matter? Aren't you well? You shake so, asked Nesvitsky, noticing that a sudden tremor ran over Prince Andrei, as though from the discharge of a Leyden jar. Nothing is the matter, replied Prince Andrei. He happened at that instant to remember his recent encounter with the doctor's wife and the officer of the baggage train. "'What's the commander-in-chief doing here?' he went on to ask. "'I haven't the least idea,' replied Nesvitsky. "'All I know is that it's nasty, nasty, nasty business,' said Prince Andrei, and he started for the house where the commander-in-chief was. Passing by Kutuzov's carriage, the jaded saddle-horses of his suite, and the vociferating Cossacks, he went into the cottage. Kutuzov himself, as Prince Andrei had been told, was in the cottage with Prince Bagration and Weirother. Weirother was the Austrian general who had succeeded to the place of the Schmidt who had been killed. In the entry, the little Kozlovsky was squatting on his heels before a clerk. The clerk, with his cuffs rolled up, was hastily writing, with a tub turned over for a desk. Kozlovsky's face looked pinched and wan. He had evidently not slept the night before. He glanced up as Prince Andrei came in, but he did not even nod to him. Second line. Have you written it? said he, proceeding with what he was dictating to the clerk. The Keef Grenadiers. The Potolian. Don't go so fast, your honor, said the clerk, in a disrespectful and surly manner, looking up at Kozlovsky. Kutuzov's animated and impatient voice was at this moment heard in the room beyond, answered by another which Prince Andrei did not recognize. By the sound of these two voices, by the preoccupied way in which Kozlovsky glanced at him, by the surly disrespect shown by the clerk, by the fact that the clerk and Kozlovsky were sitting on the floor by a tub, 
and so handy to the commander-in-chief, and finally, because the Cossacks holding the saddle-horses were laughing so noisily in front of the windows, by all this Prince Andrei was impressed with the idea that something grave and disagreeable must have occurred. Prince Andrei, with urgency, turned to Kozlovsky with questions. "'In a moment, Prince,' said Kozlovsky, "'these are the dispositions for Bagration. "'But the capitulation? "'There's no such thing. "'Preparations are making for a battle.' Prince Andrei started for the room where he heard the talking, but just as he was going to open the door, the voices in the room became silent, the door was flung open, and Kutuzov, with his eagle nose and puffy face, appeared on the threshold. Prince Andrei stood directly in front of him, but from the expression of the commander-in-chief's one available eye, it could be seen that he was so absolutely absorbed by his work and idea that he did not see anything at all. He looked straight into his aide's face, and yet did not recognize him. "'How now? Finished?' he inquired of Kozlovsky. "'In one second, Excellency.' Bagration, a short, slender man, still in the prime of life, and with a firm and impassive face of the Oriental type, followed the commander-in-chief. "'I have the honour of presenting myself,' said Prince Andrei, in a pretty loud tone, and at the same time extending an envelope. "'Ah? From Vienna? Good. Wait a little, wait a little.' Kutuzov and Bagration went out on the step. "'Well, Prince, good-bye,' said he to Bagration. "'Christ be with you. I give you my best wishes for the great emprise.' Kutuzov's face unexpectedly softened, and the tears came into his eyes. With his left hand he drew Bagration to him, and with his right, on which flashed a ring, he made the sign of the cross over him in a manner peculiar to himself, and offered him his puffy cheek to kiss— instead of which Bagration kissed him on the neck. "'Christ be with you,' repeated Kutuzov, and got into the calash. "'Come with me,' said he to Bolkonsky. "'Your Excellency, I should like to be employed in this movement. Let me stay in Prince Bagration's division.' "'Come with me,' again said Kutuzov, and noticing that Bolkonsky hesitated, he added, "'I myself need good officers. I need them myself.' They took their seats in the calash and drove in silence for some minutes. "'There is still much, very much, before us,' said he, with an old man's keenness of perception, as though he clearly read all that was passing in Bolkonsky's mind. "'If a tenth part of this division returns to-morrow, I shall thank God,' added Kutuzov, as though talking to himself. Prince Andrei looked at Kutuzov, and his eyes were involuntarily attracted by the deep scar on Kutuzov's temple, where the Turkish bullet had crashed through his head at Ismailio, and his extravasated eye. Yes, he has a right to speak thus calmly of the destruction of these men, thought Prince Bolkonsky. That was the very reason why I ask you to let me go with that division, said he aloud. Kutuzov made no reply. It seemed as though he had already forgotten what he had just said, and he sat absorbed in thought. Five minutes later, Kutuzov, comfortably rocking on the easy springs of the calash, turned to Prince Andrei. His face showed not a sign of emotion. With gentle irony he began to ask Prince Andrei after the details of his interview with the Emperor, and the court gossip concerning the Krems engagement, and concerning certain women of whom both of them were acquainted. End of chapter 13「Part II, Chapter fourteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Kutuzov had learned on the thirteenth of November, through one of his scouts, that the army under his command was in an almost helpless position. The scout had brought word that the French, in overwhelming numbers, had crossed the bridge at Vienna, and were marching to cut off the communication between Kutuzov and the reinforcements coming to him from Russia. If Kutuzov decided to remain at Krems, then Napoleon's army of 150,000 men would cut him off from all his communications, would outflank his exhausted army of 40,000, and then he would be in the same position as Mack at Ulm. If Kutuzov decided to abandon the road leading to his point of communications with his reinforcements, then he would be obliged to penetrate into the unknown and pathless region of the Bohemian Mountains, defending his rear from the constant attacks of the enemy on his trail, and giving up all hope of effecting a junction with Buxhovden. 
if Kutuzov determined to take the highway from Krems to Olmutz so as to meet the reinforcements from Russia, then he ran the risk of being anticipated on this route by the French, who had crossed the Danube at Vienna and would be likely to force him to fight in the middle of the march, burdened with all the luggage and heavy baggage, and to deal with an enemy double his own number and surrounding him on every side. Kutuzov had decided on this last alternative. The French, according to the report of the scout, had crossed the bridge at Vienna and were in full march upon Znaim, which lay in the line of Kutuzov's projected retreat, more than a hundred versts, about sixty miles, ahead of him. If they could reach Znaim before the French, they were in a fair hope of saving the army, but if the French were given a chance of getting into Znaim first, it meant the disgrace of a surrender, like that at Ulm, or else the general destruction of the army. It was certainly impossible to anticipate the French with all the troops. The road which the French would traverse from Vienna to Znam was both shorter and better than the road which the Russians had from Krems to Znam. On the night after receiving this information, Kutuzov sent four thousand men of Bagration's vanguard over the mountains to occupy the road from Vienna to Znam. Bagration was ordered to make this short cut without pausing to rest he was to face Vienna and turn his back on Znaim, and if he succeeded in anticipating the French, he was to do his best to hold them in check. Kutuzov himself, with all the baggage, would hasten on towards Znaim. Bagration, crossing the mountains marching without a road, forty-five versts on a stormy night, losing a third part of his forces in stragglers, came out with his famished, shoeless men at Hollebrunn on the road from Vienna to Znaim, a few hours before the French reached it from Vienna. It was necessary for Kutuzov to travel a whole day and night with his baggage wagons before reaching Znam, and therefore, in order to save the army, Bagration, with only four thousand soldiers, hungry and tired out, was obliged to engage the entire force of the enemy during the course of the twenty-four hours. This was manifestly impossible. But a strange chance made the impossible possible. Having been successful in the peace of finesse which had given the French the bridge at Vienna without a blow, Marat thought that it would be fine to try a similar deception on Kutuzov. Meeting Bagration's feeble contingent on the road to Znaim, he supposed that it was Kutuzov's whole army. In order that there might be no question of his crushing this army, he determined to await the arrival of all the forces that had started out from Vienna, and with this end in view he proposed an armistice for three days with the condition that both armies should not change their positions or move from their places. Murat asserted that negotiations for peace were already in progress and that, therefore, in order to avoid the useless shedding of blood, he had proposed the armistice. The Austrian general, Count Nositz, who was posted in the van, credited the words of Murat's emissary and retired, exposing Bagration, Another emissary came to the Russian line to make the same assurances about negotiations of peace and to propose three days armistice. The Gratian answered that he was not authorized either to refuse or accept an armistice, and he sent his adjutant back to Kutuzov to carry the proposition that had been made to him. The armistice was, for Kutuzov, the only means of gaining time, of giving Bagration's toil-worn division a chance to rest, and of sending the baggage wagons and other things the movements of which were concealed from the French, by a roundabout way to Znam. The proposal for an armistice offered the only possibility, and one most unexpected, of saving the army. On receipt of this news, Kutuzov promptly sent his adjutant-general, Vinzengeroda, who happened to be present, over to the hostile camp. Vinzengeroda was not only to accept the armistice, but also even to propose terms of capitulation, while, in the meantime, Kutuzov sent his aides back to expedite the movements of the baggage train of the whole army along the road from Krems to Znaim. The weary, famished contingent under Bagration was to cover this operation of the baggage train and of the whole army, and to maintain a firm front against the enemy eight times as strong. Kutuzov saw that by discussing terms of capitulation, which did not bind him to anything, time would be gained for sending around at least a portion of the heavy baggage, but he also saw that Marat's blunder would be quickly detected. Both of these anticipations were realized. As soon as Bonaparte, who was at Schönbrunn, twenty-five versts from Hollebrunn, read Marat's report and his scheme for an armistice and capitulation, he saw through the hoax and wrote the following letter to him. Schönbrunn, 
november sixteenth eighteen o five eight o'clock a m to prince marat i cannot find words to express my displeasure you merely command my van and have no right to conclude an armistice without orders from me you are making me lose the advantage of a campaign end the armistice instantly and march on the enemy explain to him that the general who signed this capitulation had no right to do so that only the emperor of russia has this right however if the russian emperor should ratify the proposed agreement i also would ratify it but it is only a trick march destroy the russian army you are in a position to capture their baggage and artillery the russian emperor's adjutant general is a blank officers are of no account when they are not endowed with any powers this one had none the austrians let themselves be duped without crossing the vienna bridge you have allowed yourself to be duped by the russians napoleon bonaparte's aide galloped off at headlong speed to carry this angry letter to marat bonaparte himself not feeling confidence in his generals moved toward the field of battle with all his guards fearing lest he should be cheated of his prey and the four thousand men under bagration gaily building bouvier fires dried and warmed themselves and for the first time in three days cooked their kasha gruel and not one of the detachment knew or dreamed of what was threatening them End of chapter fourteen part two chapter fifteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne it was four o'clock in the afternoon when prince andrei having through his urgency been granted his request by kutuzov reached grund and reported to bagration bonaparte's aide had not yet reached murat's division and the battle had not begun nothing was known in bagration's detachment about the general course of events they talked about a peace but did not believe in its possibility they talked also about an engagement but neither did they believe in the imminence of any engagement bagration knowing that bolkonsky was the commander-in-chief's favorite and trusted adjutant received him with all the marks of respect and condensation possible to a commander assured him that either that day or the next an engagement would probably take place and granted him free choice to be present with him during the battle or to remain in the rear and superintend the retreat which he said would be a very important position however it is most likely that nothing will be done to-day said prince bagration as if to relieve prince andrei's anxieties at the same time he thought if this is only one of the ordinary jack -a dandies of the staff sent out to win a cross he will get it just as well by staying in the rear but if he desires to be with me let him he will be useful if he is a brave officer prince andrei gave no decided answer but asked the prince's permission to reconnoitre the position and learn the disposition of the forces so that in case of necessity he might know where he was an officer on duty a handsome man faultlessly attired and with a diamond ring on his index finger who spoke french badly but fluently offered to be prince andrei's guide on all sides were to be seen wet and melancholy-looking officers apparently searching for something and soldiers lugging from the village doors benches and fences here prince we cannot get rid of men such as these said the staff officer pointing to the soldiers the officers let them leave their places and here again the officer pointed to a salter's tent pitched near them they gather around and loaf and loaf this morning i drove them all out and look it's all full again i must go and disperse them one minute let us go and i will get some cheese and a loaf of bread from him said prince andrei who had not yet had anything to eat why didn't you tell me prince i should have been delighted to have shared my bread and salt with you they dismounted and went into the salter's tent where a few men and a number of officers with flushed and weary faces were sitting around a table eating and drinking now what does this mean gentlemen said the staff officer in a tone of vexation like a man who has been iterating the same thing again and again you know it is forbidden to absent yourself from your posts in this way the prince has forbidden any such thing and here you are mr captain said he turning to a little lean dirty artillery officer who without boots he had given them to the salterer to dry in his stocking feet stood up as the others entered 
and greeted them with a not altogether natural smile. "'Well, aren't you ashamed of yourself, Captain Tushin?' continued the staff officer. "'One would think that as an officer you would set a good example, and here you are with your boots off. If an alarm were sounded, you would make a fine show without boots.' The staff officer smiled satirically. "'Please go to your places, gentlemen. All, all of you,' he added, in a tone of command. Prince Andrei could not help smiling, as he looked at Captain Tushin, who, silent and smiling, stood first on one bare foot and then on the other, and looked inquiringly with his large, intelligent, and good-natured eyes, from Prince Andrei to the officer of the day. "'The soldiers say it is easier to go barefooted,' said Captain Tushin, timid and still smiling, evidently anxious to escape from his awkward predicament by assuming a jesting tone. But he did not say anything further, as though he felt that his joke was not appreciated and was not a success. He grew confused. "'Please go to your places,' repeated the staff officer, trying to preserve his gravity. Prince Andrei once more glanced at the diminutive form of the artillery officer. There was something about it, peculiar, utterly unmilitary and rather comical, but still extraordinarily attractive. The officer of the day and Prince Andrei remounted their horses and rode on. Having passed by the village, constantly overtaking or meeting soldiers and officers of different divisions, they came in sight of the new entrenchments at their left, made of reddish clay freshly dug up. Several battalions of soldiers, in their shirt-sleeves, in spite of the cold wind, and looking like white ants, were busy digging at these fortifications. Behind the breastworks, shovels full of red clay were constantly tossed up by the men hidden from sight. They rode up to the earthworks, examined them, and riding on, mounted the opposite slope. From the top of it they could see the French. Prince Andrei reined in his horse and began to look around. "'There's where our battery is stationed,' said the staff officer, indicating the highest point, "'under command of that droll fellow whom we saw without his boots.' From the top there you can get a bird's-eye view of everything. Let us go to it, Prince. I thank you cordially, but now I can make my way alone, said Prince Andrei, wishing to get rid of the staff officer. Do not trouble yourself, I beg you. The staff officer turned back, and Prince Andrei rode on alone. The farther toward the front he rode, and the nearer to the enemy he came, the more orderly and admirably disposed seemed to be the army. The greatest disorder and despondency were in the division of the baggage train before Znaim, which Prince Andrei had overtaken that morning, and which was at least ten versts from the French. In Grund also there was a certain atmosphere of apprehension and fear of something. But the nearer Prince Andrei came to the French outposts, the more satisfactory seemed to be the condition of the Russian forces. The soldiers in their capotes stood drawn up in line, and a sergeant and captain were counting the men laying a finger on the breast of the last soldier of each division, and directing him to lift his hand. Others, scattered over the whole space, were dragging sticks and brushwood and constructing rude huts, while they gaily laughed and chatted. Around the bouviac fires, some dressed, and others stripped, were drying their shirts and leg wrappers, mending their boots and capotes, crowding around the kettles and kasha boilers. In one company, dinner was ready, and the soldiers, with eager faces, gazed at the steaming kettle, and waited while the captor namus, or sergeant, carried a wooden cupful to be tasted by the officer who was sitting on a log in front of his hut. In another company, more fortunate, since not all were provided with vodka, the soldiers stood in a throng around a pockmarked, broad-shouldered sergeant, who, tilting the keg, filled in turn the covers of the cans which eager hands extended toward him. The soldiers, with reverent faces, lifted the can covers to their lips, drained them, and rinsing the vodka in their mouths and wiping them on their coat sleeves, went off with contented faces. All the faces were as free from care as though the enemy were miles away, and there was no probability of a battle in which at least half of the division might be left on the field, as though indeed they were somewhere in their native land anticipating undisturbed repose. Having ridden past the regiment of Jaegers, Prince Andrei reached the Kreef Grandiers, gallant young fellows, occupied all with the same peaceful pursuits, but not far from the regimental commander's hut, distinguished only by its height from the others, he saw a platoon of the grenadiers, in front of whom lay a man, stripped. Two soldiers held him down, 
and two flourishing supple rods were giving him measured strokes on his naked back. The man who was undergoing the punishment screamed unnaturally. A stout major walked up and down in front of the line, and without heeding the man's shrieks, kept saying, "'It's scandalous for a soldier to steal. A soldier ought to be honest, noble, and brave. And if he steals from his comrade, he has no honor in him. He is a mean fellow. More! More!' and still resounded the swishing of the rods and the despairing but pretendedly piteous cries. More! More! repeated the major. A young officer, who was just turning away from the scene of the punishment with a mixed expression of incredulity and compassion, looked up questioningly at the adjutant as he rode by. Prince Andrei, penetrating to the extreme front, rode along by the outposts. The Russian pickets and those of the French were separated by a considerable distance at each flank, but at the centre, on the space where the emissaries had crossed in the morning, the lines were so close that they could see each other's faces and exchange remarks. Besides the soldiers, who were stationed as pickets in this place, there stood on both sides many sightseers, who, laughing and jesting, stared at the hostile troops as though they were strange and foreign curiosities. Ever since early morning, Notwithstanding the orders to stay away, the officers had been unable to rid themselves of these inquisitive individuals. The soldiers, standing in the lines like men who had come out to see something rare, no longer paid any attention to the French, but made observations on the newcomers, or, bored to death, waited to be relieved. Prince Andrei reined in his horse to reconnoitre the French. "'Look you, look,' said one soldier to his comrade, pointing to a musketeer, who— in company with an officer, had gone up to the line of sentries and was talking earnestly and hotly with a French grenadier. See how glib he jabbers. The Frenchman can't begin to keep up with him. That beats you, Sidorov. Wait, listen. He's clever, replied Sidorov, who considered himself a master in the art of speaking French. The soldier whom the jesters were remarking was Dolokhov. Prince Andrei recognized him and listened to what he was saying. Dolokhov, with his captain, had gone up to the sentry on the left flank, where their regiment was stationed. "'There, once more, once more,' urged the captain, leaning forward, and trying not to miss a word, albeit it was perfectly unintelligible to him. "'Please make haste. What does he say?' Dolokhov did not answer his captain. He had got drawn into a heated discussion with the French grenadier. Naturally they were talking about the campaign. The Frenchman— confusing the Austrians with the Russians, contended that it was the Russians who had surrendered and run away from Ulm. Dolokhov contended that the Russians had not surrendered, but had beaten the French. "'And here, if they tell us to clear you out, we will do it,' said Dolokhov. "'You look out that we don't take you and all your Cossacks with us,' retorted the Frenchman. The spectators and the Frenchmen, who were listening, laughed. "'We will teach you to dance Russian fashion, as we did in the time of Suvorov,' said Dolokhov. "'What's that time he's giving us?' asked another Frenchman. "'Ancient history,' said another, perceiving that the reference was to some past war. "'The emperor will teach your Suvara, the same as he has taught others.' "'Bonaparte,' began Dolokhov, but the Frenchman interrupted him. "'We have no Bonaparte. We have the emperor. Sacre nom!' cried the other excitedly. "'The devil skin your emperor!' And Dolokhov began to pour out a string of oaths, in Russian, soldier fashion, and shouldering his musket, walked off. "'Let us be going, Ivan Lukitch,' he said to his captain. "'He stopped talking French,' cried the soldiers in the line. "'Now it's your turn, Sidorov.' Sidorov winked, and addressed the Frenchman, beginning to jabber a perfect stream of meaningless words. "'Kari, mala, tafa, safi, muter, kashka,' he jabbered, trying to give great expression to the inflections of his voice. Ho, 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 ha, 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 ugh, ugh, rang among the soldiers, with such a hearty and jovial laughter that the Frenchmen across the line were irresistibly infected, and one would have thought, after this, that all that was necessary was for them to fire off their muskets, explode their cartridges, and scatter to their homes as soon as possible. But the guns remained loaded. The barbarians in the huts and earthworks looked out just as threateningly as ever, and the unlimbered cannon remained as before, pointing at each other. End of chapter 15 
Part two, chapter sixteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. After riding the entire line from the right flank to the left, Prince Andrei made his way to the battery, from which, according to the staff officer, the whole field was visible. Here he dismounted and leaned against the last one of four unlimbered field pieces. A sentry, who was pacing up and down in front of the guns, started to give Prince Andre the military salute, but at a sign from the officer, desisted, and once more began his monotonous, tedious march. Behind the guns were the gun carriages. Still farther back the horses were picketed, and the bouviac fires of the gunners were burning. At the left, at a little distance from the outmost gun, was a new, wattled hut, in which could be heard the lively voices of officers, talking together. It was true, from the battery a view was disclosed of almost all the disposition of the Russian forces, and of a large part of the enemies. Directly in front of the battery, on the slope of another hill, lay the village of Schöngraben. Farther, both to the left and to the right, could be distinguished in three places, through the smoke of their bouviac fires, the masses of the French troops, the greater part of which were evidently stationed in the village itself, and behind the hill. At the left of the village, in the smoke, something that resembled a battery could be made out, but by the naked eye it was impossible to distinguish it clearly. The Russian right flank was distributed along a rather steep elevation, which commanded the position of the French. Here were stationed the Russian infantry, and at the very end could be seen the dragoons. At the centre, where Tushin's battery was posted, and where Prince Andrei was studying the lay of the land, there was a very steep and direct descent and approach to a brook separating the Russians from Schöngraben. At the left of the Russian position, the infantry were engaged in cutting wood in the forest, and there also arose the smoke of their bouviac fires. The French lines were much more extended than ours, and it was plain that the French could outflank us easily, on both sides. Back of our position was a steep and deep ravine, along which it would be difficult for artillery or cavalry to retreat. Prince André, leaning on the cannon, took out a notebook and drew a plan of the disposition of the armies. At two places he indicated with a pencil certain observations to which he should draw Bagration's attention. In the first place, it was his idea that the artillery should be concentrated in the centre, and in the second place, to transfer all the cavalry to the other side of the ravine. Prince André, having been constantly thrown with the commander-in-chief, and occupied with the movements of masses and general arrangements, and having diligently studied descriptions of historical engagements, found himself involuntarily trying to forecast the course of the action, but only in its general features. He imagined that the engagement would probably occur somewhat as follows. If the enemy attack the right flank, he said to himself, the Kreef grenadiers and the Polodian Jaegers will be obliged to hold their position until the reserves from the centre are sent to their aid. In this case the dragoons may attack the flank and cut them to pieces. In case the attack is made on the center, we must place on this elevation our central battery, and under its protection we can draw back the left flank and let them retreat down the ravine and echelon. Thus he reflected. All the time that he was in the battery by the cannon, he had constantly heard the voices of the officers talking in the hut. But, as often happens, he had not noticed a single word that they said. Suddenly he was so struck, by the tone of sincerity in the tone of their voices, that he involuntarily began to listen. No, my dear, said a pleasant voice, that somehow seemed very familiar to Prince André. I say that if it were possible to know what was to be after death, then none of us would have any fear of death. That's so, my dear. Another voice, evidently that of a younger man, interrupted him. Well, whether we're afraid of it or not, it's all the same, there's no escaping it. But all men are afraid of it, "'Yes, you know so much,' said a third lusty voice, breaking in upon the others. "'You artillerymen know so much because you can take with you, everywhere you go, your tipples of vodka and your rations.' And the possessor of the lusty voice, evidently an infantry officer, laughed. "'Yes, all men are afraid of it,' continued the first familiar voice. "'We are afraid of the unknown. That's it. It's no use saying the soul goes up to heaven. Why, we know very well.' that up yonder there's no heaven, but only the atmosphere. Again the lusty voice interrupted the artilleryman. 
Come now, Tushin, let us have some of your Travnik. So that is the very same captain who is at the Salter's tent, in his stocking feet, said Prince Andrei to himself, glad to recognize the pleasant voice of the philosopher. The Travnik you can have, said Tushin, but still, as to comprehending the life to come. He did not finish his sentence. At that instant a whiz was heard in the air, nearer and nearer, swifter and louder, swifter and louder, and a cannonball, as though unable to say all that it wanted to say, plunged into the earth not far from the hut, tearing up the ground with superhuman violence. The ground seemed to groan with the terrible shock. In a moment the little Tushin came running out of the hut ahead of the others, with his after-dinner pipe at the side of his mouth, his kind, intelligent face rather pale. He was followed by the possessor of the lusty voice, a young infantry officer, who hurried off to his company, buttoning his coat as he ran. End of chapter 16「Part Two, Chapter Seventeen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Prince Andrei mounted his horse, but remained in the battery, trying to distinguish by the smoke the cannon that had sent the projectile. His eyes wandered over the whole landscape. All that he could make out was that the till now motionless masses of the French were beginning to stir, and that there really was a battery at the left. The smoke above it had not yet dispersed. Two French riders, apparently aides, were spurring down the hill. At the foot of the hill, a small but clearly distinguishable column of the enemy were moving, evidently for the purpose of strengthening the lines. The smoke of the first gun had not blown away when another puff arose, followed by the report. The action had begun. Prince Andrei turned his horse and galloped back to Grund to find Prince Bagration, Behind him he heard the cannonade, growing more frequent and louder. It was plain that our side had begun to reply. Below, in the space where the envoys had met, musket shots were heard. Lemereux, with Bonaparte's angry letter, had just dashed up to Marat, and Marat, ashamed of himself and anxious to retrieve his blunder, had immediately begun to move his army against the centre, and at the same time around both flanks, hoping before night and the arrival of the emperor to demolish the insignificant division that opposed him. "'It has begun. Here it is,' said Prince Andrei to himself, feeling his heart beat more violently. "'But where? How shall I find my Toulon?' Riding among the companies which had been eating their kasha gruel and drinking vodka only a quarter of an hour before, he everywhere found the soldiers hastily moving about, getting into line and examining their guns. On all faces there was the same feeling of expectancy which he had in his heart. The face of every soldier seemed to say, It has begun. Here it is. How terrible! How glorious! Before he reached the unfinished earthworks, he saw in the twilight of the gloomy autumn day some horsemen riding toward him. The foremost, in a felt burka and lamb's wool cap, rode a white horse. This was Prince Bagration. Prince Andrei stopped and waited for them. Prince Bagration reined in his horse and, recognizing Prince Andrei, nodded to him. He kept his eyes straight ahead all the time, while Prince Andrei was reporting to him what he had seen. The thought, it has begun, here it is, could also be read on Bagration's strong, brown face with the half-closed, dull eyes that seemed to show the lack of sleep. Prince Andrei, with uneasy curiosity, looked into his impassive face and tried to read whether he had any thoughts or feelings and if so, what the thoughts and feelings of this man were at this moment. Is there anything remarkable behind that impassive face? Prince Bagration nodded his head in approval of what Prince Andrei reported and said, Good, as though all that had taken place and all that he heard was exactly what he had already anticipated. Prince Andrei, all out of breath from his swift gallop, spoke hurriedly, Prince Bagration pronounced his words with his eastern accent, and with especial deliberation, as though to give the impression that there was no haste. However, he put his horse to the trot in the direction of Tushin's battery. Prince Andrei and his suite followed him. His suite consisted of an attaché, of Zerkov, the prince's personal adjutant, an orderly, the staff officer of the day on a handsome English cob, and a civil chinovnik serving as auditor, 
who, out of curiosity, had asked permission to come out to the battle. The auditor, a fat man with a fat face, with a naive smile of delight, glanced around, as he jolted on his horse, presenting a strange figure, his camelot cloak on a pack-saddle, among the hussars, cossacks, and adjutants. "'This man here wanted to see a battle,' said Zerkov to Bolkonsky, pointing to the auditor. "'Why, he's got a pain in the pit of his stomach already.' "'Come now, that'll do,' exclaimed the auditor, with a radiant, naive, and at the same time shrewd smile, as though he enjoyed being made the butt of Zerkov's jokes, and as though he purposely made himself out to be duller than he really was. "'Très drôle, mon monsieur prince,' said the staff officer of the day. He remembered that in French there was some peculiar way of speaking the title of prince, but he could not get it quite right. By this time they had all reached Tushin's battery. A cannonball fell a short distance in front of them. "'What was that that fell?' asked the auditor, with his naive smile. "'French pancakes,' replied Zarkov. "'Such things kill, I suppose,' mused the auditor. "'How shocking!' And it was evident that he took great delight in witnessing the whole scene. The words were hardly out of his mouth, when again unexpectedly came the same terrible whistle, interrupted suddenly by striking into something alive, and swish, 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 a Cossack, riding only a few steps behind, and at the right, plunged off his horse and to the ground. Zerkov and the staff officer of the day crouched down in their saddles and drew their horses to one side. The auditor reined up near the Cossack and looked at him with eager curiosity. The Cossack was dead. The horse was still struggling. Prince Bagration, blinking his eyes, glanced around, and seeing the cause of the confusion, turned his head again indifferently, as much as to say, it isn't worth while to bother with trifles. He reined in his horse with the skill of a good rider, bent over a trifle, and adjusted his sword, which had got entangled in his burqa. The sword was an old one, unlike those worn at the present time. Prince Andrei remembered having heard it said, that Suvorov had given his sword to Bagration in Italy, and this recollection was peculiarly agreeable to him at this time. They reached the very same battery where Bokonsky had been when he made his reconnaissance of the battlefield. "'Whose company?' asked Prince Bagration of the gunner who was standing by the Cassians. He asked, "'Whose company?' but his question seemed really to imply, "'Aren't you all frightened, you men here?' and the gunner understood it so. "'Captain Tushin's, Your Excellency,' cried the freckled, red-haired gunner, in a jocund voice, saluting. "'So, so,' exclaimed Bagration, absent-mindedly, as he passed by the limbers toward the last gun. Just as he reached it, this cannon rang out, with a report that deafened Bagration and his suite, and in the smoke that spread round could be seen the gunners, seizing the cannon and slowly bringing it back to its first place. Gunner number one, a huge soldier with broad shoulders, holding the sponge, leaped back with a long stride to the wheel, and number two, with trembling hand, forced the charge down the muzzle. A little round-shouldered man, the officer, Tushin, stumbled over the tail of the carriage, hastened forward, without heeding the general, and gazed into the distance from under his small hand. "'Raise it two lines more. There, there, that'll do,' he cried in his little, thin voice, to which he tried to impart a vigour, ill-suiting his nature. "'Number two, he whined. "'Let him have it, Medvedev.' Magration beckoned to the officer, and Tushin, with an awkward and timid gesture, absolutely unlike those used by military men, and more like a priest when giving a blessing, raised three fingers to his visor and went to the general. Although it had been intended for Tushin's field pieces to sweep the valley, he had begun to send red-hot balls at the village of Schöngraben, in front of which heavy masses of the French could be seen concentrating. No one had directed Tushin where and how to fire, and so, having consulted with his sergeant, Zakrachenko, in whom he had great confidence, he decided that it would be a good plan to set the village on fire. Good, said Bagration, in reply to the officer's scheme, and then began to scan the field of battle before him, and seemed to be lost in thought. On the right, in the foreground, the French were advancing. Below the height on which the Kief regiment was stationed, in the ravine through which flowed the brook, could be heard the soul-stirring roll and rattle of musketry, and just at the right the attaché pointed out to the prince the column of the French 
trying to outflank our wing. At the left, the horizon ended in dense forest. Prince Bagration ordered two battalions from the center to strengthen the right wing. The attaché ventured to remark to the prince that if these battalions were withdrawn, the artillery would be uncovered. Prince Bagration turned to the attaché and, without replying, looked at him through his lifeless eyes. It seemed to Prince André that the attaché's criticism was correct, and that in fact no reply could be made to it. But at this instant an adjutant came galloping up from the regimental commander who was in the valley, with the report that overwhelming masses of the French were marching down upon them, and that his regiment was demoralized and was falling back upon the Kief grenadiers. Prince Bagration inclined his head in token of assent and approval. He walked slowly towards the right, and then sent the adjutant to order the dragoons to charge the French. But after the adjutant had been gone half an hour with this order, he returned with the report that the commander of the dragoon regiment had retired to the other side of the ravine so as to escape the destructive fire brought to bear upon him and to avoid useless loss of life, and therefore he had dispatched sharpshooters into the woods. Good, said Bagration. Just as he was leaving the battery, at the left also, the reports of rifles in the forest began to be heard, and as it was too far for him to reach the left wing in time, Prince Bagration sent Zerkov thither to tell the old general, the very one who had exhibited his regiment before Kutuzov at the Brnau, to retreat as soon as possible to the other side of the ravine, since, probably, the right wing would not be strong enough to withstand the enemy any length of time. Tushin and the battalion covering him were quite forgotten. Prince Andrei listened attentively to Prince Bagration's conversation with his subordinates, and to the orders that he issued, and to this amazement discovered that in reality he did not give any orders at all, but that the prince only tried to give the impression that all that was done by his various officers, either through necessity, chance, or volition, was done if not exactly by his orders, at all events in accordance with his design. Prince André noticed that owing to the tact displayed by Prince Bagration, in spite of the fortuitousness of events and their absolute independence of the general's will, his presence was of great importance. The subordinates, with distracted faces, who kept galloping up to the prince, instantly became calm. Soldiers and officers received him with enthusiasm and were animated by his presence and evidently took pride in displaying their courage. End of chapter 17「Part 2 Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Prince Bagration, having ridden up to the highest point of our right flank, began to make the descent, toward the spot where a continual rattle of musketry was heard, and nothing could be seen through the gunpowder smoke. The nearer they approached the valley, the less they could see what was going on, but the more evident it became that they were near an actual battlefield. They began to meet with wounded. One man, with bleeding head, and without his cap, was being dragged along on the arms of two soldiers. He was gurgling and spitting. The bullet had apparently entered his mouth or throat. Another whom they met was stoutly marching off by himself, without his musket, groaning loudly and shaking his injured hand with the keenness of the smart, while the blood was slowly dripping down his capote. His face appeared more frightened than hurt. He had only just been wounded. Crossing the road, they rode down a steep incline, and on the slope they saw a number of men lying. Then they met a crowd of soldiers, none of whom were wounded. These soldiers were hurrying up the slope, breathing heavily, and in spite of the general's presence they were talking in loud voices and gesticulating. Farther forward in the smoke could now be seen the ranks of grey capotes, and an officer, recognizing Bagration, dashed after the retreating throng of men, shouting to them to return. Bagration rode up to the lines, along which, here and there could be heard the swift crackling of musket shots, suppressed remarks, and the shouts of command. The whole atmosphere was dense with gunpowder smoke. The faces of all the soldiers were blackened with powder and full of animation. Some were ramming the charge home, others putting powder in the pan, or taking wads from their pouches, still others were firing. But it was impossible to make out what they were aiming at through the dense cloud of smoke which hung in the motionless air. Quite often could be heard the pleasant sounds of buzzing and whistling bullets. 
what does this mean prince andrei asked himself as he rode up to the throng of soldiers it cannot be a charge because they are not moving it cannot be a square for that is not the way they form the regimental commander a rather spare slender old man with eyelids that more than half concealed his aged-looking eyes giving him a benignant aspect rode up toward prince bagration with the pleasant smile and received him as a host receives a welcome guest he explained to prince bagration that the french had made a cavalry charge against his regiment but that though the charge had been repelled it had cost him half of his men the regimental commander declared that the charge had been repulsed meaning to express by this military term what had happened to his forces but in reality he himself did not know what had taken place during the preceding half hour in the army entrusted to his command and was unable to say with absolute certainty whether the charge had been repulsed or whether his regiment had been worsted in the attack at the beginning of the engagement he simply knew this that along his whole line cannonballs and shells began to fly and to kill his men that next someone had cried the cavalry and our men had begun to fire and they had been firing till that time not at the cavalry which was out of sight but at the french infantry showing themselves in the valley and shooting down our men prince bagration inclined his head to signify that this was just as he had wished and anticipated turning to his adjutant he ordered him to bring down from the hill the two battalions of the sixth jaegers by which they had just been riding at this moment prince andrei was struck by the change which had taken place in bagration's face it expressed that concentrated and joyful resolution such as is shown by a man ready on a hot day to leap into the water and who is taking the final run that impression of dullness and lethargy covering a pretense of deep thoughts had vanished away his hawk's eyes round and determined looked straight ahead with an enthusiastic and rather contemptuous expression and wandered restlessly from one object to another although his motions were as slow and deliberate as before the regimental commander turned to prince bagration and begged him to retire to the rear on the ground that it was very perilous where they were please your illustriousness for god's sake said he looking for confirmation to the attache who was turning away from him be kind enough to notice he called his attention to the bullets which were constantly whizzing singing and whistling around them he spoke in a questioning reproachful tone such as a joiner might use to a gentleman trying to use an axe this is our work and we're used to it but you will callous your dainty hands he spoke as though there were no possibility of these bullets killing him and his half-closed eyes gave his words a still more persuasive effect the staff officer joined his entreaties to those of the regimental commander but prince bagration did not deign to answer him but merely gave his orders to have the men cease firing and to open the ranks so as to give room for the two battalions that were on their way to join them just as he issued his command a breeze springing up lifted the canopy of smoke which covered the valley it was as though an invisible hand stretched across the sky from right to left and the opposite height with the french marching down was brought into full view all eyes were involuntarily fixed upon this column of the enemy moving toward us and winding like a serpent down the escarpment of the hill already the soldiers bearskin shakos could be seen already the officers could be distinguished from the ranks and their banner as it clung around the staff they march superbly said someone in bagration's suite the head of the column was now just entering the valley the collision would necessarily take place on this side of the ravine the remains of the regiment that had been in the action before hastily reformed and went toward the right behind them driving in the stragglers came the two battalions of the sixth jaegers in good order they had not yet reached the position where bagration was but their heavy measured step could be heard as the whole body kept perfect time on the left wing nearest of all to bagration marched the company commander a round-faced stately man with a stupid happy expression of face he was the very man who had been in titian's hut it was evident that his only thought at this moment was that he was marching bravely past his superiors with the self-satisfaction of one attracting notice he marched by lightly on his muscular legs he almost seemed to fly without the slightest effort keeping his back straight and distinguishing himself by his grace from the heavy march of the men who pressed on after him he carried down by his side a slender delicate sword unsheathed a sort of curving scimitar 
not like a weapon, and looking now at the commander, now back at his men, not once losing step, he gallantly hastened on with all the energy of his gigantic frame. It seemed as though all the strength of his mind were directed toward going past his commander in the best possible form. Being conscious that he was doing this, he was happy. Left! 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 It seemed as if he said this inwardly at every step, and taking the same time the wall of soldiers marched by with heavy knapsacks and equipment, as though each one of these hundreds of different soldiers, with their grave faces, said to themselves in thought, Left! 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 A stout major, puffing and losing step, as he had to turn out of his way for a bush, a straggler, gasping for breath, his face expressing terror at his neglect, came at the double quick to overtake his company. A cannonball condensing the air before it flew over the heads of Bagration and his suite, and accenting the beat, left, left, plunged through the column. Close up ranks, ran the intrepid voice of the company commander. The soldiers made a bend around the place where the shot had made a gap, an old cavalryman, a non-commissioned officer who had remained behind to care for the wounded, regained the ranks, with a hop and a skip fell into step, and looked around sternly. Left, 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 seemed to resound from the threatening silence and from the monotonous tramping of feet beating simultaneously on the ground. Brave fellows, boys, said Prince Bagration. Glad, dad, dad, ran the reply down the line. A morose-looking soldier, as he passed to the left, shouting at the top of his voice, turned his eyes on Bagration, his expression seeming to say, You yourself know. And another, not looking up, and evidently afraid of having his attention distracted, with wide open mouth, shouted and went by. The command was given to halt and unstrap knapsacks. Bagration rode up to the ranks that had just marched past him and got down from his horse. He gave the bridle to a Cossack, took off his burqa and handed it to him, stretched his legs, adjusted his leather cap on his head. The head of the French column, with officers at the front, now appeared at the foot of the hill. S. Bogum, God be with you, shouted Bagration, in a firm, loud, ringing voice, and instantly taking the lead and lightly waving his arm, he led them himself, with the awkward and apparently laborious gait of a cavalryman, across the first half of the field. Prince André felt as though some irresistible impulse dragged him forward, and he experienced a great sense of happiness. Already the French were near at hand. Already Prince André, rushing on side by side with Bagration, saw the belts, the red epaulets, even the faces of the French. He clearly distinguished one elderly French officer, who, with feet turned out and wearing gaiters, was struggling up the hill. Prince Bagration gave no new orders, and marched on in silence at the head of his forces. Suddenly from among the French rang out one discharge, then a second, a third, and along the whole extent of the enemy's lines spread smoke and the rattle of musketry. A few of our men fell. In the number, that round-faced officer who had marched so gallantly, and in such good form. But at the very instant that that first discharge had taken place, Bagration turned round and shouted, Hurrah! Hurrah, rah, rah, rang in a protracted yell down our line, and outstripping Bagration and each other, in a broken but joyous and animated line, our men dashed down the slope after the enemy who had given way. End of chapter 18「Part two, chapter 19 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The charge of the six Jaegers secured the retreat of the right wing. In the centre, the action of Tushin's forgotten battery, which had succeeded in setting the village of Schöngraven on fire, retarded the advance of the French. They stopped to put out the conflagration, which the wind was spreading, and thus gave time to retreat. The retirement of the centre through the ravine, was accomplished hastily and noisily, but there was no sign of demoralization. But the left wing, consisting of the infantry of the Azov and Podolian regiments, and the Pavlograd Hussars, which was attacked simultaneously and outflanked by overwhelming numbers of the French, under the command of Lanz, 
was defeated. Bagration had sent Zerkov to the general in command of the left wing, with orders to retreat slowly. Zerkov, raising his hand to his cap, struck spurs into his horse and swiftly dashed off. But he had not more than got out of Bagration's sight than his courage began to fail him. Irresistible fear came over him, and he could not make up his mind to go where it seemed to him so perilous. He rode over to the army of the left wing, but he did not dare press forward to the front, where there was firing, and he began to search for the general and the officers where there was no possibility of finding them, and therefore the order was not delivered. The command of the left wing fell by order of seniority to the regimental commander of that same brigade which had been reviewed at Brunau by Kutuzov, and in which Dolokhov served as a private. The command of the extreme left wing was entrusted to the colonel of the Pavlograd regiment, in which Rostov served. This led to a serious misunderstanding. The two commanders had become involved in a violent quarrel, and at the very time when the right wing was in the thick of the battle, and the French had already begun to retreat, the two commanders were absorbed in a dispute, each doing his best to affront the other. The troops, both infantry and cavalry, were very far from being prepared for the work before them. The men, from private to general, were not expecting an engagement, and were calmly occupying themselves with the ordinary pursuits of peace. The cavalrymen engaged in feeding their horses, the infantry in collecting firewood. He's my senior, however, in rank, the German colonel of hussars was saying, flushing and addressing the aide who had just ridden up to him. So let him do as he pleases. I cannot sacrifice my hussars. Bugler, sound the retreat. But the battle came upon them in hot haste. Cannonade and musketry, all in confusion, thundered and rattled at their right and center, and the capotes of Lane's sharpshooters were already crossing the mill dam and forming on this side two gunshots away. The infantry general, with his tottering gait, went to his horse, and mounting and drawing himself up very straight and tall, rode off to the Pavlograd commander. The two men met with polite bows, and with concealed hatred in their hearts. "'Once for all, Colonel,' said the general, "'I cannot leave half of my men in the woods. I beg of you, I really beg of you,' he repeated the word, "'to draw up in position and meet the charge. "'I beg of you not to meddle with my affairs,' replied the colonel angrily. "'If you were a cavalryman, "'I am not a cavalryman, Colonel, but I am a Russian general. "'And if you don't know this—' "'I know it very well, Your Excellency,' cried the Colonel, "'suddenly starting up his horse and turning purple with rage. "'Wouldn't you like to come to the line, "'and then you can see that this position is as bad as it could be? "'I do not care to destroy my regiment for your gratification.' "'You forget yourself, Colonel.' I am not seeking my own gratification, and I will not permit this to be said. The general, accepting the colonel's invitation as a challenge of courage, swelled out his chest and, frowning, rode forward with him in the direction of the outposts, as though all their dispute were to be settled there, at the front, under the fire of the enemy. They reached the outposts, a few bullets flew over them, and they paused and were silent. There was no reason for inspecting the outposts, since, from the place where they had been before, it was perfectly evident that there was no chance for cavalry to maneuver among the bushes and gullies, and that the French were outflanking the left wing. The general and colonel looked at each other with fierce and significant eyes, like two gamecocks all ready for battle, and each waited vainly for the other to show a sign of cowardice. Both stood the test. As there was nothing for them to say— and as neither wished to give the other a chance to assert that he had been the first to retire from exposure to the enemy's fire, they would have stood there a long time, each manifesting his bravado, if at this time they had not heard in the forest, almost directly behind them, the crackling of musketry and a dull, confused yell. The French had fallen on the soldiery scattered through the forest gathering firewood. It was now impossible for the hussars to retreat at the same time with the infantry, they were already cut off by the French line at the left. Now, although the locality was most unpropitious, 
it was absolutely necessary to fight their way through to reach the road beyond. The squadron in which Rostov served had barely time to mount their horses before they found themselves face to face with the enemy. Again, as at the bridge over Inns, between the squadron and the line of the enemy there was no one, and between them lay that terrible gap of the unknown and the dreadful, like the bourne that divides the living from the dead. All these men felt conscious of that gap, and were occupied by the question whether they should pass beyond it or not, and how they should cross it. The colonel came galloping along the front, and angrily replied to the questions of his officers, and like a man who in despair insists on his own way, thundered out some command. No one said anything definitely, but someone had given the squadron an idea that there was to be a charge. The command to fall in was given, then sabres were drawn with a clash, but as yet no one stirred. The army of the left wing and the infantry and the hussars felt that their leaders did not know what to do, and the indecision of the commanders communicated itself to the soldiers. If they would only hurry, hurry, thought Rostov, feeling that at last the time was at hand for participating in the intoxication of a charge of which he had heard so much from his comrades, the hussars. Espogom, forward, children, rang out Denisov's voice. Twat! In the front rank, the haunches of the horses began to rise and fall. Grachik began to pull on the reins and dashed ahead. At the right, Rostov could see the forward ranks of his hussars, but farther in front there was a dark streak, which he could not make out distinctly, but supposed to be the enemy. Reports were heard, but in the distance. Charge! rang the command, and Rostov felt how his Grachik broke into a gallop and seemed to strain every nerve. He realized that his division was dashing forward, and it became more and more exciting to him. He noticed a solitary tree just abreast of him. At first this tree had been in front of him, in the very center of that line which seemed so terrible, but now he had passed beyond it, and there was not only nothing terrible about it, but it seemed ever more and more jolly and lively. Ugh! how I will slash at them, thought Rostov, as he grasped the handle of his sabre. Hurrah, rah, 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 rang the cheers in the distance. Now let us be at them, if ever, thought Rostov, striking the spurs into Grachik and overtaking the others. He urged him to the top of his speed. The enemy were already in sight before him. Suddenly, something like an enormous lash cracked all along the squadron. Rostov raised his sabre, in readiness to strike, but just at that instant, Nikintendo, a hussar galloping in front of him, swerved aside from him, and Rostov felt, as in a dream, that he was being carried with unnatural swiftness forward, and yet was not moving from the spot. A hussar whom he recognized as Bandarchuk was galloping behind him and looked at him gravely. Bandarchuk's horse shied, and he dashed by him. What does it mean? Am I not moving? Have I fallen? Am I dead? These questions Rostov asked and answered in a breath. He was alone in the middle of the field. In place of the galloping horses and backs of the hussars, he saw all around him the solid earth and stubble. Warm blood was under him. No, I am wounded, and my horse is killed. Grachek raised himself on his forelegs, but fell back, pinning down his rider's foot. From the horse's head a stream of blood was flowing. The horse struggled but could not rise. Rostov tried to get to his feet, but likewise fell back. His sabre Tasha had caught in the saddle. Where our men were, where the French were, he could not tell. There was no one around him. Freeing his leg, he got up. Where? In which direction? is now that line which so clearly separated the two armies, he asked himself, and could find no answer. Has something bad happened to me? Is this the way things take place? And what must be done in such circumstances? He asked himself again, as he got to his feet. And at this time he began to feel as though something extra were hanging to his benumbed left arm. His wrist seemed to belong to another person. 
He looked at his hand, but could find no trace of blood on it. There now, here are our fellows, he exclaimed mentally, with joy, perceiving a few running toward him. They will help me. In front of these men ran one in a foreign-looking shako and in a blue capote. He was dark and sunburnt, and had a hooked nose. Two or three others were running at his heels. One of them said something in a language that was strange and un-Russian. Surrounded by a similar set of men, in the same sort of shakos, stood a Russian hussar. His hands were held, just behind him. They were holding his horse. Is our man really taken prisoner? Yes. And will they take me too? Who are these men? Rostov kept asking himself, not crediting his own eyes. Can they be the French? He gazed at the oncoming strangers, and in spite of the fact that only a second before he had been dashing forward solely for the purpose of overtaking and hacking down these same Frenchmen, their proximity now seemed to him so terrible that he could not trust his own eyes. Who are they? Why are they running? Are they running at me? And why? Is it to kill me? Me, whom everyone loves so? He recollected how he was beloved by his mother, his family, his friends, and the purpose of his enemies to kill him seemed incredible. But perhaps they may. For more than ten seconds he stood, not moving from the spot, and not realizing his situation. The foremost Frenchman with the hooked nose had now come up so close to him that he could see the expression of his face, and the heated, foreign-looking features of this man, who was coming so swiftly down upon him with fixed bayonet and bated breath, filled Rostov with horror. He grasped his pistol, but instead of discharging it, flung it at the Frenchman, and fled into the thicket with all his might. He ran not with any of that feeling of doubt and struggle which had possessed him on the bridge at ends, but rather with the impulse of a hare trying to escape from the dogs. One single fear of losing his happy young life took possession of his whole being. Swiftly guiding among the heather, and with all the intensity with which he had ever run when playing Gorelki, he flew across the field, occasionally turning round his pale, kindly young face, while a chill of horror ran down his back. No, I'd better not look round, he said to himself, but as he reached the shelter of the bushes, he glanced round once more. The Frenchmen had slackened their pace, and at the very minute that he glanced round, the foremost runner had just come to a stop and was starting to walk back, shouting something in a loud voice to his comrade behind him. Rostov paused. It cannot be so, he said to himself. It cannot be that they wish to kill me. But meantime his left arm became as heavy as though a hundredweight were suspended to it, he could not run another step. The Frenchman also paused and aimed. Rostov shut his eyes and ducked his head. One bullet, then another, flew humming by him. He collected his last remaining energies, took his left arm in his right hand, and hurried into the thicket. Here in the bushes were the Russian rangers. End of chapter 19「Part 2 Chapter 20 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The infantry regiments, taken unawares in the forest, had rushed out, and the companies, becoming confused one with another, had formed a demoralized mob. One soldier, in his panic, had shouted the senseless words so terrible in war, "'Cut off!' and these words, with the accompanying panic, had spread through the whole troop. Surrounded, cut off, lost, cried the voices of the fugitives. The regimental commander, the moment that he heard the musketry and the shouting behind him, comprehended that something awful had happened to his regiment, and the thought that he, who had been during many years of service an exemplary officer, never guilty of any breach, might now be accused of negligence or faulty arrangements, came on him so keenly that, for the moment entirely forgetting the recalcitrant colonel of cavalry and his own importance as a general, and, above all, forgetting the peril and the impulse of self-preservation, he seized his saddle-bow and, spurring on his horse, 
dashed back toward the regiment under a shower of bullets falling all around him, but fortunately sparing him. He had only one desire, to find out what had occurred, to bring aid, and to repair the blunder, if it were in any way to be attributed to him, and to escape all censure after his twenty-two years' service, in which his record as an officer had been blameless. Having fortunately spurred through the lines of the French unharmed, he came upon his regiment on the other side of the same forest, through which our men had been running and scattering down the ravine, not heeding the word of command. That moment of moral vacillation had arrived which decides the fate of a battle. Would these scattered throngs of soldiers heed their commander's voice, or would they merely look at him and pursue their way? Notwithstanding the despairing shouts of their general, which had hitherto been so terrible to them, notwithstanding his infuriated, purple face, so unlike his ordinary appearance, and notwithstanding his brandished sword, the soldiers still persisted in their flight, shouted, fired their guns into the air, and paid no heed to the command. The moral balance, which decides the destiny of battles, had evidently kicked the beam on the side of panic. The general coughed, choking with the violence of his shouts and the gunpowder smoke, and reined in his horse in despair. All seemed lost. But at this moment the French, who had fallen upon our lines, suddenly, without any apparent reason, fell back and vanished behind the edge of the forest, and the Russian sharpshooters made their appearance. This was Timokhin's company, the only one in the woods which had preserved any semblance of order, Entrenching themselves in the ditch near the forest, they had unexpectedly attacked the French. Timokhin had thrown himself upon the enemy with such a desperate cry, and flourishing his rapier, had dashed after them with such frantic and rash energy, that the French, before they had time to collect their wits, flung away their muskets and fled. Dolokhov, dashing on a breast of Timokhin, killed one Frenchman point-blank, and was the first to seize the officer by the collar and make him surrender. The fugitives turned back, the battalions formed again, and the French, who had cut the left wing into two, were driven back in a trice. The reserves succeeded in uniting their forces, the fugitives were brought to a halt. The regimental commander was standing with Major Ekonomov by the bridge, watching the retreating companies file past him, when a soldier approached him, seized his stirrup, and almost leaned against him. This soldier wore a blue coat of broadcloth, without a knapsack or shako. His head was bound up, and over his shoulder he carried a French cartridge pouch. In his hand he held an officer's sword. This soldier was pale. His blue eyes looked boldly into the general's face, and a smile parted his lips. Although the general was engaged in giving directions to Major Ekonomov, he could not help noticing this soldier. "'Your Excellency, here are two trophies,' said Dolokhov, showing the French cartridge pouch and sword. "'I took an officer prisoner with my own hand. I stopped the company.' Dolokhov was all out of breath with fatigue. He spoke in broken sentences. "'The whole company can bear me witness. I beg of you to remember it, Your Excellency.' "'Very good, very good,' said the regimental commander, and he turned to Major Ekonomov, but Dolokhov did not pass on. He untied his handkerchief, pulled him by the sleeve, and called his attention to the clotted blood on his hair. A bayonet wound. I was in the front. Remember, Your Excellency. Tushkin's battery had been entirely forgotten, and only at the very end of the engagement, Prince Bagration, still hearing cannonading at the centre, sent thither the first staff officer of the day, and then Prince André, to order the battery to retire as speedily as possible. The covering forces, which had been stationed near Tushin's cannon, had been withdrawn during the heat of the engagement by someone's orders, but the battery still continued to blaze away, and had not been taken by the French, simply because the enemy could not comprehend the audacity of four guns continuing to fire after the supporting columns had been withdrawn. On the contrary, they supposed, from the energetic activity of this battery, that the principal forces of the Russians were here concentrated in the centre, and twice they attempted to storm this point, and both times they were driven back by discharges of grape from these four cannon, standing alone on the hill. 
shortly after prince bagration's departure titian had succeeded in setting schongraben on fire see see them scatter it burns see the smoke cleverly done splendid the smoke the smoke cried the gunners growing excited all the cannon had been directed without special orders in the direction of the fire as though by one impulse the soldiers would cry out after every shot cleverly done that's the way to do it see see there admirable the fire fanned by the wind quickly spread the french columns retreating behind the village fell back but as though for a punishment for this misfortune, the enemy established a battery of ten guns a little to the right of the village and began to reply to Tushin's fire. In their childish delight at setting the village on fire, and at their successful onslaught upon the French, our gunners did not notice this battery until two cannonballs, followed by four at once, fell among the guns. One of them knocked over two horses, and the other carried away the leg of the powder-master, the animation of the men once aroused was not dampened however but only changed in character the horses were replaced by two others from the reserve the wounded were removed and the four cannon were turned against the ten-gun battery an officer tushin's comrade had been killed at the beginning of the action and during the course of the hour out of forty men serving the guns seventeen were disabled but still the gunners were jolly and full of energy twice they noticed that below and not far away from them the french were beginning to appear and they had loaded with grape the little captain with his weak awkward gestures kept calling upon his jeshnik for just one more little pipe which he called trybotchka instead of trubotchka and then knocking the ashes out he would leap forward and look from under his little hand at the enemy let em have it boys he would exclaim and himself seizing the cannon by the wheel he would bring it back into position, or he would clean out the bore. In the smoke, stunned by the incessant firing, though he jumped every time a gun went off, Tushin, keeping his nose-warmer between his teeth, ran from one gun to another, now aiming, now counting the charges left, now making arrangements for the change or removal of the killed or wounded horses, and shouting his orders in his weak, delicate, irresolute voice his face kept growing more and more animated only when his men were killed or wounded did he frown and turning away from the unfortunate shout sternly to the others who as usual pressed forward ordering them to carry away the wounded or the dead the soldiers for the most part handsome young heroes as always happens in the artillery a couple of heads taller than their officer and twice as broadly built looked at their commander with the inquiring look of children in trouble, and the expression which happened to be in his face was immediately reflected in theirs. As a consequence of the terrible din and roar, and the necessity for oversight and activity, Tushin felt not the least unpleasant qualm of fear, nor did the thought that he might be killed or painfully wounded enter his head. On the contrary, he kept growing happier and happier. It seemed to him that it was very long ago— not even that same afternoon since the moment when he first caught sight of the advancing enemy and had fired the first gun and that little scrap of ground where he stood had been long long known and familiar to him although he remembered everything took everything into consideration did everything the best of officers could have done in his position still he was in a state bordering on the delirium of fever or the condition of a drunken man in the midst of the stunning sounds of his own guns roaring on every side of him, in the midst of the enemy's shells, whistling and striking around him, seeing his sweating, flushed men serving their guns, seeing the blood of men and horses, seeing the puffs of smoke in the direction of the enemy, followed always by the swift flight of the cannonball, striking into the ground, on a human being, on the guns, or among the horses, seeing all these various sights, still his mind was filled with a fantastic world of his own which at this moment constituted a peculiar delight to him the enemy's guns were in his imagination not guns but pipes from which from time to time a viewless smoker puffs out wreaths of smoke see there he gave another puff said tushin in a half whisper to himself 
just as a wreath of smoke leaped away from the hill and was borne to the left in a ribbon by the wind. Now, let us catch the little ball and send it back. What is your order, your honor? asked a gunner, who stood near him, and noticed that he had muttered something. Nothing. Send a shell, he replied. Now then, our Mat Vilyevna, he said to himself. It was the great, old-fashioned howitzer that Tushin personified under the name of Mat Vilyevna, daughter of Matthew. The French around their guns reminded him of ants. Gunner number one of the second field piece, a handsome fellow, too much given to drink, was Diadia, uncle in his world. Tushin looked at him oftener than the others, and delighted in all his movements. The sound of the musketry in the valley, now dying away and then increasing in violence, seemed to him like some one drawing long breaths. He listened to the intermittent rising and falling of these sounds. Hark! She's breathing again, breathing hard, he said to himself. He imagined himself a mighty giant of monstrous size, seizing the cannonballs with both hands and hurling them at the French. Well, Matveyevna, Matushka, little mother, don't betray us, he was just saying, and starting away from the cannon, when back of him was heard a voice, which he did not know. Captain Tushin! Captain! Tushin looked around in alarm. It was the same staff officer who had sent him out of Grund. In a quavering voice the officer cried, Are you beside yourself? Twice you have been ordered to retire, and you— now why do they bother me exclaimed tushin to himself looking with dread at the officer i-i'm all right he returned raising two fingers to his visor i but the colonel did not say all that he meant to say a cannon-ball flying close to him cut him short and made him cower down close to his horse he paused and was just going to repeat his order when still another cannon-ball silenced him he wheeled his horse round and galloped away "'Retire! All of you, retire!' he cried from the distance. The soldiers laughed. In a minute an adjutant came with the same order. This was Prince André. The first thing he saw as he reached the little space occupied by Tushin's cannon was an unharnessed horse with a broken leg, neighing near his mates. From his leg the blood was spurting as from a fountain. Among the limbers lay a number of the killed, one cannonball after another flew over him as he galloped up, and he was conscious of a nervous tremor running down his back. But the mere thought that he was afraid again roused his courage. "'I cannot be afraid,' he said to himself, and he deliberately dismounted among the field pieces. He delivered his message, and still lingered in the battery. He resolved that the gun should be removed from their position and brought in under his direction. He and Tushin, stepping among the dead bodies, made the arrangements for limbering the cannon, even while the French were pouring a murderous fire upon them. An officer just dashed up here, but he made himself scarce in no time, remarked a gunner to Prince André. He wasn't like your honor. Prince André exchanged no words with Tushin. They were both so occupied that it seemed as though they did not see each other. When at last they succeeded in getting two of the four field pieces limbered, they started to descend the hill leaving one field piece dismounted, together with the Hollitzer. Prince André turned to Tushin. "'Well, good-bye,' said he, offering him his hand. "'Good-bye, my dear,' returned Tushin. "'Dear heart, farewell, my dear fellow,' exclaimed Tushin, the tears springing to his eyes, though he knew not why. End of chapter 20「Part Two, Chapter Twenty One of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The breeze had died down. Dark clouds hung low over the battlefield, mingling on the horizon with the smoke of gunpowder. It had grown dark, and therefore, with all the more clearness, the blaze of the two burning villages stood out against the sky. The cannonade had slackened but still the rattle of musketry at the rear, and at the right was heard with ever-increasing frequency and distinctness. As soon as Tushin and his field pieces, jolting and constantly meeting wounded men, got out of range and descended into the ravine, he was met by the commander and his aides, among whom were both the staff officer and Zerkov, 
who had been twice sent but had not once succeeded in reaching Tushin's battery. All of them gave him confused orders and counter-orders as to how and where to go, and overwhelmed him with reproaches and criticisms. Tushin made no arrangements, but rode toward the rear on his artillery jade, not saying a word for fear he should burst into tears, which, without his knowing why, were ready to gush from his eyes. Although the order was to abandon the wounded, many dragged themselves after the troops and begged for a ride on the gun carriages. That very same gallant infantry officer, who before the beginning of the engagement had darted so energetically from Tushin's hut, was stretched out on the carriage of the Matveyevna, with a bullet in his belly. At the foot of the hill, a pale yunker of hussars, holding one arm in his hand, came to Tushin and asked for a seat. "'Captain, for God's sake, my arm is crushed,' said he, timidly. "'For God's sake, I can't walk any longer. For God's sake.' It was evident that this yunker had more than once repeated this request and had been everywhere refused. He asked in an irresolute and piteous voice, "'Give me a place, for God's sake.' "'Climb on, climb on,' said Tushin. "'Spread out a cloak, uncle.' he added, turning to his favorite gunner. But where's the wounded officer? We took him off. He died, replied someone. Climb on. Sit there. Sit down, my dear fellow. Sit there. Spread out the cloak, Antonov. The yunker was Rostov. He held his left arm in his right hand. His face was pale, and his teeth chattered with fever. He was assisted to climb, on the Matveyevna, to the very same spot from which they had removed the dead officer. There was blood on the cloak which Antonov spread out, and it stained Rostov's riding trousers and hands. "'What, are you wounded, my dear?' asked Tushin, approaching the gun on which Rostov was riding. "'No, only a bruise. But where did that blood come from, on the gun-cheek?' asked the other. "'That's the officer's, your honor,' replied a gunner, wiping away the blood with the sleeve of his capote, as though he were apologizing for the stain on the gun." By main force, and with the help of the infantry, the guns were dragged up the slope, and when they reached the village of Gunthersdorf, they halted. By this time it was quite dark, so that it was impossible at ten paces to distinguish the uniforms of the soldiers. The musketry fire was beginning to slacken. Suddenly shouts and the rattle of shots were heard again near by at the right. The darkness was lighted up by the flashes of the guns. This was the last attack of the French and the soldiers replied to it as they entrenched themselves in the houses of the village. Once more all hands rushed out from the village, but Tushin's field pieces were hopelessly fast, and the gunners and Tushin and the yunker, silently exchanging glances, awaited their fate. Then the firing began to die away once more, and out from a side street came a party of soldiers, engaged in lively conversation. "'Safe and sound, Petrov?' asked one. "'We gave it them hot and heavy, brother. "'They won't meddle with us again,' returned the other. "'Can't see a thing. How was it? "'Warmed em up a little, eh? "'Can't see a thing. It's so dark, fellows. "'Anything to drink?' "'The French had been driven back for the last time, "'and once more, through the impenetrable darkness, "'Tushin's field pieces moved forward, "'surrounded by the rumbling infantry as by a frame.' Something seemed to be flowing on through the darkness like an invisible, gloomy river, ever pushing forward in one direction, with a murmur of voices and the clinking of bayonets and the rumble of wheels. And above the general turmoil, clear and distinguishable above all other sounds, arose the groans and cries of the wounded in the blackness of the night. Their groans seemed to coincide with the pitchy blackness which surrounded the army. Their groans and this darkness of the night seemed to be one and the same thing. After a while, a wave of excitement ran through this onward struggling mass. Someone had come from headquarters on a white horse and shouted something as he rode along by. What's that he says? Where now? Is it to halt? Did he express any gratitude? Such were the eager questions heard on all sides, and then the whole moving mass, as it moved forward, recoiled on itself. Evidently the van had halted, and the report spread that orders were to Bouviac there. All hands settled down where they were in the middle of the muddy road. Fires were lighted, 
and voices began to grow animated. Captain Tushin, having made his arrangements for his company, sent one of his men to find the temporary hospital, or at least a surgeon for the Yunker, and sat down in front of the fire which his soldiers had built by the roadside. Rostov also dragged himself up to the fire. The fever, caused by his pain, the cold, and the dampness shook his whole frame. An irresistible inclination to drowsiness overcame him, but still he could not sleep, owing to the tormenting pain which he felt in his arm. It ached, and he found no position that relieved it. Sometimes he closed his eyes, then, again, he gazed into the fire, which seemed to him angrily red. Then again at the round-shouldered, slender figure of Tushin, sitting Turkish fashion near him. Tushin's large, intelligent, kindly eyes were fastened upon him with sympathy and compassion. He saw that Tushin with all his soul desired, and yet was totally unable, to help him. On all sides were heard the steps and voices of the infantry passing by, coming up and settling down around them. The sounds of voices, of steps, and trampling of horses, stamping their hoofs in the mud, the echo of axes far and near, all mingled in one pulsating uproar. Now it was no longer like a viewless river rolling onward through the darkness, but rather like a gloomy sea, roaring and breaking after a storm. Rostov, half-dazed, looked and listened to what was going on around him and before him. A foot-soldier came up to the bouviac fire, squatted down on his heels, rubbed his hands over the fire, and turned his face around. "'Any harm, your honor? he asked, turning to Tushin with an inquiring expression. "'Here. I've lost my company, your honor. I don't know where it is. Hard luck.' At the same time with the soldier, an infantry officer with a bandaged cheek came to the fire, and begged Tushin to order his field pieces to be moved a trifle, so as to allow the baggage train to pass. The company commander was followed by two soldiers. They were quarreling desperately, reviling each other, and almost fighting over a boot. "'You lie! You didn't pick it up! Oh, you villain!' one of them was crying in a hoarse voice. Then came a lean, pale, soldier, with his neck done up in blood-stained bandages, and, in an irascible voice, asked the artillerymen for a drink of water. "'What! Must I die like a dog?' he grumbled. Tushin ordered the men to give him a drink. Then came a jolly soldier, asking for some fire for the infantry. "'A little fire from a red-hot man for the infantry. Good luck to you, fellow countrymen. Thank you for the fire. We'll return it with interest.' said he, as he disappeared into the darkness with a flaming brand. After this soldier came four, carrying something heavy wrapped up in a cloak, and went past the fire. One of them stumbled. "'Oh, bah! The devils! They have been spilling firewood!' cried one of them. "'He's dead. What's the use of lugging him?' exclaimed another. "'Well, I tell you.' And they vanished in the darkness with their burden. "'Say!' "'Does it hurt?' asked Tushin, in a whisper. "'Yes, it hurts. "'Your Honor, the General wants you. "'He's at the cottage yonder,' said one of the gunners, coming up to Tushin. "'In a moment, my boy.' Tushin got up, and buttoning his cloak, and straightening himself, he left the fireside. In a cottage which had been made ready for him, not far from the artillerist's fire, Prince Bagration was still sitting at the dinner-table, talking with a number of high officers who had called in for consultation. There was the little, old man, with half-closed eyes, piteously gnawing a mutton-bone, and the general of twenty-two years' blameless service, his face flushed from his vodka and his dinner, and the staff officer with the birthday ring, and Zerkov, uneasily looking at the others, and Prince Andrei, with compressed lips and feverishly shining eyes. In the corner of the cottage leaned the standard taken from the French, and the auditor, with his innocent face, was fingering the stuff of which the standard was made, shaking his head doubtfully, perhaps because he was really interested in the standard, and perhaps, because being hungry, it was hard to see the dinner-table at which no place had been set for him. In the next cottage was a captured colonel of dragoons, with our officers crowding around him, with curiosity in their eyes. 
Prince Bagration thanked the officers of the various divisions, and made inquiries about the details of the engagement, and the losses. The regimental commander, who had commanded the review at Bernau, explained to the prince that as soon as the action began, he had withdrawn from the woods, collected the men engaged in gathering firewood, and sending them back, had charged with two battalions, and simply carried the French at the point of the bayonet. When I saw that the first battalion was giving way, your illustriousness, I stood on the road and said to myself, I will let them get by first, and then order a running fire, and that was the way I did it. The regimental commander had been so anxious to do this, and so sorry that he had not been successful in doing it, that it now seemed to him that he actually had done so. Indeed, may it not have been so? How was it possible to decide, in the general confusion, what had happened and what had not happened? By the way, I ought to observe, your illustriousness, he went on to say, remembering Dolokhov's conversation with Kutuzov and his last meeting with the young man, that the cashiered private, Dolokhov, took a French officer prisoner, under my very eyes, and distinguished himself notably. "'It was there I saw the charge of the Pavlograd Hussars, your illustriousness,' remarked Zerkov, looking around uneasily, for he had not that day seen a single hussar, and had only heard about them from the infantry officer. They broke two squares, your illustriousness. A few, hearing Zerkov's words, smiled, because a joke was always expected from him. But, perceiving that what he said also redounded to the glory of our arms, and of the day's doings, they grew serious again, though they knew very well that what Zerkov said was a lie without even a semblance of foundation. Prince Bagration turned to the elderly colonel. I thank you all, gentlemen. All parties have worked like heroes, infantry, cavalry, artillery. But how was it two field pieces were abandoned in the center, he demanded, looking round for some one. Prince Bagration made no inquiries for the cannon of the left wing. He knew by this time that all the cannon there had been abandoned at the very beginning of the action. I believe I asked you about them, he said, turning to the staff officer of the day. One was dismounted, replied the staff officer, but the other, as to that I myself cannot understand. I was there all the time and gave orders for it to be retired, and immediately I was called away. It was hot there, to be sure, he added modestly. Some one remarked that Captain Chushin was right here in the village, and that he had already been sent for. Ah, but you were there, were you not? asked Prince Bagration of Prince Andrei. Certainly, we almost met there, said the staff officer, giving Prince Andrei an affable smile. I did not have the pleasure of seeing you, declared Prince Andrei, coolly and curtly. All were silent. Tushin now appeared on the threshold, modestly making his way behind the backs of the generals. Passing around the generals, in the narrow room, and confused, as always, in the presence of his superiors, Tushin did not see the flagstaff and stumbled over it. Several laughed. "'How is it the guns were abandoned?' asked Bagration, frowning, but not so much at the captain as at those who were rude enough to laugh, among whom Zerkov's voice was distinguished above the rest. Tushin, now for the first time, at the sight of the stern commander, realized with horror his crime and disgrace at having lost two guns while he himself was left alive. He had been so agitated that, till this moment, he had not had time to think of this incident. The laughter of the officers still more threw him off his balance. He stood in front of Bagration, with his lower jaw trembling, and could hardly stammer, I... I... I don't know your illustriousness. I had no men, your illustriousness. You might have had them from the forces that covered you. Tushin did not reply that there were no forces covering him, though this would have been the unvarnished truth. He was afraid he might compromise some of his superior officers, and so in silence, with staring eyes, he gazed into Bagration's face, as a schoolboy looks in confusion into his master's. A rather long silence ensued. Prince Bagration, evidently not wishing to be too severe, knew not what to say. The others did not venture to interfere in the conversation. Prince Andrei looked askance at Tushin, and his fingers twitched nervously. "'Your illustriousness,' said Prince Andrei, breaking the silence in his clear voice, "'you are pleased to send me to Captain Tushin's battery. 
I went there and found two-thirds of his men and horses disabled, two of his guns dismounted, and no forces to cover him. Prince Bagration and Tushin kept their eyes fixed on Bolkonsky, who was speaking under the influence of restrained excitement. And if your illustriousness will permit me to express my opinion, he went on to say, we are indebted more than all for the success of this day to the action of this battery and the heroic steadfastness of Captain Tushin and his company, said Prince Andrei, and without waiting for any reply, he got up and left the table. Prince Bagration looked at Tushin, and evidently not wishing to show any disbelief in Prince Bolkonsky's stiff judgment, and at the same time not feeling himself prepared to acquiesce entirely with it, he inclined his head and told Tushin that he might go. Prince Andre followed him. "'Thank you, my boy. You have saved me,' said Tushin to him. Prince Andre looked at Tushin, and without saying anything, turned away from him. His heart was heavy and full of melancholy. It was all so strange, so unlike what he had anticipated." who are they why do they come here what do they want and when will all this end rostov asked himself as he gazed at the shadows which unceasingly passed before him the pain in his arm grew worse and worse unconquerable drowsiness oppressed him red circles danced before his eyes and the impression of these voices and these faces and the sense of his loneliness mingled with the sense of his agony these soldiers wounded and not wounded they all did the same thing they all pressed upon him crushed him tore his muscles and roasted the flesh in his broken arm and shoulder to rid himself of them he closed his eyes he lost himself for one moment but during that brief interval of forgetfulness he saw in his dream a countless collection of objects he saw his mother with her large white hand he saw sonya's thin shoulders Natasha's eyes and smiling lips, and Denisov, with his queer voice and long moustache, and Telyanin, and his whole encounter with Telyanin and Bogdanuitch. All this story was one and the same thing with what this soldier with the shrill voice said, and all this story and this soldier so cruelly, so constantly crushed, twitched, and pulled his arm in one direction. He struggled to escape from them, but they would not for a single second let go of his shoulder, or in the least relax their hold. It would not have hurt, it would have been all right, if they would cease pulling him, but it was impossible to get rid of them. He opened his eyes and looked up. A black strip of the night, an arshan wide, hung over the glowing coals. Across this strip of light flew the powdery snow as it fell. Tushin did not return. The surgeon had not come. He was alone. A little soldier now sat on the other side of the fire, stripped and warming his thin, sallow body. I'm of no use to anyone, thought Rostov. No one helps me or takes pity on me. But if I were only at home, strong, happy, beloved. He sighed, and his sigh involuntarily changed into a groan. Aye, does it hurt? asked the little soldier shaking his shirt over the fire, and without awaiting his answer, quacking like a duck, he added, "'Good many men knocked to pieces this day. Terrible!' Rostov did not heed the soldier. He gazed at the snowflakes fluttering down into the fire, and he recalled what winter would be at home in Russia, his warm, bright home, with his downy furs, swift sledges, his strong, healthy body, and the love and care of his family." And why did I come here? he asked himself. On the following day the French did not renew their attack, and the remains of Bagration's division effected a conjunction with Kutuzov's army. End of chapter 21 and end of part 2《Of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Prince Vasily was not in the habit of forecasting his plans. Still less did he ever think of doing people harm for the sake of his own advantage. 
he was merely a man of the world who had been successful in the world so that success had become a sort of second nature to him he was always accustomed to allow circumstances and his relations to other men to modify his various plans and projects but he rarely gave himself a very scrupulous account of them though they constituted his chief interest in life he managed to have several such plans and projects on the docket at one and the same time and thus while a dozen formulated themselves some came to something while others fell through he never said to himself for example this man is now in power i ought to gain his confidence and friendship and thereby secure myself the advantage of his assistance or this here pierre is rich i ought to induce him to marry my daughter and thus get the forty thousand roubles that i need but if by chance he met the man in power instinct immediately whispered to him that this man might be profitable to him and prince vasili struck up a friendship with him and at the first opportunity led by instinct flattered him treated him with easy familiarity and finally brought about the crucial conversation pierre was under his tutelage at moscow and prince vasili procured for him an appointment as gentleman-in-waiting which at that time conferred the same rank as councillor of state and he insisted on the young man accompanying him to petersburg and taking up his residence in his own mansion without making any exertion and at the same time taking it absolutely for granted that he was on the right track prince vasili was doing all in his power to marry pierre to his daughter if prince vasili had formulated his plans beforehand he could not have been so natural in his conversation so simple and unaffected in his relations with all men not only those above him but those who stood below him there was something that ever attracted him to men richer or more powerful than himself and he was endowed with the rare art of seizing exactly the right moment for profiting by people pierre who had unexpectedly succeeded to count bezukhoi's wealth and title found himself after his late life of loneliness and inaction surrounded and occupied to such a degree that only when he was in bed could he have a moment entirely to himself he was obliged to sign letters to show himself at the court-house in regard to matters of which he had no clear comprehension to ask questions about this and that of his chief overseer to ride out to his estate in the suburbs of moscow and to receive many people who hitherto had ignored his very existence but would have been offended and insulted if he refused to see them all these various individuals businessmen relations acquaintances were all with one accord disposed to treat the young heir in the most friendly and flattering manner they were all indubitably persuaded of pierre's distinguished merits he was constantly hearing such phrases as with your extraordinary goodness or considering your kind heart or you are so upright count or if he were as clever as you are and so on until he actually began to believe in his extraordinary goodness and his extraordinary intelligence all the more because always in the depths of his heart it had seemed to him that he was really very good and very clever even people who before had been cross to him and showed him undisguised hatred now became sweet and affectionate toward him for example the sharp-tempered elder sister the princess with the long waist and the phenomenally smooth hair like a doll's came into pierre's room after the funeral dropping her eyes and flushing deeply she assured him how sincerely she regretted the misunderstandings that had arisen between them and asked him as a special favor though she felt that she had no right to do so that she might be allowed after the blow that had befallen her to remain for a few weeks longer in the house which she had loved so well and where she had borne so many sacrifices she could not restrain her tears and wept freely at these words touched by the change that the statuesque princess had undergone pierre took her by the hand and begged her forgiveness though he could not have told for what from that day the princess began to knit pierre a striped scarf and became entirely different to him do this for her my dear fellow for she had much to put up with on account of the late count's whims said prince vasili giving him a paper to sign for the princess's benefit prince vasili had made up his mind that he must cast this die and get this check of thirty thousand roubles for the poor princess in order that it might not enter her head to talk about the part which he had taken in the matter of the mosaic portfolio pierre signed the check and from that time forth the princess became still more affectionate to him the younger sisters also were very flattering in their behaviour to him especially the youngest one the beauty with the mole 
who often embarrassed Pierre with her smiles and her own embarrassment at the sight of him. It seemed to Pierre so natural that everybody should like him, it seemed to him so unnatural that anyone should not like him, that he could not help believing in the sincerity of those who surrounded him. In the first place, he had no time to question the sincerity or lack of sincerity. He had no time for anything, but was constantly in a state of delicious intoxication, as it were. He was conscious that he was the centre of an important social mechanism, feeling that something was constantly expected of him, that if he failed to accomplish this he would offend many, and disappoint their expectations. But if he did this thing and that, all would be well, and he did whatever was asked of him, and always imagined that better things lay in store for him. During this first part of the time, Prince Vasily, more than anyone else, undertook the management of Pierre and his affairs. After Count Buzikoy's death, he scarcely let Pierre out of his sight. Prince Vasily acted like a man, who, though overburdened with business, wearied and careworn, was so filled with sympathy that he found it impossible to leave this hapless young man, the son of an old friend, and the possessor of such an enormous fortune, to the play of fate and the designs of knaves. During the few days which he spent in Moscow after Count Buzikoy's death, he kept calling Pierre to him, or going himself to Pierre, and instructed him on his duties in a tone of such weariness and assurance that he seemed to say each time, "'You know that I am overwhelmed with business, but it would be heartless in me to leave you now, and you know that what I tell you is the only thing feasible.' "'Well, my dear fellow, to-morrow we will start at last,' said he one day, closing his eyes and touching Pierre's elbow with his fingers, while his voice had a tone that seemed to imply that this had long, long ago been decided upon, and was now perfectly beyond question." "'Tomorrow we start. I will give you a place in my carriage. I am glad. We have done everything necessary here, and I ought to have been at home long ago. Here's what I got from the Chancellor. I asked him for it for you. You have a place in the diplomatic corps, and are appointed gentleman-in-waiting. The diplomatic career is now open to you.' Notwithstanding the tone of weariness and assurance in which these words were spoken, Pierre, who for some time had been thinking about his future, began to make an objection. But Prince Vasily interrupted him and spoke in that low, persuasive tone which effectually prevents any one from breaking into a man's discourse, and which he employed in case it were absolutely necessary to meet a final objection. But, my dear fellow, I did this for my own sake, to satisfy my own conscience, and there is nothing to thank me for. No one ever complained of being too well loved, but then you are free. You can leave to-morrow. Then you can see for yourself in Petersburg— it is high time that you left these scenes of painful recollections. Prince Vasily sighed. Well, well, my dear, and let my valet follow in your carriage. Oh, yes, I had almost forgotten, added Prince Vasily. You know, my friend, we had some accounts with the late lamented, and so I have collected and kept the money from your raisin property. You don't need it. We will settle it up afterwards." What Prince Vasily called, from the raisin property, was a few thousand roubles of obruk, or peasant's quit-rent, which he had appropriated for his own use. In Petersburg, just the same as in Moscow, Pierre found himself surrounded by an atmosphere of affection and love. He could not decline the office, or rather sinecure, for he had nothing to do, which Prince Vasily had procured for him, but he was so engrossed with acquaintances, invitations, and social duties, that he felt— even more than in Moscow, the sense of confusion, hurry, and of happiness ever beckoning but never becoming realized. Many the set of gay young bachelors with whom he had formerly been intimate were now absent from Petersburg. The guard were away on the campaign. Dolokhov was serving in the ranks. Anatole had joined the army and had been sent into the province. Prince Andrei was abroad, and therefore Pierre had no chance to spend his nights as he had once liked to do, or in occasionally engaging in confidential talks with some old and treasured friend. All his time was spent in dinners and balls, and pre-eminently in the society of Prince Vasily, the portly princess his wife, and the beautiful Ellen. Anna Pavlovna Cher, like everybody else, made Pierre feel the change which had come over society in regard to him. Hitherto, Pierre, in Anna Pavlovna's presence, had constantly felt that whatever he said was unbecoming, wanting in tact, unsuitable, that his speeches, however sensible they might seem while he was getting them ready in his mind, were idiotic as soon as he spoke them aloud, while on the other hand, Ippolit's most stupid utterances were regarded as wise and witty. 
Now, however, everything that he said was greeted with the epithet splendid. Even if Anna Pavlovna did not say this, still he was made to see that she meant it, and that she refrained from saying it only out of regard for his modesty. At the beginning of the winter of the years 1805, 1806, Pierre received from Anna Pavlovna the usual pink note of invitation, and with this postscript, the beautiful Ellen will be with us, whom one is never tired of looking at. On reading this sentence, Pierre for the first time realized that a peculiar bond had sprung up between him and Ellen, recognized by other people, and this thought alarmed him because it seemed to place him under some sort of obligation which he could not fulfill, and at the same time it pleased him as an amusing situation. Anna Pavlovna's reception was exactly like the former one, except that the dessert with which she regaled her guests was not Montmartre as before, but a diplomat who had just arrived from Berlin, bringing the freshest details about the visit of the Emperor Alexander at Potsdam, and how the two most august friends had there sworn an oath of eternal alliance to protect the cause of right against the enemy of the human race. Pierre was received by Anna Pavlovna with a shade of melancholy, evidently having reference to the recent loss which the young man had undergone in the death of Count Buzikoy. Everyone constantly felt it their duty to assure Pierre that he was greatly afflicted by his father's taking off, although he could hardly be said to have known him, and in Anna Pavlovna's case this melancholy was almost equal to that high degree of melancholy which she always manifested at the mention of the most august Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Pierre felt himself quite overwhelmed by this. Anna Pavlovna, with her usual art, arranged the circles of her drawing-room. The largest, in which Prince Vasily and the generals were conspicuous, was enjoying the diplomat's conversation. Still another group was gathered about the tea-table. Pierre was anxious to join the former, but Anna Pavlovna, who was in the excitable state of a great captain on the field of battle, when a thousand new and brilliant ideas are struggling almost hopelessly for a successful accomplishment, Anna Pavlovna, seeing Pierre's motion, laid her finger on his sleeve. "'Wait. I have designs on you for this evening.' She glanced at Ellen, and gave her a smile. "'My dear Ellen, you must be good to my poor aunt, who has conceived a perfect adoration for you. Go and spend ten minutes with her. And lest it should be very tiresome to you, here is our dear Count, who certainly will not fail to follow you.' The beauty went over to Ma Tante, but Anna Pavlovna detained the young man, pretending that she still had some indispensable arrangement to complete. "'Charming, isn't she?' said she to Pierre, referring to the stately beauty who was sailing away. "'And so self-possessed, and so much tact for a young girl, such wonderful capability and dignity. It all comes natural to her. Fortunate will be the man who secures her. With her a man, even of the humblest position in society, could not fail to attain the most brilliant position. Isn't that so? I only wanted to know your opinion.' and Anna Pavlovna released Pierre. Pierre had honestly replied in the affirmative to her question about Ellen's art of self-reliance. Whenever he thought of Ellen, he thought of her beauty and of her extraordinary ability to appear grave and dignified in society. Ma Tante received the two young people in her corner, but it seemed as though she were trying to hide her adoration for Ellen and make rather a show of awe for Anna Pavlovna. She glanced at her niece as though asking how she should behave toward these people. As Anna Pavlovna turned away, she again touched Pierre's sleeve with her finger and said, "'I hope that you won't say another time that you are bored at my house,' and she glanced at Ellen. Ellen smiled back with a look that seemed to say that she could not admit the possibility of anyone seeing her, and not being delighted. The aunt coughed, swallowed down the phlegm, and said in French that she was very glad to see Ellen. Then she turned to Pierre with the same compliment and the same look. During their tedious and dulcetory conversation— Ellen glanced at Pierre, and smiled upon him with the same bright and radiant smile that she bestowed upon all people. Pierre was so accustomed to this smile that it made little impression upon him, and he gave it no special attention. The aunt happened at that moment to be speaking about a collection of snuff-boxes, which had belonged to Pierre's late father, Count Buzikoy, and she showed him her own snuff-box. The Princess Ellen asked to see the portrait of her husband painted in miniature on the cover, that is apparently the work of Vinet, remarked Pierre, mentioning the name of a distinguished miniature painter. He leaned over the table to take up the snuff-box, but all the time he was listening to the conversation at the other table. He got up, intending to pass around, but the aunt handed him the snuff-box, 
passing it directly behind Ellen. Ellen moved aside to give room, and, as she looked up, she smiled. In accordance with the custom of the day, she wore a dress cut very low both in front and behind. Her bust, which always reminded Pierre of marble, was so near to him that even with his near-sighted eyes he could not help seeing the exquisite beauty of her neck and shoulders, and if he had stooped but a little his lips would have touched her neck. He was conscious of the warmth of her body, the faint breath of some perfume, and the rustle of her corset as she moved. He saw not the statuesque beauty which agreed so well with the color of her dress. He saw and felt the whole charm of her form, concealed as it was, only by her drapery. And having once seen this, his eyes refused to see her in any other way, just as it is impossible for us to recall an illusion that has once been explained. "'And so you have not noticed before how charming I am,' Ellen seemed to say. "'Have you not noticed that I am a woman? "'Yes, I am a woman, whom any man might win. "'Even you,' her look seemed to say. "'And at that instant Pierre was conscious that Ellen not only might be, "'but that she must be his wife, that it could not be otherwise. "'He knew this at this instant just as surely as he would have known it "'had he been standing with her under the bridal crown. "'How would this be?' and when would it be? He could not tell, but he was sure that it would be the best thing for him. He even had a dim consciousness that somehow it would not be for the best, but he still knew that it would be. Pierre dropped his eyes, then raised them, and tried once more to see that beauty so far off and foreign to him, as it were, which he had seen every day before, but he found it impossible. He no more could recall his former thought of her than a man who, having seen a blade of step-grass in the midst and mistaken it for a tree, could ever be deceived into taking the blade of grass for a tree again. She was terribly near to him. Already she had begun to wield her power over him, and between him and her there was no longer any impediment except the impediment of his own will. "'Excellent. I leave you in a quiet corner. I see that you are getting along very well there,' said Anna Pavlovna's voice." and Pierre, coming to his senses with a start of terror, lest he had been guilty of something reprehensible, reddened and glanced around. It seemed to him that all knew, as well as he himself did, what had happened to him. After a little while, when he had joined the large circle, Anna Pavlovna said to him, I hear that you are refitting your Petersburg house. This was true. The architect had told him that it was needful to be done, and Pierre, though he did not know why, allowed the huge mansion to be improved. "'That's a good plan, but I wouldn't give up your quarters at Prince Vasily's. "'It's a good thing to have a friend like the Prince,' said she, smiling at Prince Vasily. "'I know something about it, do I not? "'And you are still so young. You need someone to advise you. "'You are not angry with me for exercising the prerogative of an old woman, I hope.' "'She added this in Russian, and paused as women always pause, "'expecting something complimentary when they have been mentioning their age.' If you marry, that would be a different thing. And she united them in one significant glance. Pierre did not look at Ellen, but she looked at him. But all the time she was terribly close to him. He stammered something and reddened. After he returned home, Pierre was long unable to sleep, for thinking of what had happened to him. What had happened to him? Nothing. All he knew was that a woman whom he had known as a child, of whom he had often heedlessly said, Yes, she's pretty, when he was told that Ellen was a beauty, might be his. But she is stupid. She acknowledges that she is stupid, he said to himself. There's something revolting in the eye of her exciting my love, something repulsive. I have been told that her own brother Anatole was in love with her, and that she loved him in return, and that there was quite a scandal about it, and that was the reason why Anatole was sent away. Ippolit is her brother, her father, Prince Vasily. That's all ugly, he went on thinking, and even while he came to this decision, such considerations are endless, he found himself to his surprise indulging in a smile, and acknowledged that another series of considerations were arising in his mind, that while he was thinking of her faults, he was at the same time dreaming how she would be his wife, how she might be in love with him, how she might be quite different, and how all that he had heard and thought about her might be untrue. And again he saw her, not as Prince Vasily's daughter, but as a woman, her form concealed merely by her grayish garment. But no, why has this idea never entered my mind before? And again he assured himself that it was impossible, 
that there would be something shameful, contrary to nature, something, as it seemed, dishonorable to him in this marriage. He recalled her words and glances, and the words and glances of those who had seen them together. He remembered Anna Pavlovna's words and looks when she spoke to him about his house. He remembered a thousand similar insinuations on the part of Prince Vasily and others. And a sense of horror came over him, lest he had bound himself by the very undertaking of such a project, a project which was evidently wrong, and which he ought not to have undertaken. But at the very time that he came to this decision, in the other half of his mind arose her form in all its womanly beauty. End of chapter 1 Part 3, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. In November, 1805, Prince Vasily was obliged to go to four governments on a tour of inspection. He had secured this commission for himself so as to visit one of his ruined estates, and it was his intention, having picked up his son Anatole, who was with his regiment at one of the places on his route, to go with him on a visit to Prince Nikolai Andreyevich Bolkonsky, so as to marry this same son to the daughter of this wealthy old man. But before starting on this journey, and undertaking these new duties, Prince Vasily felt called upon to bring Pierre's little affair to a crisis. The truth was, Pierre, during these latter days of his visit at Prince Vasily's, had shown himself absurd, agitated, and moping in Ellen's presence, the proper condition of a man in love, but still he had not made his decision. Tout ça est bel et bon, mais il faut que ça finisse. It must be decided, said Prince Vasily one morning with a melancholy sigh, confessing to himself that Pierre, considering under what obligations he was to him, though Christ be with him, was not behaving very nicely in this matter. Youth, fickleness. Well, God bless him, said Prince Vasily, with a feeling of satisfaction at his own benevolence. Mais il faut que ça finisse. Day after tomorrow is Leolina's birthday. I will have a little party for her, and if he does not come up to the point in seeing what his duty is, then it will be my affair. Yes, my affair. I am her father. A fortnight after Anna Pavlovna's reception, and the sleepless, agitated night that followed it, when he had made up his mind that to marry Ellen would lead to unhappiness, and that it was his duty to flee from her and to go away, Pierre, in spite of this decision, was still at Prince Vasily's, and felt with a sort of horror that each day he was becoming, in the eyes of the world, more and more attached to her, that he could not return to his former way of looking upon her, could not tear himself from her, that it was abominable, but still he must link his fate with hers. Perhaps he might have abstained, but scarcely a day passed that Prince Vasily, who formerly had so rarely given receptions, did not have company, and Pierre was obliged to be present, unless he were willing to disturb the general contentment and disappoint the expectation of all. Prince Vasily, during those rare moments when he was at home, as he passed by Pierre, would draw his head down, carelessly offer him his shaven, wrinkled cheek to kiss, and say, Till tomorrow, or, We'll meet at dinner, or else I shall not see you, or, I stay at home for your sake, or the like. But notwithstanding the fact that Prince Vasily, according to his own account, stayed at home for Pierre's sake, he did not exchange two words with him, and yet Pierre did not feel himself strong enough to disappoint him. Each day he said to himself ever the same thing, I must in the end understand her and explain her. What is she? Was I mistaken in her before, or am I mistaken now? No, she is not stupid. No, she is a beautiful girl, he said to himself from time to time. Never did she make a single error. Never, by any chance, did she say anything stupid. She spoke little, but what she said was always simple and clear. So she could not be stupid. Never was she agitated or confused. She could not be a vile woman. Often it chanced that he began to discuss with her, or to utter his thoughts in her hearing, but every time she replied in some brief but appropriately worded remark, showing that she was not interested, or else with a silent smile and look, which more palpably than anything else proved to Pierre her superiority. She was in the right, for she made it evident that all arguments and reasonings were rubbish in comparison with this smile. She always treated him with a radiant, confiding, and confidential smile, which was meant for himself alone, 
as though there were in it something more significant than there was in that smile which she wore for the world in general. Pierre knew that all were waiting for him to at last speak the one word needful, to step over the certain line, and he knew that sooner or later he should cross it. A strange and invincible horror seized him at the mere thought of this momentous step. A thousand times in the course of this fortnight, during which he felt himself all the time drawn deeper and deeper into the terrible gulf, he said to himself, What does it mean? What I need is decision. Why do I lack it? He was anxious to come to a decision, but felt with horror that, in this matter, he was not displaying the strength of will which he knew he had, and which he really had. Pierre belonged to the number of those who are strong only when they have the consciousness of being perfectly pure but ever since he had begun to be overmastered by the feeling of sensual desire that came upon him at Edda Pavlovna's, during the scene with the snuff-box, an undefined sense of guilt had paralyzed his will-power. On the evening of Ellen's name-day, a small party of friends and relatives, our nearest and dearest, as the princess expressed it, took supper at Prince Vasily's. All these friends and relatives were given to understand that, on this day, the young lady's fate was to be decided." The guests were seated in the dining-room. The Princess Kuragina, the portly, imposing woman who had once been famous for her beauty, sat at the head of the table. On each side of her were placed the more important guests, an old general, his wife, and Anna Pavlovna Scherer, and at the other end of the table were the younger and less honoured guests. And there, also, sat the various members of the household, Pierre and Ellen side by side. Prince Vasily did not sit down with the rest. He walked around the table, in a jocund mood, stopping to chat now with one, now with another of his guests, speaking some light and pleasant word to all, except Pierre and Ellen, whose presence he seemed entirely to ignore. Prince Vasily was the very life of the company. The wax candles burned brightly, the silver and cut glass gleamed, the jewels of the ladies and the gold and silver epaulets of officers glistened, the clatter of knives and plates and glasses, and the hum of lively conversation was heard around the table. An aged chamberlain, at one end, was heard assuring an aged baroness of his passionate love for her, while her laugh in reply rang out. At the other end, someone was telling of the misfortune that had fallen a certain Maria Viktorovna. Near the centre of the table, Prince Vasily was standing, with a little circle of auditors, while he told the ladies, with a facetious smile on his face, of the last meeting on Wednesday, of the Imperial Council, at which Sierzy Kuzmitz Vazmitinov, the new military governor-general of Petersburg, received and read the then famous receipt addressed to him from the army headquarters by the Emperor Alexander Pavlovich. The Emperor declared that he was receiving from all sides proofs of the devotion of the people, and that the demonstration of Petersburg was particularly delightful to him, that he was proud of being the head of such a nation, and would do all in his power to prove himself worthy of the honor. This rescript began with the words, Sergei Kuzmich, from all sides reports reach me. And so he could not get further than Sergei Kuzmich, asked a lady. No, not a hair's breadth, replied Prince Vasily, laughing. Sergei Kuzmich, from all sides, Sergei Kuzmich, from all sides. Poor Besmitinov could not get any further. Several times he began the letter over again, but could only say, Sergei, then sobs, Ku, Smith, Titch, tears, and then the words, from all sides, were drowned in sobs, and he could not get any further. And again his handkerchief, and again, Sergei Kuzimich, from all sides, and more tears, until at last he had to get someone else to read it for him. Kuzimich, from all sides, and tears, repeated someone with a laugh. Don't be naughty, exclaimed Anna Pavlovna, from the other end of the table, raising her finger threateningly. Our good Vyazmitinov is such a dear, excellent man. This greatly amused the company. At the upper end of the table, where sat the honorary guests, all were apparently in jovial spirits, and under the influence of the most varied and lively emotions. But Pierre and Ellen sat silent, side by side, at the lower end of the table. On the faces of each hovered a radiant smile, not evoked by the story about Sergei Kuzmitich, but rather a smile of bashfulness at their own thoughts. The others might chatter and laugh and jest. They might with good appetite enjoy the Rhine wine and the sauté and the ice creams. They might let their eyes avoid resting on that couple. They might seem to be quite indifferent and even to ignore their existence. Nevertheless, there was something in the very atmosphere that made it evident by the furtive glances bent upon them 
that the anecdote about Sergei Kuzmitich and the laugh that it evoked, and the dinner and everything, were but merely pretense, and that the energies of the whole company were, in reality, devoted to this young couple, Pierre and Ellen, even while Prince Vasily was imitating the lachrymo Sergei Kuzmitich. All the time his glance sought his daughter, and even when he was laughing his heartiest, the expression on his face seemed to say, Yes, yes, it is going all right. It will be decided this evening. Anna Pavlovna, when she threatened him with notre bon Vasmatinov, let Prince Vasily read in her eyes as they flashed for a moment in Pierre's direction a congratulation for his daughter's coming marriage and good fortune. The old princess, as she offered a glass of wine to her neighbor with a melancholy sigh, and glanced gravely toward her daughter, seemed to say by this sigh, Yes, my dear, now there is nothing for us but to sip sweet wine. Now it is the young people's turn to be insolently, defiantly happy. And what melancholy rubbish all that I have to say is, as though it meant anything, thought the old diplomat, as he gazed at the happy faces of the lovers, yonder is true happiness. Amid these mean, petty, and artificial interests uniting this company, there rose the natural feeling of attraction felt for each other by a handsome and healthful young man and woman, and this human feeling put to naught and soared above all their artificial babble. The jests were not amusing, the news was not interesting, the liveliness was only counterfeited. Not only they, but also the servants, waiting on the table, seemed to feel the same thing, and forget the proprieties of the service, as they gazed on beautiful Ellen, with her radiant face, and on Pierre's comely, stout face, so happy and so uneasy. It even seemed as if the light from the candles were all concentrated on these two happy faces. Pierre was conscious that he was the center of everything, and this position both pleased him and made him uncomfortable. He found himself in the position of a man plunged in some sort of absorbing occupation. He saw nothing, heard nothing, understood nothing clearly. Only occasionally, through his consciousness, flashed fragmentary thoughts and expressions of the reality. And so it is all over, he said to himself. How in the world did it happen? It was so sudden. Now I know that it is not for her sake alone, nor for my sake alone, but for the sake of all. This must be accomplished without fail. They all expect this so confidently. They are so certain that it will take place that I cannot, I cannot disappoint them. But how will it take place? I know not, but it will be, it infallibly must be, thought Pierre, as he glanced at those shoulders gleaming so near him. Then suddenly a feeling of humiliation mingled in his thoughts. He felt embarrassed to be the object of general attention, to be a lucky man in the eyes of all others, to be another, though homely Paris, possessing his Helen of Troy. But, to be sure, this has always been, and therefore it must be so, he said, trying to comfort himself. And besides, what have I done to bring it about? When did it begin? I came from Moscow with Prince Vasily. There was certainly nothing in that. Then what harm was there in my staying at his house? And so I played cards with her, and picked up her reticule, and went to drive with her. When did it begin? When did it all begin? And now here he is, sitting by her, in the quality of accepted suitor, hearing, seeing, feeling her presence, her breathing, her every motion, her beauty. Then suddenly it seemed to him that it was not she who was the beauty, but he himself, and to such an extraordinary degree that all had to look at him, and that he, delighting in this universal admiration, swelled out his chest, raised his head high, and rejoiced in his own happiness. Suddenly he heard a voice, a well-known voice, speaking and saying something for the second time, but Pierre was so absorbed that he did not comprehend what was said to him. "'I asked you when you last heard from Bolkonsky,' said Prince Vasily for the third time. "'How absent-minded you are, my dear fellow!' Prince Vasily smiled, and Pierre saw that all, all were smiling at him and at Ellen. "'Well, suppose you all do know,' said Pierre to himself. "'What then? It is true.' and he himself smiled his sweet, childlike smile, and Ellen also smiled. "'When did you get the letter? Was it from Olmutz?' repeated Prince Vasily, who pretended that he wished to know in order to decide a dispute. "'How can one talk and think about such trifles?' was Pierre's mental exclamation. "'Yes, from Olmutz,' he replied with a sigh. 
After supper Pierre gave his arm to Ellen and led her to the drawing-room in the wake of the others. The guests began to disperse, and some went away without bidding Ellen farewell. Others, as though unwilling to tear her away from serious concerns, went up to her for a minute and then hurried away, without allowing her to accompany them to the door. The diplomat preserved a mournful silence as he left the drawing-room. The utter futility of his diplomatic career presented itself in comparison with Pierre's good fortune. The old general growled out a surly reply to his wife when she asked him about the gout in his foot. Eka, the old fool, he said to himself. Here's Elena Vissilevna, and she'll be just as much of a beauty at fifty. It seems as though I might congratulate you, said Anna Pavlovna, in a whisper to the old princess, and gave her a resounding kiss. If I hadn't a sick headache, I would stay a little longer. The princess made no answer. She was tormented by jealousy at her daughter's good fortune. While the guests were taking their departure, Pierre was left for some time alone with Ellen in the little sitting-room where they often sat. During the past fortnight he had been often alone with Ellen, but he had never said a word to her about love. Now he felt that this was indispensable, but still he found it impossible to make up his mind to undertake this last step. He felt abashed. It seemed that here in Ellen's presence he occupied a place that belonged to someone else. Not for thee is this good fortune, some internal voice seemed to whisper. This happiness is for those who have not what thou hast. But it was essential to say something, and he tried to talk. He asked her if she had enjoyed the evening. She replied with her usual simplicity that this name-day had been one of the pleasant events of her life. One or two of the nearest relatives still remained. They were gathered in the great drawing-room. Prince Vasily with leisurely steps came to Pierre. Pierre got up and remarked that it was already late. Prince Vasily looked at him with a gravely questioning face, as much as to imply that what he said was too strange to be heard. But instantly this expression of sternness vanished, and Prince Vasily laid his hand on Pierre's sleeve, making him sit down again, and gave him a flattering smile. "'Well, Leolia, he asked, turning instantly to his daughter, with that easy-going tone of habitual affection peculiar to parents who have lived on terms of a special affection with their children ever since their childhood, but which in Prince Vasily's case had been acquired only through having observed other parents. And then he turned again to Pierre. Sergey Kuzmitich, from all sides, he repeated, nervously unbuttoning the upper button of his waistcoat. Pierre smiled, but his smile made it evident how well he understood that Prince Vasily was not interested now in this anecdote about Sergey Kuzmitich, and Prince Vasily understood that Pierre understood this. Prince Vasily suddenly muttered some excuse and left the room. It seemed to Pierre that even Prince Vasily was embarrassed. The appearance of embarrassment in this old society man deeply affected Pierre. He glanced at Ellen, and she, it seemed, was also embarrassed, and her glance said, "'Well, it is all your fault.' "'It is absolutely indispensable for me to take this step. But I cannot. I cannot,' said Pierre to himself, and once more he began to talk about irrelevant things, about Sergey Kuzmitich, asking what was the point of this anecdote, as he had not caught it. Ellen, with a smile, confessed that she also knew nothing about it. When Prince Vasily returned to the drawing-room, the princess was engaged in talking in low tones with an elderly lady about Pierre. Of course it is a brilliant match, but happiness, my dear, said she, in the usual mixture of French and Russian. Marriages are made in heaven. Le mariage se font dans les yeux, returned the old lady. Prince Vasily, pretending not to hear what she said, went to the farthest table and sat down on the sofa. He closed his eyes and appeared to be dozing. His head sank forward, and then he woke with a start. Alina, he said to his wife, go and see what they are doing. The princess went to the door, passed by it with a significant but indifferent look, and glanced in. Pierre and Ellen were still sitting and talking. Just the same, she said in reply to her husband. Prince Vasily scowled, and screwed his mouth to one side, and his cheeks began to twitch with that unpleasant coarse expression so characteristic of him. Then with a sudden impulse he sprang to his feet, threw his head back, and with decided steps, strode past the ladies into the little sitting-room. Swiftly, and with great assumption of delight, he went straight to Pierre. His face was so unusually triumphant that Pierre, in seeing him, rose to his feet in dismay. "'Slava Bohu! Glory to God!' he cried. "'My wife has told me all.' He threw one arm around Pierre, the other around his daughter. 
my dear boy, Liola, I am very, very glad, his voice trembled. I loved your father, and she will make you a good wife. God bless you. He embraced his daughter, then Pierre again, and kissed him with his malodorous mouth. Tears actually moistened his cheeks. Princess, come here, he cried. The princess came and wept. The elderly lady also wiped her eyes with her handkerchief. They kissed Pierre, and he kissed the lovely Ellen's hand several times. After a little while they were left alone again. All this had to be so, and could not be otherwise, thought Pierre, and there is no need to ask if it be good or evil. Good, at least, in that it is decided, and I am no longer tortured by suspense. Pierre silently held the hand of his betrothed, and looked at her fair bosom as it rose and fell. Ellen, he said aloud, and then paused. He was aware that something of this sort must be said under such circumstances, but he could not for the life of him remember what was the proper thing to say. He looked into her face. She came nearer to him. Her face grew crimson. Ach, take them off. How they— She pointed to his glasses. Pierre took them off, and his eyes had a scared and entreating look in addition to that strange expression which people's eyes assume when they remove their glasses suddenly. He was about to bend over her hand and kiss it, but she with a quick and abrupt motion of her head intercepted the motion and pressed her lips to his— her face disturbed Pierre by its changed and unpleasantly passionate expression. Now it is too late. It is all decided. Yes, and I love her, thought Pierre. Je vous aime, he said at last, remembering what was necessary in these circumstances, but these words sounded so meagre that he was ashamed of himself. At the end of a fortnight he was married, the fortunate possessor, as they say, of a beautiful wife and of millions, and settled in the enormous Petersburg mansion of the Counts Buzikoy, newly refitted for them. End of chapter 2 Part 3, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The old prince, Nikolai Andreyevich Volkonsky, in December, 1805, received a letter from Prince Vasily, announcing his coming with his son on a visit. I am making a tour of inspection, and of course the hundred versts distance across the country shall not keep me from coming to see you, venerated benefactor, he wrote, and my Anatole accompanies me. He is on his way to the army, and I hope you will permit him to show you the deep respect which he— in emulation of his father, has conceived for you. "'Well, there's no need of bringing Marie out, if suitors come to us of their own accord,' said the little princess indiscreetly, when this was mentioned to her. Prince Nikolai Andreyevich frowned and made no reply. Two weeks after the receipt of the letter, Prince Vasily's servants made their appearance in advance of him, and on the next day he and his son arrived. The old Prince Volkonsky had a low opinion of Prince Vasily's character— and this had been intensified of late by the great advances which he had made in rank and honours under the emperors Paul and Alexander. Now especially, from the letter and the insinuations made by the little princess, he saw what was in the wind, and his low opinion of Prince Vasily was transmuted in his heart into a feeling of really malevolent contempt. He snorted whenever he mentioned his name. On the day that Prince Vasily was expected, Prince Nikolai Andreyevich was especially surly and out of sorts. Whether he were out of sorts because Prince Vasily was coming, or whether he was dissatisfied with Prince Vasily's visit because he was out of sorts, it did not alter the fact that he was out of sorts, and Tikhon early in the morning advised the architect not to come near the prince unless he was summoned. "'Listen, hear him walking up and down,' remarked Tikhon, calling the architect's attention to the sounds of the prince's tramp. "'He stamps his heels,' and we all know what that means. However, at the usual hour of nine o'clock, the prince came out for his morning walk, dressed in his velvet shubka, with its sable collar, and in a cap of the same fur. The night before there had been a snowstorm. The path along which the prince walked to the orangery had been swept, traces of the broom were still to be seen on the snow, and the shovel was driven into a light embankment of snow, heaped high on both sides of the path. The prince went the round of the greenhouses, the yard, and the various buildings, frowning and silent. "'Can sleighs come up?' he asked of his overseer, 
a man who was his image in face and actions and was accompanying him with great deference back to the house the snow is deep your illustriousness i have already given orders to have the snow shoveled away from the preshbeck the prince bent his head and started to go up the steps glory to thee o lord was the overseer's mental exclamation the cloud has passed it was hard to approach your illustriousness added the superintendent when i heard your illustriousness that your illustriousness was expecting a minister the prince turned round toward his overseer and fastened his gloomy eyes upon him what a minister what minister who commanded you he exclaimed in his shrill harsh voice the road is cleared not for the princess my daughter but for a minister we have no ministers at my house your illustriousness i supposed you supposed screamed the prince uttering the words more and more hastily and incoherently you supposed cutthroats placards i will teach you to suppose and raising his cane flourished it over albatuitch and would have struck him had not the overseer instinctively dodged the blow you supposed blackguard screamed the prince but notwithstanding the fact that alpatuitch alarmed at his audacity in avoiding the blow hastened up to the prince and humbly bent before him his bald pate or possibly for this very reason the prince continued to scream blackguards have the road shoveled back again but did not raise the cane a second time and hastened into his room the princess marie and mademoiselle Bouillon, knowing that he was in a bad humor stood waiting for him to come to dinner mademoiselle burine with a beaming face which said oh i know nothing about it as for me i am always the same and the princess pale and scared with downcast eyes hardest of all was it for the princess marie to know that in these circumstances she ought to imitate mademoiselle burine but she could not do so it seemed to her if i should pretend not to pay any attention he would think that i had no sympathy for him and if i show him that i am melancholy and out of sorts myself he will say as he always does that i am in the blues the prince looked at his daughter's scared face and snorted goo or fool he muttered and the other one not here can they have been tattling to her he wondered when he saw that the little princess was not in the dining-room where is the princess he asked is she hiding herself she is not feeling very well said mademoiselle burine with a radiant smile she won't come down that is natural in her condition hm hm oh, grumbled the prince and took his seat at the table his plate seemed to him not quite clean he pointed to a spot and flung it away tikhon caught it and handed it to the butler the little princess was not ill but she was so invincibly afraid of the old prince that when she learned that he was in a bad humor she resolved not to leave her room i am afraid for my baby said she to mademoiselle burine god knows what might happen if i were frightened the little princess lived at louisia garay most of the time with a sense of fear and apathy for her father-in-law whom she did not understand because her terror so overmastered her that she could not the prince reciprocated this antipathy for his daughter-in-law but it was not so strong as his contempt for her the princess since her residence at louisia Guret, had taken special fancy to mademoiselle burine spent whole days with her often begged her to sleep with her and talked about the old prince with her and criticized him some visitors are coming to see us prince said mademoiselle burine as she unfolded her white napkin with her rosy fingers his excellency prince kurigan i understand said she with a questioning inflection hm this excellency as you call him is a puppy i got him appointed to the college said the prince disdainfully but why his son is coming is more than i know the princess lizaveta karlovna and the princess marya possibly they know but i don't know what he's bringing his son here for i don't want him and he looked at his blushing daughter so she isn't very well to-day from fear of the minister i suppose as that blockhead of an alpatuitch called him to-day no mon père though mademoiselle burine had been particularly unfortunate in her choice of a subject of conversation she was not at all put out of countenance but rattled on about the greenhouses and about the beauty of some new flower that had just blossomed and the prince after his soup melted and became more genial 
After dinner he went to see his daughter-in-law. The little princess was sitting by a stand and chatting with Masha, her maid. She turned pale at the sight of her father-in-law. The little princess had very much altered. One would now much sooner call her ugly than pretty. Her cheeks were sunken, her lip was raised, her eyes had a drawn look. Yes, a little headache, she replied to the prince's question how she felt. Do you need anything? Non, merci, mon père. Well, then. Very good. Very good. He left the room and went to the office. Albatuich, with drooping head, was waiting for him there. Is the snow shoveled back? It is, your illustriousness. Forgive me, for God's sake, this one piece of stupidity. The prince interrupted him and smiled his unnatural smile. Well, then, very good, very good. He stretched out his hand for Alpatuich to kiss, and then went to his cabinet. Prince Vasily arrived in the evening. He was met on the Preshpek, as they call the prospect, or high road, by the coachman and stable hands, who with loud shouts dragged his covered vozuk and sledge up to the entrance, over snow which had been purposefully heaped upon the driveway. Separate chambers had been prepared for Prince Vasily and Anatole. Anatole, in his shirt-sleeves, and with his arms akimbo, was sitting before a table on one corner of which he stared absent-mindedly with his large, handsome eyes, while a smile played over his lips. He looked upon his life as one unbroken round of gaiety which it was fated should be prepared for his amusement, and even now he looked in the same way on this visit to a churlish old man and a rich and monstrously ugly heiress. According to his theory, all this might lead to something very good and amusing. And why should he not marry her, if she was so very rich? That never comes amiss, thought Anatole. He shaved, perfumed himself carefully and coquettishly, and with an expression of indifference that was innate to him, and holding his head high, like a young conqueror, he went to his father's chamber. Two valets were engaged in getting Prince Vasily dressed. He himself looked around him with much animation, and gave a nod to his son as he came in, as much as to say, Good, that's the way I want you to look. No, but tell me, Babushka, without joking, is she monstrously ugly? Say, he asked, as though continuing a conversation that had been more than once broached during the course of their journey. Oh, that'll do. It's all nonsense. The main thing is to try to be respectful and prudent towards the old prince. If he's going to say unpleasant things to me, I shall go right away, said Anatole. I can't abide these old men, eh? Remember, your whole future depends upon this. Meantime, in the maidservant's room, not only was it known that the minister and his son had arrived, but every detail of their personal appearance had been circumstantially discussed. But the Princess Maria sat alone in her room, and vainly struggled to conquer her inward agitation. Why did they write me? Why has Liza spoken to me about this? Why, of course it cannot take place, said she to herself, looking into her mirror. How can I go down to the drawing-room? Even if he pleased me, I could not now be sure of myself in his presence. The mere thought of her father's eyes renewed her dismay. The little princess and Mademoiselle Burine had, by this time, received all necessary information from the maid, Masha, who told them what a handsome young man, with rosy cheeks and dark eyebrows, the minister's son was, and how, when his papenka had been scarcely able to drag his feet up the stairs, he had flown up like an eagle, three steps at a time. After hearing this news, the little princess and Mademoiselle Birine hastened to the Princess Maria's room, filling the corridor with the lively sound of their voices as they went. Ils sont arrivés, Marie. Did you know it? said the little princess, waddling along and dropping heavily into an armchair. She was no longer in the dressing sack, which she had worn in the morning, but had put on one of her best gowns. Her hair was carefully brushed, and her face was full of animation, which, however, did not atone for her sunken and livid features. In the finery in which she was accustomed to appear in Petersburg society, it was still more noticeable that her beauty had sadly faded. Mademoiselle Burine had also taken pains to make some improvement in her dress, and this made her pretty, fresh face still more attractive. "'What? And you intend to appear as you are, dear princess?' she exclaimed. "'They will be here in a moment to bring word that the gentlemen are in the drawing-room.' "'We must go down,' 
so won't you make just a little change in your toilet? The little princess got up out of the armchair, rang for the maid, and hastily and merrily began to devise some adornment for her sister-in-law, and get it materialized. The Princess Maria felt humiliated, in her own sense of dignity, by the excitement which the coming of her suitor stirred in her, and still more humiliated because both of her friends did not seem to imagine that it was possible to be otherwise. To tell them how ashamed she was for herself, and for them, would have been to betray her agitation. Moreover, to have refused to put on the adornment which they were getting ready for her would have entailed endless jests and reproaches. She grew red, her lovely eyes lost their brilliancy, her face became covered with patches, and with the unlovely expression, as of a victim, coming more and more frequently into her face, she surrendered herself into the power of Mademoiselle Burine and Lisa. Both the ladies labored in perfectly good faith to render her handsome. She was so homely that neither of them could ever dream of entering into rivalry with her. Therefore, being perfectly sincere in that naive and firm conviction peculiar to women, that ornaments can make a face beautiful, they busied themselves with her adornment. "'No, it's a fact, ma bonne amie, that dress isn't becoming,' said Lisa, looking critically at her sister-in-law from some little distance. "'Truly, that dark red masaka that you have. Truly. You know your whole fate, perhaps, depends upon this matter. This one is too light. It won't do. No. Oh, no. It won't do.' It was not that the dress was not becoming, but the princess's face and whole figure were at fault. But neither Mademoiselle Burine nor the little princess realized this. It seemed to them that if they put a blue ribbon in her hair, and combed it up properly, and then added a blue scarf to her cinnamon-colored dress, and made some other additions, all would be well. They forgot that her scared face and her figure could not be altered, and, therefore, no matter how much they might vary the frame and adornment, the face itself would remain pitiful and unattractive. At last, after two or three experiments, to which the Princess Maria patiently submitted, when her hair had been combed up high from her forehead, a mode of dressing the hair that absolutely changed her face, and that for the worse, she was dressed in the masaka dress with a blue scarf, the little princess walked around her twice in succession, adjusted with her dainty fingers some of the folds in the skirt, pulled out the scarf, looked at her with her head bent now on this side, now on that. No, that is impossible, said she, decidedly, clasping her fans. No, Marie, decidedly this does not do at all. I like you better in your little everyday grey dress. Now please, do this for me, Katya, she said to the maid. Bring the princess her greyish dress, and see, Mademoiselle Burine, how I am going to fix it, she added, with a thrill of anticipation in her artistic pleasure. But when Katya brought the desired garment, the Princess Maria sat motionless before the mirror looking at her face, and the mirror gave back the reflection of eyes full of tears, and a mouth trembling with the premonition of a storm of sobbing. Foyon, cher princess, said Mademoiselle Burine. Encore un petit effort. The little princess, taking the dress from the maid, went to the Princess Marie. Well, now we will try something that is simple and becoming, said she. The three voices— hers, Mademoiselle Burine's, and Katya's, who was laughing, mingled into one merry chatter like the chirping of birds. Non, laissez-moi, let me be, said the princess, and her voice sounded so serious and sorrowful that the chirping of the birds ceased instantly. They looked at her large, beautiful eyes, full of tears and of melancholy, and they knew from their wide and beseeching expression that it was useless and even cruel to insist. Un moi chance de coiffure, said the little princess. I told you so, said she reproachfully to Mademoiselle Burine. Marie has one of those faces which can't stand this way of dressing the hair. Not at all, not at all. Change it, please do. Laissez-moi, laissez-moi. It's all absolutely the same to me, replied the young princess in a weary voice and scarcely refraining from tears. Mademoiselle Burine and the little princess were obliged to acknowledge to themselves that the Princess Maria, as they had dressed her, was very homely, more so than usual, but now it was too late. She looked at them with that expression which they had learned to know so well, an expression of deep thought and melancholy. It did not inspire them with any sense of awe of her, for that feeling she could never inspire, but they knew that when her face had this expression, she was silent and immovable in her resolutions. Vous changerez, n'est-ce pas? asked Lisa, 
but when the Princess Maria made no reply, Lisa left the room. The Princess Maria was left alone. She would not grant Lisa's request, and not only she did not change the style of her hair, but did not even look at herself in the glass. Dropping her eyes, and letting her hands fall nervously, she sat and pondered. She saw in her imagination her husband, a man, a strong, commanding, and strangely attractive being, who should suddenly carry her off into his own world, so different from hers, so full of happiness. She imagined herself pressing to her bosom her own child, just such a baby as she had seen the evening before at her old nurse's daughter's. Her husband stands looking affectionately at her and their baby. But no, this is impossible. I am too homely, said she to herself. Please come to tea. The prince will be down in a moment, said the voice of the chambermaid outside the door. She started up from her daydream, and was horror-struck at her own thoughts, and before she went downstairs she got up, went into the oratory, and pausing before the blackened face of the great image of the Saviour, lighted by the beams of the tapers, she stood there for several moments with folded hands. Her heart was filled with painful forebodings. Could it be that for her there was the possibility of the joy of love, of earthly love for husband? In her imaginings concerning marriage, the Princess Maria dreamed of family happiness and children, but her principal dream, predominating over all others, though unknown to herself, was that of earthly love. The feeling was all the stronger, the more she tried to hide it from others, and even from herself. "'My God!' she cried. "'How can I crush out of my heart these thoughts of the evil one? How can I escape once and for all from evil imaginings, and calmly fulfill thy will?' and she had hardly offered this prayer ere God gave an answer in her own heart. Desire nothing for thyself, seek not, disturb not thyself, be not envious. The future and thy fate must needs be hidden from thee, but live so as to be ready for anything. If it please God to try thee in the responsibilities of marriage, be ready to fulfill his will. With this consoling thought, but still with a secret hope that her forbidden earthly dream might be realized, the Princess Maria, with a sigh, crossed herself and went downstairs, thinking not of her dress, or of her hair, or of how she should make entrance, or of what she should say. What did all that signify in comparison with the preordination of God, without whose will not a hair can fall from a man's head? End of chapter 3 Part Three, Chapter Four of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. When the Princess Maria came down, Prince Vasily and his son were already in the drawing room, talking with the little princess and Mademoiselle Burine. When she came in with her heavy gait, treading on her heels, the gentleman and Mademoiselle Burine stood up, and the little princess exclaimed, "Viola Marie." The Princess Maria saw them all, and saw them distinctly. She saw Prince Vasily's face becoming for an instant serious at the sight of her, instantly resume its smiling expression, and the little princess watching curiously the impression which her entrance would produce upon their guests. She also saw Mademoiselle Burine, with her ribbon and her pretty face, and her eyes more sparkling than usual, fixed on him. But she could not bring herself to see him, and all she could see was something tall, brilliant and magnificent coming toward her as she entered the room. Prince Vasily was the first to greet her, and she kissed the bald forehead, bending over her hand, and answered his question by assuring him that, on the contrary, she remembered him very well. Then Anatol came to her. She could not see him as yet at all. She was only conscious of a soft hand holding hers, while she lightly touched with her lips the white brow adorned with handsome brown hair. When she looked at him, his beauty dazzled her. Anatol, hooking his right thumb behind one button of his uniform, stood with his chest thrust out and his back bent in, resting his weight on one leg and slightly inclining his head, and looking at the princess cheerily, but without speaking. He was evidently not thinking of her at all. Anatol was not quick-witted or a ready talker, but on the other hand, he had that gift of composure which is so invaluable in society— and a self-confidence that nothing could disturb. 
if a man lacking self-confidence is silent at a first introduction and betrays a consciousness of the impropriety of such a silence and attempts to escape from it it makes a bad matter worse but anatole swaying a little on one leg had nothing to say and gazed with an amused look at the princess's hair it was evident that such ease of manner would enable him to preserve silence any length of time his look seemed to say if this silence is awkward for any one then speak but as for me i have no desire to say anything moreover anatole had in his behaviour toward women that manner which strongly piques curiosity and excites fear and even love in them a sort of scornful consciousness of his own superiority his look seemed to say to them i know you i know what is disturbing you ah oh, how happy you would be if possibly he did not think any such thing when he met women and there is considerable ground for such a supposition because he thought very little but this was what was expressed by his look and manner the princess felt it and apparently wishing to show him that she did not venture to do such a thing as engage his attention she turned to his father the conversation became general and rather lively thanks to the merry voice of the little princess whose downy lip was constantly showing her white teeth she met prince vasily with that peculiarly vivacious manner which is often employed by people of merry loquacious mood and consists in the interchange between you and your acquaintance of the regular stock of witticisms of the day and of pleasant and amusing reminiscences which it is taken for granted are not understood by all people but which really do not exist at all any more than they did exist in the case of the little princess and prince vasily prince vasily willingly adapted himself to this spirit the little princess managed to include anatole as well though she scarcely knew him and soon found herself sharing with him in recollections of events that in some cases had never happened at all mademoiselle burine also took part in these general recollections and even the princess maria had a sort of satisfaction in feeling herself drawn into this light gossip here at least we shall have the benefit of your company all to ourselves dear prince said the little princess in french of course to prince vasily it won't be as it used to be at our receptions at annette's where you always made your escape you know cette chère annette ah but of course you won't oblige me to talk about politics as annette does but our tea-table oh yes why were you never at annette's asked the little princess to anatole oh but i know i know said she with a sly expression your brother ippolit told me all about your doings oh she exclaimed threatening him with her finger and then again in paris i know all about your pranks and hasn't ippolit told you asked prince vasily addressing his son and seizing princess liza by the arm as though they were in danger of her running away and he wished to prevent it while yet there was time hasn't he ever told you how he himself was dead in love with our dear princess here and how she wouldn't have anything to say to him oh she is a pearl among women princess said he addressing the princess maria mademoiselle burine on her part when she heard the word paris did not lose the opportunity of also adding her recollections to the general conversation she allowed herself to inquire of anatole if he had been long in paris and how that city pleased him anatole took evident pleasure in answering the frenchwoman's questions and with a smile talked with her about her native land seeing how pretty la burine was anatole decided that after all it would not be so very stupid here at louisia Guri. not at all bad looking he said to himself as he looked at her very far from it i hope that when she marries me she will take this demoiselle de compagnie with her la petite gentille the old prince took his own time about dressing and as he thought what course was best for him to take he frowned the coming of these guests annoyed him what are prince vasily and his son to me prince vasily is an empty swaggerer and his son must be a fine specimen he grumbled to himself he was annoyed because the coming of these guests aroused in the depths of his soul an unsettled and constantly avoided question a question in regard to which the old prince was always deceiving himself the question was this whether he could make up his mind to part with his daughter and let her marry the old prince could never bring himself to ask the question directly knowing beforehand that if he should answer it honestly his honesty would come into open antagonism not merely with his feelings but with the whole order and system of his life for prince nikolai andreitch life without his daughter 
little as he outwardly seemed to appreciate her, was out of the question. And why should she get married, he asked himself, probably to be unhappy. Here is Liza. Certainly it would be hard to find a better husband than Andre, and yet is she contented with her lot? And who would take her from mere love? She is homely, awkward. They would marry her for her connections, for her wealth. And can't girls live unmarried? They'd be much happier. Thus thought Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch as he performed his toilet in his cabinet, and still at the same time the ever-procrastinated question now demanded an immediate solution. Prince Vasily had brought his son, evidently with the intention of making a proposal, and therefore this very day, or the next, he should have to give a direct answer. His name, his position in the world, was excellent. "'Well, I've no objection,' said the prince to himself, "'but let him prove himself worthy of her. "'Well, we shall see. "'Yes, we shall see,' he exclaimed aloud. "'Yes, we shall see how it is.' and with his usual firm tread he went into the drawing-room, took in all present with a sweeping glance, noticed even the change that the little princess had made in her dress, and La Burine's ribbon, and the Princess Maria's monstrous headdress, and her isolation in the general conversation, and not least, Burine and Anatole's exchange of smiles. "'She is dressed up like a fool,' he thought, giving his daughter a wrathful glance. "'She has no sense of shame, and he—' He does not care anything about making her acquaintance. He went straight to Prince Vasily. Well, how are you? How are you? Glad to see you. Friendship laughs at distance, exclaimed Prince Vasily, quoting the familiar proverb with ready wit, and with his usual self-confident familiarity. Here is my second son. Grant him your friendship, I beg of you. Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch surveyed Anatole. A fine young fellow— "'Fine young fellow,' said he. "'Now come, give me a kiss.' And he offered him his cheek. Anatole kissed the old man and looked at him curiously, but with perfect composure, expecting soon to hear one of those droll remarks of which his father had told him. Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch sat down in his usual place at one end of the sofa and drew up an armchair for Prince Vasily, pointed him to it, and began to ask him about the news in the political world. He listened with apparent attention to what Prince Vasily had to say, but he kept glancing at the Princess Maria. "'So that's what they write from Potsdam, is it?' said he, repeating Prince Vasily's last words, and then suddenly getting up he went over to his daughter. "'So this is how you dress before company, eh?' exclaimed here. "'Excellent. Admirable. You appear before folks with your hair done up in this new-fangled way, and I tell you, in the presence of these same folks, Never again, without my leave, to rig yourself up in such a fashion. It was my fault, mon père, said the little princess, blushing and coming to her sister-in-law's rescue. You can do as you please, said Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch, making a low bow before his son's wife. But she has no right to disfigure herself. She's ugly enough without that. And once more resumed his place, paying no further heed to his daughter, who was ready to weep. "'On the contrary, that way of dressing her hair is very becoming to the princess,' said Prince Vasily. "'Well, Batyushka, my young prince, what is his name?' said Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch, turning to Anatole. "'Come here. Let us have a little talk and get acquainted.' "'Now the sport begins,' thought Anatole, and with a smile he took a seat by the old prince. "'Well now, my dear, you have been educated abroad, somewhat different from your father and me,' who had the parish Yokchak to teach us our ABCs. "'Tell me, my dear, you serve in the horse guards, don't you?' asked the old prince, scrutinizing Anatole closely and keenly. "'No, I have been transferred to the line,' replied Anatole, scarcely able to keep from laughing. "'Ah, excellent thing! So that you can serve the Tsar in your country. It's wartime. Such fine young men as you ought to be in the service. At the front, I suppose?' No, Prince, our regiment has gone, but I was detached. What was I detached for, Papa? asked Anatole, turning to his father with a laugh. Famous way of serving, I must confess. What am I detached for? Ha <laughs> ha! roared Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch, and Anatole joined in still more vociferously. Suddenly Prince Nikolai Andreyevitch began to scowl. Well, get you gone, said he to Anatole. Anatole, with a smile, went and rejoined the ladies. 
"'And so you have had him educated abroad, eh, Prince Vasily?' asked the old prince of Kurigan. "'I did the best I could for him, and I must say that the schools there are far better than ours.' "'Well, everything is changed, all new-fangled notions. He's a fine young man, a fine lad. Now let's go into my room.' He took Prince Vasily by the arm and carried him off to his cabinet. Prince Vasily, finding himself alone with the old prince, immediately began to unfold to him his wishes and hopes. "'What kind of an idea have you?' exclaimed the old prince savagely. "'That I keep her tied and cannot part with her? What notions they have!' he exclaimed angrily. "'Tomorrow, as far as I am concerned, I merely tell you that I want to know my daughter's husband better. You know my principles, all above board. Tomorrow I will ask her in your presence if she will have him. If she will, then let him stay. Let him stay, I will study him.' The prince snorted. "'Or let him go, it's all the same to me,' he cried in the same piercing tone in which he had uttered his farewell when his son took his departure." "'I will tell you frankly,' said Prince Vasily, in the tone of a cunning man who is convinced of the uselessness of trying to be shrewd towards such a sharp-eyed opponent. "'You see, your eyes read through men. Anatole is no genius, but he is an honourable, kind-hearted boy, and an excellent son.' "'Very good. We shall see.' As usually happens in the case of women, who have been long deprived of the society of men, all three of the women at Prince Andreevich's, now that they had Anatole in their midst, felt that hitherto life had not been life for them. The powers of thinking, feeling, loving, were instantly multiplied tenfold in each one of them, so that their existence, which had been till now, as it were, spent in darkness, was suddenly filled by a new light, full of rich significance. The Princess Maria no longer gave a thought to her looks, or the dressing of her hair, her whole attention was absorbed by the handsome open face of the man who perhaps would be her husband. He seemed to her good, brave, resolute, manly, and noble. She was quite convinced of this. A thousand dreams of the family life which she should enjoy in the future persisted in rising in her mind. She tried to banish them and keep them out of her imagination. "'But was I too cool toward him?' queried the Princess Maria. I try to be reserved, because I feel in the depths of my soul that he is already too near to me, but of course he cannot know all that I think about him, and he may imagine that I do not like him. And the young princess strove, and yet was unable to be amiable to her new guest. La pauvre fille, elle est diable molède. Devilishly ugly. Such was Anatole's uncomplimentary thought of her. Mademoiselle Burine, who Anatole's arrival had brought into a high state of excitement, allowed herself to have quite different thoughts. Of course, being a pretty young girl, without any stated position in society, without relatives and friends, and far from her native land, she had no intention of devoting her whole life to the service of Prince Nikolai Andreevich, reading books to him and playing the part of companion to the Princess Maria. Mademoiselle Burine had been long waiting for the Russian prince, who should immediately have wit enough to appreciate her superiority to these homely, unbecomingly dressed, and awkward Russian princesses, should fall in love with her and elope with her. Now at last the Russian prince had come. Mademoiselle Burine knew a story which her aunt had once told her, and which in imagination she liked to repeat to the end, with herself in the heroine's place. The story was about a young girl who had been seduced, and whose poor mother, sa pauvre mère, finding where she was, came and covered her with reproaches because she had gone to live with a man to whom she was not married. Mademoiselle Burine was often melted to tears by imagining herself telling him, her seducer, this story. And now this he, this genuine Russian prince, had made his appearance. He would elope with her. Then sa pauvre mère would appear, and he would marry her. Thus in Mademoiselle Burine's fertile brain the whole romance evolved itself, from the moment that she began to talk with him about Paris. Not that Mademoiselle Burine conceived of all the details, or what she was going to do did not once occur to her, but still all the materials were long ago ready in her, and now they merely grouped themselves around Anatole, whom she was anxious and determined to please as much as possible. The little princess, forgetting her situation instinctively, and like an old war-horse at the sound of the trumpet, made ready to flirt at headlong speed 
without meaning anything by it, but with her usual naive and light-hearted spirit of fun. In spite of the fact that Anatole in the society of women generally affected the position of a man who considers it a bore to have them running after him, still he felt a consciousness of gratified vanity to see his power over these three women. Moreover, he began to feel for the pretty and enticing Burine a real animal passion, such as sometimes overcame him with extraordinary rapidity and impelled him to commit the coarsest and most audacious actions. After tea, they all went into the divan room, and the Princess Maria was invited to play on the harpsichord. Anatole leaned on his elbows, in front of her, near Mademoiselle Burine, and, with eyes full of mirth and gaiety, looked at the young princess, who with a painful and at the same time joyous emotion felt his gaze resting on her. Her favorite sonata bore her away into a most genuinely poetic world, and the consciousness of that glance endowed this world with even more poetry. In reality, however, Anatole, though he looked in her direction, was not thinking of her, but was occupied with the motion of Mademoiselle Burine's foot, which he was at this moment pressing with his under the piano. Mademoiselle Burine was also looking at the princess, but her beautiful eyes had an expression of frightened happiness and hope. How fond she is of me, thought the Princess Maria. How happy I am now, and how happy I might be with such a friend and such a husband. Husband! Can it be possible? she asked herself, not daring to look at him, but, nevertheless, feeling his gaze fixed on her face. In the evening, when after supper they were about to separate for the night, Anatole kissed the young princess's hand. She herself knew not how she dared to do such a thing, but she looked straight into his handsome face as it approached her short-sighted eyes. Turning from the princess, he went and kissed Mademoiselle Burine's hand. This was contrary to etiquette, but he did everything with such confidence and simplicity. Mademoiselle Burine flushed and glanced in dismay at the princess. Quelle délicatesse! How considerate of him, thought the princess. Can it be that Emile, so she called Mademoiselle Burine, thinks that I should be jealous of her and do not appreciate her affection and devotion to me? She went straight over to Mademoiselle Burine and gave her an affectionate kiss. Anatole was about to kiss the little princess's hand also. Non, non, non. When your father writes me that you are behaving beautifully, then I will let you kiss my hand. Not before and, shaking her finger at him, she left the room with a smile. End of chapter 4 Part 3, Chapter 5 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne All had gone to their rooms, but, with the exception of Anatole, who went to sleep as soon as he got into bed, it was long before any one could close an eye that night. Is he really to be my husband, this handsome stranger, who seems so good? Ah, yes, above all, so good, thought the Princess Maria, and a feeling of fear, such as she had scarcely ever experienced before, came upon her. She was afraid to look round. It seemed to her as though someone were standing there behind the screen in the dark corner, and this someone was he, the devil, and he was this man with the white forehead, the black eyebrows, and the rosy lips. She called her maid and begged for her to sleep in her room. Mademoiselle Burine, that same evening, walked for a long time up and down the winter garden, vainly expecting someone, now smiling at her own thought, now stirred to tears by imagining the words which so pauvre mère would say in reproaching her after her fall. The little princess scolded her maid because her bed was not comfortable. It was impossible for her to lie on her side or on her face. Any position was awkward and uncomfortable. She felt more than ever tried today, especially because Anatole's presence brought back so vividly the days before she was married, when she was light-hearted and merry. She reclined in her easy chair, in her dressing jacket and nightcap. Katya, half asleep, with her hair hanging down in a braid, was turning for the third time and shaking up the heavy mattress, muttering to herself. "'I told you that it was all humps and hollows,' insisted the little princess. "'I should like to go to sleep myself. "'I'm sure it isn't my fault.' And her voice trembled, as though she were a child, getting ready to cry. The old prince also could not sleep. Tikhon, as he napped, 
heard him stamping wrathfully up and down and snorting it seemed to the old prince that he had been insulted through his daughter the insult was painful because it was directed not to himself but to another to his daughter whom he loved better than himself he kept telling himself that he would calmly think the whole matter over and decide how in justice to himself he must act but instead of so doing he grew more and more vexed with himself let the first young man come along and she forgets father and all and she runs upstairs combs up her hair and prinks and is no longer like herself glad to throw her father over and she knew that i that i noticed it fur 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 and then haven't i eyes to see that that simpleton has no eyes for any one except yurinka must get rid of her and how is it that she hasn't enough pride to see it herself if not for her own sake she might at least show some for mine i must show her that this booby doesn't think of her at all but only stares at burine she has no pride but i'll prove this for her the old prince knew that if he told his daughter that she was laboring under a delusion that anatole was bent on flirting with burine he would in this way touch his daughter's pride and his game would be played for he was anxious not to part with his daughter this consideration served to quiet him he summoned Tikhon and began to undress. "'The devil take him,' he said to himself, as Tikhon slipped the nightshirt over his master's thin, old body, the chest overgrown with grey hairs. "'I did not invite him. They have come to upset my whole life, and my life will soon come to an end. The devil with him," he muttered, when his head was still hidden by the shirt. Tikhon knew the prince's habit of sometimes thinking aloud, and therefore he met with unflinching eyes the prince's wrathfully scrutinizing gaze as his head came out from the nightshirt. "'Have they gone to bed?' asked the prince. Tikhon, after the manner of all well-trained valets, knew by intuition what his baron was thinking about. He judged that the question referred to Prince Vasily and his son. "'They have deigned to go to bed, and their lights are out, your lustrousness.' "'No reason why they shouldn't,' briskly exclaimed the prince, and thrusting his feet into his slippers and his arms into his dressing-gown he went to the sofa where he usually slept although but few words had been exchanged by anatole and mademoiselle burine they thoroughly understood one another as to the first chapters of the romance up to the appearance of pauvre mer they understood that they had much to say to each other in secret and therefore early in the morning they both sought an opportunity for a private interview while the young princess was going at the usual hour to meet her father Mademoiselle Burine and Anatole met in the winter garden. The Princess Maria, on this particular day, went with more than her usual trepidation to the door of her father's cabinet. It seemed to her that every one knew that this day her fate was to be decided, but also knew what she herself felt about it. She read this expression on Tikhon's face, and on the face of Prince Vasily's valet, as he met her in the corridor on his way with hot water for the prince, and made her a low bow. The old prince this morning was thoroughly affectionate and kind in his behavior to his daughter. The princess Maria well knew this expression of kindness. It was the expression which his face generally wore when his nervous hands doubled up with vexation because she did not understand her arithmetical examples, and he would spring to his feet, walk away from her, and then repeat the same words in a low, gentle voice. He immediately addressed himself to the business in hand, and began to explain to her, all the time using the formal oui, you. I have received an offer for your hand in marriage, said he, with an unnatural smile. I suppose you did not imagine, he went on to say, that he came here and brought his pupil. For some inexplicable reason, Prince Nikolai Andreyevich called Anatole Vospitanik, pupil, for the sake of my handsome eyes. Last evening he proposed for your hand, and, as you know my principles, I refer it to you. How am I to understand you, mon père? she exclaimed, turning pale and then blushing. How understand me? cried her father, wrathfully. Prince Vasily is satisfied with you for a daughter-in-law, and has proposed for your hand in behalf of his pupil. That's what it means. How understand it? That I ask you. I do not know so well as you, mon père, whispered the princess. I? I? What have I got to do with it? Consider me out of the question. I'm not the one who's going to be married. What's your opinion? That is what must be known. 
the princess saw that her father did not regard the matter very favorably but at the same time the thought occurred to her that now or never the whole destiny of her life hung in the balance she dropped her eyes so as not to see his face because she knew that she could not think if she were under its dominion but even then she could only be subject to him and she said i desire only one thing to fulfill your will but if it be necessary for me to express my desire she had no time to finish her sentence the prince interrupted her that's admirable he cried he will take you for your fortune and by the way we'll call mademoiselle burine she will be his wife and you the prince paused he noticed the effect produced on his daughter by his words she hung her head and was ready to burst into tears well well i was only jesting said he remember this one thing princess i stick to my principles that a girl has a perfect right to choose for herself i give you your freedom remember this though the happiness of your whole life depends upon your decision leave me out of the consideration but i do not know mon père there is nothing to be said he will marry as he is bid whether it be you or somebody else but you are free to choose go to your room think it over and at the end of an hour come to me and tell me in his presence what your decision is yea or no i know that you'll have to pray over it well pray if you please only you'd better use your reason get you gone yea or no yea or no yea or no cried he as the princess still in a mist left the room with tottering step her fate was already decided and happily decided but what her father said about mademoiselle burine that insinuation was horrible false let us hope but still it was horrible and she could not keep it out of her thoughts she started directly to her room through the winter garden seeing nothing and hearing nothing when suddenly mademoiselle burine's well-known chatter struck her ear and woke her from her dreaming she raised her eyes and two paces away saw anatole with the frenchwoman in his arms and whispering something in her ear with a terrible expression on his handsome face he looked at the princess maria and at first did not release mademoiselle burine who had not seen the princess at all who is here what is the trouble just wait a little anatole's face seemed to say the princess maria silently gazed at them she could not comprehend it then mademoiselle burine uttered a cry and fled anatole with an amused smile gave the princess a bow as though asking her to look on the ridiculous side of this strange behavior and shrugging his shoulders disappeared through the door that led to his own quarters at the end of an hour tikhon came to summon the princess maria he conducted her to her father's room and told her that prince vasily was also there when tikhon came for her the princess was sitting on a sofa in her room with her arm around mademoiselle burine the latter was weeping and the princess softly stroked her hair the princess's beautiful eyes with all their usual calmness and brilliancy gazed with affectionate love and sympathy into mademoiselle burine's pretty face no princess my place is forever gone from your heart said mademoiselle burine why i love you more than ever replied the princess maria and i will try to do all that is in my power for your happiness but you despise me you who are so pure will never understand this frenzy of passion ah my poor mother i understand it all replied the princess with a melancholy smile compose yourself my friend i am going to see my father said she and left the room prince vasily with one leg thrown across his knee and holding his snuff-box in his hand was greatly excited and evidently realized that he was in a precarious condition and yet he tried to conquer his own nervousness he was sitting with an imploring smile on his face as the princess maria entered the room he hastily applied a pinch of snuff to his nose ah ma bonne ma bonne he exclaimed rising and seizing her by both hands he sighed and added my son's fate is in your hand Decidez, ma bonne ma chère ma dose marie i have always loved you as though you were my own daughter he turned away genuine tears stood in his eyes fur fur snorted prince nikolai andreitch the prince in the name of his pupil i mean his son makes you an offer 
will you or will you not be the wife of prince anatole kuragin speak yea or no cried he and then i reserve to myself the right to give my opinion also yes my opinion and only my opinion added prince nikolai andreitch in reply to prince vasily's beseeching expression yea or no my desire mon père is never to leave you nor to part from you as long as we live i do not wish to marry said she with firm deliberation fixing her beautiful eyes on prince vasily and on her father folly nonsense 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 cried prince nikolai andreitch frowning he drew his daughter close to him yet he did not kiss her but merely brought his forehead close to hers and squeezed her hand which he held in his so that she screamed out with pain prince vasily arose my dear i will tell you that this is a moment that i shall never forget never but my dear can't you give us a little hope of ever touching your kind and generous heart say that perhaps the future is so long only say perhaps prince what i have told you is all that my heart can say i thank you for the honour but i can never be your son's wife well that ends it my dear fellow very glad to have seen you very glad to have seen you go to your room princess go to your room said the old prince very very glad to have seen you he reiterated embracing prince vasily my vocation is different said the princess maria to herself my vocation is to be happy in the happiness of others a different sort of happiness the happiness of love and self-sacrifice and so far as within me lies i will bring about the happiness of poor emily she loves him so passionately she repents her conduct so bitterly i will do everything to bring about a marriage between them if he is not rich i will give her the means i will petition my father i will ask andre and i shall be so happy when she becomes his wife she is so unfortunate lonely and helpless in a strange land ah bosmois how passionately she must love him if she can so far forget herself maybe i myself should have done the same thing thought the princess maria End of chapter five Part three, chapter six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Rostovs had not heard for a long time from the Nikolushka, and it was near the middle of winter when a letter was handed to the Count, on the envelope of which he recognized his son's handwriting. On receipt of the letter, the Count hastily and anxiously stole off to his own cabinet, walking on his tiptoes. To as to escape observation, and shut himself in, and began to read it. Anna Mikhailovna, learning about the arrival of the letter, for she knew everything that took place in the house, quietly followed the Count, and found him with the letter in his hands, sobbing and laughing at the same time. Anna Mikhailovna, notwithstanding the improvement in her affairs, still continued to live at the Rostovs. Mon bon ami, exclaimed Anna Mikhailovna, with a tone of pathetic inquiry in her voice, and prepared to give him sympathy to any extent the count sobbed still more violently nikolushka a letter wounded he w was wounded ma chere wounded my darling boy the little countess ben made an officer glory to god salva bohu how can i tell the little countess Anna Mikhailovna sat down by him, wiped the tears from his eyes with her handkerchief, and from the letter, for they were dropping on it, and then from her own eyes, read the letter herself, soothed the Count, and decided that she would use the time till dinner, and even tea, for preparing the Countess, and then after tea she would break the news to her, if God would only aid her. During dinner-time Anna Mikhailovna talked about the events of the war, and about Nikolushka, and asked twice when they had received the last letter from him though she herself knew perfectly well and remarked that very likely they might have a letter from him perhaps that day every time when at such insinuations the countess began to grow uneasy 
and glance anxiously first at the count and then at anna mikhailovna anna mikhailovna most adroitly led the conversation to insignificant topics natasha more than the rest of the family was endowed with peculiar sensitiveness to shades of intonation to the looks and expressions of faces and as soon as dinner began she pricked up her ears and came to the conclusion that there was some secret between her father and anna mikhailovna and that it was something referring to her brother and that anna mikhailovna was trying to prepare some one notwithstanding all her audacity she dared not ask any questions during dinner-time for she knew too well how sensitive her mother was in regard to all that related to her son but her curiosity was so great that she ate nothing and kept turning and twisting in her chair in spite of the reproaches of her governess after dinner she rushed precipitously after anna mikhailovna and threw herself into her arms auntie darling tell me what it is nothing my dear yes there is dearest sweet one you old pet and i shan't let you go till you tell me for i know that you know anna mikhailovna shook her head your little witch une fine mouche mon enfant said she a letter from nikolenka truly isn't that it cried natasha reading an affirmative answer in anna mikhailovna's face yes but for heaven's sake be more cautious you know how this might trouble your maman i will i will but tell me all about it you won't tell me well then i'm going right to tell her anna mikhailovna in few words told natasha the contents of the letter under the conditions of secrecy my true true word of honor said natasha crossing herself i won't tell any one and immediately she went to sonya nikolenka wounded a letter she exclaimed triumphantly and joyously nicholas cried sonya turning pale natasha seeing the impression produced on sonya by the news that her brother was wounded realized for the first time all the sorrowful side of the news she ran to sonya threw her arms around her neck and burst into tears he's not badly wounded and has been promoted to be an officer he's all well again for he wrote the letter himself cried she through her tears that's the way all you women are milksops exclaimed petya marching along with gallant strides up and down the room i am very glad more glad than i can tell that my brother has distinguished himself so you are all crybabies you haven't any sense at all natasha smiled through her tears you haven't read the letter have you no i haven't read it but she said the worst was over and that he was already an officer glory to god cried sonya crossing herself but maybe she was deceiving you let's go to maman petya walked silently up and down the room if i had been in nikolushka's place i should have killed still more of those frenchmen said he after a little what nasty brutes they are i would have killed such a lot of them that it would have made a pile so high continued petya hush petya what a goose you are i am not a goose but you are geese to cry over mere trifles said he do you remember him suddenly asked natasha after a moment's silence sonya smiled do i remember nicholas no sonya do you remember him perfectly so that you can recall everything about him asked natasha with an emphatic gesture evidently wishing to give her words the most serious meaning well now i remember nikolenka i remember him well but i don't remember boris i don't remember him at all what you don't remember boris exclaimed sonya in amazement no i don't really remember him i have a general idea how he looked but i can't bring him up before me as i can nikolenka if i shut my eyes i can see but it is not so with boris she shut her eyes that way no not at all oh natasha said sonya looking at her friend with enraptured earnestness as though she considered her unworthy to hear what she had in mind to say and as though she were saying it to some one else with whom it was impossible to jest i love your brother and whatever might happen to him or to me i shall never cease to love him as long as i live natasha looked at sonya with wondering inquisitive eyes and made no answer she felt convinced that what sonya had said was true that what sonya talked about was real love but natasha had never experienced anything like it 
she believed that it was in the realm of the possible, but she could not understand it. "'Shall you write him?' she asked. Sonya deliberated. The question how to write to Nicholas, and whether it were her duty to write to him, and what she should write to him, tormented her. Now that he were already an officer, and a wounded hero, it was a question of doubt in her mind whether it would be right for her to remind him of herself, and of the promise which he had made to her. "'I do not know. I think if he writes to me, then I will answer it,' she replied, blushing. "'And shan't you feel ashamed to write to him?' Sonya smiled. "'No. Well, I should feel ashamed to write to Boris, and I am not going to. Why should one feel ashamed? There now, I'm sure I don't know. It's awkward, anyway. I should be—well, I know why she would be ashamed, said Petya, affronted at Natasha's first remark, because she fell in love with that fat fellow with the glasses. He meant by this his namesake, Pierre, the new Count Buzikoy. And now she's in love with that singer— Petya now referred to an Italian who was giving Natasha singing lessons, and that's why she would be ashamed. Petya, you're too silly. I'm no sillier than you are, Matushka, said the ten-year-old lad, exactly as though he were an elderly brigadier. The countess had been prepared during dinner-time by means of Anna Mikhailovna's hints. Going to her own room, she sat down on her sofa, not taking her eyes from a miniature picture of her son, painted on her snuff-box, and her eyes quickly filled with tears. Anna Mikhailovna, with the letter, came into the countess's room on her tiptoes and remained standing. "'Don't you come in,' she said to the old count, who was following her. She closed the door behind her. The count applied his ear to the keyhole and tried to listen. At first all that he heard was a monotonous sound of voices. Then Anna Mikhailovna, making a long speech without interruption, then a shriek, then silence, then again both voices speaking together with joyful inflections, and then steps, and Anna Mikhailovna opened the door. Anna Mikhailovna's face wore the proud expression of a surgical operator, who had just accomplished a difficult amputation and allows the public to enter and appreciate his skill. C'est fait. It's all right, said she to the Count, pointing with an enthusiastic gesture to the Countess, who held in one hand the snuff-box with the portrait, in the other the letter, and was pressing her lips first to the one and then to the other. Seeing the Count, she stretched out her hand toward him, embraced his bald head, and over his bald head looked at the letter and the portrait, and then, in order to press them to her lips again, very gently pushed the bald head away. Fiera, Natasha, Sonya, and Petya came into the room, and the reading of the letter began. It contained a brief description of the campaign and the two engagements in which Nikolushka had taken place. He announced his promotion and said that he kissed Maman and Papa's hands, asking for their blessing, and kissed Viera, Natasha, and Petya. Moreover, he made his respects to Mr. Schelling and Madame Sauchet and his old nurse, and then he begged them to kiss his dear Sonya, whom he had always loved so, and whom he had remembered so affectionately. When Sonya heard this, she blushed so that tears came into her eyes, and, not able to endure the glances fastened on her, she ran into the drawing parlor, whirled around it at full speed, her dress flying out like a balloon, and then plumped down on the floor, all flushed and smiling. The countess melted into tears. "'What makes you cry, maman? asked Viera. "'Everything that he writes seems to me a cause for rejoicing, and not for weeping.' This was perfectly true, but, nevertheless, the Count and the Countess and Natasha all looked at her reproachfully. "'Whom is she like, I wonder?' said the Countess to herself. Nikolushka's letter was re-read a hundred times, and those who felt themselves entitled to hear it had to go to the Countess, who would not let it out of her hands. The tutors came, and the nurses, and Matenka, and ever so many acquaintances, and the Countess read the letter to them each time with new delight, each time discovering new virtues in her Nikolushka. How strange, marvellous, and beautiful it was to her that her son, that son, the almost imperceptible motions of whose tiny limbs she had felt twenty years before, that son over whom she had quarrelled with the Count for spoiling him, that son who had learned to say Grusha first and then Baba, 
that this same son was now far away in a foreign land in foreign surroundings a heroic soldier alone without help or guidance performing there his part in the deeds of heroes the universal experience of the world in all ages going to show that children by imperceptible steps march from the cradle into manhood was not realized by the countess the attainment of manhood by her son was at every step as extraordinary as though there had not been millions upon millions of men who had gone through exactly the same process just as twenty years before it had been almost impossible for her to believe that the mysterious little being that was living and moving somewhere under her heart would ever wail and nurse and learn to talk so now it was incredible that this same being had become a strong gallant man the paragon of sons and of men such as he was now judging by his letter what a style he has how elegantly he expresses himself said she as she read over the descriptive portions of the letter and how much soul nothing about himself nothing at all something about denisof but he himself must have been braver than all the rest he writes nothing at all about his sufferings how much heart he has how well i know him and how kindly he remembers all the household he did not forget a single one but i always said it of him even when he was ever so little i always said it for more than a week rough drafts of letters to nikolushka were prepared and written and copied out on white paper by the whole family under the superintendence of the countess and the zealous care of the count all sorts of necessary articles were made into a parcel together with money for the new uniform and the installation of the newly appointed officer anna mikhailovna a practical woman had been shrewd enough to secure for her son a protector in the army even for the better forwarding of correspondence she had managed to find the opportunity of sending her letters in care of the grand duke konstantin pavlovitch who commanded the guards the rostovs had supposed that ruskaya gvardia zagranitsye the russian guard on service abroad was a sufficiently definite address and that if a letter reached the grand duke commanding the guards then there was no reason why it should not reach the pavlograd regiment which must be somewhere near and therefore it was decided to be best to send the packet and the money by the grand duke's courier to boris and boris would see to it that it was put into nikolushka's hands there were letters from the old count from the countess from petya from viera from natasha from sonya and finally six thousand roubles for his outfit and various things which the count wished to send him End of chapter six part three chapter seven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle the slipper vox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne on the twenty fourth of november kutuzov's fighting army bouviacked near olmutz made ready to be reviewed on the following day by the emperor of russia and the emperor of austria the imperial guards which had just arrived from russia encamped about fifteen versts from olmutz and on the next day were to proceed directly to the review which would take place about ten o'clock in the morning on the parade ground at olmutz nikolai rostov on that day had received a note from boris informing him that the izmailovsky regiment was going to encamp about fifteen versts away and that he wanted to see him to give him some letters and some money the money came particularly handy to rostov just now when after the toils of the campaign the army had settled down at olmutz and well-provided salters and austrian jews offering all sorts of enticements infested the camp the pavlograd warriors enjoyed banquet after banquet celebrated in honor of promotions won during the campaign as well as excursions into the town where carolina called vergenka or the hungarian had recently opened a tavern at which all the waiters were girls rostov had just celebrated his promotion from yunker to cornet had bought denisov's horse bedouin and was in debt to his comrades and the salters on every side on receipt of the note from boris rostov rode into olmutz with some comrades dined there drank a bottle of wine and rode off alone to the guards camp to find the friend and companion of his youth rostov had not as yet had a chance to procure his new uniform he wore a soiled yunker's jacket with private's cross his ordinary well-worn leather-seated riding trousers and an officer's sabre with a sword-knot 
the horse which he rode was a don pony which he had bought during the campaign of a cossack his crumpled cap was rakishly set sideways on the back of his head when he reached the camp of the ismailovsky regiment he thought how much he should surprise boris and all his comrades of the guard by appearing before them like a veteran who had been under fire the guard had made the whole campaign as though it were a picnic making a great display of their neatness and discipline their marches had been short their knapsacks had been transported on the baggage wagons and the officers had been given splendid entertainments at every halting place by the austrian authorities the regiments entered and left the cities with music playing and during the whole campaign much to the pride of the guard the men had marched in serried ranks keeping step while the officers mounted rode in their places of assignment boris during the whole campaign had marched and halted with berg who had now risen to be rotnui commandeer or captain berg having been given a company had succeeded by his promptness and punctuality in winning the good will of his superiors and his financial affairs were now in very good shape boris had made many acquaintances with men who might be of service to him and by means of a letter of introduction given him by pierre had become acquainted with prince andrei bolkonsky through whom he hoped to obtain a place on the staff of the commander-in-chief berg and boris neatly and elegantly dressed were resting after their day's journey and seated in a neat room that had been made ready for them were playing checkers at a small round table berg held between his knees the pipe which he was smoking boris with the carefulness characteristic of him had piled up the checkers in pyramidal form with his delicate white fingers and was waiting for berg's move and looking at his opponent's face evidently thinking only of the game just as he always thought only of what occupied him at the moment there now how will you get out of that he asked we'll do our best replied berg touching a king and then dropping his hand again at this moment the door opened ah you petit enfant à la couche d'omir he cried quoting the words of their old nurse in which he and boris always found great amusement but yushki how you have changed boris arose to meet rostof but as he did so he took pains to pick up and replace the checkers that had fallen and he was about to embrace his friend but nikolai slipped out of his grasp with that feeling peculiar to youth which suggests the avoidance of beaten paths and the expression of feelings like every one else and especially that often hypocritical fashion which obtains with our elders nikolai wanted to do something unusual and original on the occasion of meeting his friends he wanted to give boris a pinch or a push anything except kiss him as was universally done boris on the contrary threw his arms around rostof in a composed and friendly fashion and kissed him three times they had not met for almost six months and in such an interval when young men have been taking their first steps on the pathway of life each finds in the other tremendous changes due to surroundings so entirely different from those in which they had taken their first steps of life both had changed greatly since they last met and each was equally anxious to show the other the changes that they had undergone oh you cursed dandies spruce and shiny just in from a promenade not much like us poor sinners of the line exclaimed rostof with baritone notes in his voice and with brusque army manners quite new to boris and he exhibited his own dirty and bespattered trousers on hearing rostof's loud voice the german mistress of the house put her head in through the door rather pretty hey cried nikolai with a wink what makes you shout so you will scare them said boris i wasn't expecting you to-day he added it was only this afternoon that i sent my note to you through an acquaintance of mine kutuzov's adjutant bolkonsky i didn't think of its reaching you so soon well how are you been under fire already have you asked boris rostov said nothing in reply but shook the georgievsky cross on the lace of his coat and pointed to his arm which he carried in a sling looking at berg with a smile as you see said he well well so you have returned boris with a smile and we have also had a glorious campaign you know his imperial highness was most of the time near our regiment so that we had all sorts of privileges and advantages what receptions we had in poland what dinners and balls i can't begin to tell you and the cesarevich was very courteous to all of us officers then the two friends related their experiences the one telling of the jolly good times with the hussars and his campaign life 
the other of the pleasures and advantages of serving under the direct command of men high in authority, and so on. "'Oh, you guardsmen!' cried Rostov. "'But come now, send out for some wine.' Boris scowled. "'Certainly, if you really wish it,' and going to his couch he took out from under the clean pillows a purse and ordered his man to bring wine. "'Oh, yes, and I will deliver over to you some of the letters and your money,' he added. Rostov took his packet, and flinging the money on the sofa, leaned both elbows on the table and began to read. He read a few lines and then gave Berg a wrathful glance. Berg's eyes fastened upon him, annoyed him, and he shielded his face with the letter. "'Well, they've sent you a good lot of money,' exclaimed Berg, glancing at the heavy purse, half buried in the sofa. "'And here we have to live on our salaries, Count. Now I will tell you about myself.' "'Look here, Berg, my dear fellow,' said Rostov. "'When I find you, with a letter just received from home, "'and with a man with whom you want to talk about all sorts of things, "'I will instantly leave you, so as not to disturb you. "'Hear what I say. "'Get you gone anywhere, anywhere, to the devil,' he cried, "'and then seizing him by the shoulder "'and giving him an affectionate look full in the face, "'evidently for the purpose of modifying the rudeness of his words, "'he added, "'Now see here.' Don't be angry with me, my dear heart. I speak frankly because you are an old acquaintance. Ah, for heaven's sake, Count, I understand perfectly, said Berg, getting up and swallowing down his throaty voice. Go and see our hosts. They have invited you, suggested Boris. Berg put on his immaculate, neat, and dustless coat, went to the mirror, brushed the hair up from his temples, after the style of the emperor, Alexander Pavlovich, and, being persuaded by Rostov's looks that his coat was noticeable, left the room with a smile of satisfaction. "'Ugh! What a brute I am, though!' exclaimed Rostov, reading the letter. "'What now?' "'Ugh! What a pig I am that I did not write them sooner, and frighten them so! Ugh! What a pig I am!' he repeated, suddenly reddening. "'Well, you sent Gavrilo for wine, have you? Very good. We'll have a drink,' said he. Among the home letters there was enclosed a note of recommendation to Prince Bagration, which the old countess at Anna Mikhailovna's suggestion obtained from some acquaintance and sent to her son, urging him to present it and get all the advantage she could find from it. "'What nonsense! Much I need this,' said Rostov, flinging the letter on the table. "'Why did you throw it down?' asked Boris. "'Oh, it was a letter of suggestion. What the deuce do I want of such a letter?' "'Why do you say that?' asked Boris, picking up the letter and reading the inscription. "'This letter might be very useful to you.' "'I don't need anything, and I don't care to become anyone's adjutant.' "'Why not, pray?' asked Boris. "'It's a lackey's place.' "'You still have some queer notions, I see,' rejoined Boris, shaking his head. "'And you're the same old diplomat. However, that's not to the point. "'How are you?' asked Rostov. "'Just exactly as you see.' So far, all has gone well with me, but I confess, I should very much like to be made an adjutant, and not stick to the line. Why? Because, having once entered upon the profession of arms, it is best to make one's career as brilliant as possible. Yes, that's true, said Rostov, evidently thinking of something else. He gave his friend a steady, inquiring look, evidently trying in vain to find in his eyes the answer to some puzzling question. Old Gavrilo brought the wine. "'Hadn't we better send now for Alphonse Karluich?' asked Boris. "'He will drink with you, for I can't.' "'Yes, do send for him. But who is this Dutchman?' asked Rostovs, with a scornful smile. "'He is a very, very nice, honourable and pleasant man,' exclaimed Boris. Rostov once more looked steadily into Boris's eyes and sighed. Berg came back, and over the bottle of wine, the conversation between the three officers grew more lively. The two guardsmen told Rostov of their march, and how they had been honoured in Russia, Poland, and abroad. They told about the sayings and doings of their commander, the Grand Duke, together with anecdotes about his goodness and irascibility. Berg, as usual, kept silent when there was nothing that specially concerned himself, but when they began to speak about the goodness and irascibility of the Grand Duke, he told with great gusto how, in Galicia, he happened to have a talk with the Grand Duke. The Grand Duke was making the tour of the regiment, and became very angry at the disorderly state of the division. With a smile of complacency on his face, Berg told how the Grand Duke, in a great state of vexation, 
came up to it and shouted, Arnaud Tui, villains, being a favorite term of abuse when he was vexed, and called the company commander. Would you believe it, Count? I was not the least scared, because I knew that I was all right. And, Count, I may say without boasting, that I knew all the regulations by heart, and the standing orders as well, knew them just as well as our Father in Heaven. And so, Count, in my company, there was no complaint to be made of negligence. And that was the reason of my being so composed, and having such an untroubled conscience. I stepped forward. Here Berg stood up and represented in pantomime how he had raised his hand to his visor as he stepped forward. Really, it would have been hard to imagine a face more expressive of deference and self-sufficiency. Oh, how he scolded me, rated me, you might say, rated and rated and rated mortally, not for life, but for death, as the Russians say, and called me an Arnaut, and a devil, and threatened me with Siberia, proceeded Berg, with a shrewd smile. But I knew that I was in the right, and so I made no reply. Wasn't that best, Count? What? Are you dumb? he cried. Still I hold my tongue. What do you think of that, Count? On the next day there was nothing at all about it in the general orders, so that's what comes of not losing one's wits. Isn't that so, Count? demanded Berg, lighting his pipe and sending out rings of smoke. Yes, that's splendid, said Rostov with a smile. But Boris, perceiving that Rostov was all ready to poke fun at Berg, adroitly changed the conversation. He asked Rostov to tell them how and where he had been wounded. This quite suited the young man, and he began to give a circumstantial account of it, growing more and more animated all the time. He described his action at Schöngraben exactly in the way that those who take part in battles always describe them, that is, in the way that they would be glad to have had them happen, so that his story agreed with all the other accounts of the participants, but was very far from being the exact truth. Rostov was a truthful young man, for not anything in the world would he have deliberately told a falsehood. He began with the intention of telling it exactly as it happened, but imperceptibly, involuntarily, and unavoidably, as far as he was concerned, he fell into falsehood. If he had told the truth to these listeners of his, who had already heard from others, just as he himself had many times, the story of the charge, and had formed a definite idea of how the charge was made, and expected a substantially similar account of it from him, either they would not have believed him, or, what would have been worse, they would have come to the conclusion that Rostov was himself to blame for it, and that he had not undergone what he claimed to have undergone, since it did not agree with what is usually related of cavalry charges. He could not tell them in so many words that they had all started on the trot, that he had fallen from his horse, sprained his arm, and run away from the Frenchman with all his might and main into the forest. Moreover, in order to tell the story in its grim reality, he would have been obliged to exercise much self-control to tell only what had occurred. To tell the truth is very hard, and young men are rarely capable of it. It was expected of him to tell how he grew excited under the fire, and, forgetting everything, had dashed like a whirlwind against the square, how he had cut and slashed with his sabre right and left, as a knife cuts cheese, and how at length he had fallen from exhaustion, and the like. And that was what he told them. In the midst of his tale, just as he was saying the words, you can't imagine what a strange sensation of frenzy you experienced during a charge. Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, whom Boris had been expected, came into the room. Prince Andrei, who liked to bear a patronizing relationship toward young men, was flattered at having Boris consigned to his protection, and was very well disposed toward him. Boris had succeeded in making a pleasant impression upon him, and he had made up his mind to have the young man's desire gratified. Being sent with dispatches from Kutuzov to the Cesarevich, he had looked up his young protégé, expecting to find him alone. When he came in and found there a hussar of the line, relating his military experiences, a sort of individual whom the prince could not endure, he gave Boris an affectionate smile, scowled at Rostov, half closing his eyes, and with a stiff little bow took his seat wearily and indifferently on the sofa. He was disgusted at finding himself in uncongenial society. Rostov, feeling this instinctively, instantly took fire. But it was all the same to the prince. This was a stranger. He looked at Boris, and saw that he seemed to be ashamed of being in company with a hussar of the line. 
notwithstanding Prince Andrei's disagreeable, mocking tone, notwithstanding the general scorn which, from his point of view, as a hussar of the line, Rostov shared for the staff adjutants, to which number evidently belonged the gentleman who had just entered, Rostov felt overwhelmed with confusion, reddened, and grew silent. Boris asked what was the news at headquarters, and whether it were indiscretion for him to inquire about our future movements. "'Probably shall advance,' replied Bolkonsky, evidently not wishing to commit himself further in the presence of strangers. Berg took advantage of his opportunity to ask with his usual politeness whether it were true, as he had heard, that double rations of forage were to be supplied to the captains of the line. At this Prince Andrei smiled, and replied that he could not give an opinion in regard to such important questions of state, and Berg laughed heartily with delight. "'In regard to that matter of yours,' said Prince Andrei, turning to Boris, again, "'we will talk about it by and by,' and he glanced at Rostov. "'You come to me after the review. We will do all that is in our power.' And glancing around the room, he addressed himself to Rostov, pretending not to notice his state of childish confusion, which was rapidly assuming the form of ill-temper. Said he, "'I suppose you were telling about the affair at Schungraben?' were you there certainly i was there spitefully replied rostov as though desiring by his tone to insult the adjutant volkonsky noticed the hussar's state of mind and it seemed to him amusing a scornful smile played lightly over his lips yes there are many stories afloat now about that affair stories indeed exclaimed rostov in a loud voice turning his angry eyes on boris and volkonsky yes many stories but the stories we tell are the accounts of those who are under the hottest fire of the enemy. Our accounts have some weight, and are very different from the stories of those staff officers, milk-suckers, who win rewards by doing nothing. "'By which you mean to insinuate that I am one of them?' demanded Prince Andrei, with a calm and very pleasant smile. A strange feeling of anger, and at the same time of respect for the dignity of this stranger were at this moment united in Rostov's mind." I was not speaking of you, said he. I do not know you, and I confess I have no desire to know you. I merely made a general remark concerning staff officers. And I will say this much to you, said Prince Andrei, interrupting him, a tone of calm superiority ringing in his voice. You wish to insult me, and I am ready to have a settlement with you, it being very easy to bring about, if you have not sufficient self-respect, but you must agree with me that the time and place are exceedingly unpropitious for any such settlement. We are all soon to take place in a great and far more serious duel, and moreover, Drubetskoy here, who says that he is an old friend of yours, cannot be held accountable for the fact that my face was unfortunate enough to displease you. However, he went on to say, as he got up, you know my name, and you know where to find me. But don't forget, he added, that I consider that neither I nor you have any ground for feeling insulted, and my advice, as a man older than you, is not to let this matter go any further. Well, Drubetskoy, on Friday, after the review, I shall expect you. Au revoir, called Prince Andrei, and he went out with a bow to both of them. It was only after Prince Andrei had left the room that Rostov remembered what reply he should have made, and he was still more out of temper because he had not had the wit to say it. He immediately ordered his horse brought round, and bidding Boris farewell, rather dryly, rode off to his own camp. Should he go next day to headquarters and challenge this captious adjutant, or should he follow his advice and leave things as they were? That was the question that tormented him all the way. At one moment he angrily imagined how frightened this little, feeble, bumptious man would look when covered by his pistol. The next he confessed with amazement, that of all the men whom he knew— there was none whom he should be more glad to have as his friend than this same detestable adjutant. End of chapter 7 Part 3 Chapter 8 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne On the day following the meeting of Boris and Rostov, occurred the review of the Austrian and Russian troops, including those who had just arrived from Russia, as well as those who had made the campaign with Kutuzov. Both the Emperor of Russia, with the Cesarevich, and the Emperor of Austria, with the Archduke, reviewed this army, aggregating 80,000 men. 
early in the morning the soldiers elegantly spruced and attired began to move falling into line in front of the fortress here thousands of legs and bayonets moved along with streaming banners and at the command of their officers halted or wheeled or formed into detachments passing by other similar bodies of infantry in other uniforms there with measured hoof-beats and jingling of trappings came the cavalry gaily dressed in blue red and green embroidered uniforms with gaily dressed musicians ahead riding coal-black chestnut and gray horses yonder stretching out in a long line with their polished shining cannon jolting with a brazen din on their carriages and with the smell of linstocks came the artillery between the infantry and cavalry and drew up in the places assigned to them not only the generals in full-dress uniform with slender waists or stout waists tightened in to the last degree and with red necks tightly clasped by their collars and wearing their scarfs and all their orders not only the officers promenaded and decked with all their glories but all the soldiers with shining clean-washed and freshly shaven faces and with all their opportunities polished up to the highest lustre and all the horses gaily comparisoned and groomed so that their coats were as glossy as satin and every individual hair in their manes in exactly its proper place had the consciousness that something grave significant and solemn was taking place every general and every soldier felt his own insignificance counting himself as merely a grain of sand in the sea of humanity and at the same time felt his power when regarded as part of this mighty whole by means of strenuous efforts and devoted energy the preparations which had begun early in the morning were completed by ten o'clock and everything was in proper order the ranks were drawn up across the broad parade ground the whole army was arranged in three columns in front the cavalry then the artillery and in the rear the infantry between each division of the army was a space like a street the three divisions of this army were sharply contrasted with each other kutuzov's war-worn veterans among whom on the right flank of the front row stood the pavlogradsky hussars the troops of the line that had just arrived from russia and the regiments of the guard and the austrian army but all stood in one line under one commander and in identical order like the wind rustling the leaves a murmur agitated the lines they are coming they are coming vivacious shouts of command were heard and throughout the whole army like a wave ran the bustle of the final preparations far away in front of them near Olmutz, appeared a group coming toward them at this moment though the day was calm a gentle breeze as it were stirred the army and seemed to shake the pennoned pikes and the loosened standards clinging to their staffs it seemed as though the army itself by this silent tremor expressed its gladness at the approach of the emperors the word of command was heard uttered by one voice Semirno, eyes front then like the answering of cocks at daybreak many voices repeated this command from point to point and all grew still in the death-like silence the only sound heard was the trampling of horses feet this was the suite of the emperors the two monarchs rode along the left wing and the bugles of the first cavalry regiment burst forth with the general march it seemed as if it were not the bugles that played this march but as if the army itself in its delight at the approach of the emperors emitted these sounds their echoes had not died away when the emperor alexander's affable young voice was distinctly heard addressing the men he uttered the usual welcome and the first regiment gave forth one huzza so deafening so long drawn out and expressive of joy that the men themselves were amazed and awestruck at the magnitude and strength of the mass which they constituted hurrah rostov standing in the front rank of kutuzov's army which the emperor first approached shared the feeling experienced by every man in that army a feeling of self-forgetfulness a proud consciousness of invincibility and of passionate attachment to him on whose account all this solemn parade was prepared he felt that the mere word of this man was only needed for this mighty mass including himself as an insignificant grain of sand to dash through fire and water to commit crime to face death or perform the mightiest deeds of heroism and therefore he could not help trembling could not help his heart melting within him at the sight of this approaching word hurrah 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 was roared on all sides 
and one regiment after another welcomed the sovereigns with the music of the general marsh and then renewed huzzas the general march and huzzas on huzzas which growing louder and louder mingled in one overpowering and deafening tumult until the sovereign came quite close every regiment in its silence and rigidity seemed like a lifeless body but as soon as the sovereign came abreast of it the regiment woke to life and broke out into acclamations which mingled with the roar extending down the whole line past which the sovereign rode amid the tremendous deafening tumult of these thousands of voices through the midst of the armies standing in their squares as motionless as though they had been carved out of granite moved easily carelessly but symmetrically and above all with freedom and grace the hundreds of riders constituting the suites and in front of all two men the emperors upon them and upon them alone were concentrated the suppressed but eager attention of all that mass of warriors the handsome young emperor alexander in his horse guards uniform and three-cornered hat worn pointed forward with his pleasant face and clear but not loud voice was the cynosure of all eyes rostof stood not far from the buglers and his keen glance recognized the emperor while he was still far off and followed him as he drew near when the sovereign had approached to a distance of twenty paces and nikolai could clearly distinguish every feature of his handsome and radiant young face he experienced a sense of affection and enthusiasm such as he had never felt before everything every feature every motion seemed to him bewitching in his sovereign pausing in front of the pavlograd regiment the monarch said something in french to the emperor of austria and smiled seeing this smile rostof himself involuntarily smiled also and felt a still more powerful impulse of love toward his sovereign he felt a burning desire to display this love in some way he knew that this was impossible and he felt like weeping the sovereign summoned the regimental commander and said a few words to him what would happen to me if the sovereign were to address me thought rostof i should die of happiness the emperor also addressed the officers gentlemen said he and rostof listened as to a voice from heaven how happy he would have been now could he only die for his tsar i thank you all from my heart you have won the standards of the george proved yourself worthy of them only to die to die for him thought rostof the sovereign said a few words more which rostov did not catch and the soldiers straining their throats cried hurrah hurrah rostov also joined with them leaning forward in his saddle and shouting with all his might willing to burst his lungs in his efforts to express the full extent of his enthusiasm for his sovereign the emperor stood a few seconds in front of the hussars as though he were undecided how can the sovereign be undecided mused rostov but immediately even this indecision seemed to him a new proof of majesty and charm like everything else that the sovereign did the emperor's indecision lasted only a moment his foot shod in a narrow sharp-pointed boot such as were worn at that time pressed against the flank of the english groomed bay mare on which he sat the sovereign's hand in a white glove gathered up the reins and he rode off accompanied by a disorderly tossing sea of adjutants as he kept riding farther and farther down the line he kept halting in front of the different regiments and at last only his white plume could be seen by rostov distinguishing him from the suite that accompanied the emperors in the number of those who accompanied the emperor he noticed bolkonsky lazily and indifferently bestriding his steed the yesterday evening's quarrel with him came into his mind and the question arose whether or no he ought to challenge him of course it is out of the question now thought rostov is it worth while to think or to talk about such a thing at such a moment as this at a time when one feels such impulses of love enthusiasm and self-renunciation what consequence are our petty quarrels and provocations i love the whole world i forgive every one now said rostov to himself after the sovereign had ridden past almost all the regiments the troops began to move in front of him in ceremonial march and rostov on his bedouin which he had recently bought of Denisov, rode at the end of his squadron, that is, alone, and in a most conspicuous position before his sovereign. Just before he came up to where the emperor was, Rostov, who was an admirable horseman, 
plunged the spurs in bedouin's flanks and urged him into that mad frenzied gallop which bedouin always took when he was excited pressing his foaming mouth back to his breast arching his tail and seeming to fly through the air and spurning the earth gracefully tossing and interweaving his legs bedouin also conscious that the emperor's eyes were fastened on him dashed gallantly by rostov himself keeping his feet back and sitting straight in his saddle feeling himself one with his horse rode by his sovereign with disturbed but beatific face a very devil as denisov expressed it bravo pravla gradsui exclaimed the emperor Bos moi how happy i should be if only he would bid me to dash instantly into the fire thought rostov when the review was ended the officers who had just come from russia and those of kutuzov's division began to gather in groups and talk about the rewards of the campaign about the austrians and their uniforms about their line of battle about bonaparte and what a desperate position he had got himself into now especially if essen's corps should join them and prussia should take to their side but more than all else in each of these circles the conversation ran on the sovereign alexander and every word that he had spoken was repeated and everything that he had done was praised and all were enthusiastic over him all had but one single expectation under the personal direction of the sovereign to go with all speed against the enemy under the command of the emperor himself it would be an impossibility not to win the victory over any one in the world so thought rostov and the majority of the officers after this review all were more assured of victory than they could have been after the gaining of two battles end of chapter eight part three chapter nine of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne on the day following the review boris dressed in his best uniform and accompanied by the wishes of his comrade berg for his success rode off to olmutz to find bolkonsky anxious to take advantage of his good will and secure a most brilliant position especially the position of adjutant to some important personage as this seemed to him the most attractive branch of the service it's fine for rostov whose father sends him ten thousand at a time to argue that he would not accept favors of any one or be any one's lackey but i who have nothing except my brains must pursue my career and not miss opportunities but take advantage of them he did not find prince andrei in omuts that day but the site of the town where the imperial headquarters were situated where the diplomatic corps were established and both emperors were quartered with their suites and courtiers and intimates only expired the more desire in the young man's heart to belong to this exalted world he had no acquaintances and notwithstanding his elegant uniform of the guards all these superior people crowding the streets in handsome equipages plumes ribbons and orders these courtiers and warriors seemed to stand so immeasurably above him that not only would they not but they could not recognize the existence of such an insignificant officer of the guards as he was at the establishment of the commander-in-chief kutuzov where he inquired for bolkonsky all the adjutants and even the servants looked at him as though it were their wish to inspire him with the idea that there was a great abundance of officers like him there and that all were very much annoyed by their presence in spite of this or rather in direct consequence of this on the very next day the twenty seventh immediately after dinner he went to olmutz again and going to the house occupied by kutuzov inquired for bolkonsky prince andrei was at home and boris was ushered into a great drawing-room where probably in times gone by balls had been given but which was now occupied by five beds and a heterogeneous melody of furniture tables chairs and a harpsichord one adjutant in a persian smoking-jacket was sitting at a table near the door and writing another the stout and handsome nesvitsky lay on his bed with his hands supporting his head and laughing and talking with an officer who was sitting near him a third was at the harpsichord playing a viennese waltz a fourth leaned on the harpsichord and was humming the air bolkonsky was not in the room not one of these gentlemen though they glanced at boris paid him the slightest attention the one who was writing and whom boris ventured to address turned round with an air of annoyance and told him that bolkonsky was on duty 
and that he would find him by passing through the door on the left and going to the reception room if he wanted to see him boris thanked him and went to the reception room he found there ten or a dozen generals and their officers at the moment that boris came in prince andrei with a contemptuous frown on his face and that peculiar look of well-bred weariness which says louder than words that if it were not my duty i should not think of wasting any more time talking with you was listening to an old russian general with orders on his breast who was standing upright almost on his tiptoes and with a servile expression characteristic of the military on his purple face was laying his case before prince andrei very good be kind enough to have patience he was saying to the general in russian but with that french accent which he affected when he wished to speak rather scornfully then catching sight of boris and making no further reply to the general who hastened after him with his petition begging him to let him say just one thing more prince andrei with a radiant smile and waving his hand to him went to meet boris boris at this instant clearly understood what he had suspected before that in the army there was above and beyond the fact of subordination and discipline as laid down in the code and which they in the regiments knew by heart and which he knew as well as anyone else there was another still more essential form of subordination one which compelled this anxious general with the purple face to bide his time respectfully while captain prince andrei for his own satisfaction found it more interesting to talk with ensign drubetskoye more than ever boris decided henceforth not to act in accordance with the written law but with this unwritten code he now felt that merely through the fact of having been sent to prince andrei with a letter of recommendation he was allowed to take precedence of this old general who in other circumstances at the front for instance might utterly humiliate him a mere ensign of the guards prince andrei came to meet him and gave him his hand very sorry that you missed me yesterday i spent the whole day with the germans went with weirother to inspect the disposition of the troops what fellows these germans are for accuracy there's no end to it boris smiled exactly as though he understood to what prince andrei referred he affected to see in it a piece of generally known information but really this was the first time that he had heard weirother's name and even the word dispositia well now my dear so you would still like to become an adjutant would you i was just thinking about you yes replied boris in spite of himself reddening at the very thought i was thinking of calling upon the commander-in-chief he has had a letter in regard to me from prince kuragin i wanted to ask it he added as though by way of apology because i was afraid the guards would not take part in any action very good very good we will talk it all over said prince andrei only let me finish up this gentleman's business and i will be at your service while prince andrei went to report on the business of the purple-faced general this general evidently not sharing boris's comprehension in regard to advantages of the unwritten code glared so fiercely at the audacious young ensign who had interrupted his conversation with the adjutant that boris grew uncomfortable he turned away and waited impatiently for prince andrei's return from the commander-in-chief's private room well my dear fellow as i said i was just thinking of you said prince andrei as they went into the big room where the harpsichord was there is no use in your going to call on the commander-in-chief he went on to say he will make you pleasant enough speeches he will have you invited to dinner that would not be so bad according to this other code thought boris in his own mind but nothing more would come of it if it did there would soon be a whole battalion of us adjutants and orderlies but i tell you what we'll do i have a good friend who is general adjutant and a splendid man prince dolgorukov and perhaps you may not know this but it is a fact that just now kutuzov and his staff and all of us are of mighty little consequence everything at the present time is centred on the emperor so let us go to dolgorukov i have an errand to him anyway and i have already spoken to him of you so we will see whether he can't find the means of giving you a place on his own staff or somewhere even nearer to the sun prince andrei always showed great energy when he had the chance to lend a young man a hand and help him to worldly success under the cover of the assistance granted another and which he would have been too proud to accept for himself he came within the charmed circle which was the source of success and in reality a powerful attraction for him he very readily took boris under his wing and went with him to prince dolgorukov 
it was already quite late in the afternoon when they reached the palace of olmutz occupied by the emperors and their immediate followers on this very day there had been a council of war in which all the members of the hofkriegsrath and the two emperors had taken part in the council it had been decided contrary to the advice of the old generals kutuzov and schwarzenberg to act immediately on the offensive and offer bonaparte general battle the council had only just adjourned when prince andrei accompanied by boris entered the palace in search of prince dolgorukov already the magic impression of this war council which had resulted in victory for the younger party could be seen in the faces of all whom they met at headquarters the voices of the temporizers who advised further postponement of the attack had been so unanimously drowned out and their arguments confuted by such indubitable proofs of the advantage of immediate attack that the subject of their deliberations that is the impending engagement and the victory which would doubtless result from it seemed to be a thing of the past rather than of the future all advantages were on our side the enormous forces of the allies doubtless far outnumbering napoleon's forces were concentrated at one point the armies were inspired by the presence of the emperors and eager for action the strategical point where the battle was to be fought was known in its minutest details to the austrian general weirother who would take direction of the army it happened also by a fortunate coincidence that the austrian army had manoeuvred the previous year on the very plains where it now was proposed that they should meet the french in battle all the features of the ground were well known and accurately delineated on the maps and bonaparte evidently weakened was making no preparations to meet them Dogolikov, one of the most fiery partisans in favor of immediate attack had only just returned from the council weary and jaded but full of excitement and proud of the victory won prince andrei introduced the young officer whom he had taken under his protection but prince Dogolikov, though he politely and even warmly pressed his hand said nothing to him and being evidently unable to refrain from expressing the thoughts that occupied him at this time to the exclusion of everything else he turned to prince andrei and said in french well my dear fellow what a struggle we've been having may god only grant that the one which will result from it will be no less victorious one thing my dear fellow said he speaking eagerly and brusquely i must confess my injustice to these austrians and especially weirother what exactness and care for details what accurate knowledge of the localities what foresight for contingencies what thoughts for all the minutest details no my friend nothing more advantageous than the condition in which we find ourselves could possibly be imagined austrian accuracy and russian valor combined what more could you desire so an engagement has actually been determined upon asked Belkonsky. and do you know my dear it seems to me that really bonaparte has lost his latin do you know a letter was received from him to-day addressed to the emperor dolgorukov smiled significantly what's that what did he write asked Belkonsky. what could he write traderie de ra and so forth merely for the sake of gaining time that's all i tell you he's right in our hands that's certain but the most amusing thing of all said he with a good-natured smile was this that no one could think how it was best to address the reply to him not as counsel and still less as emperor of course i suppose it would be to general bonaparte but there is considerable difference between not recognizing him as emperor and addressing him as general bonaparte said bolkonsky that's the very point said dolgorukov interrupting him with a laugh and speaking rapidly you know bilibin he's a very clever man he proposed to address him as usurper and enemy of the human race dolgorukov broke into a hearty peal of laughter was that all remarked bolkonsky but in the end it was bilibin who invented a serious title for the address he's a shrewd and clever man what was it head of the french government a chef de gouvernement francais replied prince dolgorukov gravely and with satisfaction say now wasn't that good very good but it won't please him much replied polkonsky oh not at all my brother knows him he's dined with him more than once with the present emperor at paris and told me that he never saw a more refined and cunning diplomat french finesse combined with italian astuteness you know you've heard the anecdotes about him and count markov haven't you count markov was the only man who could meet him on his own ground you know the story of the handkerchief it's charming 
and the loquacious Dolgulikov, turning now to Boris, now to Prince Andrei, told how Bonaparte, wishing to test Markov, our ambassador, purposely dropped his handkerchief in front of him and stood looking at him, apparently expecting Markov to hand it to him, and how Markov instantly dropped his handkerchief beside Bonaparte's, and stooping down picked it up, leaving Bonaparte's where it lay. Charmant, exclaimed Bolkonsky. But, Prince, I have come as a petitioner in behalf of this young man here. Do you know whether— But before Prince Andrei had time to finish, an adjutant came into the room with a summons for Prince Dolgorukov to go to the Emperor. Ah, what a nuisance! exclaimed Dolgorukov, hurriedly rising and pressing Prince Andrei and Boris's hands. You know, I should be very glad to do all in my power either for you or for this charming young man. Once more he pressed Boris's hand, with an expression of good-natured frankness and mercurial heedlessness. But we'll see about it. See you another time. Boris was greatly excited by the thought of being so near to such exalted powers. He felt that here he was almost in contact with the springs which set in motion all these enormous masses of which he and his regiment appeared to be a small, humble, and insignificant part. They followed Prince Dolgorukov into the corridor. Just then, from out the door leading into the sovereign's apartment, through which Dolgorukov was going, came a short individual in civil attire, with an intellectual face and a strongly pronounced and prominent lower jaw, which without disfiguring him lent a special energy and mobility to his expression. This short man nodded to Dolgorukov as to a friend, and came along straight toward Prince Andrei with a fixed cold stare, evidently expecting him to make a bow, or to stand out of the way from him. Prince Andrei did neither. A wrathful expression came into his face, and the young man, turning about, went down the corridor in the other direction. "'Who was that?' asked Boris. "'That is one of the most remarkable, and to me, most detestable of men, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Prince Adam Sartorinsky. Those are the men,' said Bolkonsky, with a sigh which he could not stifle, as they left the palace. "'Those are the men who decide the fate of nations.' On the next day the armies were set in motion, and Boris had no opportunities, until the battle of Austerlitz itself, to meet either Prince Bolkonsky or Dolgorukov, and remained for the time being in his regiment. End of chapter 9 Part 3, Chapter 10 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At dawn, on the 28th, Denisov's squadron, in which Nikolai Rostov served, and which belonged to Prince Bagration's division, marched out from its bouviac to battle, as it was said, and after proceeding about a verst, behind the other columns, was halted on the highway. Rostov saw the Cossacks riding forward past them, then the first and second squadron of hussars, and battalions of infantry and artillery, and then the generals, Bagration and Dolgorukov, and their adjutants also rode by. All the fear which, just as at the previous battle, he had experienced before the action, all the internal conflict, by means of which he had overcome this fear, all his dreams of how he would distinguish himself in hussar fashion, in this action, were wasted. Their squadron were stationed in the reserve, and Nikolai Rostov spent that day bored and anxious. About nine o'clock in the morning he heard at the front the sounds of musketry firing, huzzas, and shouting. He saw some wounded men carried to the rear, there were not many of them, and at last he beheld a whole division of French cavalrymen, conducted by in charge of a sotnia of Cossacks. Evidently the action was at an end, and though it appeared to be of small magnitude, it was attended with success. The soldiers and the officers, as they returned, narrated the story of their brilliant victory, resulting in the occupation of the city of Vischau and the capture of a whole squadron of the French. The day was clear and sunny, after the nipping frost of the night before, and the joyful brilliancy of an autumn day seemed to harmonize with the news of the victory, which was confirmed not only by the narratives of those who had taken part in it, but still more by the enthusiastic faces of the soldiers, officers, generals, and adjutants, passing this way and that before Rostov. Nikolai's heart was the heavier for having suffered to no purpose all the pangs of fear anticipatory of the battle and then being obliged to spend this glorious day in inaction. Vostov, come here. Let us drown our sorrow in drink,' cried Denisov, 
seated on the edge of the road, with a flask and lunch spread before him. The officers gathered in a circle around Denisov's bottle case, eating their lunch and chatting. "'Here they come, bringing another!' exclaimed one of the officers, pointing to a French dragoon who had been made prisoner, and was walking along under guard of two Cossacks. One of them was leading by the bridle a large, handsome French horse that had been taken from the prisoner. "'Sell us the horse!' cried Denisov to the Cossack. "'Certainly, your nobility.' The officers sprang up and crowded around the Cossacks and the prisoner. The French dragoon was a young Alsatian, speaking French with a German accent. He was quite out of breath with emotion. His face was crimson. Hearing the officers talking French, he began to speak with them eagerly, turning to one and another of them. He told them that he ought not to have been taken, and that it was not his fault he was taken, but the fault of Le Caporal, who had sent him to get some caparisons, and that he told him the Russians were already there. And at the end of every sentence he added, Mais qu'on ne fasse pas de mal à mon petit cheval. Don't let them harm my little horse, at the same time petting his coat. It was evident that he didn't understand very well what had happened to him. Now he apologized for having been captured. Then, as though he imagined himself in the presence of his own superiors, he vaunted his strict attention to the duties of a soldier and his zeal in the service. He brought with him to our rear guard in all its freshness the very atmosphere of the French army, which was so foreign to our men. The Cossacks sold the horse for two ducats, and Rostov, who was now just possessed of money in plenty, and was the richest of the officers, bought it. Mais qu'on ne fasse pas de mal à mon petit cheval, said the Alsatian good-naturedly to Rostov, when the horse was handed over to the hussar. Rostov, with a smile, reassured the dragoon, and gave him some money. Aliou, aliou, said the Cossack, attempting to speak in French, and touching the prisoner's arm to make him move on. Gozuda, Gozuda, the emperor, the emperor, was suddenly heard among the hussars. All was hurry and confusion as the officers scattered, and Rostov distinguished down the road a number of horsemen with white plumes in their hats riding toward them. In a moment's time all were in their places and waiting. Rostov did not remember and had no consciousness of how he got to his place and mounted his horse. Instantly his disappointment at not being present at the skirmish the mutinous frame of mind that he had felt during the hours of inaction passed away. Every thought about himself instantly vanished. He was perfectly absorbed in the sense of happiness arising from the proximity of his sovereign. He felt himself compensated by the mere fact of his presence for all the loss of the day. He was as happy as a lover in expectation of the wished-for meeting. Not daring to look down the line, and not glancing around, he felt his approach by his enthusiastic sense and he felt this was not alone by the mere trampling of the horse's hoofs as the cavalcade rode along, but he felt it because in proportion as they drew near, all around him grew brighter, more radiant with joy, more impressive and festive. Nearer and nearer came what was the sun for Rostov, scattering around him rays of blissful and majestic light, and now at last he realized that he was enveloped by these rays. He heard his voice, that affable, serene, majestic, and at the same time utterly unaffected voice. A dead silence ensued, just as Rostov felt ought to be the case, and this silence was broken by the sound of his sovereign's voice. Les hussards de Pavlogra? he asked. La reserva, sire, replied some other voice, a mere human voice, after the superhuman voice which had asked if they were the Pavlograd hussars. The emperor came up near where Rostov was and reined in his horse. Alexander's face was still more beautiful than it had been three days before at the time of the parade. It fairly beamed with delight and youthful spirits, such innocently youthful spirits that it reminded one of the sportiveness of a fourteen-year-old lad, and yet, nevertheless, it was the face of a majestic emperor. Chancing to glance down the squadron, the sovereign's eyes met Rostov's, and for upwards of two seconds gazed into them. Maybe the sovereign read what was passing in Rostov's soul, it certainly seemed to Rostov that he must know it. At all events, he fixed his blue eyes for the space of two seconds on Rostov's face. A sweet and gentle light seemed to emanate from them. Then suddenly his eyebrows contracted, and with a brusque movement of his left foot, he spurred his horse and galloped forward. The young emperor could not restrain his desire to be present at the battle, and in spite of all objections of his courtiers, 
he managed about twelve o'clock to leave the third column, under whose escort he had been moving, and spurred off to the front. But before he reached the hussars he was met by adjutants with the report of the happy issue of the skirmish. The engagement, which was merely the capture of a squadron of French, was represented as a brilliant victory, and consequently the sovereign, and the whole army, after this, and especially before the smoke had cleared away from the field of battle, were firmly convinced that the French were conquered and were in full retreat. A few minutes after the passing of the sovereign, the division of the Pavlograd hussars were ordered to advance. In the little German town of Vischau, Rostov saw the emperor yet a second time. In the town square, where, just before the sovereign's arrival, there had been a pretty lively interchange of shots, still lay a number of men, killed and wounded, whom it had not been possible as yet to remove. The sovereign, surrounded by his suite of military and civil attendants, and riding a chestnut mare, groomed in English style, though not the same one which he had ridden at the parade, leaning over and gracefully holding a gold lorgnette to his eye, was looking at a soldier stretched out on the ground, without his shako, and with his head all covered with blood. The soldier was so filthy, rough, and disgusting, that Rostov was quite affronted that he should be so near his majesty. Rostov saw how the sovereign's stooping shoulders contracted, as though a chill ran down his back, and how his left heel convulsively pressed the spur into the horse's side, and how the admirably trained animal looked around good-naturedly and did not stir from his place. An adjutant dismounted, and taking the soldier under the arm, assisted to lift him to a stretcher which had just been brought. The soldier groaned. "'Gently, gently! Can't you lift him more gently?' exclaimed the sovereign, apparently suffering more keenly than the dying soldier, and rode away. Rostov saw the tears that filled his monarch's eyes, and heard him say in French to Tsar as he rode away, "'What a terrible thing war is! What a terrible thing! Quelle terrible chose que la guerre!' The vanguard had been stationed in front of Vizjau, in sight of the enemy's pickets, who had left us the place after desultory firing that had lasted all day. The vanguard had been personally congratulated and thanked by the emperor, rewards had been promised, and a double portion of vodka had been dealt out to the men. The bouviac fires crackled even more merrily than the night before, and the soldiers' songs rang out with greater gusto. Denisov that night gave a supper in honor of his promotion as major, and Rostov, who had already taken his share of wine, at the end of the merrymaking proposed a toast to the sovereign's health. Not to the sovereign emperor. The Gozuda Emperor, as he is called in official circles, said he, but the health of the sovereign as a kind-hearted, lovable, and great man. Let us drink to his health and to our probable victory over the French. If we fought well before, he went on to say, and gave no quarter to the French at Schöngraben, Will not this be the case now when he himself leads us? We will all die, gladly die, for him. Isn't that so, gentlemen? Perhaps I do not express myself very well, for I have been drinking a good deal, but that's what I feel, and so do you all. To the health of Alexander I! Hurrah! 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 rang the hearty voices of the officers, and the old Captain Kirsten shouted just as heartily and no less sincerely than the twenty-year-old Rostov. When the officers had drunk in the toast and broken their glasses, Kirsten got a fresh one and filled it, and in his shirt-sleeves and riding trousers, with the glass in his hand, went to the campfire of some of the soldiers, assuming a majestic pose, waving his hand over his head, stood with his long grey moustache and white chest visible under his unbuttoned shirt in the firelight. Children, to the health of the sovereign emperor, to victory over our enemies, Hurrah! he cried in his youthful old hussar's baritone. The hussars crowded around, and answered in friendly wise with a tremendous shout. Late that night, when all had separated, Denisov laid his stubby hand on his favorite Rostov's shoulder. In the field, no room for love affairs, when one's so much in love with the Tsar, said he. Denisov, don't jest on this subject, cried Rostov. This is such an exalted, such a noble feeling that i agree with you i agree with you my friend i understand i approve no you can't understand it and rostov got up and began to wander among the watchfires and dreamed of what bliss it would be to die as to losing his life he did not dare think of that 
but simply to die in the presence of his sovereign. He was really in love, not only with the Tsar, but also with the glory of the Russian arms, and the hope of impending victory. And he was not the only one who experienced this feeling on the memorable days that preceded the Battle of Austerlitz. Nine-tenths of the men composing the Russian army were at that time in love, though perhaps less ecstatically, with their Tsar and the glory of the Russian arms. End of chapter 10「Three, Chapter Eleven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. On the following day, the sovereign remained in Vischau. His body physician Villiers was several times called to see him, and not only at headquarters but in the various corps. The report was spread abroad that the emperor was ill. He had eaten nothing that day and had slept badly the night before so those who were in his councils reported. This indisposition proceeded from the powerful impression produced upon his sensitive soul by the sight of the wounded and the killed. At daybreak, on the twenty-ninth, a French officer with a flag of truce passed the sentinels and was brought into Vischau demanding a personal interview with the Russian emperor. This officer was Savre. The sovereign had just fallen asleep, and therefore Savre was obliged to wait. At noon he was admitted into the emperor's presence, and at the end of an hour came out and rode, accompanied by Prince Dolgulukov, back to the pickets of the French army. It was soon reported that the purpose of Sevres' mission was a proposal for a meeting of the emperor with Napoleon. This personal meeting was refused, much to the gratification and delight of the whole army, and in the sovereign's place Prince Dolgorukov the conqueror of Vizjau was delegated to confer with Napoleon, if contrary to anticipation he should express a genuine desire for peace. In the evening Dolgorukov returned, went directly to the sovereign, and was closeted a long time with him alone. On the 30th of November and the 1st of December the armies moved forward two more stages, and the advanced pickets of the army, after slight skirmishes, retired. Before noon of December 1st, there began in the upper circles of the army a vigorous stirring and exciting movement which continued until the morning of the second of december when was fought the world-renowned battle of austerlitz up till the afternoon of the first the movement the excited conversations the galloping about and carrying of messages was confined to the headquarters of the two emperors in the afternoon of the same day the excitement was communicated to kutuzov's headquarters and to the staffs and the division commanders. By evening, this movement had spread by means of the adjutants to all the remotest portions of the army, and during the night that followed the 1st of December, the enormous mass of 80,000 men, comprising the allied armies, arose from their bouviacs with a hum of voices, and stirred and wavered like a mighty fabric ten versts in length. The concentrated movement, beginning in the morning at the headquarters of the emperors, and finally giving its impulse to the whole, even to the remotest parts, was analogous to the first movement of the central wheel of a great tower clock. The one wheel moves slowly, it starts another, a third, and ever more and more swiftly the wheels, pulleys, pinions begin to revolve, the chimes of bells to play, the figures to go through their evolutions, the hands to move in measured time, showing the results of the motions. As in the mechanism of the clock, so in the mechanism of this military movement, no less irresistibly they move even to the last resultant, when once the impulse is given, and just as impassably immovable, up to the moment when the movement is started, are the parts of the mechanisms as yet unstirred by their work. The wheels whiz on their axles, the cogs catch, the revolving sheaves hiss in their rapid motion, but the next wheel is as yet as calm and immovable as though it had before it a century to remain in immobility. And then its movement comes, the cog has caught, and becoming subject to the motion of the wheel begins to whir as it revolves and takes part in an activity, the results and aim of which are incomprehensible to it. Just as in the clock, the result of the complicated motions of numberless and different wheels and pulleys is merely to move the hands slowly and in measured rhythm so as to tell the time. 
so the results of all the complicated human motions of these one hundred and sixty thousand russians and french all the passions desires regrets humiliations sufferings transports of pride panic enthusiasms of all of these men was merely the loss of the battle of austerlitz called the battle of the three emperors in other words the measured forward motion of the hand of universal history on the dial of humanity prince andrei was on duty this day and constantly by the side of the commander-in-chief about six o'clock in the evening kutuzov came to the headquarters of the emperors and after a short audience with his sovereign went to see count tolstoy the oberhofmarschall master of supplies bolkonsky took advantage of this time to run into dogorokov's to find out about the impending engagement prince andrei felt that kutuzov was dissatisfied and out of sorts for some reason or another and that he was out of favor at headquarters and that all whom he had met at the emperor's headquarters behaved toward him like men who know more than others know and it was for this reason that he was anxious for a talk with dolgorukov well how are you mon cher exclaimed dolgorukov who was drinking tea with bilibin the celebration comes to-morrow what's the matter with your old man he seems out of sorts i should not say that he was out of sorts but i think that he would like to have been listened to well he was listened to at the council of war and he will be when he is willing to talk business but to be temporizing and waiting for something now that bonaparte fears a general engagement more than anything else is impossible and so you've seen him have you asked prince andrei well what sort of man is this bonaparte what impression did he produce upon you yes i have seen him and i am convinced that he is more afraid of a general engagement than of anything else in the world replied dolgorukov evidently laying great store by this general conclusion drawn from his interview with napoleon if he were not afraid of a general battle why should he have demanded this interview and entered into negotiations and above all retreated when retreating is contrary to his entire method of carrying on war believe me he is afraid afraid of a general engagement his hour is at hand mark my words but tell me about him what kind of man is he asked prince andrei he is a man in a grey overcoat very anxious for me to address him as your majesty and very much affronted because i gave him no title at all that's the kind of a man he is and that's all i can say replied dolgorukov looking at bilibin with a smile in spite of my perfect confidence in old kutuzov he went on to say we should all be in a fine state if we kept on waiting for something to happen and thereby giving him the chance to outflank us or play some trick upon us now that he's right in our hands evidently no it's not a good thing to forget suvorov and his rule it's a better policy to attack than to be attacked i assure you in war the energy of young men often points out the way more wisely than all the experience of old tacticians but in what position are we going to attack him i was at the advance post to-day and it is impossible to make out where his main force is stationed said prince andrei he was anxious to explain to dolgorukov a plan of attack of his own that he had devised oh it's of absolutely no consequence replied dolgorukov hastily getting up and spreading a map on the table all contingencies are foreseen if he's posted at brun and prince dolgorukov rapidly and not very clearly unfolded weirother's plan for a flank movement prince andrei hastened to raise objections and to expound his own plan perhaps it was fully as good as weirother's but it had one serious fault that weirother's had been approved instead as soon as prince andrei began to point out the disadvantages of weirother's and the excellencies of his own plan prince dolgorukov ceased listening to him and looked absently not at the map but at prince andrei's face well there is to be a council of war this evening at kutuzov's there you will have a chance to deliver your views said dolgorukov i certainly shall said prince andrei pushing the map aside and what are you struggling over gentlemen asked bilibin who until now had been listening to their discussion with a gay smile and had at last made up his mind to get some sport out of it whether we have a victory or a defeat to-morrow the glory of the russian arms is assured except our kutuzov there isn't a single russian division commander the heads are Herr General Wimpfen, Le Comte de la Grene, Le Prince de Liechtenstein, 
le prince de hohenlohe at einfin pretz pretz and all the rest of the alphabet like all polish names hush mouvez lanka said dogolikov it isn't so for here are two others russians milorodovich and dokhtarov and we might count count erekcheyev as a third but he has weak nerves well i think mikhail ilyaronovitch must have come out said prince andrei i wish you all happiness and success gentlemen he added and after shaking hands with dolgorokov and bilibin went in search of kutuzov on the way back to their quarters prince andrei could not refrain from asking kutuzov who sat in moody silence beside him what he thought of the approaching engagement kutuzov looked sternly at his adjutant and after a moment of silence replied i think that the battle will be lost and so i told count tolstoy and begged him to repeat it to the sovereign and what do you think was the answer he gave me ah my dear general rice and cutlets occupy me you attend to the affairs of war yes that's the way they answer me End of chapter eleven part three chapter twelve of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne at ten o'clock that evening weirother came with his plans to kutuzov's headquarters where the council of war was to be convened all the division commanders had been summoned to meet at the commander-in-chief's and with the exception of prince bagration who excused himself all appeared at the appointed hour weirother who was the chief promoter of the proposed engagement presented by his eagerness and vehemence a sharp contrast to the dissatisfied and sleepy-looking kutuzov who in spite of himself was obliged to preside as chairman over the council of war weirother evidently felt that he was the head centre of the movement which had already become irresistible he was like a horse harnessed into a loaded team and going downhill he knows not whether he is pulling it or whether it is forcing him onward but he is borne down with all possible rapidity and has no time to deliberate on the outcomes of this downward motion weirother twice that afternoon had been out personally to inspect the enemy's pickets and had twice called on the russian and austrian emperors with his reports and explanations and had been to his own chancellery where he had dictated his dispositions in german and now all worn out he came to kutuzov's he was evidently so full of his own ideas that he forgot to be civil to the commander-in-chief he interrupted him spoke rapidly and incoherently not looking into the face of his colleague not replying to the questions asked him and he was spattered with mud and had a woebegone haggard distracted but at the same time self-conceited and haughty appearance kutuzov occupied a small manor-house near austerlitz in the large drawing-room which had been converted into a cabinet for the commander-in-chief were gathered all the members of the council of war including kutuzov himself and weirother they were drinking tea they were only waiting for bagration in order to open the council session shortly after ten o'clock bagration's orderly rode over with the message that the prince was unable to be present prince andrei came in to report this to the commander-in-chief and improving the permission previously granted by kutuzov to be present at the council remained in the room well then as prince bagration is not to be here we may as well begin exclaimed weirother hastily jumping up from his seat and going over to the table whereon was spread a large map of the environs of brun kutuzov with his uniform unbuttoned apparently to give greater freedom to his stout neck clasped by his collar was sitting in a voltaire chair with his plump, aged-looking hand symmetrically placed on the arms, and was almost asleep. At the sound of Weirother's voice, he with difficulty opened his one eye. "'Yes, yes, please, else it will be late,' said he, nodding his head, he let it sink, and again closed his eye. If, at first, the members of the council supposed that Kutuzov was only pretending to sleep, this time the sounds that proceeded from his nose during the course of the subsequent reading were sufficient proof that what occupied the commander-in-chief was vastly more serious to him than his desire to express scorn for the plan of battle or anything else what concerned him at that moment was the invincible requirement of human nature sleep he was actually napping 
Weirother, with the action of a man too much occupied to waste a moment of time, glanced at Kutuzov, as though he perceived that he was asleep, took his paper, and in a loud, monotonous tone, began to read his plan for the disposition of forces for the impending engagement, under the heading, which he also read, Distribution of the Forces for the Attack on the Enemy's Position, behind Kobolnitz and Sokolnitz, November 30, 1805. The disposition was very complicated and difficult to comprehend. In the original German it was to the following effect. Since the enemy rests his left wing on the wooded mountains and his right wing stretches along by Nobelnitz and Sokolnitz behind the ponds that are there, while we, on the other hand, far outnumber his right wing with our left, it is, therefore, to our advantage to attack the enemy's right wing, especially if we are in possession of the villages of Sokolnitz and Kobolnitz, because we should immediately fall upon the enemy's flanks, and be able to drive him across the plain between Schlapanitz and the Thueris forest, and avoid the defiles of Schlapanitz and Belowitz, which protect the enemy's front. To this end it is necessary. The first columns must march, the second column must march, the third column must march, and so on. Thus read Weirother. The generals found it hard to listen to the tedious details of the scheme. The tall, fair-haired General Buxhovden stood leaning up against a wall, and resting his eyes upon the lighted candles, seemed neither to listen nor to wish it to be supposed that he was listening. Directly opposite Weirother sat Miloradovich, with his brilliant, wide-open eyes, ruddy face, and elevated moustache and shoulders. In soldierly attitude, resting his hands on his knees, with the elbows turned out, he preserved a stubborn silence, gazing directly into Weirother's face, and taking his eyes from him only when the Austrian commander paused. Then Miloradovich looked significantly at the other generals. But it was utterly impossible to tell by this significant look whether he agreed or disagreed, whether he were satisfied or dissatisfied with the proposed plan. Nearest of all to Weirother sat Count de Langeron, and with a shrewd smile which did not once during the reading vanish from his southern French countenance, he gazed at his slender fingers, rapidly twirling by the corners his gold snuff-box adorned with a miniature portrait. In the midst of one of the longest sentences he stopped this whirling of his snuff-box, raised his head, and, with a disagreeable show of politeness, carried to extremes, he interrupted him and started to make some remark. But the Austrian general, not pausing in his task, frowned angrily and made a gesture with his elbows, as much as to say, Wait, wait, you shall tell me your ideas by and by. Now be good enough to look at the map and follow me. Langeron threw up his eyes with an expression of perplexity, glanced at Miloradovich, as though seeking for an explanation, but meeting Miloradovich's significant but enigmatical glance, he looked away gloomily, and began once more to twirl his snuff-box. Une leçon de géographie, he exclaimed, as if to himself, but loud enough to be heard by the others. Preshevsky, with respectful but dignified politeness, held one hand to the ear nearest Weirother, and had the appearance of a man whose attention is perfectly absorbed. Dokhturov, small in stature, sat opposite Weirother, with attentive and modest mien, and leaned over the map unrolled before him, and conscientiously followed the scheme as it was evolved, studying the places which he did not know. Several times he begged Weirother to repeat some word that he had failed to understand, or the names of villages that were hard for him to catch. Weirother complied with his request, and Dokhturov wrote them down in his notebook. When the reading, which had lasted upwards of an hour, was completed, Langeron, again laying down his snuff-box, and without looking at Weirother, or any one in particular, began to discourse on the difficulties in the way of carrying out such a plan of battle, even where the position of the enemy was known, and particularly when the position of the enemy could not be known, owing to their constant changing from one place to another. Langeron's objections were well taken, but it was evident that their animus came from a desire to show General Weirother, who had been reading his plan of attack in the most conceited manner, as though to a pack of schoolboys, that he was dealing not with dunces, but with men who were able to give even him lessons in the art of waging war. When Weirother's monotonous voice ceased, Kutuzov opened his eyes, 
like a miller who wakes the moment the sophoric sounds of his mill-wheels are interrupted. He listened to what Langeron said, and then, as much as to say, well, what nonsense you are all capable of uttering, hurriedly closed his eyes again, and let his head sink even lower on his breast. Langeron, evidently to wound Weirother as cruelly as possible in his self-love as an author and soldier, went on to show that Bonaparte might easily attack, instead of waiting to be attacked, and, consequently, make all this elaborate plan of battle perfectly nugatory. Weirother replied to all these objections with a steady, scornful smile, that was evidently prepared beforehand against everything that might be said to him. "'If he had been able to attack us, he would have done so to-day,' said he. "'You think that he is weak, do you?' asked Longueron. "'He is well off if he has forty thousand men,' replied Weirother, with the same smile of a regular practitioner to whom a woman doctor wishes to suggest some remedy. "'In that case, he is rushing on his own ruin by waiting for us to attack him,' said Langeron, with a slightly ironical smile, looking to Miloradovitch again for confirmation. But Miloradovitch was apparently thinking least of all of what the generals were contending about. Ma foi, said he, tomorrow we shall find out all about it on the battlefield. Weirother again indulged in that smile which said that to him it was absurd and strange to meet the objections of the Russian generals toward what not only he himself but the sovereign emperors had had faith in. The enemy have quenched their fires, and a constant rumble has been heard in his camp, said he. What does that signify? Either he is retreating, which is the only thing that we have to fear, or he is changing his position, he smiled. But even if he should take up his position in Thurassa, he is merely saving us great trouble, and all our arrangements, even to the minutest details, would remain the same. How so? asked Prince Andrei, who had been watching for some time for an opportunity to express his doubts. Kutuzov here woke up, coughed severely, and looked around on the generals. Gentlemen, the arrangements for tomorrow, or rather for today, for it is already one o'clock, cannot be changed, said he. You have heard them, and we will all perform our duty. But before the battle there is nothing more important, he paused a moment, than to have a good night's rest. He made a motion to arise. The generals bowed and separated. It was already after midnight. Prince Andrei went to his quarters. The council of war, at which Prince Andrei was not given a chance to express his opinion as he had hoped, left a dubious and disturbing impression on his mind. He did not know who was right. Dolgorukov and Rothweiler, or Kutuzov and Langeron and the others, who did not approve of the plan of attack. But is it possible that Kutuzov cannot communicate his ideas directly with the Emperor? Can't this be done even now? Can it be that for mere court or private considerations thousands of lives must be imperiled? And mine? Mine? he asked himself. Yes, it is very possible, he thought, that I may be killed tomorrow. And suddenly at this thought of death a whole series of most remote and most sincere recollections began to arise in his mind. He recalled his last parting with his father and his wife. He remembered the early days of his love toward her. He remembered the baby that she was to bear him, and he began to feel sorry for her and for himself. And so in a nervously tender and agitated frame of mind, he left the cottage where he lodged with Nesvitsky and began to walk up and down in front of the house. The night was cloudy, but the moonbeams mysteriously gleamed through the clouds. Yes, tomorrow tomorrow he thought tomorrow perhaps all will be ended as far as i am concerned all these recollections will have vanished all these recollections will be for me as a mere nothing tomorrow perhaps indeed most probably tomorrow i am convinced of it i shall have an opportunity for the first time at last of showing all that i can do and he began to picture to himself the battle the loss of it the concentration of the fighting at one single point, and the confusion and bewilderment of all the leaders. And now comes the blessed moment, that Toulon, for which he had been waiting so long, offering itself to him. He resolutely and clearly tells his opinion to Kutuzov and Varother and the emperors. All his plans are honored with their approval, but no one offers to carry them out, 
and so he selects a regiment a division imposes the condition that no one shall interfere in his arrangements and he leads his division to the decisive point and alone wins the victory but death and suffering says another voice prince andrei however paid no heed to this voice and continued to dream of his triumphs the arrangements of the next battle are entrusted to him alone he is still nothing but an officer of the day in kutuzov's army but still he does everything by his own unaided efforts the next battle is gained by him alone kutuzov is removed he is called to fill his place well but what then whispered the other voices what then supposing you are not wounded ten times killed or overreached well then and what next i am sure i do not know replied prince andrei to himself i know not what will come next i cannot know and i have no wish to know but if i wish this if i wish to gain glory if i wish to be a famous man if i wish to be loved by men then i am not to blame because i desire it because this is the only thing that i desire the only thing for which i live yes the only thing i never will confess this to any one but my god what can i do if i love nothing except glory only and devotion to humanity death wounds loss of family nothing is terrible to me and yet dear to me precious to me as many people are father sister wife the dearest of all yet strange and unnatural as it may seem i would instantly sacrifice them all for one minute of glory of triumph for the affection of men whom i do not know and never shall know even for the love of those men there he said to himself as he listened to the sounds of voices talking in kutuzov's courtyard in kutuzov's courtyard the denschinks were busy packing up and talking one voice apparently that of the coachman who was teasing kutuzov's old cook whom prince andrei knew and whom they called tit kept saying tit i say tit there now replied the old man tit tit grind the wheat Tiff, go to the devil rang the voice which was drowned by the shouts of laughter of the denschinks and servants and yet i love and prize the victory over them all i prize this mysterious strength and glory which seems here to hover above my head in yonder clouds End of chapter twelve part three chapter thirteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne rostov went that same night with his platoon to serve as outpost stationed in the front of bagration's division his hussars were posted two and two along the line he himself kept riding his horse the whole length of the line struggling to overcome his irresistible inclination to drowsiness behind him he could see the enormous extent of space filled with the watch-fires of our army dimly gleaming through the fog in front of him was the misty darkness though he strained his eyes to penetrate this misty distance he could see nothing now it seemed to brighten up a little then there seemed to be some black object then he imagined that he saw a light which he thought must be the watch-fires where the enemy were and then again he told himself that his eyes had deceived him he closed his eyes and his imagination presented now his sovereign now denisov now his recollections of moscow and again he would open his eyes and see right before his face the head and ears of his horse and here and there the dark forms of hussars as he came within six paces of them while everywhere was the same misty darkness veiling the distance why not it might very possibly come to pass thought rostof the emperor might meet me and give me an order just as to any other officer might say ride off yonder and find out what is there i have heard many stories about his finding just by mere chance an officer like me and taking him into his personal service what if he should take me into his personal service oh and how i should watch over him how i should tell him the whole truth how i should unmask his deceivers 
and Rostov in order to give greater color to the love and devotion which he felt for his sovereign, imagined that he had before him an enemy whom he was killing, or a German traitor whose ears he was roundly boxing, in presence of his sovereign. Suddenly a distant shout startled him. He awoke and opened his eyes. Where am I? Oh, yes, at the outposts. Countersign and password are cart pole and umuts. What a shame that our squadron is going to be held in reserve tomorrow, he said to himself. I will beg to take part. That is probably the only chance I shall have of seeing the emperor. It won't be long before I am relieved. I will ride up and down once more, and then I will go and ask the general. He straightened himself up in the saddle, and turned his horse once more to inspect his hussars. It seemed to him that it had grown lighter. Toward his left he could see a slope, the gleam of a declivity, and, lying opposite to him, a dark knoll which seemed as steep as a wall. On the top of this knoll was a white spot. Rostov could not clearly make out whether it was a clearing in the woods, lighted by the moon, or a patch of snow, or white houses. It even seemed to him that there was something moving in that white spot. It must be snow, that spot. Spot, untash, said Rostov, first in Russian, then in French. How absurd! It's no Tash. Natasha, my sister, has black eyes. Natashka. How amazed she will be when I tell her I have seen the emperor. Natasha. My saber, Tasha. Take it. Farther to the right, your nobility, there are bushes there, said the voice of the hussar, by whom Rostov was passing, half asleep. Rostov raised his head, which had fallen over almost down to his horse's mane. He drew up near the hussar. The sleep of youth, of childhood, irresistibly overcame him. Oh, dear me, what was I thinking of? I must not forget. How shall I speak to the emperor? No, that's not it. That's for tomorrow. Oh, yes, yes, that spot. Sitash. They'll be attacking us. Us? Who? the hussars, but the hussars and, and a pair of moustaches. Along the Sverskaya the hussar was riding, and I was thinking about him, right opposite Harif's house, the old man Harif. Ech, splendid little Denisov. Ah, oh, this is all nonsense. The main thing, the emperor is here now. How he looked at me and wanted to say something to me, but he did not venture. No, it was I who did not venture. This is all mixed up. But the main thing is that I must not forget that I had something important on my mind. So I had. Natashka. Natasha. Latash. Yes, that's a good joke. And again his head sank forward on the horse's mane. Suddenly it seemed to him that the enemy were firing at him. What? What? What's that? Speak! "'What is it?' cried Rostov, waking. At the instant Rostov opened his eyes, he heard in front of him, in the direction of the enemy, the prolonged shouts of thousands of voices. His horse, and the hussar's station near him, picked up their ears at these sounds. On the spot from which the cries proceeded, one point of fire after another flashed and died, and along the whole line of the French army, stretching up the hills, gleamed those fires— while the shouts grew louder and louder. Rostov made out that it was French, but could not distinguish the words. There was too great a roar of voices. All it sounded like was a confused ah and rrr. What's that? What do you think it is? asked Rostov, turning to his neighbor, the hussar. It's from the enemy, isn't it? The hussar made no reply. What? Don't you hear anything? asked Rostov after waiting for some time for the hussar to speak. "'How can anybody tell, your nobility?' replied the hussar, in a non-committal way. "'Judging from the direction, it must be the enemy, mustn't it?' inquired Rostov. "'Maybe tis, and maybe tisn't,' exclaimed the hussar. "'You see, it's night. There now, steady,' he cried to his horse, who was growing restive. Rostov's horse also became excited, and pawed the frozen ground, as he listened to the shouting and glanced at the flashing fires. The shouts of the voices constantly increased in volume. 
and mingled in a general roar, such as could have been produced only by an army of many thousand men. The fires stretched out more and more, until at last they seemed to extend throughout the French camp. Rostov had now lost all inclination to sleep. The joyful, enthusiastic huzzas in the enemy's army had a most stimulating effect upon him. Viva l'Empereur! L'Empereur! were the words that Rostov could now clearly distinguish. Well, they can't be far away. It must be just beyond the brook, said he to the hussar by his side. The hussar only sighed, without vouchsafing any answer, and coughed sullenly. Along the line of the hussars was heard the sound of horsemen coming at full gallop, and out of the darkness of the night suddenly loomed up a shape apparently larger than a colossal elephant. It was a non-commissioned officer of hussars. "'The generals, your nobility,' cried the subaltern, riding up to Rostov. Rostov, still looking in the direction of the shouting and the light, joined the subaltern and rode back to meet several horsemen who were riding along the line. One was on a white horse. It was Bagration, who, together with Prince Dolgorukov and several aides, came down to see what they could make of the strange phenomenon of the fires and the shouting in the enemy's army. Rostov rode up to Bagration, reported, and took his place among the adjutants, who were listening to what the general might say. "'Believe me,' said Prince Dolgorukov, addressing Bagration, this is nothing but a ruse. He is retreating, and has ordered the rear-guard to light fires and make a noise, so as to deceive us. It is not likely, said Bagration. Last evening I saw them on that knoll. If they were retreating, they would have abandoned it. Mr. Officer, turning to Rostov, are his scouts still there? They were there last evening, but I can't tell now, your illustriousness. If you would like, I will take some of the hussars and find out, replied Rostov. Bagration hesitated, and making no answer, tried to peer into Rostov's face. "'Well, all right. Go and reconnoitre,' said he, after a short pause. "'I will do so.' Rostov applied spurs to his horse, called Subaltern Fenchenko and two other hussars, ordered them to follow him, and galloped off down the slope in the direction of the prolonged shouts. Rostov felt both sad and glad to be riding thus alone with three hussars yonder into that mysterious and terrible misty distance where no one had preceded him. Bagration called to him from the crest not to go further than the brook, but Rostov pretended not to hear what he said, and without pausing they rode farther and farther, constantly finding themselves subject to illusions, mistaking bushes for trees, gullies for men, and constantly rectifying his impressions. After they had reached the bottom at a rapid trot, they no longer saw any fires, either on our side or on the enemy's, but the shouts of the French began to sound louder and clearer. In the ravine, he saw before him what looked to be a river, but when he approached it, he recognized that it was a highway over which he had once ridden. When he reached the highway, he reined in his horse with some uncertainty. Should he ride along the road, or cross it, or strike into the dark field on the other side, to ride along the road which shone through the fog was less perilous, because he could distinguish men at a greater distance. "'Follow me,' he cried, crossing the road, and he began to gallop up the hill toward that place where a French picket had been stationed the afternoon before. "'Your nobility, there he is!' exclaimed one of the hussars, and before Rostov had a chance to look at what was beginning to loom up black in the fog, there came a flash of fire, the report rang out, and the bullet, as though regretting something, buzzed high over their heads through the fog, and sped out of hearing. There was no second report. The powder merely flashed in the priming pan. Rostov turned his horse about and rode back at a gallop. Again from different points four musket shots rang out, and the bullets with various tones whistled by and buried themselves in the darkness. Rostov reined in his horse, which, like himself, felt a thrill of joy at the firing, and proceeded at a walk. "'Well, there it is again,' "'There it is again,' whispered some inspiriting voice in his heart, but there were no more shots. As soon as he neared Bagration, Rostov again urged his horse into a gallop, and held his hand to his visor as he approached. Dolgorukov still clung to his opinion that the French were retreating, and had kindled the fires merely for the sake of deceiving us. "'What does this signify?' he asked, as Rostov rode up to them. "'They might retreat and still leave pickets.' 
It is evident they have not all gone, Prince, said Bagration. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow, we shall know for a certainty. There is a picket, your illustriousness, in just the same place as yesterday, reported Rostov, bending forward, still holding his hand at his visor, and unable to refrain from a smile of delight at his ride, and especially at the sound of the bullets. Very good, very good, replied Bagration. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Your illustriousness, asked Rostov, allow me to ask a favor. What is it? Tomorrow our squadron is to be left in reserve. Allow me to be transferred to the first squadron. What is your name? Count Rostov. Ah, good. Stay with me as orderly. Son of Ilya Andreyitch, asked Dolgorukov, but Rostov made him no answer. So I may expect it, your illustriousness? I will see to it. Tomorrow, very likely, I may be sent with some message to the sovereign, said Rostov to himself. Glory to God! The shouts and cries in the enemy's army arose from the circumstance that at the time Napoleon's general order was being read throughout the army, the emperor himself came on horseback to inspect the bouviacs. The soldiers, seeing the emperor, lighted trusses of straw and followed him with cries of, Viva l'Empereur! Napoleon's order was as follows. Soldiers, the Russian army has come against us in order to avenge the Austrian army of Ulm. These are the same battalions which we defeated at Holobrun, and which, since that time, we have been constantly following up. The position which we occupy is paramount, and as soon as they attempt to outflank my right they will expose their own flank. Soldiers, I myself will direct your battalions. I will keep out of range of the firing if you, with your usual gallantry, carry confusion and consternation into the ranks of the enemy. But if the combat becomes for one instant doubtful, you will see your emperor exposing himself at the front to the blows of the enemy, since there can be no hesitation in the victory, especially today, when the honor of the French infantry, in whose hand lies the honor of the nation, is at stake. Do not break the ranks under the pretext of carrying away the wounded. Let each man be animated by the thought that we must conquer these mercenaries of England, filled with such hatred against our nation. This victory will bring the campaign to an end, and we can retire to winter quarters where we shall be joined by the fresh troops which are mobilizing in France. And then the peace which I shall conclude will be memorable for my people, for you and for me. Napoleon. End of chapter 13. Part 3, Chapter 14 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At five o'clock in the morning, it was still perfectly dark. The troops of the center, of the reserves, and the right wing under Bagration, were as yet motionless, but on the left wing the columns of infantry, cavalry, and artillery, ordered to be the first to descend from the heights and attack the enemy's right flank, and drive him back into the mountains of Bohemia, according to the disposition, were already stirring and beginning to rise from their couches. The smoke from the fires, into which they were throwing everything superfluous, made their eyes smart. It was cold and dark, the officers were hastily drinking their tea and breakfasting. The soldiers were munching their biscuits, kicking the round shot to warm their feet, and crowding about in front of the fires, throwing in the remains of their huts, chairs, tables, wheels, buckets, and everything that could not be taken with them. The Austrian guides came between the Russian lines and gave the signal for the start. As soon as the Austrian officer made his appearance near the quarters of a regimental commander, the regiment began to stir. The soldiers hastened from the fires, thrust their pipes into their bootlegs, their bags into the baggage wagons, put their guns in order, and fell into line. The officers buttoned themselves up, put on their swords and pouches, and inspected the lines, now and then venting their displeasure. The adjutants, battalion commanders, and colonels mounted their horses, crossed themselves, and issued their last instructions, orders, and commissions, to the train hands left in charge of the baggage. Then was heard the monotonous tramping of thousands of feet. The columns were set in motion, 
but they knew not whither they were going, and owing to the throngs that surrounded them, and the smoke and the thickening fog, they could not see either the place that they were leaving or that to which they were sent. The soldier in a military movement is as much surrounded, limited, and fettered by his regiment as a sailor is by the ship in which he sails. However far he goes, into whatever strange unknown and terrible distances he is sent, around him are always and everywhere the same comrades, the same ranks, the same sergeant, Ivan Mitrich, the same company's dog, Zotka, the same officers. Just as for the sailor, there are the same decks, the same masts, and the same cables. The sailor rarely cares to know what distances over which his ship has sailed. But on the day of a military movement, God knows how, or whence, or in what world of mystery, the soldiers hear a stern note, which is the same for all, and which signifies the nearness of something decisive and solemn, and invites them to dream of what they are not usually wont to think about. The soldiers on the day of a military movement are excited, and strive to get beyond the petty interests of their own regiment. They are all ears and eyes, and greedily ask questions about what is going to take place before them. The fog was so dense that, though it had grown lighter, it was impossible to see ten paces ahead. Bushes seemed like huge trees. Level places gave the impression of being precipices and slopes. Anywhere, at any moment, they might fall upon the enemy, who would be utterly invisible within ten paces. But the columns marched for a long time in the same fog, up hill and down dale, skirting gardens and orchards, along by places where none of them had ever been before, and still they found no enemy. On the other hand, in front of them, behind them, on all sides of them, the soldiers were made conscious that our Russian columns were all marching in the same direction. Each soldier felt a thrill at the heart, at the knowledge that many, many others of our men were going where he was going, that is, he knew not whither. See there, the Kursk men have started, said various voices in the ranks. Terrible lot of our troops collecting here, messmates. Last evening I looked around when the fires were lit, couldn't see the end of them. Like Moscow, in one word. Although not one of the division Nachalniks came near the ranks or had anything to say to the soldiers, the division Nachalniks, as we saw in the council of war, were out of sorts and dissatisfied with the work in hand, and, consequently, merely carried out the general orders and did nothing to inspirit the men. Still the soldiers marched on cheerfully, as is usually the case when they are going into action, and particularly to offensive action. But after they had been marching for about an hour, all the time in thick fog, they were ordered to halt, and an unpleasant consciousness of disorder and confusion in the operations spread through the ranks. It would be very difficult to explain how such a consciousness got abroad, but there was no doubt that it was transmitted and spread with extraordinary rapidity. The uncertainty became certainty, gaining with irresistible force as water rushes down a ravine. If the Russian army had been alone by itself, without allies, then possibly it would have taken much longer time for this consciousness of confusion to grow into a general certainty. But, as it was, all took a natural satisfaction in attributing the cause of the disorder to the stupid Germans, and were convinced that the pernicious snarl was due to the sausage-makers. "'Why are we halting? What? Have we got blocked? We can't have come afoul of the French, can we?' "'No. We should have heard from them. They'd have begun to fire at us.' They hurried us off so, and now here we are, all in muddle in the middle of the field. That's the way with those cursed Germans. They muddle everything all up. What stupid devils! If I'd had anything to do with them, I'd have put them to the front. But instead, you may be sure of it, they press us from behind. And here we are without having anything to eat. Well, I wonder if we shall be planted here all day. The cavalry, they say, is what is blocking the road exclaimed an officer. Ugh! Those damned Germans don't know their own country, said another. What division are you? cried an adjutant, riding up to them. The 18th. Then why are you here? You should have been at the front long since. You won't get there now before the afternoon. Here's a stupid piece of confusion. They themselves don't know what they're up to, said the officer, and he rode off. 
then a general passed and angrily shouted some order in a language that wasn't russian to fa la fa what sort of stuff is he jabbering can't make out a thing he says remarked a soldier mimicking the general as he rode off i'd have had them all shot down the scoundrels we were ordered to be in position by nine o'clock and now we have not got halfway there what stupid arrangements and this was heard on all sides and the feeling of energetic ardor with which the army had started out began to be wasted in vexation and anger against the arrangements and the germans the cause of the confusion was this after the austrian cavalry on the left wing had set forward those who had charge of it came to the conclusion that the russian centre was too widely separated from the right and all the cavalry was commanded to cross over to the right side several thousands of cavalrymen rode across the front of the columns of infantry and the infantry had to wait till they passed at the front a dispute had arisen between the austrian guide and a russian general the russian general shouted angrily demanding that the cavalry should stop the austrian insisted that he was not to blame but his superior officers meantime the army was obliged to halt and was growing impatient and losing spirit after an hour's delay the troops at last began to move forward once more and found themselves descending into the valley the fog which had been scattering on the heights was as thick as ever on the lower lands where they were now marching in front of them in the fog one shot and then a second was fired incoherently and at different points tra -ta -ta -ta. and then the firing became more regular and rapid and the engagement fairly began over the brook called holdbach as the troops had no expectation of falling in with the enemy so far down in the valley as the brook and then met them unexpectedly in the fog as they had no words of encouragement from their commanding officers and the idea was widespread among them that it was too late and moreover as they could not see any one either in front of them or anywhere near them owing to the density of the fog they apathetically and lazily exchanged shots with the enemy slowly moved forward and then came to a halt again failing to receive in time the word of command from their officers or the adjutants who wandered at haphazard through the fog in places with which they were unacquainted and in search of their own divisions that was the way that affairs occurred to the first second and third columns which had been ordered to march down into the valley the fourth column which kutuzov himself had under his own command was stationed on the heights of the pratzer in the lowlands where the battle had already begun the fog seemed thicker than ever but on the heights it was clear still nothing could be seen of what was going on at the front until nine o'clock no one could tell whether the enemy was in his full strength as we supposed ten versts in advance or was down there in the impenetrable fog it was now nine o'clock the fog like a fathomless sea spread over the valley but on the height in front of the village of schlapanitz on the height where napoleon stood surrounded by his marshals it was perfectly bright over them was the bright blue heaven and the mighty sun like a gigantic hollow ball of fire just rose above the milk-white sea of fog the french troops and napoleon himself with his staff were not on the farther side of the brooks and the hollows of sokolnitz and schlapanitz behind which we had expected to take up our positions and begin the engagement but they had all come over to the hither side and were so near our troops that napoleon with his naked eye could distinguish in our army a horseman from an infantry soldier napoleon mounted on his little grey arab and wearing the same blue cloak in which he had made the whole italian campaign stood a little in advance of his marshals he silently gazed at the summits of the hills seeming to emerge from the fog and watched the russian troops moving along in the distance and listened to the sounds of firing in the valley not a muscle of his face it was still thin moved his glittering eyes were steadfastly fixed upon one spot his anticipation seemed to be justified the russian troops had already in part defiled down into the ravine toward the ponds and lakes and part of them were evacuating the heights of the pretzer which he considered the key of the situation and intended to attack he could see amid the fog how down into the hollow formed by the two high hills near the village of pretzen the russian columns with glittering bayonets were steadily moving in one direction toward the valley and disappearing one after another into the sea of fog by the reports which had been brought him the evening before by the sound of wheels and footsteps that had been heard during the night along the vanguard 
by the disorderly movements of the Russian columns, by all the indications, he clearly saw in fact that the Allied armies supposed him to be posted a long distance from them, that the columns moving near in the vicinity of Pretzen constituted the center of the Russian army, and that this center was weak enough to justify him in giving it attack. But still, he did not begin the battle. That was a solemn day for him, the anniversary of his coronation. Just before morning he had taken a nap for a few hours, and then waking, healthy, jovial, fresh, and in that happy frame of mind in which everything seems possible, success certain, he mounted his horse and rode out into the field. He stood motionless, gazing at the hills becoming visible through the fog, and into his cold face there came that peculiar shade of self-confident, well-deserved happiness, such as is sometimes seen on the face of a young lad who is happy and in love. His marshals were grouped behind him, and did not venture to distract his attention. He gazed now at the heights of the pretzer, now at the sun swimming out of the fog. When the sun had risen clear above the fog, and his dazzling radiance gushed over the fields and the fog, as though this were the signal for which he was waiting to begin the affair, he drew off his glove from his handsome white hand, beckoned his marshals, and gave the order for the beginning of the battle. The marshals, accompanied by their aides, galloped off in different directions, and within a few moments the chief forces of the French army were in rapid motion toward those same heights of the Pretzer, which the Russian troops were abandoning more and more as they filed to the left and into the vale. End of chapter 14part three chapter fifteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne at eight o'clock that morning kutuzov had ridden up toward the pretzer at the head of the fourth division milodradovich's which was to take the place of the columns of preshevsky and de langeron which were now on their way down into the valley he greeted the men of the foremost regiment and gave the word of command, thereby signifying that he intended to lead that column in person. When he reached the village of Pritzen, he halted. Prince André, forming one of his large staff, stood just behind him. Prince André felt stirred and excited, and at the same time self-confident and calm, as is apt to be the case with a man at the arrival of the moment which he has been anxiously awaiting. He was firmly convinced that this day was to be his Toulon or his bridge of Arcola. How it would come about he had not the faintest idea, but he was firmly convinced that it would be. The lay of the land and the position of our forces were well known to him, so far as they could be known to any one in our army. His own strategical plan, which now seemed to be doomed never to be carried into effect, had been forgotten. Having made himself master of Weirother's scheme, Prince André wondered what possibilities might rise before him, and began to make new combinations according to which his presence of mind and firmness of might might be called into request. Toward the left, in the valley below, where the fog lay, could be heard the musket fires of the unseen opponents. There, so it seemed to Prince André, the fighting would be hottest, there the obstacles would be met with, and there I shall be sent, he said to himself, with a brigade or division and with the standard in my hand, I shall rush on and conquer everything before me. Prince André could not look at the standards of the battalions passing before him without a thrill. As he looked at one, he kept saying to himself, Maybe that is the very standard that I shall seize when I lead the army to the front. The nocturnal fog remained on the heights only in the form of hoarfrost, which was rapidly changing into dew. In the hollows, however, it still spread out like milk-white sea. Nothing could be discerned in that fog toward the left, where our troops were descending, and where the musketry firing was heard. Over the heights stretched the clear, bright sky, and at the right hung the monstrous ball of the sun. Far away toward the front, on the other shore of the sea of fog, the wooded hills could be seen rising. There the enemy must be stationed, and there some object could be distinguished. At the right, the guards, with echoing tramp and rattling wheels, and occasionally the glint of bayonets, were passing down into the dominion of the fog. 
at the left beyond the village similar masses of cavalry were filing down and disappearing from view in the sea of fog in front and behind the infantry were debouching the commander-in-chief stationed himself at the entrance of the village and allowed the troops to file past him kutuzov that morning appeared fatigued and irritated the infantry filing by him came to a halt without any orders apparently because they had come in contact with some obstacle ahead of them go and tell them to form into battalions and get outside the village said kutuzov to a general who came riding along how is it you do not understand your excellency my dear sir that it's impossible to open ranks so along a village street when we are moving against the enemy i propose to form behind the village your eminence replied the general kutuzov gave him a satyrine smile you'd be in a fine condition deploying your front in presence of the enemy very fine idea the enemy are still a long way off your eminence according to the plan the plan cried kutuzov bitterly and who told you that be good enough to do as i bid you i obey mon cher whispered nesvetsky to prince andrei the old man is surly as a dog an austrian officer in a white uniform with a green plume in his hat galloped up to kutuzov and asked him in the name of the emperor whether the fourth column were taking part in the action kutuzov without answering him turned around and his glance fell accidentally on prince andrei who was stationed near him when he noticed bolkonsky the vicious and acrimonious expression of his face softened as though to acknowledge that he was not to blame for what was taking place and still without answering the austrian adjutant he turned to bolkonsky and said in french go and see my dear if the third division has passed the village yet command them to halt and await my orders as soon as prince andrei started he called back and ask if the skirmishers are posted and what they are doing what they are doing he repeated to himself still paying no attention to the austrian prince andrei galloped off to execute this order outstripping the battalions which were all the time pressing forward he halted the third division and convinced himself that no skirmishers had been thrown out in front of our columns the general command in front of the foremost regiment was greatly amazed at the order from the commander-in-chief to throw out sharpshooters the regimental commander was firmly assured in his own mind that other troops were in front of him and that the enemy could not be less than ten versts distance in reality nothing could be discerned in front of them except waste ground which sloped down and was shrouded in fog after giving him the commander-in-chief's orders to repair his negligence prince andrei galloped back kutuzov was still in the same place and with his fat body sitting in a dumpy position in the saddle was yawning heavily with his eyes closed the troops had not yet moved but stood with grounded arms good very good said he to prince andrei and turned to the general who holding his watch in his hand said that it must be time to move since all the columns had already gone down from the left wing time enough your excellency said kutuzov we shall have time enough he repeated at this time behind kutuzov were heard the sounds of the regiments in the distance cheering and these voices quickly ran along the whole extent of the line of the russian columns under march it was evident that the one whom they greeted was approaching rapidly when the soldiers of the regiment at whose head kutuzov was stationed began to cheer he rode a little to one side and glanced around with a frown along the road from pratzen came what appeared to be a squadron of gay-coloured horsemen two of them at a round gallop rode side by side ahead of the others one was in a black uniform with a white plume on a chestnut horse groomed in the english style the other in a white uniform on a coal-black steed these were the two emperors with their suite kutuzov with the affectation of the thorough soldier found at his post shouted smirno eyes front to the soldiers halting near him and saluting rode toward the emperor his whole figure and manner had suddenly undergone a change he had assumed the mien of a subordinate of a man ready to surrender his own will with an affectation of deference which evidently was not pleasing to the emperor alexander he came to meet him and saluted him this impression crossed the young and happy face of the emperor and disappeared like the mist wreaths in the clear sky 
After his indisposition, he was a trifle thinner that day than he had been on the fields of Olmutz, where Bakonsky had for the first time seen him abroad. There was the same enchanting union of majesty and sweetness in his beautiful grey eyes, and on his thin lips the same possibility of varied feelings, and the same predominating expression of beneficent, innocent youth. At the review at Olmutz, he had been more majestic. Here he was happier and more full of energy. His face was a trifle flushed after his gallop of three verse, and as he reined in his horse, he drew a long breath and glanced around into the faces of his suite, all young men like himself, and like himself all full of life. Zartorisky and Novosilstov, and Prince Volkonsky, and Stroganov, and many others, all richly dressed, jovial young men on handsome, well-groomed, fresh-looking, and slightly sweating horses, chatting and laughing together, formed a group behind the sovereign. The Emperor Franz, a florid young man, with a long face, sat bolt upright in his saddle on his handsome black stallion, and slowly glanced around him with an anxious expression. He beckoned to one of his white-uniformed aides and asked him some question. Probably he asked at what hour they had come, thought Prince Andrei, gazing at his old acquaintance with a smile which he could not repress at the thought of his audience. The emperor's suite was composed of young orderlies, Austrian and Russian, selected from the regiments of the guards and of the line. Grooms had brought with them handsome reserve horses in embroidered comparisons for the emperors. Just as when a fresh breeze from the fields breezed through an open window into a stuffy chamber, so these brilliant young men brought with them to Kutuzov's dispirited staff the sense of youth and energy and confidence in victory. "'Why don't you begin, Mikhail Larionovitch? impatiently demanded the Emperor Alexander, turning to Kutuzov, at the same time looking curiously toward the Emperor Franz. "'I was waiting, Your Majesty,' replied Kutuzov, deferentially bowing low. The Emperor leaned toward him, frowning slightly, and giving him to understand that he did not hear. "'I was waiting, Your Majesty,' repeated Kutuzov, and Prince Andrei noted that Kutuzov's upper lip curled unnaturally when he repeated the words, "'I was waiting.' "'The columns have not all assembled, Your Majesty.' The sovereign heard, but the answer evidently displeased him. He shrugged his drooping shoulders, glanced at Novosilstov, who was standing near him, and his glance seemed to imply a certain compassion for Kutuzov. "'We are not on the Empress's field, Mikhail Larionovitch, where the review is not begun until all the regiments are present,' said the Emperor, again glancing at the Emperor Franz's eyes, as if to ask him if he would not take part so that he might listen to what he might say. But the Emperor Franz, who was still gazing about, did not heed him. "'That's the very reason I do not begin, sire,' said Kutuzov, in a ringing voice, seeming to anticipate the possibility that the Emperor might not see fit to hear him, and again a peculiar look passed over his face. "'That's the very reason I do not begin, sire, because we are not on parade and not on the Empress's field,' he repeated, clearly and distinctly. The faces of all those composing the Emperor's suite expressed annoyance and reproach, as they hastily exchanged glances on hearing these words. No matter if he is old, he ought not, he never ought to speak in that way, the faces seemed to say. However, if you give the order, Your Majesty, said Kutuzov, raising his head and again assuming that former tone of a general ready to listen to orders and to obey. He turned his horse, beckoning to division commander Miloradovich, he gave him the order to attack. The troops were again set in motion, and two battalions of the Novgorodsky regiment and one battalion of the Asferian regiment filed forward past the emperor. While this Asferian battalion was passing, the florid Miloradovich, without his cloak and with his uniform covered with orders and his hat decorated with an immense plume and set on one side with a point forward, galloped forward and gallantly saluting, reined in his horse in front of the sovereign. "'Es Bogum, God be with you, General,' exclaimed the Emperor. "'We will do our best, sire,' replied the other cheerily. Nevertheless, the gentlemen of the suite could not refrain from smiling contemptuously at the exorable way in which he pronounced his French. Miloradovich turned his horse sharply round and remained a short distance behind the Emperor. The Sferian boys— inspired by the presence of their sovereign, marched by the emperors and their suite with lively, gallant strides, keeping perfect time. "'Children,' cried Miloradovich, in a loud, 
self-confident and cheering voice, evidently roused by the sounds of the firing, the expectation of the battle, and the sight of the Asferan boys, who had been his comrades in the campaign with Suvorov, and were now briskly marching past the emperors, and roused to such a pitch that he forgot that the sovereign was present. "'Children, this is not the first village that you have had to take,' he cried. "'Do our best,' cried the soldiers. The emperor's mare started at the unexpected shout. This mare, which the emperor had ridden before during other reviews in Russia, here on the battlefield of Austerlitz carried her rider, not noticing the captious thrusts of his left heel, pricking up her ears at the sound of the musketry firing, just as she did on the field of Mars, not realizing the significance of those re-echoing volleys, nor of the neighborhood of the Emperor Franz's black stallion, nor of what the man who was on that day sat upon her back said, thought, felt. The sovereign, with a smile, turned to one of his immediate suite, and pointing to the Asphyrian lads, made some remark. End of chapter 15part three chapter sixteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle the slipper vox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne kutuzov accompanied by his aides rode slowly after the carabiners after riding half a verst he caught up with the rear end of the column and halted at a single deserted house it had apparently been a drinking house near the junction of two roads both roads led down into the valley, and both were crowded with troops. The fog began to disperse, and already two versts away could be seen, though as yet indistinctly, the ranks of the enemy on the heights opposite. Down in the valley at the left, the firing was growing more violent. Kutuzov halted, discussing some point with the Austrian general. Prince Andrei, sitting on his horse a little distance behind, gazed at them, and then, wishing to obtain the use of a field-glass, turned to one of the aides who had one. "'Look! Look!' exclaimed this adjutant, turning his glass not at the distant host, but to a hill nearby in front of them. "'Look! There are the French!' The two generals and the adjutants reached after the glass, one taking it from the other. All the faces suddenly changed, and an expression of dismay came into them. They expected to find the French two versts away, and there they were unexpectedly appearing right at hand, is that the enemy? It can't be. Yes, look, they. Certainly it is. What does it mean? exclaimed various voices. Prince Andrei, with his naked eye, could see a dense mass of the French moving up at the right to meet the Esferian boys, not more than five hundred paces from the very spot where Kutuzov was standing. Here it is. The decisive moment is at hand. My chance has come, said Prince Andrei, and starting up his horse he approached Kutuzov. The Asphyrian men ought to be halted, your eminence, he cried. But at that very instant all became veiled in smoke. The rattle of musketry sounded near them, and a naively terrified voice only two steps from Prince Andrei called, Well, brothers, it's all up with us. And this voice seemed to be a command. At this voice all started to run. Confused, but still constantly increasing throngs ran back by the very same place where five minutes before the troops had filed so proudly past the emperors. Not only was it hard to arrest these fugitives, but it was even impossible not to be borne back by the mob. Balkonsky could only struggle not to let them pass him, and he gazed around, finding it quite out of the question to understand what was taking place at the front. Nezvitsky, with angry face, flushed and quite unlike himself, cried to Kutuzov that if he did not instantly come away, he would probably be taken prisoner. Kutuzov still stayed in the same place, and without answering, took out his handkerchief. A stream of blood was trickling from his face. Prince Andrei forced his way through to where he was. "'You are wounded?' he asked, scarcely controlling the trembling of his lower jaw. "'The wound is not here, but yonder,' said Kutuzov, pressing his handkerchief to his wounded cheek and pointing to the fugitives. "'Halt them!' he cried, and at the same time, evidently convinced that it was an impossibility to bring them to a halt, he gave spurs to his horse and rode off to the right." New masses of fugitives came pouring along like a torrent, engulfed him, and bore him along with them. These troops were pouring back in such a dense throng that when one was once entangled in the midst of it, there was great difficulty in extricating oneself. Some shouted, He's coming! Why don't you let him pass? 
others turned around and fired their muskets into the air others struck the horse on which kutuzov rode but by the exercise of supreme force kutuzov accompanied by his staff diminished by more than half struggled through to the left and rode off in the direction of the cannonading herd not far away prince andrei also forcing his way through the throng of fugitives and endeavoring not to become separated from kutuzov could make out through the reek of gunpowder smoke a russian battery on the side of the hill still blazing away vigorously while the french were just marching against it a little higher up stood the russian infantry neither moving forward to the aid of the battery nor back in the same direction with the fugitives a general spurred down from this brigade of infantry and approached kutuzov out of kutuzov's staff only four men were left and all were pale and silently exchanged glances stop those poltroons cried kutuzov all out of breath as the regimental commander came up to him and pointing to the fugitives but at that very second as though for punishment for those words like a bevy of birds a number of bullets flew buzzing over the heads of the regiment and of kutuzov's staff the french were charging the battery and when they caught sight of kutuzov they aimed at him at this volley the regimental commander suddenly clapped his hand to his leg a few soldiers fell and an ensign standing with the flag dropped it from his hand the flag reeled and fell catching on the bayonets of the soldiers near him the men began to load and fire without orders oh groaned kutuzov with an expression of despair and glanced around bolkonsky he whispered his weak old man's voice trembling with emotion bolkonsky he whispered pointing to the demoralized battalion and at the enemy what does this mean but before he had uttered these words prince andrei conscious of the tears of shame and anger choking him had already leaped from his horse and rushed toward the standard children follow me he cried in his youthful penetrating voice here it is thought prince andrei as he seized the flagstaff and he listened with rapture to the whiz of the bullets that were evidently directed straight at him a number of the soldiers fell hurrah cried prince andrei instantly seizing the flag and rushing forward with unfailing confidence that the whole battalion would follow him in fact he ran on only a few steps alone then one soldier was stirred and then another and the whole battalion with huzzas dashed forward and overtook him a non-commissioned officer of the battalion grasped the standard which from its weight shook in prince andrei's hand but he was instantly shot down prince andrei again grasped the flag and dragging it along by the staff followed after the battalion in front of him he saw our artillerymen some fighting others abandoning the guns and running toward him he also saw the french infantry who had seized the artillery horses and were reversing the field pieces prince andrei and the battalion were now only twenty paces distant from the battery he heard the incessant whizzing of the bullets over his head and the soldiers constantly groaning and falling at his left and at his right but he did not look at them his eyes were fastened only on what was going on in front of him where the battery was he now saw distinctly a red-headed artilleryman with his shako knocked in and on one side struggling with a french soldier for the possession of the ramrod prince andrei distinguished clearly the distorted and angry faces of these two men who evidently were not aware of what they were doing what are they up to queried prince andrei as he looked at them why doesn't the sandy artillerist run if he has no weapons and why doesn't the frenchman finish him he wouldn't have time to get any distance though before the frenchman would recollect his musket and put an end to him in point of fact another frenchman with pointed bayonet ran up to the combatants and the fate of the red-haired artillerist who had no idea what was coming upon him and had just triumphantly made himself master of the ramrod must have been sealed but prince andrei did not witness the end of the struggle it seemed to him as though one of the approaching soldiers struck him in the head with the full weight of a cudgel it was rather painful but his chief sensation was that of displeasure because it distracted his attention and prevented him from seeing what he had been looking at what does this mean am i falling surely my legs are giving way he said to himself and he fell on his back he opened his eyes hoping to see how the struggle between the artillerymen and the frenchmen ended and anxious to know whether or not the red-haired artillerist was killed or not and the cannon saved or captured but he could see nothing of it over him he could see nothing except the sky the lofty sky no longer clear but still immeasurably lofty and with light gray clouds slowly wandering over it 
how still calm and solemn how entirely different from when i was running said prince andrei to himself it was not so when we were all running and shouting and fighting how entirely different it is from when the frenchmen and the artillerymen with vindictive and frightened faces were struggling for possession of the ramrod it wasn't so that the clouds then floated over the infinite depths of sky how is it that i never before saw this lofty sky and how glad i am that i have learned to know it at last yes all is empty all is deception except these infinite heavens nothing nothing at all beside and even that is nothing but silence and peace and thank god end of chapter 16Part three, chapter seventeen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At nine o'clock, the right wing under Bagration had not as yet begun to fight. Unwilling to acquiesce in Dolgorukov's urgency to begin the battle, and anxious to escape the responsibility, Prince Bagration proposed to the latter to send and make inquiries of the commander in chief. Bagration knew that as the distance separating the two wings was almost ten versts, the messenger, if he were not killed, which was very probable, and even if he found the commander-in-chief, which would be extremely difficult, would not have time to return till late in the afternoon. Bagration glanced over his staff, with his great, expressionless, sleepy eyes, and was involuntarily attracted by Rostov's boyish face, full of excitement and hope. He chose him for the messenger." and if i should meet his majesty first before i found the commander-in-chief your illustriousness asked rostof touching his cap visor you can give the message to his majesty said dolgorukov taking the words out of bagration's mouth after he was relieved at the outposts rostof had been able to catch a few hours sleep before the morning and felt happy full of daring and resolution and brimming over with elasticity of motion and confidence in his own good fortune in such a state of mind everything seems easy bright and possible all his desires had been fulfilled that morning a general engagement was to be fought he was to take part in it moreover he had been made orderly on the staff of one of the bravest generals nay more he was entrusted with a message to kutuzov and might have to deliver it to the sovereign himself the morning was clear and bright the horse that he rode was excellent his heart was full of joy and courage Having received his instructions, he struck in the spurs and galloped off along the line. At first he passed in front of Bagration's forces, which had not as yet engaged, and were ranged in motionless ranks. Then he rode into the space occupied by Uvarov's cavalry, and here he began to remark some excitement and indications of readiness for battle. After passing Uvarov's cavalry, he began to distinguish clearly the sounds of cannonading and musketry in front of him. The firing kept growing more violent. The morning air was fresh and clear, and it was no longer firing at irregular intervals, two or three shots at a time, and then one or two cannon shot, but along the declivities of the hills in front of Pratzen was heard the thunder of musketry, dominated by such frequent reports from the heavy guns that often a number of them could not be distinguished apart, but mingled in one general rumble. It could be seen how over the mountainside the puffs of smoke from the muskets seemed to run along, chasing each other, and how the great clouds of smoke from the cannon rolled whirling up, spread and mingled in the air. By the glint of bayonets through the smoke, the masses of infantry could be seen moving along, and the narrow ribbons of artillery, with their green caissons. Rostov reined in his horse on a hilltop for a moment, in order to watch what was going on, but in spite of the closeness of his scrutiny, he could not make out or decipher himself from what he saw. What men were moving in the smoke— or what bodies of troops were hurrying this way and that, back and forth. But why? Who are they? Where are they going? It was impossible to tell. This spectacle did not arouse in him any melancholy or timid feelings. On the contrary, they filled him with a new energy and zeal. Well, then, give it to them again, said he, mentally replying to these sounds. And again he started on a gallop along the lines, making his way farther and farther within the domain of troops already now entering into the action. How this is going to turn out yonder I do not know, but it will be all right, thought Rostov. Having passed by some of the troops of the Austrian army, 
Rostov noticed that the portion of the line next, they were the guards, were already moving to the attack. So much the better, I can see it close at hand, he said to himself. He was now riding along almost at the very front. A number of horsemen were galloping in his direction. These were our Lieb Uhlans, who, with broken and disorderly ranks, were returning from the charge. Rostov passed them and could not help noticing that one of them was covered with blood, but he galloped on. That's of no consequence to me, he said to himself. He had ridden only a few hundred paces further when he perceived at his left, coming down upon him, an immense body of cavalry extending the whole length of the field and likely to cross his path. They were on coal-black horses and dressed in brilliant white uniforms. Rostov spurred his horse at full speed so as to get out of the way of these cavalrymen, and he would easily have done so had they kept on at the same pace all the time, but they rode faster and faster, and some of the horses were almost upon him. Rostov distinguished more and more clearly the trampling of their feet and the jingling of their arms, and could see more and more distinctly their horses, their figures, and their faces. These were our cavalier guards, on their way to charge the French cavalry, who were deploying to meet them. The cavalier guards came galloping along, still keeping their horses under restraint. Rostov could already see their faces, and hear the word of command spoken by an officer. Marsh! Marsh! who was urging on his blooded charger. Rostov, afraid of being crushed or carried away into the charge against the French, spurred along the front with all the speed that he could get out of his horse, and still it seemed as though he were going to fail of it. The last rider in the line, a pockmarked man of giant frame, frowned angrily when he saw Rostov in front of him, knowing that they must infallibly come into collision. This guardsman would surely have overthrown Rostov, for Rostov himself could not help seeing how small and slight he and Bedouin were, in comparison with these tremendous men and horses, if he had not had the presence of mind to shake his riding-whip into the eyes of the guardsman's horse. The charger, black as coal, heavy and high, shied, cropping back his ears, but the pock-marked rider plunged his huge spurs into his side with all his might, and the charger, arching his tail and stretching out his neck, rushed onwards faster than ever. Rostov was hardly out of the way of the guardsmen when he heard their huzzas, and glancing around saw that their front ranks were already mingling with strange horsemen with red epaulets, apparently the French. Farther away it was impossible to see anything, because immediately after this on the other side the cannon began to belch forth smoke, and everything was shrouded. At the moment that the guardsmen dashed past him and were lost to view in the smoke, Rostov was undecided in his own mind whether he should gallop after them or go where his duty called him. This was that brilliant charge of the cavalier guards, which the French themselves so much admired. It was terrible for Rostov when he heard afterward that out of all that throng of handsome young giants, out of all those brilliant rich young men, officers and yunkers mounted on splendid chargers who galloped past him, only eighteen were left alive after the charge. Why should I envy them? My turn will come and perhaps I shall see the sovereign very soon now, thought Rostov, as he galloped on. When he came up to the infantry of the guards, his attention was called to the fact that shot and shell were flying over them and all around them, not so much because he heard the sounds of the missiles as because he saw dismay on the faces of the soldiers and an unnatural martial solemnity on the faces of the officers. As he was riding behind one of the infantry regiments of the guard, he heard a voice calling him by name. Rostov! "'What is it?' he replied, not seeing that it was Boris. "'What do you think of this? We were put in the front line. Our regiment has been in a charge,' said Boris, smiling with the happy face such as young men wear when they have been for the first time under fire. Rostov drew up. "'Have you indeed?' he said. "'And how was it?' "'Repulsed,' said Boris eagerly, and becoming talkative. "'You can imagine,' and Boris began to relate how the guards, as they stood in their places and seeing troops in front of them, mistook them for Austrians, and then suddenly by the shots that came flying over them from these same troops, recognized that they were in the front line and unexpectedly engaged in the conflict. Rostov, not stopping to hear Boris to the end of the story, started his horse. "'Where are you bound?' "'To His Majesty, with a message.' "'There he is,' said Boris, who supposed that Rostov wanted His Highness instead of His Majesty, and therefore pointed him to the Grand Duke, who was standing not a hundred paces away. Dressed in a helmet and a cavalier guard collet or jacket, with elevated shoulders and frowning face, 
he was shouting something to a pale Austrian officer in a white uniform. "'No, that's the Grand Duke, but my errand is to the Commander-in-Chief, or to the Emperor,' said Rostov, and was just getting his horse under way. "'Count! Count!' cried Berg, who, no less excited than Boris had been, came running out from the other side. "'Count, I have been wounded in my right arm,' said he, pointing to his wrist, which was bloody and wrapped up in a handkerchief, and I stayed at the front. Count, I had to hold my sword in my left hand. In our family all the von Bergs have been knighted. Berg went on to say something more, but Rostov, not stopping to listen to him, was already far away. Passing by the guards and across a vacant space, Rostov, in order not to get into the front again, as he had been when he was caught by the charge of the cavalier guards, rode along the line of the reserves, making a considerable detour of the place where the most violent cannonade and musketry firing was heard. Suddenly he heard loud volleys of musketry before him, and behind our troops, in a place where he would never have suspected the presence of the enemy. "'What can that mean?' wondered Rostov. "'Can the enemy have outflanked us?' "'It cannot be,' he said to himself, and a horror of fear for himself and for the success of the battle suddenly came over him. "'Whatever it is, however,' he thought, now there's no avoiding it. I must find the commander-in-chief here, and if all is lost, then it is my place to perish with the rest. The gloomy presentiment which had come over him was more and more made certainty the farther he rode into the fields behind the village of Pratzen, which were occupied by throngs of demoralized troops. What does this mean? What can this mean? At whom are they firing? Who is firing? he inquired, as he overtook Russian and Austrian soldiers running in confused throngs across his path. "'The devil only knows. He has beaten us all. All is lost,' answered the throngs of the fugitives in Russian, in German, and in Bohemian, and they could tell no better than he himself could what was going on there. "'Hang the Germans!' cried one. "'The devil take em, the traitors!' "'Zum Henker dieser Russen! To the devil with these Russians!' stammered some German." A number of wounded were wandering down the road. Curses, cries, groans, mingled in one general uproar. The firing ceased. As Rostov afterwards heard, Russian and Austrian soldiers had fired at each other. Bouzmoi, my God, what does this mean? thought Rostov. And here, where any minute the emperor might see them. But no, these were apparently only a few cowards. This is only transient. This is nothing. It cannot be, he said to himself. I must get by them as soon as possible. The idea of a defeat, and of a total defeat, could not enter Rostov's head. Although he could see the French cannon and troops on the Pratzer, on the very place where he had been commanded to find the commander-in-chief, he could not, and would not, believe this. End of chapter 17《パート3》Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Rostov had been told that he should find Kutuzov and the Emperor somewhere in the vicinity of the village of Pratzen, but they were not to be found there, nor was a single Nachalnik in sight, but everywhere throngs of fleeing troops of all nationalities. He spurred on his horse, which was already growing fagged so as to pass by these fugitives as quickly as possible, but the farther he went, the more demoralized he found the forces. Along the high roads where he was riding, carriages and equipages of all sorts were crowded together. Russian and Austrian soldiers of all the different branches of the service. Wounded and not wounded. All this mess hummed and confusedly swarmed under the dispiriting sounds of the shells fired from French batteries, posted on the heights overlooking Pratzen. "'Where is the Emperor? Where is Kutuzov?' asked Rostov of all whom he could bring to a stop, but not one could vouchsafe him any answer. At last seizing a soldier by the collar, he obliged him to reply. "'Eh, hey, brother, they've all been yonder this long time, all cut sticks,' said the soldier laughing for some reason, and breaking away. Releasing the soldier, who was evidently drunk, Rostov managed to stop the denschik, or the groom, of some person of consequence, and began to ply him with questions. The dense chick told Rostov that the emperor had been driven by an hour before at full speed, in a carriage along this same road, and that the emperor had been wounded. "'It cannot be,' said Rostov. 
it must have been someone else i myself saw him said the denschik with a self-satisfied laugh i ought to know the sovereign by sight i should like to know how many times i have seen him in petersburg he leaned back in the carriage and was pale very pale heavens what a rate those four black horses thundered by us here i should think i might know the tsar's horses and ilya ivanuitch i guess ilya the coachman wouldn't be very likely to drive by with any one less than the tsar rostof gave his horse the spur and started to ride farther a wounded officer passing by turned to him who was it you wanted asked the officer the commander-in-chief he was killed by a cannonball hit him in the chest right at the head of our regiment not killed only wounded said another officer who kutuzov asked rostov no not kutuzov but what do you call him ah well it's all the same not many are left alive if you go down yonder yonder to that village you'll find all the commanders gathered said the officer pointing to the village of gostiradek and he passed on rostov walked his horse not knowing now where to go or whom to seek the sovereign wounded the battle lost it was impossible to believe that even now rostov rode away in the direction indicated by the officer in the distance could be seen towers and a church what was the need of him to hurry what had he now to say to the sovereign or to kutuzov even if they were alive and not wounded that road take that road your nobility else they'll shoot you down yonder cried a soldier to him they'll shoot you oh what are you talking about cried another that's the nearest way to where he's going rostof considered a moment and then rode in exactly the direction where they said that he would be killed now it's all the same to me if the sovereign is wounded why should i try to save my life he asked himself he rode out on the open space where there had been the heaviest slaughter of men escaping from Pratzen. the french had not yet occupied this place and the russians that is those who were alive or only slightly wounded had long before abandoned it on the ground like shocks of corn on a fertile field lay ten men fifteen men killed or wounded on every root of the place the wounded had crawled together two or three at a time and their cries and groans could be heard most gruesomely though it seemed to rostof that they were often simulated he put his horse at a trot so as not to see all these suffering men and a great horror overcame him he was not afraid for his own life but lest he should lose the manliness which he felt was essential to him he knew that he could not endure the spectacle of those unfortunate wretches the french had ceased to fire on this field strewn with dead and wounded because there was no longer any sign of life on it but when they caught sight of the adjutant riding across they turned one of their cannon on it and sent a few balls after him the sensation caused by these terrific whistling sounds and the spectacle of the dead around him aroused in rostof's mind an impression of horror and self-commiseration he recalled his mother's last letter how would she feel he asked himself if she should see me now here in this field with these cannon pointed at me at the village of gostiradek the russian troops were retiring from the field of battle in good order though the regiments were mixed together this was out of range of the french cannonballs and the sounds of the firing seemed more distant here all clearly saw and openly confessed that the battle was lost no one to whom rostov applied for information could tell him where the emperor was or where kutuzov was some declared that the report about the sovereign being wounded was correct others denied it and explained this false though widespread rumor by the fact that the oberhofmarschall count tolstoy who had gone out in company of others of the suite to see the battle had dashed away pale and frightened from the field of battle in the emperor's carriage one officer told rostov that in the rear of the village over toward the left he had seen some officials of high rank and rostov started in that direction not indeed with the expectation of finding any one but merely for the sake of clearing his conscience after riding three versts and passing beyond the last of the russian troops rostov reached an orchard protected by a ditch and saw two riders standing near the ditch one with a white plume in his hat had a familiar look the other rider whom he did not know was mounted on a handsome chestnut charger this charger somehow seemed familiar to rostov and rode up to the ditch put spurs to his horse and giving him his head easily leaped the ditch into the orchard 
the earth merely crumbled away a little from the embankment under the horse's hind hoofs. Turning his horse short, he leaped back over the ditch again and addressed himself respectfully to the rider with the white plume, apparently urging him to do the same thing. The rider whose figure Rostov seemed to recognize, and had therefore involuntarily attracted his attention, shook his head and made a gesture of refusal with his hand, and Rostov immediately by this gesture knew that it was his idolized, lamented sovereign. But it cannot be that he is left alone in this bare field, thought Rostov. Just then Alexander turned his head, so that he had a good view of those beloved features so sharply graven in his memory. The sovereign was pale, his cheeks sunken, and his eyes cavernous, but there was all the more charm, all the more sweetness in his features. Rostov was delighted to be convinced that the rumor of the sovereign's wound was false. He was happy to have seen him. He knew that he might, nay, that he ought, go straight up to him and deliver the message that had been entrusted to him by Dolgorukov. But just as a young man in love trembles and loses his presence of mind, not daring to say what he has been dreaming about night after night, and timidly looks around, in search of help or the possibility of postponing it, when the wished-for moment has at last arrived, and he stands alone with her. So also with Rostov, now that he had attained what he had yearned for more than all else in the world, he did not know how to approach his sovereign, and devised a thousand excuses for finding it untimely, improper, and impossible. What? I might seem to be taking advantage of his being alone and dejected. An unknown face at this moment of sorrow might seem unpleasant and troublesome. Besides, what could I say to him now, when one glance from him makes my heart swell within me and seem to leap into my mouth? Not one of those innumerable speeches which he had so carefully prepared in case he should meet the emperor now recurred to his mind. Those speeches were for the most part indicated under different conditions. They were to be spoken at the moment of victory and triumph. Above all, on his deathbed, when he sank under the wounds that he had received, his sovereign would come to see him and thank him for his heroic conduct. Thus he would show him his love sealed by his death. Besides, what now could I ask the emperor in regard to his commands to the left wing, when now already it is four o'clock in the afternoon, and the battle is lost? No, really I ought not to trouble him. I ought not to break in upon his reflections. It would be better to die a thousand times than to receive an angry look or an angry word from him. Such was Rostov's decision, and melancholy, and with despair in his heart he rode away, constantly glancing back at the emperor, still remaining in the same undecided attitude. While Rostov was making these reflections and sadly rode away from his sovereign, Captain von Toll galloped up to the same place, and seeing the emperor went straight up to him, offered him his services, and helped him to cross the ditch on foot. The emperor, wishing to rest and feeling ill, sat down under an apple tree, and Toll stood near him. Rostov looked from afar, and saw with jealousy and regret how von Toll talked long and eagerly to the sovereign, and how the sovereign, apparently weeping, covered his eyes with one hand, and with the other pressed von Toll's. And I might have done that in his place, thought Rostov, and with difficulty restraining the tears of sympathy for his sovereign, he rode away in utter despair, not knowing now where he should go or for what reason. His despair was all the more bitter, because he felt that his own weakness was the cause of his misfortune. He might, not only might, but he ought to have ridden up to the emperor. And this was his only chance of exhibiting to the sovereign his devotion, and he did not take advantage of it. "'Why did I do so?' he asked himself, and he turned his horse about, and galloped back to the same place where the emperor had been sitting, but there was no one any longer on the other side of the ditch. A train of baggage-wagons and carriages was winding along. From one of the wagoneers Rostov learned that Kutuzov's staff were not very far away, at the village where the wagons were bound. Rostov followed them. The foremost in the train, Kutuzov's groom, leading a horse with his trappings, the wagons followed behind the groom, and behind the wagon walked an old man, a household serf, with bandy legs, wearing a cap and a half shuba. "'Tit! Ah, tit!' cried the groom. "'What is it?' asked the old man heedlessly. "'Tit! Tit! Grind the wheat! Eeh! Durak! Tch! said the old man, angrily spitting. Some time passed in silence as they moved onward, 
and then the same joking rhyme was repeated. By five o'clock in the evening the battle was lost at every point. More than a hundred cannon had already fallen into the hands of the French. Prashevsky and his battalion had laid down their arms. The other columns, having lost more than half their efficient, were retreating in disorderly, demoralized throngs. The relics of Langeron and Dukhtorov's forces, all in confusion, were crowded together around the ponds, on the dikes and banks of the village of August. By six o'clock the only cannonading that was any longer heard was directed at the dike of August by some of the French, who had established a large battery on the slopes of the Pratzer, and were trying to cut down our men as they retreated. At the rear, Dokhtorov and some others, having collected their battalions, made a stand against the French, who were pursuing our troops. It had begun to be entirely dark. On the narrow dike of August, where so many years the little old miller had peacefully sat with his hook and line, while his grandson, with shirt-sleeves rolled up, played in the water-can with a palpitating silver fish. On that dike, over which the Moravians, in shaggy caps and blue blouses, had driven their two horse teams loaded down with spring wheat, and returned dusted with flour and with whitened teams. Along this same dike, this narrow dike, among vans and field pieces, under the feet of horses and between the wheels, crowded a throng of men, their faces distorted with fear of death, pushing each other, expiring, trampling on the dying and dead, and crushing each other, only to be killed themselves a few steps farther on. Every ten seconds a cannonball, compressing the air, flew by, or a shell came bursting amid this dense throng, dealing death and spattering with blood those who stood nearby. Dolokhov, wounded in the arm, on foot with ten men of his company, he was now an officer again, and his regimental commander, on horseback, constituted the sole survivors of the whole regiment. Carried along in the throng, they were crowded together at the very entrance of the dike, and pressed on all sides, were obliged to halt, because a horse attached to a field piece had fallen, and the throng were trying to drag it along. One cannonball struck someone behind them, another struck just in front, and spattered Dolokhov with blood. The crowd moved on in desperation, squeezing together, and then halted again. If only we could make those hundred paces, and safety is sure, if we stay here two minutes longer, our destruction is certain, said each one to himself. Dolokhov, standing in the midst of the throng, forced his way through to the edge of the dike, knocking down two soldiers, and sprang out on the glare ice that covered the pond. "'Turn out this way,' he cried, sliding along on the ice, which bent under his weight. "'Turn out,' he cried to the gunner. "'It will hold! It will hold!' And it was evident that it would immediately give way, if not under his weight alone, certainly under that of the field piece or the throng of men. They looked at him, and crowded along the shore, not venturing to step upon the ice. The commander of the regiment, sitting on horseback at the entrance, was just raising his hand and opening his mouth to speak to Dolokhov, when suddenly a cannonball flew so close over the men that they all ducked their heads. There was a dull thud as though something soft were struck, and the general fell in a pool of blood. No one looked at the general, or thought of picking him up. "'Come on the ice! Cross the ice!' come on move on don't you hear come was heard suddenly from innumerable voices after the cannonball had struck the general though the men knew not what or why they were crying one of the last field pieces that was just entering the dike ventured on the ice a throng of soldiers hastened down from the ground upon the frozen pond one of the rearmost soldiers broke through one leg slumping down into the water he tried to save himself and sank up to his belt. The men who stood nearest held back. The driver of the field piece drew in his horses, but still behind them were heard the shouts, "'Take to the ice! What are you stopping for? Take to the ice! Take to the ice!' and cries of horror were heard among the throng. The soldiers surrounding the gun gesticulated over their horses and beat them to make them turn and go on. The horses struck out from the shore. The ice— which might have held the foot-soldiers, gave way in one immense sheet, and forty men who were on it threw themselves some forward and some back, trampling on each other. All the time the cannonballs kept regularly whistling by and falling on the ice, into the water, and, more frequently than all, into the mass of men that covered the dike, the ponds, and the banks. 
End of chapter 18part three chapter nineteen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne on the pratzer hill in the same spot where he had fallen with the flagstaff in his hand lay prince andrei bolkonsky his life-blood oozing away and unconsciously groaning with light pitiful groans like an ailing child by evening he ceased to groan and lay absolutely still he did not know how long his unconsciousness continued suddenly he felt that he was alive and suffering from a burning and tormenting pain in his head where is that lofty heaven which i had never seen before and which i saw to-day that was his first thought and i never knew such pain as this either he said to himself yes i have never known anything anything at all till now but where am i he tried to listen and heard the trampling hoofs of several horses approaching and the sounds of voices talking french he opened his eyes over him still stretched the same lofty heavens with clouds sailing over it in still loftier heights and beyond them he could see the depths of endless blue he did not turn his head or look at those who to judge from the hoof-beats of the horses and the sounds of the voices rode up to him and paused these horsemen were napoleon accompanied by two aides bonaparte who had been riding over the field of battle had given orders to strengthen the battery that was cannonading the dyke of august and was now looking after the killed and wounded left on the battlefield de beaux hommes handsome men said napoleon gazing at a russian grenadier who lay on his belly with his face half buried in the soil and his neck turning black and one arm flung out and stiffened in death. The ammunition for the field guns is exhausted, sire. Half that of the reserves brought, said Napoleon, and then a step or two nearer he paused over Prince André, who lay on his back with the flagstaff clutched in his hands. The flag had been carried off by the French as a trophy. Voilà, un bel amant, said Napoleon, gazing at Balkonsky. Prince André realized that this was said of him, and that it was spoken by napoleon he heard them address the speaker as sire but he heard these words as though they had been the buzzing of a fly he was not only not interested in them but they made no impression upon him and he immediately forgot them his head throbbed as with fire he felt that his life-blood was ebbing and he still saw far above him the distant eternal heavens he knew that this was napoleon his hero but at this moment napoleon seemed to him merely a small insignificant man in comparison with that lofty infinite heaven with the clouds flying over it it was a matter of utter indifference to him who stood looking down upon him or what was said about him at that moment he was merely conscious of a feeling of joy that people had come to him and of a desire that these people give him assistance and bring him back to life which seemed to him so beautiful because he understood it so differently now he collected all his strength to move and make some sound he managed to move his legs slightly and uttered a weak feeble sickly moan that stirred pity even in himself ah he is alive said napoleon take up this young man ce jeune homme and take him to the temporary hospital having given this order napoleon went on to meet marshal lens who removing his hat and smiling rode up and congratulated him on the victory Prince André recollected nothing further. He lost consciousness of the terrible pain caused by those who placed him on the stretcher, and by the jolting as he was carried along, and the probing of the wound. He recovered it again only at the very end of the day, as he was carried to the hospital together with the other Russian wounded, and taken prisoner. At this time he felt a little fresher, and was able to glance around, and even to speak. The first words which he heard after he came to were spoken by a French officer in charge of the convoy, who said, "'We must stop here. The Emperor's coming by immediately. It will give him pleasure to see these prisoners.' "'There are so many prisoners to-day, almost the whole Russian army. I should think it would have become an old story,' said another officer. "'Well, at any events, this man here, they say, was the commander of all the Emperor Alexander's guards,' said the first speaker." indicating a wounded Russian officer in a white cavalier guard's uniform. Volkonsky recognized Prince Repnin, whom he had met in Petersburg society. 
Next him was a youth of nineteen, an officer of the cavalier guard also wounded. Bonaparte, coming up at a gallop, reined in his horse. "'Who is the chief officer here?' he asked, looking at the wounded. They pointed to Colonel Prince Repnin. "'Were you the commander of the Emperor Alexander's Horse Guard Regiment?' asked Napoleon. "'I commanded a squadron,' replied Repnin. "'Your regiment did its duty with honor," remarked Napoleon. "'Praise from a great commander is the highest reward that a soldier can have,' said Repnin. "'It is with pleasure that I give it to you,' replied Napoleon. "'Who is this young man next you?' Prince Repnin named Lieutenant Suchtelen. Napoleon glanced at him and said with a smile, "'Il est venu, bien jeune de faute et nous, very young to oppose us.' "'Youth does not prevent one from being brave,' replied Suchtelen in a broken voice. "'A beautiful answer,' said Napoleon. "'Young man, you will get on in the world.' Prince Andrei, who had been placed also in the front rank, under the eyes of the emperor, so as to swell the number of those who had been taken prisoner, naturally attracted his attention. Napoleon evidently remembered having seen him on the field, and turning to him he used exactly the same expression, young man, as when Bolkonsky had the first time come under his notice. Et vous, jeune homme? Well, and you, young man, said he, addressing him. How do you feel, mon brave? Although five minutes before this Prince André had been able to say a few words to the soldiers who were bearing him, he now fixed his eyes directly on Napoleon, but had nothing to say. To him at this moment all the interests occupying Napoleon seemed so petty, his former hero himself, with his small vanity and delight in the victory, seemed so sordid in comparison with that high, true, and just heaven which he had seen and learned to understand, and that was why he could not answer him. Yes, and everything seemed to him so profitless and insignificant in comparison with that stern and majestic train of thought induced in his mind by his lapsing strength, as his life-blood ebbed away, by his suffering and the near expectation of death. As Prince Andrei looked into Napoleon's eyes, he thought of the insignificance of majesty, of the insignificance of life, the meaning of which no one could understand, and of the still greater insignificance of death the thought of which no one could among men understand or explain. The emperor, without waiting for any answer, turned away, and as he started to ride on, said to one of the officers, Have these gentlemen looked after and conveyed to my bouviac. Have Dr. Larry himself looked after their wounds. Au revoir, Prince Repnin, and he touched the spurs to his horse and galloped away. His face was bright with self-satisfaction and happiness. The soldiers carrying Prince Andrei had taken from him the gold medallion which the Princess Maria had hung around her brother's neck, but when they saw the flattering way in which the Emperor treated the prisoners, they hastened to return the medallion. Prince Andrei did not see how or by whom the medallion was replaced, but he suddenly discovered on his chest, outside of his uniform, the little image attached to its slender golden chain. It would be good, thought Prince Andrei. Letting his eyes rest on the medallion which his sister had hung around his neck with so much feeling and reverence, it would be good if everything were as clear and simple as it seems to the Princess Maria. How good it would be to know where to find help in this life, and what to expect after it, beyond the grave! How happy and composed I should be, if I could say now, Lord, have mercy on me! But to whom can I say that? It is force, impalpable, incomprehensible, which I cannot turn to, or even express in words. Is it the great all, or nothingness, said he to himself, or is it God which is sewed in this amulet which my sister gave me? Nothing, nothing is certain, except the insignificance of all within my comprehension, and the majesty of that which is incomprehensible, but all-important. The stretcher started off. At every jolt he again felt the insufferable pain. His fever grew more violent, and he began to be delirious. The dreams about his father, his wife, his sister, and his unborn son, and the feeling of tenderness which he had experienced on the night before the battle, the figure of the little insignificant Napoleon, and above all the lofty sky, formed the principal content of his feverish imaginations. He seemed to be living a quiet life amid calm, domestic happiness 
at Luisia Gouri. He was beginning to take delight in this blissful existence, when suddenly the little Napoleon appeared with his unsympathetic, shallow-minded face, expressing happiness at the unhappiness of others, and once more doubts began to arise and torment him, and only the skies seemed to promise healing balm. Toward morning all his imaginations were utterly confused and blurred in the chaos and fogs of unconsciousness and forgetfulness, which much more likely, according to the opinion of Dr. Loray, Napoleon's physician, would end with death than recovery. C'est un sujeuner very belou. Il ne échappe pas bas. He won't recover. Prince André, together with other prisoners hopelessly wounded, was turned over to the care of the natives of the region. End of chapter 19 End of part 3 And end of volume 1 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle And recorded by Marianne Spiegel in Chicago, Illinois February 2013 Thank you to Cat Rose for proof-listening this volume